Chapter 19 Inanimate Objects In dealing with those charges which may be classed under the above description one can safely say that there is scarcely an object under the sun which has not at some time or other been introduced into a coat of arms or crest. One cannot usefully make a book on armory assume the character of a general encyclopedia of useful knowledge, and reference will only be made in this chapter to a limited number. Including those which from frequent usage have obtained a recognized heraldic character. Mention may, at the outset, be made of certain letters of the alphabet. Instances of these are scarcely common, but the family of Keketmore may be adduced as bearing, gules, three S's or, while Burlington Priory had for arms, per pale, sable and argent, three B's counterchanged. The arms of Rashleigh are, sable, a cross or, between in the first quarter a Cornish chuff argent, beaked and legged gules, in the second a text T, in the third and fourth a crescent all argent. Corporate arms, in England, afford an instance of alphabetical letters in the case of the B's on the shield of Bermondsey. Figure 498. Anchor. The anchor, figure 498. This charge figures very largely in English armory, as may, perhaps, be looked for when it is remembered that maritime devices occur more frequently in seaboard lands than in continents. The arms of the town of Musselburgh are, azure, three anchors in pale, one in the chief and two in the flanks or, accompanied with as many muscles, one in the dexter and one in the sinister chief points, and the third in base proper. The Conce de Saint Cric, with Argent, two anchors in Salter Sable, on a chief three mullets or, will be an instance in point as to France. Anvils. These are occasionally met with, as in the case of the arms of a family of the name of Walker, who bear Argent, on a chevron gules, between two anvils in chief and an anchor in base sable, a B between two crescents or mantling gules and argent. Crest. Upon a wreath of the colors, on a mount within a wreathed serpent a dove all stat and proper. Arches, castles, towers, and turrets may be exemplified, amongst others, by the following. Instances of castles and towers will be found in the arms of Carlion and Kelly, and of the former fractured castles will be found in the shield of Willoughby quartered by Bertie. While an example of a quadrangular castle may be seen in the arms of Rawson. The difference between a castle, figure 499, and a tower, fig. 500, should be carefully noticed, and though it is a distinction but little observed in ancient days it is now always adhered to. When either castle or tower is surmounted by smaller towers, as figure 501, it is termed triple towered. Figure 499. Castle. Figure 500. Dot, tower. Figure 501. Dot, Tower triple towered. An instance of a fortification as a charge occurs in the shield of sconce, azure, a fortification, sconce, argent, mass on sable, in the dexter chief point a mullet of six points of the second. Gabions were hampers filled with earth, and were used in the construction of fortifications and earthworks. They are of occasional occurrence in English armory at any rate, and may be seen in the shields of Christie and of Goodfellow. The arms of banks supply an instance of arches. Mention may here perhaps be made of William Arches, who bore at the siege of Rouen, gules, three double arches argent. The family of Lethbridge bear a bridge, and this charge figures in a number of other coats. An abbey occurs in the arms of Maitland of Dundrenan, argent, the ruins of an old abbey on a piece of ground all proper, and a monastery in that of Maclarty, Azure, the front of an ancient monastery argent. A somewhat isolated instance of a temple occurs in the shield of Templar. A curious canting grant of arms may be seen in that to the town of Eccles, in which the charge is an ecclesiastical building, and similar though somewhat unusual charges figure also in the quartering for chapel, per chevron or in azure. In chief a mullet of six points between two crosses petit of the last, and in base the front elevation of a chapel argent, borne by Brown Westhead. Arrows are very frequently found, and the arms of Hales supply one of the many examples of this charge, while a bow, without the arrows, may be instanced in the shield of bows, ermine, three bows bent and stringed palewise in fess proper. 
Arrowheads and fians are of common usage, and occur in the arms of Foster and many other families. Fians, it may be noticed in passing, are arrowheads with an inner railed edge, fig. 502, while when depicted without this peculiarity they are termed broad arrows, figure 503. This is not a distinction very stringently adhered to. Charges associated with warfare and military defenses are frequently to be found both in English and foreign heraldry. Figure 502. Fian. Figure 503. Broad arrow. Figure 504. Battle axe. Figure 505. Caltrap. Battle axes. Fig. 504, for example, may be seen in the shield of Firth and in that of Renty in Artois which has, argent, three dolwars, or broad axes, gules, those in chief adders. In blazoning a battle axe care should be taken to specify the fact if the head is of a different color, as is frequently the case. The somewhat infrequent device of a battering ram is seen in the arms of Bertie, who bore, argent, three battering rams fesswise in pale proper, armed and garnished azure. An instrument of military defense consisting of an iron frame of four points, and called a caltrap, fig. 505, or galtrap, and sometimes a cheval trap, from its use of impeding the approach of cavalry, is found in the arms of trap, argent, three caltrap sable, gillstrap and other families. While French armory supplies us with another example in the case of the family of Gedeville de Genenville, who bore for arms, d'argent, semi de chostrapes to sable. Caltraps are also strewn upon the compartment upon which the supporters to the arms of the Earl of Perth are placed. As the well-known badge of the Royal House of Tudor, the portcullis, figure 506, is familiar to anyone conversant with Henry VII's chapel at Westminster Abbey, but it also appears as a charge in the arms of the family of Wingate, gules, a portcullis and a chief embattled or, where it forms an obvious pun on the earliest form of the name, viz. Windygate, whilst it figures also as the crest of the Dukes of Beaufort, a portcullis or, nailed azure, chained of the first. The disposition of the chains is a matter always left to the discretion of the artist. Figure 506. Portcullis. Fig. 507. Beacon. Figure 508. Grenade. Examples of beacons, figure 507, are furnished by the achievements of the family of Compton and of the town of Wolverhampton. A fire chest occurs in the arms of Critchet, Vede P. Chains are singularly scarce in armory, and indeed nearly wholly absent as charges, usually occurring where they do as part of the crest. The English shield of Anderton, it is true, bears, sable, three chains argent. While another one, Dupa de Upha, has, quarterly, one and four, a lion's paw cooped in fess between two chains or, a chief nebulae of the last, thereon two roses of the first, barbed and seated proper, for Dupa. Two and three, party fess azure and sable, a trident fesswise or, between three turbots argent, for turbot. In continental heraldry, however, chains are more frequently met with. Principal amongst these cases may be cited the arms of Navarre, gules, a cross salter and double oral of chains, linked together or, while many other instances are found in the armories of southern France and of Spain. Bombs or grenades, fig. 508, for heraldry does not distinguish, figure in the shields of Vavasour, Gervois, Boycott, and many other families. Among the more recent grants canon have figured, as in the case of the Pilter Arms and in those of the Burg of Portobello. While an earlier counterpart, in the form of a culverin, forms the charge of the Lee family, Argent, a culverin in Fess Sable. Figure 509. Scaling Ladder. Figure 510. Lance or Javelin. Figure 511. Tilting Spear. The column appears as a crest in the achievement of coals. Between two cross crosslets it occurs in the arms of Adam of Maryburg, Vert, a Corinthian column with capital and base in pale proper, between two cross crosslets Fitchy in Fessor. While the arms of the Sea of Sodier and Man are blazoned, Argent, 
upon a pedestal the Virgin Mary with her arms extended between two pillars, in the dexter hand a church proper, in base the arms of man in an escutcheon. Major, of Suffolk, bears, azure, three Corinthian columns, each surmounted by a ball, two and one argent. It is necessary to specify the kind of column in the blazon. Figure 512. Arms of William Shakespeare the Poet, d. 1616 or, on a bend sable, a tilting spear of the field. Scaling ladders, figure 509, viz. Ordinary shaped ladders with grapnels affixed to the tops, are to be seen in the English coats of Durban and Lloyd, while the Veronese princes della Scala bore the ordinary ladder, gules, a ladder of four steps in pale argent. A further instance of this form of the charge occurs in the Swiss shield of Lederberg, argent, two ladders in salter gules. Spears and spearheads are to be found in the arms of many families both in England, Wales, and abroad. For example, in the arms of Amherst and Edwards. Distinction must be drawn between the lance or javelin, figure 510, and the heraldic tilting spear, fig. 511, particularly as the latter is always depicted with the sharp point for warfare instead of the blunted point which was actually used in the tournament. The Shakespeare Arms, Fig. 512, are, or, on a bend sable a tilting spear of the field, while, azure, a lance or enfield at its point by an annulet argent represents the French family of Danby. Spurs, Fig. 513, occur in coat armor as such in the arms of knight and harbin, and also occasionally, winged, figure 514, as in the crest of Johnston. Spur rowels, or spur revels, are to be met with under that name, but they are, and are more often termed, mullets of five points pierced. Examples of stirrups are but infrequent, and the best known one, as regards English armory, is that of Scudamore, while the Polish Counts Bursastowski bore, gules, a stirrup argent, within a boyer or. Figure 513. Spur. Figure 514. Winged spur. Figure 515. Sword. Stones are even more rare, though a solitary example may be quoted in the arms of Staniland, per pale or invert, a pale counterchanged, three eagles displayed two and one, and as many flint stones one and two all proper. The vigilance of the crane has been already alluded to on page. The mention of stones brings one to the kindred subject of catapults. These engines of war, needless to say on a very much larger scale than the object which is nowadays associated with the term, were also known by the name ballisti, and also by that of sweep. Their occurrence is very infrequent, but for that very reason one may, perhaps, draw attention to the arms of the English family of Magnol, Argent, a sweep azure, charged with a stone or swords, differing in number, position, and kind are, perhaps, of this class of charge the most numerous. A single sword as a charge may be seen in the shield of Dick of Wicklow, and Macfee, and a sword entwined by a serpent in that of Mackesy. A flaming sword occurs in the arms of Maddox and Lewis. Swords frequently figure, too, in the hands or paws of supporters, accordingly as the latter are human figures or animals, whilst they figure as the supporters themselves in the unique case of the French family of Bastard, whose shield is caught east by two swords, point in base. The heraldic sword is represented as figure 515, the blade of the dagger being shorter and more pointed. The scimitar follows the form depicted in figure 516. A seeks is the term employed to denote a curved scimitar, or falchion, having a notch at the back of the blade, figure 517. In heraldry the use of this last is fairly frequent, though generally, it must be added, in shields of arms of doubtful authority. As such they are to be seen, amongst others, in the reputed arms of Middlesex, and owing to this origin they were included in the grant of arms to the town of Ealing. The sabre and the cutlass when so blazoned follow their utilitarian patterns. Torches or firebrands are depicted in the arms and crest of Gilman and Tyson. Barnacles, or brays, horse curbs, occur in some of the earlier coats, as in the arms of Wyatt, Gules, a barnacle argent, while another family of the same name, or, possibly, Wyatt, bore, perfes Gules and Azure, 
1 or, 3 barnacles argent. Figure 516. Dot, scimitar. Figure 517. Dot, seeks. Figure 518. Dot, church bell. Figure 519. Dot, hawk's bell. Bells are well instanced in the shield of Porter, and the poet Wordsworth bore, argent, three bells azure. It may be noted in passing that in continental armory the clapper is frequently of a different tincture to that of the bell, as, for instance, daja, a la cloche d'argent, butale, vis. With the clapper, de sable, the arms of the cons de belligars. A bell is assumed to be a church bell, figure 518, unless blazoned as a hawk's bell, figure 519. Bridal bits are of very infrequent use, though they may be seen in the achievement of the family of Milner. The torse or wreath surmounting the helm occasionally figures as a charge, for example, in the arms of Jocelyn and Jocelyn. The buckle is a charge which is of much more general use than some of the foregoing. It appears very frequently both in English and foreign heraldry, sometimes oval-shaped, figure 520, circular, figure 521, or square, fig. 522, but more generally lozenge-shaped, figure 523, especially in the case of continental arms. A somewhat curious variation occurs in the arms of the Prussian counts Wallenrath, which are, gules, a lozenge-shaped buckle argent, the tongue broken in the middle. It is, of course, purely an artistic detail in all these buckles whether the tongue is attached to a crossbar, as in figures 520 and 521, or not, as in figures 522 and 523. As a badge the buckle is used by the Pelhams, Earls of Chichester and Earls of Yarborough, and a lozenge-shaped arming buckle is the badge of Jerningham. Cups, covered, appear in the butler arms, and derived therefrom in the arms of the town of Warrington. Lorry, of Maxwell Town, bear, sable, a cup argent, issuing therefrom a garland between two laurel branches all proper, and similar arms are registered in Ireland for Lowry. The Veronese family of Bikiri bear, argent, a fescules between three drinking glasses half filled with red wine proper. An uncovered cup occurs in the arms of fox, derived by them from the crest of Croker, and another instance occurs in the arms of a family of Smith. In this connection we may note in passing the rare use of the device of a vase, which forms a charge in the coat of the town of Burslem, whilst it is also to be met with in the crest of the family of Dalton, on a wreath of the colours. A demi-lion sable, holding in the dexter paw a cross-crosslet or, and resting the sinister upon an escutcheon charged with a vase proper. The motto is perhaps well worth recording, Lo beau est la splendeur de vrai. Figure 520. Oval buckle. Figure 521. Circular buckle. Figure 522. Square buckle. Figure 523. Lozen shaped buckle. The arms of both the city of Dundee and the University of Aberdeen afford instances of a pot of lilies, and bowls occur in the arms of Bolding. Plate V. Though blazoned as a cauldron, the device occurring in the crest of De La Rue may be perhaps as fittingly described as an open bowl, and as such may find a place in this classification, between two olive branches vert a cauldron gules. Fired and issuant therefrom a snake nowed proper. The use of a pitcher occurs in the arms of Bertrand de Monbacher, who bore at the siege of Carlovarock, Argent, three pitchers sable, sometimes found gules, within a boyer sable Byzanti. And the arms of Standish are, sable, three standing dishes Argent. The somewhat singular charge of a chart appears in the arms of Christopher, and also as the crest of a Scottish family of Cook. Figure 524. Chesrook. Figure 525. Crescent. Figure 526. In Crescent. Chess rooks, figure 524, are somewhat favorite heraldic devices, and are to be met with in a shield of Smith and the arms of Rock of Clungenford. The Crescent, Fig. 525, figures largely in all armories, both as a charge and, in English heraldry, as a difference. Variations, too, of the form of the crescent occur, such as when the horns are turned to the dexter, fig. 526, when it is termed, a crescent in crescent, or simply, an in crescent, or when they are turned to the sinister, 
when it is styled decrescent, figure 527. An instance of the crescent, reversed, may be seen in the shield of the Austrian family of Puckberg, whose blazon was, azure, three crescents, those in chief adderst, that in base reversed. In English, difference marks, the crescent is used to denote the second sun, but under this character it will be discussed later. Independently of its use in conjunction with ecclesiastical armory, the crozier, fig. 528, is not widely used in ordinary achievements. It does occur, however, as a principal charge, as in the arms of the Irish family of Crozier and in the arms of Benoit, in Dauphiny, Gules, a pastoral staff argent, while it forms part of the crest of Alfred. The term, Crozier, is synonymous with the pastoral or episcopal staff, and is independent of the cross which is borne before, and not by, archbishops and metropolitans. The use of pastoral staves as charges is also to be seen in the shield of war, while Maclaurin of Dragon bears, Argent, a shepherd's crook sable. The Palmer's staff, Fig. 529, has been introduced into many coats of arms for families having the surname of Palmer, as has also the Palmer's wallet. Figure 527. Decrescent. Figure 528. Crozier, or pastoral staff. Figure 529. Palmer's Staff. Figure 530. Shuttle. Figure 531. Woolpack. Figure 532. Escarbuncle. Cushions, somewhat strangely, form the charges in a number of British shields, occurring, for example, in the arms of Brisbane, and on the shield of the Johnstone family. In Scottish heraldry, indeed, cushions appear to have been a very ancient, and general, use, and are frequently to be met with. The Earls of Moray bore, Argent, three cushions lozengewise within a double tracer flory counterflory gules, but an English example occurs in the arms of Hutton. The distaff, which is supposed to be the origin of the lozenge upon which a lady bears her arms, is seldom seen in heraldry, but the family of body, for instance, bear one in chief, and three occur in the arms of a family of lees. The shuttle, fig. 530, occurs in the arms of Shuttleworth, and in those of the town of Lee, while the shield of the borough of Pudsey affords an illustration of shuttles in conjunction with a woolpack, figure 531. The escarbuncle, fig. 532, is an instance of a charge having so developed by the evolution of an integral part of the shield itself. In ancient warfare shields were sometimes strengthened by being bound with iron bands radiating from the center, and these bands, from the shape they assumed, became in course of time a charge in themselves under the term escarbuncle. The crest of the fanmaker's company is, a hand cooped proper holding a fan displayed, while the chief charge in the arms is, a fan displayed, the stick skules. This, however, is the only case I can cite of this object. The fasces, fig. 533, emblematic of the Roman magisterial office, is very frequently introduced in grants of arms to mayors and lord mayors, which no doubt accounts for its appearance in the arms of Durning Lawrence, Neil, Evans, and Spokes. Figure 533. Fasces. Figure 534. Fetterlock. Figure 535. Fleam. An instance of Fetterlock's, Figure 534, occurs in the arms of Kirkwood, and also in the coat of Lockhart and the crest of Wyndham. A chain is often substituted for the bow of the lock. The modern padlock has been introduced into the grant of arms to the town of Wolverhampton. Keys, the emblem of Esti. Peter, and, as such, part of the insignia of His Holiness the Pope, occur in many ecclesiastical coats, the arms of the fishmonger's livery company, and many families. Flames of fire are not frequently met with, but they are to be found in the arms of Bakey, and as crests they figure in the achievements of Graham Wigan, and also in conjunction with keys in that of Flavel. In connection with certain other objects flames are common enough. The phoenix always issues from flames, and a salamander is always in the midst of flames, figure 437. The flaming sword, a device, by the way, included in the recent grant to Sir George Lewis, Bart, has been already alluded to, as has also the flaming brand. A notable example of the torch occurs in the crest of Sir William Gull, Bart. 
no doubt an allusion, as is his augmentation, to the skill by which he kept the torch of life burning in the then Prince of Wales during his serious illness in 1871. A flaming mountain occurs as the crest of several families of the name of Grant. A curious instrument now known nearly exclusively in connection with its use by farriers, and termed a fleam, figure 535, occurs on the chief of the shield of Moor. A fleam, however, is the ancient form and name of a surgeon's lancet, and some connection with surgery may be presumed when it occurs. It is one of the charges in the arms recently granted to Sir Frederick Treves, Bart. Ferison. This singular charge occurs in the shield of black, and also in that of steel. Furisons were apparently the instruments by which fire was struck from flint stones. Figure 536. Clarion. Figure 537. Bugle horn. Figure 538. Bugle horn stringed. Charges in connection with music and musical instruments do not occur very frequently, though the heraldic use of the clarion, figure 536, and the harp may perhaps be mentioned. The bugle horn, figure 537, also occurs, stringed, fig. 538, and when the bands rounded are of a different color it is termed verald, or virald, of that color. The human heart, which should perhaps have been more correctly referred to in an earlier chapter, is a charge which is well known in heraldry, both English and foreign. Perhaps the best known examples of the heart ensign with a crown is seen in the shields of Douglas and Johnstone. The legend which accounts for the appearance of this charge in the arms of Douglas is too well known to need repetition. Ingots of silver occur in the shield of the borough of St. Helens, whilst the family of Woolon go one better by bearing ingots of gold. A manch, fig. 539, which is a well-known heraldic term for the sleeve, is, as it is drawn, scarcely recognizable as such. Nevertheless its evolution can be clearly traced. The manch, which, of course, as a heraldic charge, originated in the knightly favor of a lady's sleeve, was born from the earliest periods in different tinctures by the three historic families of Conyers, Hastings, and Wharton. Other garments have been used as heraldic charges, gloves in the arms of Fletcher and Bartolot, stockings in the arms of Hose, a boot in the crest of Hussey, and a hat in the arms of Huff. Armor is frequently met with, a cuirass appearing in the crest of Summers, helmets in the arms of Salveson, Trainer, Roberton, and many other families, gauntlets, fig. 540, which need to be specified as Dexter or Sinister, in the arms of Vane and the crest of Burton, and Amorian, figure 541, in the crest of Pixley. The garter is, of course, due to that order of knighthood. And the blue mantle of the same order, besides giving his title to one of the pursuivants of arms, who uses it as his badge, has also been used as a charge. The mill rind or fer de Moline is, of course, as its name implies, the iron from the center of a grindstone. It is depicted in varying forms, more or less recognizable as the real thing, figure 542. Mirrors occur almost exclusively in crests and in connection with mermaids, who, as a general rule, are represented as holding one in the dexter hand with a comb in the sinister. Very occasionally, however, mirrors appear as charges, an example being that of the Count Spiegel Zum Desenberg, who bore, gules, three round mirrors argent in square frames or. Figure 539. Manch. Figure 540. Gauntlet. Figure 541. Morian. Figure 542. Mill rind. Symbols connected with the sacred passion, other than the cross itself, are not a very general use in armory, though there are instances of the passion nails being used, as, for example, in the shield of Proctor Viz. Or, three passion nails sable. Pelts, or hides, occur in the shield of Pilter, and the fleece has been mentioned under the division of rams and sheep. Plummets, or sinkers used by masons, form the charges in the arms of Jennings. An instance of a pyramid is met with in the crest of Malcolm, Bart and an obelisk in that of the town of Todmerton. The shield of crooks affords an example of two devices of very rare occurrence, viz. A prism and a radiometer. Water, lakes, ships, and are constantly met with in armory, but a few instances must suffice. 
The various methods of heraldically depicting water have been already referred to, pages end. Three wells figure in the arms of Hotsoul, and a mass-owned well in that of Camberwell. The shields of Storton and Manserg supply instances of heraldic fountains, whilst the arms of Brunner and of Franco contain fountains of the ordinary kind. A tarn, or lock, occurs in the shield of the family of tarn, while Lord Lock bears, or, a saltering railed sable, between infest two swans in water proper, all within a borier vert. Figure 543. Limfid, sail furled. The use of ships may be instanced by the arms of many families, while a galley or limfid, figure 543, occurs in the arms of Campbell, MacDonald, Galbraith, MacPhee, and numerous other families, and also in the arms of the town of Oban. Another instance of a coat of arms in which a galley appears will be found in the arms recently granted to the Burg of Alo, while the towns of Wandsworth and Lerwick each afford instances of a dragon ship. The prow of a galley appears in the arms of Pitcher. Figure 544. Rainbow. A modern form of ship in the shape of a yacht may be seen in the arms of Ride, while two Scottish families afford instances of the use of the ark. Argent, an ark on the waters proper, surmounted of a dove azure, bearing in her beak an olive branch vert, are the arms borne by Jellye of Blackford. And, Argent, an ark in the sea proper, in chief a dove azure, in her beak a branch of olive of the second, within a borier of the third, are quoted as the arms of Primrose Gailies of Chorleywood. Lastly, we may note the appropriate use of a steamer in the arms of Barrow in Furness. The curious figure of the lion demidiated with the hulk of a ship which is met with in the arms of several of the towns of the sink ports has been referred to on page. Clouds form part of the arms of Leeson, which are, gules, a chief nebulae argent, the rays of the sun issuing therefrom or. The rainbow, fig. 544, though not in itself a distinctly modern charge, for it occurs in the crest of hope, has been of late very frequently granted as part of a crest. Instances occur in the crest of the family of Pontifex, and again in that of Thurston, and of Wigan. Its use as a part of a crest is to be deprecated, but in these days of complicated armory it might very advantageously be introduced as a charge upon a shield. An unusual device, the thunderbolt, is the crest of Carnegie. The arms of the German family of Donnersburg very appropriately are, sable, three thunderbolts or issuing from a chief nebulae argent, in base amount of three cupos of the second. The arms of the town of Blackpool furnish an instance of a thunderbolt in dangerous conjunction with windmill sails. Figure 545. Estoyle. Figure 546. Mullet, Scottish Star. Figure 547. Mullet Pierced, Scottish Spur Revel. Stars, a very common charge, may be instanced as borne under that name by the Scottish Shield of Alston. There has, owing to their similarity, been much confusion between stars, estoils, and mullets. The difficulty is increased by the fact that no very definite lines have ever been followed officially. In England stars under that name are practically unknown. When the rays are wavy the charge is termed an estoil, but when they are straight the term mullet is used. That being so, these rules follow, that the estoil is never pierced, and from the accepted method of depicting the estoil this would hardly seem very feasible, and that unless the number of points is specified there will be 6, see figure 545. Other numbers are quite permissible, but the number of points, more usually in an estoil termed, rays, must be stated. The arm of Hobart, for example, are, sable, an estoil of 8 rays or, between two flaunches ermine. An estoil of sixteen rays is used by the town of Ilchester, but the arms are not of any authority. Everything with straight points being in England a mullet, it naturally follows that the English practice permits a mullet to be plain, fig. 546, or pierced, figure 547. Mullets are occasionally met with pierced of a color other than the field they are charged upon. According to the English practice, therefore, the mullet is not represented as pierced unless it is expressly stated to be so. The mullet both in England and Scotland is of five points unless a greater number are specified. But mullets pierced and unpierced of six, 
figure 548, or 8 points, figure 549, are frequent enough in English armory. The Scottish practice differs, and it must be admitted that it is more correct than the English, though, strange to say, more complicated. In Scottish armory they have the estoil, the star, and the mullet or the spur revel. As to the estoil, of course, their practice is similar to the English. But in Scotland a straight-pointed charge is a mullet if it be pierced, and a star if it be not. As a mullet is really the mullet or rowel of a spur, it certainly could not exist as a fact unpierced. Nevertheless it is by no means stringently adhered to in that country, and they make confusion worse confounded by the frequent use of the additional name of spur rowel or spur revel for the pierced mullet. The mullet occurs in the arms of Veer, and was also the badge of that family. The part this badge once played in history is well known. Had the de Veres worn another badge on that fatal day the course of English history might have been changed. Figure 548. Mullet of 6 points. Figure 549. Mullet of 8 points. Figure 550. Sun in splendor. The six-pointed mullet pierced occurs in the arms of de Clinton. The sun in splendor, fig. 550, always so blazoned, is never represented without the surrounding rays, but the human face is not essential though usual to its heraldic use. The rays are alternately straight and wavy, indicative of the light and heat we derive therefrom, a typical piece of genuine symbolism. It is a charge in the arms of Hurst, Pearson, and many other families. And the demi sun issuing in base occurs in the arms of Davies, Plate 6, and of Westworth. The coat of Wardaldam affords an example of the rays of the sun alone. A Scottish coat, that of Bailey of Walstown, has azure, the moon in her complement, between nine mullets argent, three, two, three, and one. The term in her complement signifies that the moon is full, but with the moon no rays are shown, in this, of course, differing from the sun in splendor. The face is usually represented in the full moon, and sometimes in the crescent moon, but the crescent moon must not be confused with the ordinary heraldic crescent. In concluding this class of charges, we may fitly do so by an allusion to the shield of Sir William Herschel, with its appropriate though clumsy device of a telescope. As may be naturally expected, the insignia of sovereignty are a very frequent occurrence in all armories, both English and foreign. Long before the days of heraldry, some form of decoration for the head to indicate rank and power had been in vogue amongst, it is hardly too much to say, all nations on the earth. As in most things, Western nations have borrowed both ideas, and added developments of those ideas, from the East, and in traversing the range of armory, where crowns and coronets appear in modern Western heraldry. We find a large proportion of these devices are studiously and of purpose delineated as being Eastern. With crowns and coronets as symbols of rank I am not now, of course, concerned, but only with those cases which may be cited as supplying examples where the different kinds of crowns appear either as charges on shields, or as forming parts of crests. Crowns, in heraldry, may be differentiated under the royal or the imperial, the Eastern or antique, the naval, and the mural, which with the crown celestial, Valerie and Palisado are all known as charges. Modern grants of crowns of Eastern character in connection with valuable service performed in the East by the recipient may be instanced, e.g. by the Eastern crown in the grant to Sir Abraham Roberts, G.C.B. The father of Field Marshal Earl Roberts, K.G. In order of antiquity one may best perhaps at the outset allude to the arms borne by the seaport towns of Boston, and of Kingston on Hull, or Hull, as the town is usually called. Inasmuch as a tradition has it that the three crowns which figure on the shield of each of these towns originate from a recognized device of merchantmen, who, traveling in and trading with the East and likening themselves to the Magi, in their Bethlehem visit, adopted these crowns as the device or badge of their business. The same remarks may apply to the arms of Cologne, Argent, on a chief gules, three crowns or from this fact, if the tradition be one, to the adoption of the same device by the towns to which these merchants traded is not a far step. One may notice in passing that, unlike what from the legend one would expect, these crowns are not of eastern design, 
but of a class wholly connected with heraldry itself. The legend and device, however, are both much older than these modern minutiae of detail. The Archbishopric of York has the well-known coat, gules, two keys in Salter Argent, in chief a regal crown proper. The reputed arms of Esti. Etheldreda, who was both queen, and also abbess of Ely, find their perpetuation in the arms of that sea, which are, gules, three ducal, an early form of the royal, crowns or, while the recently created sea of Esti. Albans affords an example of a celestial crown, azure, a salter or, a sword in pale proper, in chief a celestial crown of the second. The celestial crown is to be observed in the arms of the borough of Kensington and as a part of the crest of Dunbar. The Sea of Bristol bears, sable, three open crowns in pale ore. The royal or imperial crown occurs in the crest of I, while an imperial crown occurs in the crests of Robertson, Wolf, and Lane. The family of Douglas affords an instance of a crown ensigning a human heart. The arms of Toledo afford another case in point, being, azure, a royal crown or, the cap being gules. Antique crowns, as such, appear in the arms of Fraser and also in the arms of Grant. The crest of the Marquis of Ripon supplies an unusual variation, inasmuch as it issues from a coronet composed of fleurs de lis. The other chief emblem of sovereignty, the scepter, is occasionally met with, as in the Whitgreave crest of augmentation. The Marquises of Mun bear the imperial orb, azure, an orb argent, banded, and surmounted by the cross or. The reason for the selection of this particular charge in the grant of arms, azure, on a fess or, a horse courant gules, between three orbs gold, banded of the third, to Sir H. E. Moss, of the Empire Theatre in Edinburgh and the London Hippodrome, will be readily guessed. Under the classification of tools and implements the pick may be noted, this being depicted in the arms of Maudsley, Mosley, and Piggott, and a pick and shovel in the arms of Hales. The arms of Crochet supply an instance of a plow, a charge which also occurs in the arms of Waterloo and the crest of Provent, but is otherwise a very infrequent occurrence. In English armory the use of scythes, or, as they are sometimes termed, sneds, is but occasional, though, as was only to be expected, this device appears in the snade coat, as follows, argent, a scythe, the blade in chief. The sned in Ben sinister sable, in the fess point a fleur de lis of the second. In Poland the Count Jaszewski bore, gules, two scythe blades in oval, the points crossing each other argent, and the ends in base tied together, or, the whole surmounted in chief by a cross patriarchal petit. Of which the lower arm on the sinister side is wanting. Two sickles appear in the arms of Shearer, while the Hungerford crest in the case of the Holdick Hungerford family is blazoned, out of a ducal coronet or, a pepper garb of the first between two sickles erect proper. The sickle was the badge of the Hungerfords. A balance forms one of the charges of the Scottish Corporation of the Dean and Faculty of Advocates, gules, a balance or, and a sword argent in salter, surmounted of an escutcheon of the second. Charged with a lion rampant within a double trace sure flory counterflory of the first, but it is a charge of infrequent appearance. It also figures in the arms of the Institute of Chartered Accountants. Figure 551. Water Bouget. Bannerman of Elsick bears a banner for arms, gules, a banner displayed argent and thereon on a canton azure a salter argent as the badge of Scotland. Figure 552. Arms of Henry Borcia. Earl of Essex, K.G. Quarterly, 1 and 4, Argent, a crossing railed gules, between 4 Waterbouges sable, 4 Borsia, 2 and 3, gules, Belette or, a fess Argent, for Louvain. From his seal. Books are frequently made use of. The arms of Rylands, the family to whose generosity Manchester owes the Rylands Library, afford a case in point, and such charges occur in the arms of the universities of both Oxford and Cambridge. And in many other university and collegiate achievements. Buckets and water bougets, figure 551, can claim a wide use. In English Armory Pemberton has three buckets, and water bougets appear in the well-known arms of Borsia, figure 552. Water bougets, which are really the old form of water bucket, were leather bags or bottles, 
two of which were carried on a stick over the shoulder. The heraldic water bouget represents the pair. Figure 553. Escallop. For an instance of the heraldic usage of the comb, the case of the arms of Ponsonby, Earls of Bessborough, may be cited. Combs also figure in the delightfully punning Scottish coat for Rokiet. Generally, however, when they do occur in heraldry, they represent combs for carding wool, as in the shield of Tunstall, sable, three wool combs argent, while the Russian counts and repelmt use, or, a comb in bend azure, the teeth downwards. Escallops, figure 553, rank as one of the most widely used heraldic charges in all countries. They figured in early days outside the limits of heraldry as the badge of pilgrims going to the Holy Land, and may be seen on the shields of many families at the period of the Crusades. Many other families have adopted them, in the hope of a similar interpretation being applied to the appearance of them in their own arms. Indeed, so numerous are the cases in which they occur that a few representative ones must suffice. Figure 554. Arms of Hammersmith, party per pale azure and gules, on a chevron between two cross crosslets in chief and an escallop in base argent, three horseshoes of the first. Crest, on a wreath of the colors, upon the battlements of a tower, two hammers in salter all proper. Motto, Spectum Agendo. Figure 555. Arms of the Great Central Railway, Argent, on a cross gules, voided of the field, between two wings in chief sable and as many daggers erect in base of the second, in the fess point Amorian winged of the third. On a chief also of the second a pale of the first, thereon eight arrows salterwise banded also of the third, between on the dexter side three bendlets enhanced and on the sinister a fleur de lis or crest. On a wreath of the colors, a representation of the front of a locomotive engine proper, between two wings or. The grant is dated February 25, 1898. They will be found in the arms of the Lord's Dacre, who bore, gules, three escallops argent, and an escallop argent was used by the same family as a badge. The Scottish family of Pringle, of Greenno, supplies an instance in, azure, three escallops or within a boyering railed of the last while the Irish earls of Band and Boar, Argent, on a bend azure three escallops of the field. Hammers figure in the crests of Hammersmith, figure 554, and of Swindon, plate 6, and a hammer is held in the claw of the demi-dragon which is the crest of Fox Davies of Colebrookdale, Company Salop, plate 6. A lantern is a charge on the shield of Cooper, and the arms of the town of Hove afford an absolutely unique instance of the use of leg irons. Three towns, Eccles, Boodle, and Ramsgate, supply cases in their arms in which a lighthouse is depicted, and this charge would appear, so far as can be ascertained, not only to be restricted to English armory, but to the three towns now named. Locomotives appear in the arms of Swindon, Plate 6, and the Great Central Railway, Figure 555. Of a similar industrial character is the curious coat of arms granted at his express wish to the late Mr. Samson Fox of Leeds and Harrogate, which contains a representation of the corrugated boiler flue which formed the basis of his fortune. Figure 556. Catherine Wheel. Figure 557. Staple. Figure 558. Hawk's Lure. Figure 559. Philfot. An instance of the use of a sand glass occurs in the arms of the Scottish family of Joseph Collinwort, which are thus blazoned. Vert, a sand glass running argent, and in chief the Holy Bible expanded proper. A Scottish corporation, too, supplies a somewhat unusual charge, that of scissors, azure, a pair of scissors or, incorporation of tailors of Aberdeen. Though a Swabian family, by name Jungingen, has for its arms, azure, a pair of scissors open, blades upwards argent. Barrels and casks, which in heraldry are always known as tons, naturally figure in many shields where the name lends itself to a pun, as in the arms of Bolton. Wheels occur in the shields of Turner, Argent, Gut de Sang, a wheel of eight spoke sable, on a chief wavy azure, a dolphin nayant of the first, and Carter, and also in the arms of Gooch. The Catherine Wheel, Fig. 556, however, is the most usual heraldic form. The staple, 
figure 557, and the hawk's lure, figure 558, deserve mention, and I will wind up the list of examples with the filfot, figure 559, which no one knows the meaning or origin of. The list of heraldic charges is very far, indeed, from being exhausted. The foregoing must, however, suffice. But those who are curious to pursue this branch of the subject further should examine the arms, both ancient and modern, of towns and trade corporations. Chapter 20 The Heraldic Helmet Since one's earliest lessons in the rules of heraldry, we have been taught, as one of the fundamental laws of the achievement, that the helmet by its shape and position is indicative of rank. And we early learnt by rote that the esquire's helmet was of steel, and was placed in profile, with the visor closed, the helmet of the knight and baronet was to be open and affront. That the helmet of the peer must be of silver, guarded by grills and placed in profile, and that the royal helmet was of gold, with grills and affront. Until recent years certain stereotyped forms of the helmet for these varying circumstances were in use, hideous alike both in the regularity of their usage and the atrocious shapes into which they had been evolved. These regulations, like some other adjuncts of heraldic art, are comparatively speaking of modern origin. Heraldry in its earlier and better days knew them not, and they came into vogue about the Stuart times, when heraldic art was distinctly on the wane. It is puzzling to conceive a desire to stereotype these particular forms, and we take it that the fact, which is undoubted, arose from the lack of heraldic knowledge on the part of the artists, who, having one form before them, which they were assured was correct, under the circumstances simply reproduced this particular form in facsimile time after time, not knowing how far they might deviate and still remain correct. The knowledge of heraldry by the heraldic artist was the real point underlying the excellence of medieval heraldic art, and underlying the excellence of much of the heraldic art in the revival of the last few years. As it has been often pointed out, in olden times they played with heraldry, and therein lay the excellence of that period. The old men knew the lines within which they could play, and knew the laws which they could not transgress. Their successors, ignorant of the laws of arms, and afraid of the hidden meanings of armory, had none but the stereotyped lines to follow. The result was bad. Let us first consider the development of the actual helmet, and then its application to heraldic purposes will be more readily followed. Figure 560 Figure 561 Figure 562 Figure 563 To the modern mind, which grumbles at the weight of present-day head coverings, it is often a matter of great wonder how the knights of ancient days managed to put up with the heavy weight of the great iron helmet. With its wooden or leather crest. A careful study of ancient descriptions of tournaments and warfare will supply the clue to the explanation, which is simply that the helmet was very seldom worn. For ceremonial purposes and occasions it was carried by a page, and in actual use it was carried slung at the saddlebow, until the last moment, when it was donned for action as blows and close contact became imminent. Then, by the nature of its construction, the weight was carried by the shoulders, the head and neck moving freely within necessary limits inside. All this will be more readily apparent, when the helmet itself is considered. Our present-day ideas of helmets, their shape, their size, and their proportions, are largely taken from the specimens manufactured, not necessarily in modern times, for ceremonial purposes, e.g. for exhibition as insignia of knighthood. By far the larger proportion of the genuine helmets now to be seen were purposely made, certainly at remote dates, not for actual use in battle or tournament, but for ceremonial use, chiefly at funerals. Few, indeed, are the examples still existing of helmets which have been actually used in battle or tournament. Why there are so few remaining to us, when every person of position must necessarily have possessed one throughout the Plantagenet period, and probably at any rate to the end of the reign of Henry VII, is a mystery which has puzzled many people, for helmets are not, like glass and china, subject to the vicissitudes of breakage. The reason is doubtless to be found in the fact that at that period they were so general, and so little out of the common, that they possessed no greater value than any other article of clothing. And whilst the real helmet, lacking a ceremonial value, was not preserved, 
the sham ceremonial helmet of a later period, possessing none but a ceremonial value, was preserved from ceremonial to ceremonial, and has been passed on to the present day. But a glance at so many of these helmets which exist will plainly show that it was quite impossible for any man's head to have gone inside them, and the sculptured helmets of what may seem to us uncouth shape and exaggerated size, which are occasionally to be found as part of a monumental effigy, are the size and shape of the helmets that were worn in battle. This accounts for the much larger sized helmets in proportion to the size of shield which will be found in heraldic emblazonments of the Plantagenet and Tudor periods. The artists of those periods were accustomed to the sight of real helmets, and knew and drew the real proportion which existed between the fighting helmet and the fighting shield. Artists of Stuart and Georgian days knew only the ceremonial helmet, and consequently adopted and stereotyped its impossible shape, and equally impossible size. Victorian heraldic artists, ignorant alike of the actual and the ceremonial, reduced the size even further, and until the recent revulsion in heraldic art, with its reversion to older types, and its copying of older examples. The helmets of heraldry had reached the uttermost limits of absurdity. The recent revival of heraldry is due to men with accurate and extensive knowledge, and many recent examples of heraldic art well compare with ancient types. One happy result of this revival is a return to older and better types of the helmet. But it is little use discarding the heraldic helmet of the stationer's shop unless a better and more accurate result can be shown, so that it will be well to trace in detail the progress of the real helmet from earliest times. Figure 564 Figure 565 Figure 566 Figure 567 Figure 568 Figure 569. Painted Pot Helmet C. 1241. Figure 570. Pot Helmet, from the Anite of Heinrich von Veldeck. In the Anglo Saxon period, the common helmet was merely a cap of leather, often four cornered, and with a serrated comb. Figures 560 and 561, but men of rank had a conical one of metal, figure 562, which was frequently richly gilt. About the time of Edward the Confessor, a small piece, of varying breadth, called a nasal, was added, figure 563, which, with a quilted or gamboised hood, or one of mail, well protected the face, leaving little more than the eyes exposed. And in this form the helmet continued in general use until towards the end of the twelfth century, when we find it merged into or supplanted by the Chapelle de Fer, which is first mentioned in documents at this period, and was shaped like a flat-topped, cylindrical cap. This, however, was soon enlarged so as to cover the whole head, figure 564, an opening being left for the features, which were sometimes protected by a movable, ventil, or a visor, instead of the nasal. This helmet, which was adopted by Richard I, who is also sometimes represented with a conical one, was the earliest form of the large war and tilting, home, or helm, which was of great weight and strength, and often had only small openings or slits for the eyes, figures 565 and 566. These eyepieces were either one wide slit or two, one on either side. The former was, however, sometimes divided into two by an ornamental bar or buckle placed across. It was afterwards pointed at the top, and otherwise slightly varied in shape, but its general form appears to have been the same until the end of the 14th century, figures 567, 568. This type of helmet is usually known as the pot-shaped. The helmets themselves were sometimes painted, and figure 569 represents an instance which is painted in green and white diagonal stripes. The illustration is from a parchment MS of about 1241 now in the town library of Leipzig. Fig. 570 shows another German example of this type, being taken from the Anite of Heinrich von Veldeck, a MS now in the Royal Library in Berlin, belonging to the end of the 12th century. The crest depicted in this case, a red lion, must be one of the earliest instances of a crest. These are the helmets which we find on early seals and effigies, as will be seen from figures 571, 574. Figure 571. Helmet of Hamelin, Earl of Surrey in Warren, died in 1202. From M. S. Cott, Julius, C. 7. 
Figure 572. Dot, from the seal of Richard de Clare, Earl of Gloucester and Hertford, died in 1262. Figure 573. Dot, from the seal of John de Warren, Earl of Surrey, d. 1305. Figure 574. Dot, from the seal, 1315, of John de Bretagne, Earl of Richmond. The cylindrical or pot shaped helmet of the Plantagenets, however, disappears in the latter part of the 13th century, when we first find mention of the bassinet, from Old French for a basin, figures 575, 579. This was at first merely a hemispherical steel cap, put over the coif of mail to protect the top of the head, when the knight wished to be relieved from the weight of his large helm, which he then slung at his back or carried on his saddlebow. But still did not consider the mail coif sufficient protection. It soon became pointed at the top, and gradually lower at the back, though not so much as to protect the neck. In the fourteenth century the mail, instead of being carried over the top of the head, was hung to the bottom rim of the helmet, and spread out over the shoulders, overlapping the cuirass. This was called the camail, or curtain of mail. It is shown in figures 576 and 577 fastened to the bassinet by a lace or thong passing through staples. The large helm, which throughout the 14th century was still worn over the bassinet, did not fit down closely to the cuirass, though it may have been fastened to it with a leather strap. Its bottom curve not being sufficiently arched for that purpose. Nor did it wholly rest on the shoulders, but was probably wadded inside so as to fit closely to the bassinet. Figure 575 Figure 576 Figure 577 Figure 578 Figure 579 It is doubtful if any actual helm previous to the 14th century exists, and there are very few of that period remaining. In that of the Black Prince at Canterbury, Fig. 271, the lower, or cylindrical, portion is composed of a front and back piece, riveted together at the sides, and this was most likely the usual form of construction, but in the helm of Sir Richard Pembridge, figs. 580 and 581, the three pieces, cylinder, conical piece, and top piece, of which it is formed are fixed with nails, and are so welded together that no trace of a join is visible. The edges of the metal, turned outwards round the ocularium, are very thick, and the bottom edge is rolled inwards over a thick wire, so as not to cut the surcoat. There are many twin holes in the helmet for the aglets, by which the crest and lambrequin were attached, and in front, near the bottom, are two plus-shaped holes for the T-bolt, which was fixed by a chain to the cuirass. The helm of Sir Richard Hauberk, figures 582 and 583, who died in 1417, is made of five pieces, and is very thick and heavy. It is much more like the later form adapted for jousting, and was probably only for use in the tilt yard. But, although more firmly fixed to the cuirass than the earlier helm, it did not fit closely down to it, as all later helms did. Singularly few examples of the pot helmet actually exist. The Blinz example, figs. 584 and 585, which is now in the Francisco Carolina Museum at Linz, was dredged out of the Tron, and is unfortunately very much corroded by rust. The fastening place for the crest, however, is well preserved. The example belongs to the first half of the 14th century. Figure 580 Figure 581 Figure 582 Figure 583 The so-called Prankerhelm, Fig. 586, from the chapter of Secca, now in the collection of armor in the Historical Court Museum at Vienna, and belonging to the middle of the 14th century, could only have been used for tournaments. It is made of four strong hammered sheets of iron 1 to 2 mm thick, with other strengthening plates laid on. The helmet by itself weighs 5 kg 357 grams. Figures 584 and 585. Dot, the Linz Pot Helmet. Figure 587. The custom of wearing the large helm over the bassinet being clumsy and troublesome, many kinds of visor were invented, so as to dispense with the large helm, except for jousting, two of which are represented in figures 575 and 579. 
In the first a plate shaped somewhat to the nose was attached to the part of the camel which covered the mouth. This plate, and the male mouthguard, when not in use, hung downwards towards the breast. But when in use it was drawn up and attached to a staple or locket on the front of the bassinet. This fashion, however, does not appear to have been adopted in England, but was peculiar to Germany, Austria, and K. None of these contrivances seem to have been very satisfactory, but towards the end of the 14th century the large and salient beaked visor was invented, figure 587. It was fixed to hinges at the sides of the bassinet with pins, and was removable at will. A high collar of steel was next added as a substitute for the camel. This form of helmet remained in use during the first half of the 15th century, and the large helm, which was only used for jousting, took a different form, or rather several different forms, which may be divided into three kinds. In this connection it should be remembered that the heavy jousting helmet to which the crest had relation was probably never used in actual warfare. The first was called a bassinet, and was used for combats on foot. It had an almost spherical crown piece, and came right down to the cuirass, to which it was firmly fixed, and was, like all large helms of the fifteenth century, large enough for the wearer to move his head about freely inside. The helm of Sir Giles Capel, figure 588, is a good specimen of this class, it has a visor of great thickness, in which are a great number of holes, thus enabling the wearer to see in every direction. The barbuda, or ovoid bassinet, with a chin piece riveted to it, was somewhat like this helm, and is often seen on the brasses of 1430 to 1450. The chin piece retaining the name of Barbuda, after the bassinet had gone out of fashion. Figure 586. Pranker Helm. Figure 591. German Tilting Armor, 1480, from the collection in the museum at Vienna. Figure 592. Tilting Helmet of Sir John Ghostwick, 1541. Figure 588. The second kind of large helm used in the 15th century was the jousting helm, which was of great strength, and firmly fixed to the cuirass. One from the Broca's collection, figs. 589 and 590, date about 1500, is perhaps the grandest helm in existence. It is formed of three pieces of different thicknesses, the front piece being the thickest, which are fixed together with strong iron rivets with salient heads and thin brass caps soldered to them. The arrangements for fixing it in front and behind are very complete and curious. The manner in which the helmet was connected with the rest of the armor is shown in Fig. 591, which is a representation of a German suit of tilting armor of the period about 1480, now in the collection of armor at the Royal Museum in Vienna. Of the same character, but of a somewhat different shape, is the helmet, Fig. 592, of Sir John Ghostwick who died in 1541, which is now in Willington Church, Bedfordshire. The illustration here given is taken from the portfolio, number 33. The visor opening on the right side of the helmet is evidently taken from an Italian model. Figure 589. The third and last kind of helm was the tournament helm, and was similar to the first kind, and also called a bassinet. But the visor was generally barred, or, instead of a movable visor, the bars were riveted on the helm, and sometimes the face was only protected by a sort of wirework, like a fencing mask. It was only used for the tourney or melee, when the weapons were the sword and mace. Figure 590. The Chapelle de Fer, which was in use in the 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries, was a light iron headpiece, with a broad, flat brim, somewhat turned down. Fig. 593 represents one belonging to the end of the 15th century, which is one of the few remaining, and is delicately forged in one piece of thin, hard steel. During the 14th century a new kind of helmet arose, called in England the Tassalad, or Saulet. The word appears to have two derivations, each of which was applied to a different form of headpiece. First, the Italian, Salata, Fig. 594, which seems originally to have been a modification of the bassinet. Second, the German, Schallern, the form of which was probably suggested by the Chapelle de Fer. Both of these were called by the French, Salade, whence our English, Salade. 
The salada came lower down than the bassinet, protected the back and sides of the neck, and, closing round the cheeks, often left only the eyes, nose, and mouth exposed. A standard of mail protected the neck if required. In the 15th century the salada ceased to be pointed at the summit, and was curved outwards at the nape of the neck, as in figure 595. Figure 593. The chalern, from shale, a shell, or bowl, was really a helmet and visor in one piece. It had a slit for the eyes, a projecting brim, and a long tail, and was completed by a chin piece, or bavier, eng, beaver, which was strapped round the neck. Figure 596 shows a German salad and a Spanish beaver. The salad was much used in the 15th century, during the latter half of which it often had a visor, as in one from Rhodes, figure 597, which has a spring catch on the right side to hold the visor in place when down. The rivets for its lining cap have large, hollow, twisted heads, which are seldom found on existing salads, though often seen in sculpture. Figure 594 Figure 595 Figure 596 Figure 597 the shale, shalern, skelern, or salad, either with or without a visor, is very seldom seen in heraldic use. An instance, however, in which it has been made use of heraldically will be found in Fig. 598, which is from a pen and ink drawing in the Fest Buck of Paulus Kell, MS now in the Royal Library at Munich. This shows the shalern with the slit for seeing through, and the fixed neck guard. The Bart, Bavier, or beaver, for the protection of the under part of the face, is also visible. It is not joined to the helmet. The helmet bears the crest of Bavaria, the red-crowned golden lion of the Palatinate within the wings of the curiously disposed Bavarian tinctures. Figure 599, p. 316, is a very good representation of a shalern dating from the latter part of the 15th century, with a sliding neck guard. It is reproduced from the Deutscher Herald, 1892, number 2. Figure 598. Schallern, with crest of Bavaria, Duke Ludwig of Bavaria, 1449. Until almost the middle of the 15th century all helmets fitted on the top of the head, or were put right over. But about 1440 the Italians made a great improvement by inventing the armet, the lower part of which opened out with hinges, so that when put on it enclosed the head, fitting closely round the lower part of it. While its weight was borne by the steel collar, or gorget. The Italian armet had a round or disc to protect the opening at the back of the neck, and a bavier strapped on in front to cover the joining of the two cheek pieces. The earlier armets, like the beaked bassinet, had a camail attached by a row of staples, figure 600, which was continued later, but then fixed either to a metal band or leather strap and riveted to the base of the armet. This form of helmet was not in common use in England until about 1500. Figure 600 shows the earliest form of Italian armet, with a reinforcing piece on the forehead, and a removable visor. Date 1450-1480 Fig. 601 represents an armet of very fine form, probably Italian, which is a nearer approach to the close helmet of the 16th century, as the visor cannot be removed, and the eye slit is in the visor. Instead of being formed by the space between it and the crown piece, and there is also no reinforcing piece in the crown. Date 1480-1500 Figure 602 is still more like the 16th century helmet, for it opens down the sides instead of down the chin and back, and the same pivot which secures the visor also serves as a hinge for the crown and chin piece. The small mentonier, or bavier, is equal on both sides, but it was often of less extent on the right. Date about 1500. Figure 603 shows a German fluted helmet, of magnificent form and workmanship, which is partly engraved and gilded. Date 1510-1525. It opens down the chin, like the early armets, but the tailpiece of the crown is much broader. The skill shown in the forging of the crown and the fluting of the twisted comb is most remarkable, and each rivet for the lining strap of the cheek pieces forms the center of an engraved six-leaved rose. 
A grooved rim round the bottom of the helmet fitted closely on a salient rim at the top of the steel gorget or hausa call, so that when placed on its gorget and closed, it could not be wrenched off. But could yet be moved round freely in a horizontal direction. The gorget being articulated, the head could also be raised or lowered a little, but not enough to make this form of joint very desirable, and a looser kind was soon substituted. Figure 604 shows what is perhaps the most perfect type of close helmet. The comb is much larger than was the custom at an earlier date, and much resembles those of the Morians of this period. The visor is formed of two separate parts. The upper fits inside the lower, and could be raised to facilitate seeing without unfixing the lower portion. It is engraved with arabesques, and is probably Italian. Date 1550-1570 Fig. 605 is an English helmet, halfway between a close helmet and a burgonet. It is really a cask, with cheek pieces to meet in front. The crown piece is joined down the middle of the comb. This helmet was probably made for the Earl of Leicester. Date about 1590. The word burgonet first appeared about the beginning of the 15th century, and described a form of helmet like the salata, and called by that name in Italy. It was completed by a buff or chin piece, similar to the bavier. Figure 600. Figure 601. Figure 602. Figure 603. Figure 604. Figure 605. During this century the Morian, really an improved chapelle de fer, was much in use. It had a curved top, surmounted by a comb, and a broad, turned-up brim, and was often elaborately engraved in gilt. The cabasset was a similar headpiece, but had a peaked top, surmounted by a small spike turned backwards, and generally a flatter, narrower brim than the Morian. These three forms of helmet were all called casks. Figure 606. Gridiron helmet, 15th century. The barred or grilled helmet owed its introduction to tournaments with swords and clubs, which necessitated better opportunities of vision than the earlier tilting helm afforded, sufficient though that was for encounters with the tilting spear. The earliest form of this type of helmet will be seen in figure 606, which is termed a gridiron helmet, developing shortly afterwards into the form of figure 607, which has a latticework visor. The former figure, the gridiron helmet, is a representation taken from an original now in the possession of Count Hans Wilczek, of Vienna. Figure 607, the helmet with the latticed visor, is from an example in the German National Museum at Nuremberg. Neither of these types of helmet appears to have been regularly adopted into heraldic art. Indeed they are seldom, if ever, to be found in heraldic emblazonment. For pictorial and artistic purposes they seem to be entirely supplanted in paintings, in seals, and in sculpture by the grilled helmet or buckler. Whether this helmet, as we find it depicted in paintings or on seals, was ever really worn in battle or tournament seems very doubtful, and no actual instance appears to have been preserved. On the other hand, the so-called prank helm, pageant helmet, bucklers, frequently made of gilded leather and other materials, are extant in some number. It is evident from their nature, however, that they can only have been used for ceremonial or decorative purposes. Figure 608 shows one of these buckled pageant helmets surmounted by the crest of the Margraviate of Burgo. Fig. 609 shows another of these pageant helmets, with the crest of Austria, ancient, or of Tyrol. These were born, with many others of the same character, in the pageant of the funeral procession of the Emperor Frederick III. 4. In 1493. The helmets were made of leather, and gilded, the two crests being carved out of boards and painted. The Burgo wings, which are inclined very far forward, are, bendy of six argent and gules, charged with a pale oar. In their normal position the wings are borne upright. The second crest, which is 86 centimeters, in height, is black, and adorned on the outside with eared pegs four centimeters long, from which gold linden leaves hang. These helmets and crests, which were formerly in St. Stephen's Cathedral, are now in the Vienna Historical Museum. At the beginning of the 17th century the workmanship became inferior, 
and beauty of line was no longer sought after. Shortly afterwards helmets ceased to be worn outside the regular army, and with the subsequent evolution of military head coverings heraldry has no concern. As a part of a heraldic achievement the helmet is not so old as the shield. It was not until the introduction of the crest that anyone thought of depicting a helmet with a shield. Figure 599. Shalern, end of 15th century. Figure 607. Helmet, with latticed visor, end of 15th century. A careful and attentive examination of the early rolls of arms, and of seals and other ancient examples of heraldic art and handicraft will at once make it plainly apparent that the helmets then heraldically depicted were in close keeping and of the style actually in use for warfare, joust, or tournament at the period. This is particularly noticeable in the helmets on the stall plates of the Knights of the Garter in St. George's Chapel at Windsor. The helms on the early stall plates, though far from being identical in shape, all appear to be of the same class or type of tilting helm drawn in profile. Amongst the early plates only one instance, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, elected 1475, can be found of the barred helmet. This is the period when helmets actually existed in fact, and were actually used, but at the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th centuries. When the helmet was being fast relegated to ceremonial usage and pictorial emblazonment, ingenious heralds began to evolve the system by which rank and degree were indicated by the helmet. Figure 608. Pageant Helmet with the crest of Burgo. Figure 609. Pageant helmet, with the crest of Austria, ancient, or Tyrol. Before proceeding to consider British rules concerning the heraldic helmet, it may be well to note those which have been accepted abroad. In Germany heraldry has known but two classes of helmet, the open helmet guarded by bars, otherwise buckles or grills, and the closed or visored helmet. The latter was the helmet used by the newly ennobled, the former by the older families of higher position, it being originally held that only those families whose birth qualified them to tilt were permitted to use this buckled helmet. Tournaments were of course always conducted on very strict lines. Woodward reprints in his Treatise on Heraldry the tourney regulations for the exposure of arms and crest, drawn up by René, Duke of Anjou, King of Sicily in Jerusalem, from Maynatrier's L'Origine d'Armoiries. The rules to be complied with are there set out. Figure 12 herein is a representation of a helmschau, where the examination of the crests is being carried on. It is interesting to notice therein that the whole of the helmets without exception have the grills. Germany was perhaps the earliest country to fall from grace in the matter, for towards the end of the 15th century the buckled helmet is found with the arms of the lower brief adults, those ennobled by patent. And the practice continued despite the violent protests of the tournament families, who considered their prerogative had been infringed. The closed helmet consequently sank gradually in Germany to the grade of Amir Burgess's helmet, and as such became of little account, although in former times it had been borne by the proudest houses. Similarly in France the buckled helmet was considered to be reserved for the military noblesse, and newly ennobled families were denied its use until the third generation, when they became bones chantillons. Woodward states that when, in 1372 Charles V, conferred on the bourgeoisie of Paris the right to use armorial bearings, it was strenuously denied that they could use the tambored helm. In 1568 an edict of Charles IX prohibited the use of armoiries tambours to any who were not noble by birth. The grills of the helmet produced with the old French heralds the opportunity of a minutiae of rule which, considering the multitude of rules fathered, rightly or wrongly, upon British heraldry, we may be devoutly happy never reached our shores. They assign different numbers of grills to different ranks, but as the writers differ as to the varying numbers, it is probable that such rules were never officially accepted even in that country. In France the rule was much as in this country, a gold helmet for the sovereign, silver for princes and great nobles, steel for the remainder. It is curious that though the tambored helm was of course known in England whilst the controversy as to its heraldic use was raging in France and Germany, no heraldic use of it whatever occurs till the beginning of the 17th century. From royalty to the humblest gentlemen, all used for heraldic purposes the closed or visored helms. 
The present rules concerning helmets which hold in Great Britain are that the helmet of the sovereign and the royal princes of this country shall be of gold, placed in an affront position, and shall have grills. The helmet of a peer shall be of silver, shall be placed in profile, and shall have golden grills, frequently stated to be five in number, a detail not stringently adhered to. The helmet of a knight or baronet shall be of steel, placed full-faced, and shall be open, whilst the helmet of an esquire or gentleman shall be of steel and in profile, with the visor closed. Within these limits considerable latitude is allowed, and even in official grants of arms, which, as far as emblazonment goes, are very much of a stereotyped style, actual unvarying adherence to a particular pattern is not insisted upon. The earliest instance amongst the garter plates in which a helmet with grills is used to denote the rank of a peer is the stall plate of Lord Knowles in 1615. In the visitations but few instances can be found in which the arms of peers are included. Peers were not compelled to attend and enter their arms and pedigrees at visitations, doubtless owing to the fact that no garter king of arms ever made a visitation. Whilst it has been the long-asserted prerogative of garter to deal with peers and their arms by himself. At the same time, however, there are some number of instances of peers' arms and pedigrees in the visitation books, several occurring in the 1587 visitation of Yorkshire. In these cases the arms of peers are set out with supporters and mottos, but there is no difference between their helmets and what we should now term the helmet of an esquire or gentleman. This is all the more curious because neither helmet nor motto is found in the tricks given of the arms of commoners. Consequently one may with certainty date the introduction of the helmet with grills as the distinguishing mark of a peer in this country between the years 1587 and 1615. The introduction of the open full-faced helmet as indicative of knight or baronet is known to date from about the period of the Restoration. Whilst these fixed rules as to helmets are still scrupulously adhered to by English heralds, Lion King of Arms would seem to be inclined to let them quietly lapse into desuetude, and the emblazonment of the arms of Sir George Duff Sutherland Dunbar. Bart. In the Lion Register at the recent rematriculation of his arms, affords an instance in which the rules have been ignored. Some of the objections one hears raised to official heraldry will not hold water when all facts are known. But one certainly thinks that those who object to the present helmet and its methods of usage have ample reason for such remarks as one frequently sees in print upon the subject. To put it mildly, it is absolutely ridiculous to see a helmet placed a front, and a lion passant looking out over the side of it. Or to see a helmet in profile with the crest of a man's head a front placed above it, and as a consequence also peeping over the side. The necessity for providing a resting place for the crest other than unoccupied space has also led to the ridiculous practice of depicting the wreath or torse in the form of a straight bar balanced upon the apex of the helmet. The rule itself as to the positions of helmets for the varying ranks is officially recognized. And the elaboration of the rule with regard to the differing medals of the royal helmet and the helmets of peers and knights and baronets is officially followed. Though the supposed regulation, which requires that the helmet of an esquire or gentleman shall be of steel alone is not, inasmuch as the helmet painted upon a grant is always ornamented with gold. These rules in England only date from the times of the Stuarts, and they cannot be said to be advantageous from any point of view, they are certainly distinctly harmful from the artistic standpoint. It is plainly utterly impossible to depict some crests upon a profile helmet, and equally impossible to display others upon an affront helmet. In Scotland the crests do not afford quite such a regular succession of glaring examples for ridicule as is the case in England. No need is recognized in Scotland for necessarily distinguishing the crest of one family from that of another, though proper differences are rigidly adhered to with regard to the coats of arms. Nevertheless, Scotland provides us with many crests which it is utterly impossible to actually carry on an actual helmet, and examples of this kind can be found in the rainbow which floats above the broken globe of the hopes. And the coronets in space to which the hand points in the crest of the family of Dunbar of both, with many other similar absurdities. In England an equal necessity for difference is insisted upon in the crest as is everywhere insisted upon with regard to the coat of arms. And in the time of the late Garter King of Arms, 
it was rapidly becoming almost impossible to obtain a new crest which has not got a row of small objects in front of it, or else two somethings, one on either side. Things, however, have now considerably improved. If a crest is to be depicted between two ostrich feathers, for example, it stands to reason that the central object should be placed upon the center of the helmet, whilst the ostrich feathers would be one on either side, that is. Placed in a position slightly above the ears. Yet, if a helmet is to be rigidly depicted in profile, with such a crest, it is by no means inconceivable that the one ostrich feather at the one side would hide both the other ostrich feather and the central object. Leaving the crest to appear when properly depicted, for example, if photographed from a profile view of an actual helmet, as a single ostrich feather. Take, for instance, the severe crest, which is an estoil between two ostrich feathers. If that crest were properly depicted upon a profile helmet, the one ostrich feather would undoubtedly hide everything else, for it is hardly likely that the estoil would be placed edge forwards upon an actual helmet. And to properly display it, it ought to take its place upon an affront helmet. Under the present rules it would be officially depicted with the estoil facing the side, one ostrich feather in front over the nose, and the other at the back of the head, which of course reduces it to an absurdity. To take another example, one might instance the crest of Sir William Crookes. It is hardly to be supposed that a helmet would ever have been born into a tournament surmounted by an elephant looking out over the side. It would most certainly have had its head placed to the front, and yet, because Sir William Crookes is a knight, he is required to use an affront helmet, with a crest which most palpably was designed for use in profile. The absurd position which has resulted is chiefly due to the position rules and largely a consequence of the hideous British practice, for no other nation has ever adopted it, of depicting, as is so often done. A coat of arms and crest without the intervening helmet and mantling. Though perhaps another cause may have had its influence. I allude to the fact that an animal's head, for example, in profile, is considered quite a different crest to the same animal's head when placed to front. And so long as this idea holds, and so long as the rules concerning the position of the helmet exist, for so long shall we have these glaring and ridiculous anomalies. And whilst one generation of a family has an affront helmet and another using the same crest may have a profile one, it is useless to design crests specifically to fit the one or the other. Mr. G. W. Eve, who is certainly one of the most accomplished heraldic artists of the present time, has adopted a plan in his work which, whilst conforming with the rules to which I have referred, has reduced the peculiarities resulting from their observance to a minimum. His plan is simple, inasmuch as, with a crest which is plainly a front and has to be depicted upon a profile helmet, he slightly alters the perspective of each, twisting round the helmet, which, whilst remaining slightly in profile, more nearly approaches the affront position, and bringing the crest slightly round to meet it. In this way he has obtained some very good results from awkward predicaments. Mr. Joseph Foster, in his, Peerage and Baronetage, absolutely discarded all rules affecting the position of the helmet. And though the artistic results may be excellent, his plan cannot be commended, because whilst rules exist they ought to be adhered to. At the same time, it must be frankly admitted that the laws of position seem utterly unnecessary. No other country has them, they are, as has been shown, impracticable from the artistic standpoint, and there can be very little doubt that it is highly desirable that they should be wholly abolished. It is quite proper that there should be some means of distinction, and it would seem well that the helmet with grills should be reserved for peers. In this we should be following or closely approximating to the rules observed formerly upon the continent, and if all questions of position are waived the only difficulty which remains is the helmet of baronets and knights. The full-faced open helmet is ugly in the extreme, anything would be preferable, except an open helmet in profile, and probably it would be better to wipe out the rule on this point as well. Knights of any order have the circle of that order within which to place their shields, and baronets have the augmentations of their rank and degree. The knight bachelor would be the only one to suffer. The gift of a plain circlet round the shield or, following the precedent of a baronet, a spur upon a canton or in escutcheon, could easily remove any cause of complaint. 
But whilst one may think it well to urge strongly the alteration of existing rules, it should not be considered permissible to ignore rules which undoubtedly do exist whilst those rules remain in force. The helmets of knights and baronets and of esquires and gentlemen, in accordance with present official practice, are usually ornamented with gold, though this would not appear to be a fixed and unalterable rule. When two or more crests need to be depicted, various expedients are adopted. The English official practice is to paint one helmet only, and both the crests are detached from it. The same plan was formerly adopted in Scotland. The dexter crest is naturally the more important and the principal one in each case. By using one helmet only the necessity of turning the dexter crest to face the sinister is obviated. The present official method adopted in England of depicting three crests is to use one helmet only, and all three crests face to the dexter. The center one, which is placed on the helmet, is the principal or first crest, that on the dexter side the second, and the one on the sinister the third. In Germany, the land of many crests, no less than thirteen were born above the shield of the margraves of brandenburg ansbach There has from the earliest times been a fixed and variable practice of never dissociating a crest from the helmet which supported it, and consequently one helmet to every crest has long been the only recognized procedure. In the United Kingdom duplication of crests is quite a modern practice. Amongst the Plantagenet garter plates there is not a single example to be found of a coat of arms with more than a single crest, and there is no ancient British example of more than one helmet which can be referred to for guidance. The custom originated in the 16th and 17th centuries in Germany. This point is more fully dealt with in the chapter devoted to the consideration of crests, but it may be here noted that in Austria a knight may place two and a baron three helmets over his shield. The continental practice is as follows, when the number of the helms is even, they are arranged so that all look inwards towards the center line of the escutcheon, half being turned to the dexter, half to the sinister. If the number be uneven, the principal helm is placed in the center of front, the others with their crests being turned towards it, thus, some face to the dexter, some to the sinister. The crests are always turned with the helmets. In Scandinavia the center helm is a front, the others, with their crests, are often turned outwards. English officialism, whilst confining its own emblazonments to one helmet only, has never sought to assert that the use of two or more was either incorrect or faulty heraldry. And particularly in these later days of the revival of heraldic art in this country, all heraldic artists, following the German example, are inclined to give each crest its own helmet. This practice has been adopted during the last few years by Lion King of Arms, and now all paintings of arms in Lion Register which have two crests have the same number of helmets. Some of the bath stall plates in Henry VII's chapel in Westminster Abbey also display two helmets. When two helmets are used, it has been customary, still following the German model, to turn them to face each other, except in the cases of the full-faced helmets of a knight or baronet. And, with the same exception, when three helmets have been employed the outer ones have been placed to face the center, whilst the center one has been placed in profile, as would be the case were it standing alone. But the multiplication of English crests in number, all of which as granted are required to differ, has naturally resulted in the stereotyping of points of difference in attitude, and and the inevitable consequence is unfortunately that without sacrificing this character of differentiation it is impossible to allow the English heraldic artist the same latitude and freedom of disposition with regard to crests that his German confrere enjoys. These remarks apply solely to English and Irish crests, for Scottish practices, requiring no differentiation in the crests, have left Scottish crests simple and unspoiled. In England the result is that to play with the position of a crest frequently results in an entire alteration of its character, and consequently, as there is nothing whatever in the nature of a law or of a rule to the contrary. It is quite as usual to now find that two profile helmets are both placed to face the dexter, as placed to face each other. Another point seems also in England to have been lost sight of in borrowing our methods from Germany. They hold themselves at liberty to, and usually do, make all their charges on the shield face to the center. This is never done in England, where all face to the dexter. 
It seems therefore to me an anomaly to apply one rule to the shield and another to the helmet, and personally I prefer that both helmets and all charges should face the dexter. In British heraldry, and in fact the rule is universal, no woman other than a reigning sovereign is permitted to surmount her arms by a helmet. Woodward states that many writers have denied the right of ecclesiastics, and, of course, of women, to the use of helmet and crest. Spenner, the great German herald, defends their use by ecclesiastics, and says that, in Germany at any rate, universal custom is opposed to the restriction. There the prelates, abbots, and abbesses, who held princely fiefs by military tenure, naturally retained the full knightly insignia. In official English heraldry, there is a certain amount of confirmation and a certain amount of contradiction of this supposed rule which denies a helmet to an ecclesiastic. A grant of arms to a clergyman at the present day, and at all times previously, after the granting of crests had become usual, contains the grant of the crest and the emblazonment shows the helmet. But the grant of arms to a bishop is different. The emblazonment of the arms is surmounted by a mitre, and the crest is depicted in the body of the patent away from and distinct from the emblazonment proper in the margin. But the fact that a crest is granted proves that there is not any disability inherent in the ecclesiastic which debars him from the possession of the helmet and crest, and the rule which must be deduced. And which really is the definite and accepted rule, is that a mitre cannot be displayed together with a helmet or crest. It must be one or other, and as the mitre is indicative of the higher rank, it is the crest and helmet which are discarded. There are few rules in heraldry to which exceptions cannot be found and there is a painting now preserved in the College of Arms, which depicts the arms of the Bishop of Durham surmounted by a helmet. That in its turn being surmounted by the mitre of episcopal rank. But the bishopric of Durham was, in addition to its episcopal character, a temporal palatinate, and the arms of the bishops of that see therefore logically present many differences and exceptions from established heraldic rules. The rules with regard to the use of helmets for the coats of arms of corporate bodies are somewhat vague and vary considerably. All counties, cities, and towns, and all corporate bodies to whom crests have been granted in England, have the ordinary closed profile helmet of an esquire or gentleman. No grant of a crest has as yet been made to an English university, so that it is impossible to say that no helmet would be allowed, or if it were allowed what it would be. For some reason the arms of the City of London are always depicted with the helmet of a peer, but as the crest is not officially recorded, the privilege necessarily has no official sanction or authority. In Scotland the helmet painted upon a grant of arms to town or city is always the open full-faced helmet of a knight or baronet. But in the grant of arms to a county, where it includes a crest, the helmet is that of an esquire, which is certainly curious. In Ireland no helmet at all was painted upon the patent granting arms to the city of Belfast, in spite of the fact that a crest was included in the grant. And the late Ulster King of Arms informed me he would not allow a helmet to any impersonal arms. Care should be taken to avoid errors of anachronism when depicting helmet and shield. The shapes of these should bear some approximate relation to each other in point of date. It is preferable that the helmet should be so placed that its lower extremity reaches somewhat over the edge of the shield. The inclined position of the shield and emblazonment is borrowed from the natural order of things, because the shield hanging by its chain or shield strap, the gauge, which was so balanced that the shield should most readily fall into a convenient position when slung on the rider's shoulders, would naturally retain its equilibrium only in a slanting direction. Chapter 21 the crest. If uncertainty exists as to the origin of arms, it is as nothing to the huge uncertainty that exists concerning the beginnings of the crest. Most wonderful stories are told concerning it. That it meant this and meant the other, that the right to bear a crest was confined to this person or the other person. But practically the whole of the stories of this kind are either wild imagination or conjecture founded upon insufficient facts. The real facts, which one may as well state first as a basis to work upon, are very few and singularly unconvincing, and are useless as original data from which to draw conclusions. First of all we have the definite, assured, and certain fact that the earliest known instance of a crest is in 1198, and we find evidence of the use of arms before that date. 
The next fact is that we find infinitely more variation in the crests used by given families than in the arms, and that whilst the variations in the arms are as a rule trivial, and not affecting the general design of the shield. The changes in the crest are frequently radical, the crest borne by a family at one period having no earthly relation to that borne by the same family at another. Again, we find that though the occasional use of a crest can, by isolated instances, be taken back, as already stated, to a fairly early period, the use of crests did not become general until very much later. Another fact is that, except perhaps in the persons of sovereigns, there is no official instance, nor any other authentic instance of importance, in which a crest appears ever to have been used by a woman until these recent and unfortunate days when unofficial examples can be found of the wildest ignorance of all armorial rules. The foregoing may be taken as general principles which no authentic instance known can be said to refute. Bearing these in mind, let us now see what other results can be obtained by deduction from specific instances. The earliest form in which anything can be found in the nature of a crest is the lion upon the headdress of Geoffrey, Count of Anjou, figure 28. This has been already referred to. The helmet of Philippe d'Alsis, Count of Flanders, c. 1181, has painted upon the side the same figure of a lion which appears upon his shield. What is usually accepted as the earliest authenticated instance of a regular crest is that afforded by the great seal of King Richard I. of England, which shows over the helmet a lion passant painted upon the fan-shaped ornament which surmounts the helmet. If one accepts, as most people nowadays are inclined to do, the Darwinian theory of evolution, the presumption is that the development of the human being, through various intermediate links including the ape, can be traced back to those cell-like formations which are the most, original, types of life which are known to us. At the same time one is hardly disposed to assert that some antediluvian jellyfish away back in past ages was the first human being. By a similar, but naturally more restricted argument, one cannot accept these paintings upon helmets, nor possibly can one accept paintings upon the fan-like ornaments which surmounted the helmet, as examples of crests. The rudiments and origin of crests doubtless they were. Crests they were not. We must go back, once again, to the bedrock of the peacock popinjay vanity ingrained in human nature. The same impulse which nowadays leads to the decoration of the helmets of the lifeguards with horsehair plumes and regimental badges, the cocked hats of field marshals and other officers with waving plumes, the kepis of commissionaries and the smasher hats of colonial irregulars with cock's feathers, the hat of the poacher and gamekeeper with a pheasant's feather, led unquestionably to the decoration of the helmets of the armored knights of old. The matter was just a combination of decoration and vanity. At first, Fig. 569, they frequently painted their helmets, and as with the gradual evolution and crystallization of armory a certain form of decoration, the device upon his shield, became identified with a certain person. That particular device was used for the decoration of the helmet and painted thereupon. Then it was found that a fan-shaped erection upon the helmet improved its appearance, and, without adding greatly to its weight, advantaged it as a head protection by attracting the blow of an opponent's sword. And lessening or nullifying its force ere the blow reached the actual crown plates of the helmet. Possibly in this we see the true origin, as in the case of the scalloped edges of the mantling, of the serrated border which appears upon these fan-shaped directions. But this last suggestion is no more than a conjecture of my own, and may not be correct, for human nature has always had a weakness for decoration. And ever has been agreeable to pay the extra penny in the tuppence for the colored or decorated variety. The many instances which can be found of these fan-shaped ornaments upon helmets in a perfectly undecorated form leads me to unhesitatingly assert that they originated not as crests, nor as a vehicle for the display of crests, but as an integral and protective part of the helmet itself. The origin of the crest is due to the decoration of the fan. The derivation of the word crest, from the Latin crista, a cock's comb, should put the supposition beyond any doubt. Disregarding crests of later grant or assumption, one can assert with confidence that a large proportion of those, particularly in German armory, where they are so frequent, which we now find blazoned or depicted as wings or plumes, carrying a device, 
are nothing more than developments of or derivatives from these fan-shaped ornaments. Figure 610. From the Seal, 1301, of Richard Fitzallen, Earl of Arundel. Figure 611. From the Seal, 1301, of Humphrey de Bohm, Earl of Hereford. Figure 612. From the Seal, 1305, of Edward of Carnarvon, Prince of Wales. These fans being, from other reasons, in existence, of course, and very naturally, were painted and decorated, and equally of course such decoration took the form of the particular decoration associated with the owner, namely, the device upon the shield. It seems to me, and for long has so seemed, essentially strange that no specialist authority, writing upon armory, has noticed that these fans, as I will call them, are really a part, though possibly only a decorative part, of the helmet itself. There has always in these matters been far too great a tendency on the part of writers to accept conclusions of earlier authorities ready-made, and to simply treat these fans as selected and chosen crests. Figs. 610 to 612 are instances of helmets having these fans. All are taken from seals, and it is quite possible that the actual fans upon the seal helmets had some device painted upon them which it was impossible by reason of the size to represent upon the seal. As has been already stated, the great seal of Richard I does show a lion painted on the fan. There are many examples of the heraldic development of these fans, for their use obtained even in this country long after the real heraldic crest had an assured footing, and a typical example occurs in Fig. 613, but probably the best known instance, one which has been often illustrated, is that from the effigy of Sir Geoffrey de Luttrell, circa 1340, which shows a fan of this character upon which the entire Luttrell arms are depicted. Figure 613. Arms of the family of Scalar, Ball Gules, a bend of lozenges argent. From the Zurich Roll of Arms. Figure 614. Modern reverse of the common seal of the City of London, 1539. A much later instance in this country will be found in the seal, dated 1539, of the City of London, which shows upon the helmet one of these fan-shaped ornaments, charged with the cross of the city arms, figure 614. The arms of the City of London are recorded in the College of Arms, Vincent, without a crest, and by the way without supporters, and this seal affords a curious but a very striking and authentic instance of the extreme accuracy of the records of the College of Arms. There being no crest for the City of London at the time of the preparation of this seal, recourse was had to the ancient practice of depicting the whole or a part, in this case a part, of the device of the shield upon a fan surmounting the helmet. In course of time this fan, in the case of London, as in so many other cases, has through ignorance been converted or developed into a wing. But the rays of the fan in this instance are preserved in the rays of the dragon's wing, charged with a cross, which the crest is now supposed to be. Whilst dealing with the arms of London, one of the favorite, flaring, examples of ancient but unrecorded arms often mentioned as an instance in which the records of the College of Arms are at fault. Perhaps I may be pardoned for adding that the shield is recorded. The crest and supporters are not. The seeming omission as to the crest is explained above. The real supporters of the City of London, to which a claim by user could, even now, be established, they are two lions, not dragons, had, with the single exception of their use upon the mayor's seal, which use is continued to the present day. Been practically discarded. Consequently the lions as supporters remained unclaimed, and therefore are not recorded. The supporters now used, two dragons, are raw new adornments, of which no example can be found before the 17th century. Those naturally, being, assumed, without authority at so recent a date, are not recorded, which is yet another testimony to the impartial accuracy of the Herald's College records. The use of the fan crest has long been obsolete in British armory, in which it can hardly ever be said to have had a very great footing, unless such use was prevalent in the 13th century. But it still survives in Germany at the present day, where, in spite of the fact that many of these fans have now degenerated into reduplications of the arms upon wings or plumes of feathers. Other crests to a considerable number are still displayed upon fans. 
Many of the current practices in British armory are the culmination of long-continued ignorance. Some, mayhap, can be allowed to pass without comment, but others deserve at any rate their share of criticism and remark. Amongst such may be included the objectionable practice, in the grants of so many modern crests, of making the crest itself a shield carrying a repetition of the arms or some other device, or of introducing in the crest an escutcheon. To the resuscitation of these, fan, repetitions of the shield device there is not, and cannot be, any objection. One would even, in these days of the multiplication of differentiated crests, recommend this as a relief from the abominable rows of assorted objects nowadays placed, for the purposes of differentiation, in front of so many modern crests. One would gladly see a reversion to the German development, from this source, of wings charged with the arms or a part of the armorial device. But one of the things a new grantee should pray to be delivered from is an escutcheon of any sort, shape, or form in the crest assigned to him. To return, however, to the fans upon the early helmets. Many of the examples which have come down to us show the fan of a rather diminutive height, but, in the form of an arc of a much enlarged circle, projected far forward beyond the front of the helmet, and carried far back. Apparently as a safeguard from blows which would otherwise descend upon the neck. A survival of the fan, by the way, may perhaps be found in the dragoon helmets of the time of the Peninsular War, in the firemen's helmets of today, and in the helmets now worn by different regiments in the Italian army. The very shape of these fans should prove they were originally a protective part of the helmet. The long low shape, however, did not, as a general circumstance, lend itself to its decoration by a duplication thereupon of the whole of the arms. Consequently these fans will nearly always be found simply adorned with one figure from the shield. It should not be forgotten that we are now dealing with a period in armory when the charges upon the shield itself were very much, as far as number and position are concerned, of an indeterminate character. If they were indeterminate for the shield, it evidences that there cannot have been any idea of a necessity to repeat the whole of the device upon the fan. As there was seldom room or opportunity for the display of the whole device, we invariably find that these fan decorations were a duplication of a distinctive part, but not necessarily the whole of the device. And this device was disposed in the most suitable position which the shape of the fan would accommodate. Herein is the explanation of the fact that whilst the arms of Percy, Talbot, and Mowbray were all, in varying tinctures, a lion rampant, the crest in each case was a lion passant or statant. In short, the fan did not lend itself to the representation of a lion rampant, and consequently there is no early instance of such a crest. Perhaps the insecurity of a large and heavy crest balanced upon one leg may be an added reason. The next step in the evolution of the crest, there can be little doubt, was the cutting of the fan into the outline of the crest, and though I know of no instance of such a crest on any effigy, there can be no reasonable doubt on the point. If a little thought is given to the matter. Until a very much later period, we never find in any heraldic representation that the helmet or crest are represented in an affront position. Why? Simply because crests at that period were merely profile representations. In later days, when tournament crests were made of leather, the weight even of these was very considerable, but for tournament purposes that weight could be endured. Half a dozen courses down the barrier would be a vastly different matter to a whole day under arms in actual battle. Now a crest cut out from a thin plate of metal set on edge would weigh but little. But perhaps the strongest proof of all is to be found in the construction of so many German crests, which are adorned down the back with a fan. Now it is hardly likely, if the demi-lion in relief had been the earliest form, that the fan would have been subsequently added to it. The fan is nothing more than the remains of the original fan-shaped ornament left when the crest, or most likely only the front outline of it, had been cut out in profile from the fan. We have no instance until a very much later period of a crest which could not be depicted in profile. And in the representations of crests upon seals we have no means of forming a certain judgment that these representations are not of profile crests. For the very nature of the craft of seal engraving would lead the engraver to add a certain amount of relief, even if this did not actually exist. It is out of the question to suppose, by reason of their weight, 
that crests were made in metal. But if made of leather, as were the tournament crests, what protection did the crest add to the helmet? The fact that wreaths and coronets did not come into use at the earliest advent of crests is confirmatory evidence of the fact that modeled crests did not exist. Inasmuch as the fan prolonged in front and prolonged behind was narrowed at its point of contact with the helmet into such a diminished length that it was comparatively easy to slip the mantling by means of a slit over the fan. Or even drape it round it. Many of the old illustrations of tournaments and battles which have come down to us show no crests on the helmets, but merely plumes of feathers or some fan-shaped direction. Consequently it is a fairly safe conclusion that for the actual purposes of warfare modeled crests never had any real existence, or, if they had any such existence, that it was most limited. Modeled crests were tournament crests. The crests that were used in battle must have been merely cut out in profile from the fan. Then came the era, in Plantagenet times, of the tournament. We talk glibly about tournaments, but few indeed really know much about them. Trial by combat and the real tournament a l'outrance seldom occurred, and though trial by combat remained upon the statute book until the 59 go 3 it was seldom invoked. Tournaments were chiefly in the nature of athletic displays, taking the place of our games and sports, and inasmuch as they contributed to the training of the soldier, were held in the high repute that polo, for example, now enjoys amongst the upper and military classes. Added to this, the tournament was the essential climax of ceremony and ceremonial, and in all its details was ordered by such strict regulations, rules, and supervision that its importance and its position in the public and official estimate was far in advance of its present-day equivalents. The joust was fought with tilting spears, the tourney with swords. The rules and regulations for justs and tournaments drawn up by the High Constable of England in the reign of Edward IV show clearly that in neither was contemplated any risk of life. In the tourney the swords were blunted and without points, but the principal item was always the joust, which was fought with tilting spears and shields. Many representations of the tourney show the participants without shields. The general ignorance as to the manner in which the tilt was run is very widespread. A strong barrier was erected straight down the center of the lists, and the knights were placed one on either side, so that by no possible chance could the two horses come into contact. Those who will read Mallory's, Mort d'Arthur, carefully, bearing in mind that Mallory described legendary events of an earlier period clothed in the manners and customs of his own day, time of Edward IV, and made no attempt to reproduce the manners and customs and real atmosphere of the Arthurian times, which could have had no relation to the manners and proceedings which Sir Thomas Mallory employs in telling his legends, will notice that. When it came to jousting, some half-dozen courses would be all that were run between contending knights. In fact the tournament rules above referred to say, for the tourney, that two blows at passage and ten at the joining ought to suffice. The time which this would occupy would not exceed the period for which any man could easily sustain the weight of a mottled crest. Figure 615. Crest of Roger de Quincy, Earl of Winchester, died in 1264. From his seal. Figure 616. Crest of Thomas, Earl of Lancaster. From his seal, 1301. Another point needs to be borne in mind. The result of a joust depended upon the points scored, the highest number being gained for the absolute unhorsing of an opponent. This, however, happened comparatively seldom, and points or spears were scored for the lances broken upon an opponent's helmet, shield, or body, and the points so scored were subject to deduction if the opponent's horse were touched. And under other circumstances. The head of the tilting spear which was used was a kind of rosette, and heraldic representations are really incorrect in adding a point when the weapon is described as a tilting spear. Whilst a fine point meeting a wooden shield or metal armor would stick in the one or glance off the other, and neither result in the breaking of the lance nor in the unhorsing of the opponent, a broad rosette would convey a heavy shock. But to effect the desired object the tilting spear would need to meet resistance, and little would be gained by knocking off an opponent's ornamental crest. Certainly no prize appears to have been allotted for the performance of this feat, which always attracts the imagination of the novelist, 
whilst there was for striking the sight of the helmet. Consequently there was nothing to be gained from the protection to the helmet which the fan of earlier date afforded, and the tendency of ceremonial led to the use in tournaments of helmets and elaborate crests which were not those used in battle. The result is that we find these tournament or ceremonial crests were of large and prominent size, and were carved in wood, or built up of leather. But I firmly believe that these crests were used only for ceremonial and tournament purposes, and were never actually worn in battle. That these modelled crests in relief are the ones that we find upon effigies is only natural, and what one would expect, inasmuch as a man's effigy displayed his garments and accoutrements in the most ornate and honourable form. The same idea exists at the present day. The subjects of modern effigies and modern portraits are represented in robes, and with insignia which are seldom if ever worn, and which sometimes even have no existence in fact. In the same way the ancient effigies are the representations of the ceremonial dress and not the everyday garb of those for whom they stand. But even allowing all the foregoing, it must be admitted that it is from these ceremonial or tournament helmets and crests that the heraldic crest has obtained its importance. And herein lies the reason of the exaggerated size of early heraldic crests, and also the unsuitability of some few for actual use. Tournaments were flourishing in the Plantagenet, Yorkist, and Lancastrian periods, and ended with the days of the Tudor dynasty, and the Plantagenet period witnessed the rise of the ceremonial and heraldic crest. But in the days when crests had any actual existence they were made to fit the helmet, and the crests in figures 615, 618 show crests very much more naturally disposed than those of later periods. Crests appear to have come into wider and more general use in Germany at an earlier period than is the case in this country. For in the early part of the 13th century seals are there to be met with having only the device of helmet and crest thereupon, a proof that the Oberwappen, helmet and crest, was then considered of equal or greater value than the shield. Figure 617. Crest of William de Montague, Earl of Salisbury, died in 1344. From his seal. Figure 618. Crest of Thomas de Mowbray, Earl of Nottingham, and Earl Marshall. From a drawing of his seal, 1389, M. S. Cott, Julius, C. 7. The actual tournament crests were made of light material, pasteboard, cloth, or a leather shell over a wood or wire framework filled with tow, sponge, or sawdust. Fig. 271, which shows the shield, helmet, and crest of the Black Prince undoubtedly contemporary, dating from 1376, and now remaining in Canterbury Cathedral, is made of leather and is a good example of an actual crest, but even this. There can be little doubt, was never carried in battle or tournament, and is no more than a ceremonial crest made for the funeral pageant. The heraldic wings which are so frequently met with in crests are not the natural wings of a bird, but are a development from the fan, and in actual crests were made of wooden or basketwork strips and probably at an earlier date were not intended to represent wings, but were mere pieces of wood painted and existing for the display of a certain device. Their shape and position led to their transition into wings, and then they were covered with dyed or natural colored feathers. It was the art of heraldic emblazonment which ignored the practical details, that first copied the wing from nature. Actual crests were fastened to the helmets they surmounted by means of ribbons, straps, laces, which developed later into the filleting torse, or rivets, and in Germany they were ornamented with hanging and tinkling metal leaves, tiny bells. Buffalo horns, feathers, and projecting pieces of wood, which formed vehicles for still further decorative appendages. Then comes the question, what did the crest signify? Many have asserted that no one below the rank of a knight had the right to use a crest. In fact some writers have asserted, and doubtless correctly as regards a certain period, that only those who were of tournament rank might assume the distinction. And herein lies another confirmation of the supposition that crests had a closer relation to the tournament than to the battlefield. Doubts as to a man's social position might disqualify him from participation in a tournament, hence the helm shall previously referred to, but they certainly never relieved him from the obligations of warfare imposed by the tenure under which he held his lands. There is no doubt, however, that whatever the regulation may have been, 
and there seems little chance of our ever obtaining any real knowledge upon the point, the right to display a crest was an additional privilege and honor. Something extra and beyond the right to a shield of arms. For how long any such supposition held good it is difficult to say, for whilst we find in the latter part of the fourteenth century that all the great nobles had assumed and were using crests. And whilst there is but one amongst the Plantagenet garter plates without a crest where a helmet has been represented above the shield, we also find that the great bulk of the lesser landed gentry bore arms, but made no pretension to a crest. The lesser gentry were bound to fight in war, but not necessarily in the tournament. Arms were a necessity of warfare, crests were not. This continued to be the case till the end of the sixteenth century, for we find that at one of the visitations no crests whatever are inserted with the arms and pedigrees of the families set out in the visitation book. And one is probably justified in assuming that whilst this state of feeling and this idea existed, the crest was highly thought of, and valued possibly beyond the shield of arms. For with those of that rank of life which aspired to the display of a crest the right to arms would be a matter of course. In the latter part of the reign of Queen Elizabeth and in Stuart days the granting of crests to ancient arms became a widespread practice. Scores upon scores of such grants can be referred to, and I have myself been led to the irresistible conclusion that the opportunity afforded by the grant of a crest was urged by the heralds and officers of arms. In order to give them the opportunity of confirming and recording arms which they knew needed such confirmation to be rendered legal. Without giving offense to those who had borne these arms merely by strength of user for some prolonged but at the same time insufficient period to confer an unquestioned right. That has always seemed to me the obvious reason which accounts for these numberless grants of crests to apparently existing arms, which arms are recited and emblazoned in the patents. Because there are other grants of crests which can be referred to, though these are singularly few in number, in which the arms are entirely ignored. But as none of these grants, which are of a crest only, appear to have been made to families whose right to arms was not absolutely beyond question or dispute, the conclusion above recited appears to be irresistible. The result of these numerous grants of crests, which I look upon as carrying greater importance in the sense that they were also confirmations of the arms, resulted in the fact that the value and dignity of the crest slowly but steadily declined. And the cessation of tournaments and, shortly afterwards, the marked decline in funereal pageantry no doubt contributed largely to the same result. Throughout the Stuart period instances can be found, though not very frequently, of grants of arms without the grant of a crest being included in the patent. But the practice was soon to entirely cease, and roughly speaking one may assert that since the beginning of the Hanoverian dynasty no person has ever been granted arms without the corresponding grant of a crest. If a crest could be properly borne with the arms. Now no crest has ever been granted where the right to arms has not existed or been simultaneously conferred, and therefore, whilst there are still many coats of arms legally in existence without a crest, a crest cannot exist without a coat of arms. So that those people, and they are many, who vehemently assert a right to the crest of their family, whilst admitting they have no right to arms, stand self-convicted heraldically both of having spoken unutterable rubbish. And of using a crest to which they can have no possible right. One exception, and one only, have I ever come across to the contrary, and very careful inquiry can bring me knowledge of no other. That crest is the crest of a family of Buckworth, now represented by Sir Charles Buckworth Hernsome, Bart. This family at the time of the visitations exhibited a certain coat of arms and crest. The coat of arms, which doubtless interfered with the rights of some other family, was respite for further proof. But the crest, which did not, appears to have been allowed, and as nothing further was done with regard to the arms, the crest stood, whilst the arms were bad. But even this one exception has long since been rectified, for when the additional name and arms of Somme were assumed by royal license. The arms which had been exhibited and respite were, with the addition of an ermine spot as a charge upon the chevron, granted as the arms of Buckworth to be borne quarterly with the arms of Somme. Plate 6. With the cessation of tournaments, we get to the period which some writers have stigmatized as that of paper heraldry. 
That is a reference to the fact that arms and crests ceased to be painted upon shields or erected upon helmets that enjoyed actual use in battle and tournament. Those who are so ready to decry modern heraldry forget that from its very earliest existence heraldry has always had the same significance as a symbol of rank and social position which it now enjoys and which remains undiminished in extent. Though doubtless less potent in effect. They forget also that from the very earliest period armory had three uses, viz. Its martial use, its decorative use, and its use as a symbol of ownership. The two latter uses still remain in their entirety, and whilst that is the case, armory cannot be treated as a dead science. But with the cessation of tournaments the decorative became the chief use of arms, and the crest soon ceased to have that distinctive adaptability to the purpose of a helmet ornament. Up to the end of the Tudor period crests had retained their original simplicity. Animals' heads and animals' passant, human heads and demi-animals, comprised the large majority of the early crests. Scottish heraldry in a marked degree has retained the early simplicity of crests, though at the expense of lack of distinction between the crests of different families. German heraldry has to a large extent retained the same character as has Scottish armory, and though many of the crests are decidedly elaborated. It is noticeable that this elaboration is never such as to render the crest unsuitable for its true position upon a helmet. In England this aspect of the crest has been almost entirely lost sight of, and a large proportion of the crests in modern English grants are utterly unsuitable for use in relief upon an actual helmet. Our present rules of position for a helmet, and our unfortunate stereotyped form of wreath, are largely to blame, but the chief reason is the definite English rule that the crests of separate English families must be differentiated as are the arms. No such rule holds good in Scotland, hence their simple crests. Whether the rule is good or bad it is difficult to say. When all the pros and cons have been taken into consideration, the whole discussion remains a matter of opinion. And whilst one dislikes the Scottish idea under which the same identical crest can be and regularly is granted to half a dozen people of as many different surnames, one objects very considerably to the typical present-day crest of an English grant of arms. Whilst a collar can be put round an animal's neck, and whilst it can hold objects in its mouth or paws, it does seem ridiculous to put a string of varied and selected objects in front of it, when these plainly would only be visible from one side. Or to put a crest, between, objects if these are to be represented, fore and aft, one toppling over the brow of the wearer of the helmet and the other hanging down behind. The crests granted by the late Sir Albert Woods, Garter, are the crying grievance of modern English heraldry, and though a large proportion are far greater abortions than they need be. And though careful thought and research even yet will under the present regime result in the grant of at any rate a quite unobjectionable crest, nevertheless we shall not obtain a real reform, or attain to any appreciable improvement. Until the position rule as to helmets is abolished. Some of the crests mentioned hereunder are typical and awful examples of modern crests. Crest of Bellasis of Martin, Westmoreland, a Mount Vert, there on a lion couchant guard ant azure, in front of a tent proper, lined gules. Crest of Herman of Preston, Lancashire, and Wifold Court, Checkenden, Oxon, in front of two palm trees proper, a lion couchant guard ant ermenoise, resting the dexter claw upon a bale of cotton proper. Motto, Fido non timio. Crest of James Harrison, ESQ, MA, Barrister at Law, in front of a demi lion rampant array store, gorged with a collar gemel azure, and holding between the paws a wreath of oak proper, three massels interlaced also azure. Motto, Pro Re GT Patria. Crest of Colonel John Davis, FSA, of Bifrons, Hans, a lion's head erased sable, charged with a caltrap war, upon two swords in salter proper, hilted and pommeled also or. Motto, Natens, AUT Perfis. Crest of the late Sir Saul Samuel, Bart, KCMG, upon a rock in front of three spears, one in pale and two in salter, a wolf current sable, pierced in the breast by an arrow argent, flight adore. Motto, A Pledge of Better Times. Crest of Johnson of Kennel Manor, Chislehurst, Kent, in front of a dexter arm embowed in armor proper, the hand also proper, 
grasping a javelin in Ben Sinister, Fiendor, and Enfield with a chaplet of roses gules. Two branches of oak in Saltervert. Crest of C. E. Lampla, E. S. Q., in front of a cubit arm erect proper, encircled about the wrist with a wreath of oak and holding in the hand a sword also proper, pommel and hilt or, an escutcheon argent, charged with a goat's head cooped sable. Mottos, through, and, Providentia de Stabilienter Familiae. Crest of Glassford, Scotland, issuing from clouds two hands conjoined grasping a caduceus ensign with a cap of liberty, all between two cornucopi all proper. Motto, Prisca Fides. We now come to the subject of the inheritance of crests, concerning which there has been much difference of opinion. It is very usually asserted that until a comparatively recent date crests were not hereditary, but were assumed, discarded, and changed at pleasure. Like many other incorrect statements, there is a certain modicum of truth in the statement, for no doubt whilst arms themselves had a more or less shifting character, crests were certainly not fixed to any greater extent. But I think no one has as yet discovered, or at any rate brought into notice, the true facts of the case, or the real position of the matter, and I think I am the first to put into print what actually were the rules which governed the matter. The rules, I believe, were undoubtedly these. Crests were, save in the remote beginning of things heraldic, definitely hereditary. They were hereditary even to the extent, and herein lies the point which has not hitherto been observed, that they were transmitted by an heiress. Perhaps this heritability was limited to those cases in which the heiress transmitted the de facto headship of her house. We, judging by present laws, look upon the crest as a part of the one heraldic achievement inseparable from the shield. What proof have we that in early times any necessary connection between arms and crest existed? We have none. The shield of arms was one inheritance, descending by known rules. The crest was another, but a separate inheritance, descending equally through an heir or coeur general. The crest was, as an inheritance, as separate from the shield as were the estates then. The social conditions of life prevented the possibility of the existence or inheritance of a crest where arms did not exist. But a man inheriting several coats of arms from different heiress ancestresses could marshal them all upon one shield, and though we find the heir often made selection at his pleasure, and marshaled the arms in various methods. The determination of which was a mere matter of arbitrary choice, he could, if he wished, use them all upon one shield. But he had but one helmet, and could use and display but one crest. So that, if he had inherited two, he was forced to choose which he would use, though he sometimes tried to combine two into one device. It is questionable if an instance can be found in England of the regular display of two helmets and crests together, surmounting one shield, before the 18th century. But there are countless instances of the contemporary but separate display of two different crests, and the visitation records afford us some number of instances of this tacit acknowledgement of the inheritance of more than one crest. The patent altering or granting the Mowbray crest seems to me clear recognition of the right of inheritance of a crest passing through an heir female. This, however, it must be admitted, may be really no more than a grant, and is not in itself actual evidence that any crest had been previously born. My own opinion, however, is that it is fair presumptive evidence upon the point, and conveys an alteration and not a grant. The translation of this patent, Patent Roll 339, 17 Ric. 2, Pt. 1, Mem. 2, is as follows, the king to all to whom, and k. Greeting, know that whereas our well-beloved and faithful kinsman, Thomas, Earl Marshall and Earl of Nottingham, has a just hereditary title to bear for his crest a leopard or with a white label. Which should be of right the crest of our eldest son if we had begotten a son. We, for this consideration, have granted for us and our heirs to the said Thomas and his heirs that for a difference in this crest they shall and may bear a leopard, and in place of a label a crown argent. Without hindrance from us or our heirs aforesaid. In witness, and k. Witness the king at Westminster, the twelfth day of January, 17 Ric. 2, by writ of privy seal. Cases will constantly be found in which the crests have been changed. 
I necessarily totally exclude from consideration crests which have been changed owing to specific grants, and also changes due to the discarding of crests which can be shown to have been born without right. Changes in crests must also be disregarded ere the differences in emblazonment are merely differences in varying designs of the same crest. Necessarily from none of these instances can a law of inheritance be deduced. But if other changes in the crests of important families be considered, I think it will be very evident that practically the whole of these are due to the inheritance through heiresses or ancestresses of an alternative crest. It can be readily shown that selection played an important part in the marshalling of quarterings upon an escutcheon, and where important quarterings were inherited they are as often as not found depicted in the first quarter. Thus the Howards have borne at different periods the wings of Howard, the horse of Fitzalan, and the royal crest granted to the Mowbrays with remainder to the heir general. And these crests have been borne, as will be seen from the garter plates, quite irrespective of what the surname in use may have been. Consequently it is very evident the crests were considered to be inherited with the representation of the different families. The Storton crest was originally a stag's head, and is to be seen recorded in one of the visitations, and upon the earliest seal in existence of any member of the family. But after the inheritance through the heiress of Lemoyne, the Lemoyne crest of the demi-monk was adopted. The Stanleys, earls of Derby, whatever their original crest may have been, inherited the well-known bird and bantling of the family of Latham. The Talbot crest was originally a Talbot, and this is still so borne by Lord Talbot of Malahide, it was recorded at the visitation of Dublin. But the crest at present borne by the earls of Shrewsbury is derived from the arms inherited by descent from Gwendolen, daughter of Rhys A. P. Griffith. The Neville crest was a bull's head as it is now borne by the Marquess of Abergavenny, and as it will be seen on the garter plate of William Neville, Lord Falkenberg. An elder brother of Lord Falkenberg had married the heiress of the Earl of Salisbury, and was summoned to Parliament in her earldom. He quartered her arms, which appear upon his garter plate and seal, in the first and fourth quarters of his shield, and adopted her crest. A younger son of Sir Richard Neville, Earl of Salisbury, bore the same crest differenced by two annulets conjoined, which was the difference mark added to the shield. The crest of Borcia was a soldan's head crowned, and with a pointed cap issuing from the crown, but when the barony of Borcia passed to the family of Robset, as will be seen from the garter plate of Sir Louis Robset, Lord Borcia. The crest of Borcia was adopted with the inheritance of the arms and barony of Borcia. I am aware of no important case in English heraldry where the change has been due to mere caprice, and it would seem therefore an almost incontrovertible assertion that changes were due to inheritance. And if that can be established it follows even more strongly that until the days when armory was brought under rigid and official control, and even until a much later date, say up to the beginning of the Stuart period, crests were heritable through heiresses equally with quarterings. The fact that we find comparatively few changes considering the number of crests in existence is by no means a refutation of this theory, because a man had but one helmet, and was forced therefore to make a selection. Unless, therefore, he had a very strong inclination it would be more likely that he would select the crest he was used to than a fresh one. I am by no means certain that to a limited extent the German idea did not hold in England. This was, and is, that the crest had not the same personal character that was the case with the arms, but was rather attached to or an uppunage of the territorial fief or lordship. By the time of the Restoration any idea of the transmission of crests through heiresses had been abandoned. We then find a royal license necessary for the assumption of arms and crests. Since that date it has been and at the present time it is stringently held, and is the official rule, that no woman can bear or inherit a crest, and that no woman can transmit a right to one. Whilst that is the official and accepted interpretation of heraldic law upon the point, and whilst it cannot now be gainsaid, it cannot, however, be stated that the one assertion is the logical deduction of the other. For whilst a woman cannot inherit a lordship of parliament, she undoubtedly can transmit one, together with the titular honours, the enjoyment of which is not denied to her. In Scotland crests have always had a very much less important position than in England. 
There has been little if any continuity with regard to them, and instances of changes for which caprice would appear to be the only reason are met with in the cases of a large proportion of the chief families in that kingdom. To such a widespread extent has the permissive character been allowed to the crest, that many cases will be found in which each successive matriculation for the head of the house, or for a cadet, has produced a change in the crest. And instances are to be found where the different crests are the only existing differences in the achievements of a number of cadets of the same family. At the present time, little if any objection is ever made to an entire and radical change in the crest, if this is wished at the time of a rematriculation, and as far as I can gather such changes appear to have always been permitted. Perhaps it may be well here to point out that this is not equivalent to permission to change the crest at pleasure, because the patent of matriculation until it is superseded by another is the authority, and the compulsory authority. For the crest which is to be born. In Germany the crest has an infinitely greater importance than is the case with ourselves, but it is there considered in a large degree a territorial upunnage. And it is by no means unusual in a German achievement to see several crests surmounting a single coat of arms. In England the royal coat of arms has really three crests, although the crests of Scotland and Ireland are seldom used, which, it may be noted, are all in a manner territorial. But the difference of idea with which crests are regarded in Germany may be gathered from the fact that the King of Saxony has five, the Grand Duke of mecklenburg schwerin five, the Grand Duke of Saxmaningen six, the Grand Duke of Saxe-Altenburg seven, the Duke of Anhalt seven, the Duke of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha six, the Prince of schwarzburg sondershausen six, the Prince of schwarzburg rittelstadt six, the Prince of waldeck Permont five, the Prince of Lipp five, the Duke of Brunswick five, and instances can be quoted of sixteen and seventeen. Probably Woodward is correct when he says that each crest formerly denoted a noble fief, for which the proprietor had a right to vote in the circles of the empire, and he instances the margraves of brandenburg ansbach who were entitled to no less than thirteen crests. In France the use of crests is not nearly so general as in England or Germany. In Spain and Portugal it is less frequent still, and in Italy the use of a crest is the exception. The German practice of using horns on either side of the crest, which the ignorance of English heralds has transformed into the probosities of elephants, is dealt with at some length on page. The horns, which are termed buffaloes or bulls' horns until the middle of the 13th century, were short and thick-set. It is difficult to say at what date these figures came to be considered as heraldic crests, for as mere helmet ornaments they probably can be traced back very far beyond any proof of the existence of armory. In the 14th century we find the horns curved inwards like a sickle, but later the horns are found more erect, the points turning outwards, slimmer in shape, and finally they exhibit a decidedly marked double curve. Then the ends of the horns are met with open, like a trumpet, the fact which gave rise to the erroneous idea that they represented elephants' trunks. The horns became ornamented with feathers, banners, branches of leaves, balls, and k and the orifices garnished with similar adornments. In England, crests are theoretically subject to marks of cadency and difference. This is not the case, however, in any other country. In Germany, in cases where the crests reproduce the arms, any mark of cadency with which the arms are distinguished will of course be repeated. But in German heraldry, doubtless owing to the territorial nature of the crest, a change in the crest itself is often the only mark of distinction between different branches of the same family. And in Seedmatcher's Wappenbuch 31 different branches of the Zorn family have different crests, which are the sole marks of difference in the achievements. But though British crests are presumed to be subject to the recognized marks of cadency, as a matter of fact it is very seldom indeed that they are ever so marked. With the exception that the mark used, usually a cross-crosslet, to signify the lack of blood relationship when arms are assumed under a royal license, is compulsory. Marks of distinction added to signify illegitimacy are also compulsory and perpetual. What these marks are will be dealt with in a subsequent chapter upon the subject. How very seldom a mark of difference is added to a crest may be gathered from the fact that with the exception of labels, chiefly upon the royal crest, one crest only amongst the Plantagenet garter plates is differenced. 
that one being the crest of John Neville, Lord Montague. Several crests, however, which are not royal, are differenced by similar labels to those which appear upon the shields. But when we find that the difference marks have very much of a permissive character, even upon the shield, it is not likely that they are perpetuated upon the crest, where they are even less desirable. The arms of cocaine, as given in the funeral certificate of Sir William Cocaine, Lord Mayor of London, show upon the shield three crescents, sable, or, and gules, charged one upon the other. The Lord Mayor being the second son of a second son of Cocaine of Sturston, descending from William, second son of Sir John Cocaine of Ashbourne. But, in spite of the fact that three difference marks are charged upon the shield, one of the quarterings of which, by the way, has an additional mark, the crest itself is only differenced by one crescent. These difference marks, as applied to arms, are in England, the rules in Scotland are utterly distinct, practically permissive, and are never enforced against the wish of the bearer except in one circumstance. If, owing to the grant of a crest or supporters, or a royal license, or any similar opportunity, a formal exemplification of the arms is entered on the books of the College of Arms. The opportunity is generally taken to add such mark of cadency as may be necessary. And no certificate would be officially issued to any one claiming arms through that exemplification except subject to the mark of cadency therein depicted. In such cases as these the crest is usually differenced, because the necessity for an exemplification does not often occur, except owing to the establishment of an important branch of the family. Which is likely to continue as a separate house in the future, and possibly to rival the importance of the chief of the name. Two examples will show my meaning. The crest of the Duke of Bedford is a goat statnet argent, armed or. When Earl Russell, the third son of the sixth Duke of Bedford, was so created, the arms, crest, and supporters were charged with a mullet argent. When the first Lord Amthill, who was the third son of the father of the ninth Duke of Bedford, was so created, the arms of Russell, with the crest and supporters, were also charged with mullets. These being of different tinctures from those granted to Earl Russell. The crest of the Duke of Westminster is a Talbot Stathant or. The first Lord Stalbridge was the second son of the Marquess of Westminster. His arms, crest, and supporters were charged with a crescent. Lord Ebury was the third son of the first Marquess of Westminster. His arms, crest, and supporters were charged with a mullet. In cases of this kind the mark of difference upon the crest would be considered permanent. But for ordinary purposes, and in ordinary circumstances, the rule may be taken to be that it is not necessary to add the mark of cadency to a crest, even when it is added to the shield, but that, at the same time, it is not incorrect to do so. Crests must nowadays always be depicted upon either a wreath, coronet, or chapeau, but these, and the rules concerning them, will be considered in a more definite and detailed manner in the separate chapters in which those objects are discussed. Crests are nowadays very frequently used upon livery buttons. Such a usage is discussed at some length in the chapter on badges. When two or more crests are depicted together, and when, as is often the case in England, the wreaths are depicted in space, and without the intervening helmets, the crests always all face to the dexter side. And the stereotyped character of English crests perhaps more than any other reason, has led of late to the depicting of English helmets all placed to face in the same direction to the dexter side. But if, as will often be found, the two helmets are turned to face each other, the crests also must be turned. Where there are two crests, the one on the dexter side is the first and the one on the sinister side is the second. When there are three, the center one comes first, then the one on the dexter side, then the one on the sinister. When there are four crests, the first one is the dexter of the two inner ones, the second is the sinister inner one. The third is the dexter outer, and the fourth the sinister outer. When there are five, and I know of no greater number in this country, they run as follows, 1, center, 2, dexter inner, 3, sinister inner, 4, dexter outer, 5, sinister outer. A very usual practice in official emblazonments in cases of three crests is to paint the center one of a larger size, and at a slightly lower level, than the others. In the case of four, numbers 1 and 2 would be of the same size, 
nose. 3 and 4 slightly smaller, and slightly raised. It is a very usual circumstance to see two or more crests displayed in England, but this practice is of comparatively recent date. How recent may be gathered from the fact that in Scotland no single instance can be found before the year 1809 in which two crests are placed above the same shield. Scottish heraldry, however, has always been purer than English, and the practice in England is much more ancient, though I question if in England any authentic official exemplification can be found before 1700. There are, however, many cases in the visitation books in which two crests are allowed to the same family, but this fact does not prove the point, because a visitation record is merely an official record of inheritance and possession. And not necessarily evidence of a regulation permitting the simultaneous display of more than one. It is of course impossible to use two sets of supporters with a single shield, but there are many peers who are entitled to two sets, Lord Ancaster, I believe, is entitled to three sets. But an official record in such a case would probably emblazon both sets as evidence of right, by painting the shield twice over. During the 18th century we find many instances of the grant of additional crests of augmentation, and many exemplifications under royal license for the use of two and three crests. Since that day the correctness of duplicate crests has never been questioned, where the right of inheritance to them has been established. The right of inheritance to two or more crests at the present time is only officially allowed in the following cases. If a family at the time of the visitations had two crests recorded to them, these would be now allowed. If descent can be proved from a family to whom a certain crest was allowed, and also from ancestors at an earlier date who are recorded as entitled to bear a different crest. The two would be allowed unless it was evident that the later crest had been granted, assigned, or exemplified in lieu of the earlier one. Two crests are allowed in the few cases which exist where a family has obtained a grant of arms in ignorance of the fact that they were then entitled to bear arms and crest of an earlier date to which the right has been subsequently proved. But on this point it should be remarked that if a right to arms is known to exist a second grant in England is point-blank refused unless the petition asks for it to be borne instead of, and in lieu of. The earlier one, it is then granted in those terms. To those who think that the Herald's College is a mere fee-grabbing institution, the following experience of an intimate friend of mine may be of interest. In placing his pedigree upon record it became evident that his descent was not legitimate, and he therefore petitioned for and obtained a royal license to bear the name and arms of the family from which he had sprung. But the illegitimacy was not modern, and no one would have questioned his right to the name which all the other members of the family bear. If he had not himself raised the point in order to obtain the ancient arms in the necessarily differenced form. The arms had always been borne with some four or five quarterings and with two crests, and he was rather annoyed that he had to go back to a simple coat of arms and single crest. He obtained a grant for his wife, who was an heiress, and then, with the idea of obtaining an additional quartering in a second crest. He conceived the brilliant idea, for money was of no object to him, of putting his brother forward as a petitioner for arms to be granted to him and his descendants and to the other descendants of his father. A grant which would of course have brought in my friend. He moved heaven and earth to bring this about, but he was met with the direct statement that two grants of arms could not be made to the same man to be born simultaneously, and that if he persisted in the grant of arms to his brother, his own name. As being then entitled to bear arms, would be specifically exempted from the later grant, and the result was that this second grant was never made. In Scotland, where rematriculation is constantly going on, two separate matriculations to the same line would not confer the right to two crests, inasmuch as the last matriculation supersedes everything which has preceded it. But if a cadet matriculates a different crest, and subsequently succeeds to the representation under an earlier matriculation, he legally succeeds to both crests, and incidentally to both coats of arms. As a matter of ordinary practice, the cadet matriculation is discarded. A curious case, however, occurs when after matriculation by a cadet there is a later matriculation behind it, by some one nearer the head of the house to which the first mentioned cadet succeeds. In which event selection must be brought into play, when succession to both occurs. But the selection lies only between the two patents, and not from varied constituent parts. 
whereas an augmentation an additional crest is granted, as has been the case in many instances, of course a right to the double crest is thereby conferred, and a crest of augmentation is not granted in lieu, but in addition. A large number of these additional crests have been granted under specific warrants from the Crown, and in the case of Lord Goff, two additional crests were granted as separate augmentations and under separate patents. Lord Kitchener recently received a grant of an additional crest of augmentation. There are also a number of grants on record, not officially ranking as augmentations, in which a second crest has been granted as a memorial of descent or office, and the other cases in which double and treble crests occur are the results of exemplifications following upon royal licenses to assume name and arms. As a rule, when an additional surname is adopted by royal license, the rule is that the arms adopted are to be born in addition to those previously in existence. And where one name is adopted instead of another the warrant very frequently permits this, and at the same time permits or requires the new arms to be born quarterly with those previously possessed, and gives the right to two crests. But in cases where names and arms are assumed by royal license the arms and crest or crests are in accordance with the patent of exemplification, which, no matter what its terms, for some do not expressly exclude any prior rights, is always presumed to supersede everything which has gone before, and to be the authority by which the subsequent bearing of arms is regularized and controlled. Roughly speaking, under a royal license one generally gets the right to one crest for every surname, and if the original surname be discarded, in addition a crest for every previous surname. Thus Mannering Eller Caronslow has three crests, Wyndham Campbell Playdell Bovary has four, and the last Duke of Buckingham and Chandos, who held the record, had one for each of his surnames, namely, Temple Nugent Bridges Chandos Grenville. In addition to the foregoing, there are one or two exceptions which it is difficult to explain. The Marquess of Butte for some reason or other obtained a grant, in the year 1822, of the crest of Herbert. The original Lord Liverpool obtained a grant of an additional crest, possibly an augmentation, and his representative, Lord Hawkesbury, afterwards created Earl of Liverpool, for some reason or other which I am quite at a loss to understand obtained a grant of a crest very similar to that of Lord Liverpool to commemorate the representation which had devolved upon him. He subsequently obtained a grant of a third crest, this last being of augmentation. Sir Charles Young, Garter King of Arms, obtained the grant of a second crest, and a former Marquess of Camden did the same thing. Lord Swansea is another recent case, and though the right of any person to obtain the grant of a second crest is not officially admitted, and is in fact strenuously denied. I cannot for the life of me see how in the face of the foregoing precedence any such privilege can be denied. Sir William Woods also obtained the grant of a second crest when he was garter, oblivious of the fact that he had not really established a right to arms. Those he used were certainly granted in lion office to a relative, but no matriculation of them in his own name was ever registered. Chapter 22 Crowns and Coronets the origin of the crown or coronet is, of course, to be met with in the diadem and fillet. In one of the Cantor lectures delivered by Mr. Cyril Davenport, F.S.A. In February 1902, on The History of Personal Jewelry from Prehistoric Times, he devoted considerable attention to the development of the diadem. And the following extracts are from the printed report of his lecture. The bandeau or fillet tied round the head was probably first used to keep long hair from getting into the eyes of primitive man. Presently it became specialized, priests wearing one pattern and fighting men another. The soft band which can be seen figured on the heads of kings in early coins, is no doubt a mark of chieftainship. This use of a band, of special color, to indicate authority, probably originated in the East. It was adopted by Alexander the Great, who also used the diadem of the king of Persia. Justinian says that Alexander's predecessors did not wear any diadem. Justinian also tells us that the diadems then worn were of some soft material, as in describing the accidental wounding of Lysimachus by Alexander, he says that the hurt was bound up by Alexander with his own diadem. This was considered a lucky omen for Lysimachus, who actually did shortly afterwards become king of Thrace. 
In Egypt diadems of particular shape are of very ancient use. There were crowns for Upper and Lower Egypt, and a combination of both for the whole country. They were also distinguished by color. The ureus or snake worn in the crowns and headdresses of the pharaohs was a symbol of royalty. Representations of the Egyptian gods always show them as wearing crowns. In Assyrian sculptures deities and kings are shown wearing diadems, apparently bands of stuff or leather studded with discs of repoussé work. Some of these discs, detached, have actually been found. Similar discs were plentifully found at Mycenae, which were very likely used in a similar way. Some of the larger ornamental headdresses worn by Assyrian kings appear to have been conical-shaped helmets, or perhaps crowns, it is now difficult to say which, because the material of which they were made cannot be ascertained. If they were of gold, they were probably crowns, like the wonderful openwork golden Scythian headdress found at Kerch, but if of an inferior metal they may have been only helmets. Adesti. Petersburg there is a beautiful ancient Greek diadem representing a crown of olive. An Etruscan ivy wreath of thin gold, still encircling a bronze helmet, is in the British Museum. Justinian says that Morimus tried to hang himself with the diadem, evidently a ribbon-like bandeau, sent to him by Mithridates. The Roman royal diadem was originally a white ribbon, a wreath of laurel was the reward of distinguished citizens, while a circlet of golden leaves was given to successful generals. Caesar consistently refused the royal white diadem which Antony offered him, preferring to remain perpetual dictator. One of his partisans ventured to crown Caesar's bust with a coronet of laurel tied with royal white ribbon, but the tribunes quickly removed it and heavily punished the perpetrator of the offense. During the Roman Empire the prejudice against the white bandeau remained strong. The emperors dared not wear it. Caligula wished to do so, but was dissuaded on being told that such a proceeding might cost his life. Eliogabalus used to wear a diadem studded with precious stones, but it is not supposed to have indicated rank, but only to have been a rich lady's parure, this emperor being fond of dressing himself up as a woman. Caracalla, who took Alexander the Great as his model as far as possible, is shown on some of his coins wearing a diadem of a double row of pearls, a similar design to which was used by the kings of Parthia. On coins of Diocletian, there shows a double row of pearls, sewn on a double band and tied in a knot at the back. Diadems gradually closed in and became crowns, and on Byzantine coins highly ornate diadems can be recognized, and there are many beautiful representations of them in enamels and mosaics, as well as a few actual specimens. At Ravenna, in mosaic work in the church of San Vitali, are crowned portraits of Justinian and his empress Theodosia. In the enamel portrait of the Empress Irene in the Pal d'Oro at Venice, can be seen a beautiful jeweled crown with hinged plaques, and the same construction is used on the Iron Crown of Lombardy, the Sacred Crown of Hungary, and the Crown of Charlemagne, all most beautiful specimens of jeweler's work. On the plaques of the Crown of Constantine Monomachos are also fine enamel portraits of himself and his Queen Zoe, wearing similar crowns. The catacystas, or jeweled chains, one over each ear and one at the back, which occur on all these crowns, may be the survival of the loose ends of the tie of the original fillet. In later times of Greece and Rome, owing to the growth of republican feeling the diadem lost its political significance, and was relegated to the ladies. In the Middle Ages the diadem regained much of its earlier significance, and ceased to be only the simple head ornament it had become. Now it became specialized in form, reserved as an emblem of rank. The forms of royal crowns and diadems is a large and fascinating study, and where original examples do not now exist, the development can often be followed in sculpture, coins, or seals. Heraldry now plays an important part. Diadems or circlets gradually give way to closed crowns, in the case of sovereigns possessing independent authority. But to pass to the crown proper, there is no doubt that from the earliest times of recorded history crowns have been a sign and emblem of sovereignty. It equally admits of no doubt that the use of a crown or coronet was by no means exclusive to a sovereign, but whilst our knowledge is somewhat curtailed as to the exact relation in which great overlords and nobles stood to their sovereign. It is difficult to draw with any certainty or exactitude definitive conclusions of the symbolism a crown or coronet conveyed. 
Throughout Europe in the 11th, 12th, and 13th, and well into the 14th centuries, the great territorial lords enjoyed and exercised many, in fact most, of the attributes of sovereignty, and in England especially. Where the king was no more than the first amongst his peers, the territorial earls were in much the position of petty sovereigns. It is only natural, therefore, that we should find them using this emblem of sovereignty. But what we do find in England is that a coronet or fillet was used, apparently without let or hindrance, by even knights. It is, however, a matter for thought as to whether many of these fillets were not simply the turban or puggery folded into the shape of a fillet, but capable of being unrolled if desired. What the object of the wholesale wearing of crowns and coronets was, it is difficult to conjecture. The development of the crown of the English sovereigns has been best told by Mr. Cyril Davenport in his valuable work on The English Regalia, Keegan Paul, Trench, Trubner and Company. Mr. Davenport, whose knowledge on these matters is probably unequaled, may best be allowed to tell the story in his own words, he and his publishers having very kindly permitted this course to be taken. The Crown of Great Britain By Cyril Davenport F. S. A. Crowns appear to have been at an early period worn by kings in battle, in order that they might be easily recognized. And although it is quite possible that this outward sign of sovereignty may have marked the wearer as being entitled to special protection by his own men, it is also likely that it was often a dangerous sign of importance. Upon the authority of their coins, the heads of the early British kings were adorned with variously formed fillets and ornamental wreaths. Helmets are also evidently intended to be shown, and on some of the coins of Athelstan the helmet bears upon it a crown of three raised points, with a single pearl at the top of each, figure 619. Other coins bear the crown with the three raised points without the helmet, figure 620. This crown of three points, bearing sometimes one and sometimes three pearls at the top of each, continued to be used by all the sole monarchs until Canute on whose head a crown is shown in which the three points develop into three clearly marked trefoils, fig. 621, on the great seal of Edward the Confessor the king is wearing an ornamental cap, which is described by Mr. Wyan in his book about the great seals as bearing a crown with three points trefoiled. But the impressions of this great seal that I have been able to see are so indistinct in this particular that I do not feel justified in corroborating his opinion. On some of the coins, however, of Edward the Confessor, an arched crown is very clearly shown, and this crown has depending from it, on each side, tassels with ornamental ends, figure 622. Figure 619. Figure 620. Figure 622. Figure 621. In the list of the English regalia which were destroyed under the Commonwealth in 1649 is found an item of great interest, viz. A gold wire work crown with little bells, which is there stated to have belonged to King Alfred, who appears to have been the first English king for whom the ceremony of coronation was used. And it is remarkable that on several of the crowns on coins and seals, from the time of Edward the Confessor until Henry I, little tassels or tags are shown which may indeed represent little bells suspended by a ribbon. On King Alfred's own coins there is unfortunately nothing which can be recognized as a crown. On the coins of Henry II. A crown is shown with arches, apparently intended to be jeweled, as is also the rim. There are also tassels with ornamental ends at the back of the crown, figure 623. Figure 623. Figure 624. Figure 625. Figure 626. William I. On his great seal wears a crown with three points, at the top of each of which are three pearls, fig. 624, and on some of his coins a more ornamental form of crown occurs having a broad jeweled rim and two arches, also apparently jeweled, and at each side are two pendants with pearl ends, figure 625. William II. On his great seal has a crown with five points, figure 626, the center one being slightly bigger than the others, and at the top of each a single pearl. At each side of the crown are pendants having three pearls at the ends. Figure 628. Figure 627. 
On some of the coins of Stephen a pretty form of crown is seen. It has three fleurs de lis and two jeweled arches, figure 627. The arches disappear from this time until the reign of Edward IV. On the great seal of Henry I. The king wears a simple crown with three fleurs de lis points, and two pendants each with three pearls at the ends, figure 628, and after this the pendants seem to have been discontinued. Figure 629. Figure 630. On the first great seal of Henry III. A crown with three fleurs de lis is shown surmounting a barred helmet, figure 629, and Edward I wore a similar crown with three fleurs de lis, but having supplementary pearls between each fig. 630, and this form lasted for a long time, as modifications of it are found on the coins of all the kings till Henry VII. On the third great seal of Edward IV. The king wears a crown with five fleurs de lis, the center one being larger than the others, and the crown is arched and has at the top an orb and cross, figure 631. Henry VI. On his first seal for foreign affairs, on which occurs the English shield, uses above it a crown with three crosses petit and between each a pearl, figure 632, this being the first distinct use of the cross petit on the English crown. And it probably was used here in place of the fleurs de lis hitherto worn in order to make a clear distinction between it and the French crown, which has the fleurs de lis only and surmounts the coat of arms of that country. The king himself wears an arched crown, but the impressions are so bad that the details of it cannot be followed. Figure 631. Figure 632. Henry VII. On his great seal uses as ornaments for the crown, crosses petit alternately with fleurs de lis, and also arches with an orb and cross at the top, fig. 633, and, on some of his coins, he reverts to the three fleurs de lis with points between them, arches being still used, with the orb and cross at the top, figure 634. An ornamental form of crown bearing five ornamental leaves alternately large and small, with arches, orb, and cross at the top, figure 635, occurs on the shillings of Henry VII. On the crowns of Henry VIII. As well as upon his great seals, the alternate crosses petit and fleurs de lis are found on the rim of the crown, which is arched, and has an orb and cross at the top, and this is the form that has remained ever since, figure 636. So we may consider that the growth of the ornament on the rim of the crown has followed a regular sequence from the points with one pearl at the top, of Athelstan, to the trefoil of Canute. The arches began with Edward the Confessor, and the center trefoil turned into the cross petit of Henry VI. The fact that the remaining trefoils turned eventually into fleurs de lis is only, I think, a natural expansion of form, and does not appear to have had anything to do with the French fleur de lis. Which was adopted as an heraldic bearing for an entirely different reason. The royal coat of arms of England did bear for a long time in one of its quarterings the actual fleurs de lis of France, and this, no doubt, has given some reason to the idea that the fleurs de lis on the crown had also something to do with France. But as a matter of fact they had existed on the crown of England long anterior to our use of them on the coat of arms, as well as remaining there subsequently to their discontinuance on our royal escutcheon. Figure 633. Figure 634. Figure 635. Figure 636. The cross petit itself may possibly have been evolved in a somewhat similar way from the three pearls of William I. As we often find the center trefoil, into which, as we have seen, these three points eventually turned, has a tendency to become larger than the others, and this difference has been easily made more apparent by squaring the ends of the triple leaf. At the same time it must not be forgotten that the cross petit was actually used on the scepter of Edward the Confessor, so it is just possible it may have had some specially English significance. I have already mentioned that as well as the official crown of England, which alone I have just been describing, there has often been a second or state crown, and this, although it has in general design followed the pattern of the official crown, has been much more elaborately ornamented, and in it has been set and reset the few historic gems possessed by our nation. The fact that these state crowns have in turn been denuded of their jewels accounts for the fact that the old settings of some of them still exist. Figure 637. 
Figure 638. Figure 639. Figure 640. Charles II. S. State Crown is figured in Sir Edward Walker's account of his coronation, but the illustration of it is of such an elementary character that little reliance can be placed on it. The actual setting of this crown, however, which was the one stolen by Colonel Blood on May 13, 1671, is now the property of Lord Amherst of Hackney. And the spaces from which the great ruby and the large sapphire, both of which are now in King Edward's state crown, have been taken are clearly seen, fig. 637, James II's state crown, which is very accurately figured in Sanford's account of his coronation, and pieces of which are still in the tower, also had this great ruby as its center ornament, figure 638. In Sir George Naylor's account of the coronation of George IV. There is a figure of his so-called new crown, the arches of which are composed of oak leaf sprays with acorns, and the rim adorned with laurel sprays, figure 639. The setting of this crown also belongs to Lord Amherst of Hackney, and so does another setting of a small state queen's crown, the ownership of which is doubtful. William IV. Appears to have had a very beautiful state crown, with arches of laurel sprays and a cross at the top with large diamonds. It is figured in Robson's, British Herald, published in 1830, figure 640. There is one other crown of great interest, which, since the time of James VI of Scotland and I of England, forms part of our regalia. This is the crown of Scotland, and is the most ancient piece of state jewellery of which we can boast. Edward I, after his defeat of John Balliol in 1296, carried off the crown of Scotland to England, and Robert Bruce had another made for himself. This in its turn, after Bruce's defeat at Methven, fell into Edward's hands. Another crown seems to have been made for Bruce in 1314, when he was established in the sovereignty of Scotland after Bannockburn, and the present crown probably consists largely of the material of the old one. And most likely follows its general design. It has, however, much French work about it, as well as the rougher gold work made by Scottish jewellers, and it seems probable that the crown, as it now is, is a reconstruction by French workmen, made under the care and by order of James V. About 1540. It was with this crown that Queen Mary was crowned when she was nine months old. Figure 641. In 1661 the Scottish regalia were considered to be in danger from the English, and were sent to Dunatar Castle for safety. From 1707 until 1818 they were locked up in a strong chest in the crown room of Edinburgh Castle, and Sir Walter Scott, in whose presence the box was opened, wrote an account of them in 1810. The crown consists of a fillet of gold bordered with flat wire. Upon it are twenty-two large stones set at equal distances, i.e. nine carbuncles, four jacinths, four amethysts, two white topazes, two crystals with green foil behind them, and one topaz with yellow foil. Behind each of these gems is a gold plate, with bands above and below of white enamel with black spots, and between each stone is a pearl. Above the band are ten jeweled rosettes and ten fleurs de lis alternately, and between each a pearl. Under the rosettes and fleurs de lis are jewels of blue enamel and pearls alternately. The arches have enameled leaves of French work in red and gold upon them, and the mount at the top is of blue enamel studded with gold stars. The cross at the top is black enamel with gold arabesque patterns, in the center is an amethyst, and in this cross and in the corners are oriental pearls set in gold. At the back of the cross are the letters I, R, V in enamel work. On the velvet cap are four large pearls in settings of gold and enamel, figure 641. Generally, the Scottish work in gold is cast solid and chaste, the foreign work being thinner and repoussé. Several of the diamonds are undoubtedly old, and are cut in the ancient oriental fashion, and many of the pearls are Scottish. It is kept in Edinburgh Castle with the rest of the Scottish regalia. None of the other pieces at all equal it in interest, as with the exception of the coronation ring of Charles I, they are of foreign workmanship, or, at all events, have been so altered that there is little or no original work left upon them. Very few people are aware, when they speak of the crown of England, that there are two crowns. 
The one is the official crown, the sign and symbol of the sovereigns of England. This is known by the name of St. Edward's crown, and is never altered or changed. As to this Mr. Cyril Davenport writes. St. Edward's crown was made for the coronation of Charles II. In 1662, by Sir Robert Viner. It was ordered to be made as nearly as possible after the old pattern, and the designs of it that have been already mentioned as existing in the works of Sir Edward Walker and Francis Sanford show that in essential form it was the same as now. Indeed, the existing crown is in all probability mainly composed of the same materials as that made by Sir Robert. The crown consists of a rim or circlet of gold, adorned with rosettes of precious stones surrounded with diamonds, and set upon enamel arabesques of white and red. The center gems of these rosettes are rubies, emeralds, and sapphires. Rows of large pearls mark the upper and lower edges of the rim, from which rise the four crosses petit and four fleurs de lis alternately, adorned with diamonds and other gems. The gem clusters upon the crosses are set upon enamel arabesques in white and red, of similar workmanship to that upon the rim. From the tops of the crosses rise two complete arches of gold crossing each other, and curving deeply downwards at the point of intersection. The arches are considered to be the mark of independent sovereignty. They are edged with rows of large pearls, and have gems and clusters of gems upon them set in arabesques of red and white, like those upon the crosses. From the intersection of the arches springs a mound of gold, encircled by a fillet from which rises a single arch, both of which are ornamented with pearls and gems. On the top of the arch is a cross petit of gold, set in which are colored gems and diamonds. At the top of the cross is a large spheroidal pearl, and from each of the side arms, depending from a little gold bracelet, is a beautifully formed pear-shaped pearl. The crown is shown in the tower with the crimson velvet cap, turned up with miniver, which would be worn with it. This crown is very large, but whether it is actually worn or not it would always be present at the coronation, as it is the official crown of England. St. Edward's crown is the crown supposed to be heraldically represented when for state or official purposes the crown is represented over the royal arms or other insignia. In this the fleurs de lis upon the rim are only half fleurs de lis. This detail is scrupulously adhered to, but during the reign of Queen Victoria many of the other details were very much at the mercy of the artist. Soon after the accession of King Edward VII, the matter was brought under consideration, and the opportunity afforded by the issue of a war office sealed pattern of the royal crown and cipher for use in the army was taken advantage of to notify His Majesty's pleasure. That for official purposes the royal crown should be as shown in fig. 642, which is a reproduction of the War Office sealed pattern already mentioned. It should be noted that whilst the cap of the real crown is of purple velvet, the cap of the heraldic crown is always represented as of crimson. Figure 642. Royal Crown. The second crown is what is known as the Imperial State Crown. This is the one which is actually worn, and which the sovereign after the ceremony of his coronation wears in the procession from the abbey. It is also carried before the sovereign at the opening of parliament. Whilst the gems which are set in it are national property, the crown is usually remade for each successive sovereign. The following is Mr. Davenport's description of Queen Victoria's state crown. This beautiful piece of jewellery was made by Roundel and Bridge in 1838. Many of the gems in it are old ones reset, and many of them are new. The entire weight of the crown is 39 ounces. 5 DWTS. It consists of a circlet of open work in silver, bearing in the front the great sapphire from the crown of Charles II. Which was bequeathed to George III. By Cardinal York, with other Stuart treasure. At one end this gem is partly pierced. It is not a thick stone, but it is a fine color. Opposite to the large sapphire is one of smaller size. The remainder of the rim is filled in with rich jewel clusters having alternately sapphires and emeralds in their centers, enclosed in ornamental borders thickly set with diamonds. These clusters are separated from each other by trefoil designs also thickly set with diamonds. 
The rim is bordered above and below with bands of large pearls, 129 in the lower row, and 112 in the upper. The crown as remade for King Edward VII. Now has 139 pearls in the lower row, and 122 in the upper. Above the rim are shallow festoons of diamonds caught up between the larger ornaments by points of emeralds encircled with diamonds, and a large pearl above each. On these festoons are set alternately eight crosses petit, and eight fleurs de lis of silver set with gems. The crosses petit are thickly set with brilliance, and have each an emerald in the center, except that in front of the crown, which contains the most remarkable jewel belonging to the regalia. This is a large spinal ruby of irregular drop-like form, measuring about two inches in length, and is highly polished on what is probably its natural surface, or nearly so. Its irregular outline makes it possible to recognize the place that it has formerly occupied in the older state crowns, and it seems always to have been given the place of honor. It is pierced after an oriental fashion, and the top of the piercing is filled with a supplementary ruby set in gold. Don Pedro, King of Castile in 1367, murdered the King of Granada for the sake of his jewels, one of which was this stone, and Don Pedro is said to have given it to Edward the Black Prince after the Battle of Najera, near Vitoria, in the same year. After this, it is said to have been worn by Henry V. In his crown at Agincourt in 1415, when it is recorded that the king's life was saved from the attack of the Duke d'Alencon, because of the protection afforded him by his crown, a portion of which, however, was broken off. It may be confidently predicted that such a risk of destruction is not very likely to happen again to the great ruby. In the center of each of the very ornamental fleurs de lis is a ruby, and all the rest of the ornamentation on them is composed of rose diamonds, large and small. From each of the crosses petit, the upper corners of which have each a large pearl upon them, rises an arch of silver worked into a design of oak leaves and acorn cups. These leaves and cups are all closely encrusted with a mass of large and small diamonds, rose brilliant, and table cut, the acorns themselves formed of beautiful drop-shaped pearls of large size. From the four points of intersection of the arches at the top of the crown depend large egg-shaped pearls. From the center of the arches, which slope slightly downwards, springs a mound with a cross petit above it. The mound is ornamented all over with close lines of brilliant diamonds, and the fillet which encircles it, and the arch which crosses over it, are both ornamented with one line of large rose-cut diamonds set closely together. The cross petit at the top has in the center a large sapphire of magnificent color set openly. The outer lines of the arms of the cross are marked by a row of small diamonds close together and in the center of each arm is a large diamond, the remaining spaces being filled with more small diamonds. The large sapphire in the center of this cross is said to have come out of the ring of Edward the Confessor, which was buried with him in his shrine at Westminster. And the possession of it is supposed to give to the owner the power of curing the cramp. If this be indeed the stone which belonged to St. Edward, it was probably recut in its present form of a rose for Charles II, even if not since his time. Figure 643. Queen Alexandra's Coronation Crown. Not counting the large ruby or the large sapphire, this crown contains, for rubies, eleven emeralds, sixteen sapphires, two hundred and seventy seven pearls, two thousand seven hundred and eighty three diamonds. As remade for King Edward VII. The crown now has 297 pearls and 28 18 diamonds. The large ruby has been valued at 110,000 pounds. When this crown has to take a journey it is provided with a little casket, lined with white velvet, and having a sliding drawer at the bottom, with a boss on which the crown fits closely, so that it is safe from slipping. The velvet cap turned up with miniver, with which it is worn, is kept with it. This crown has been recently remade for King Edward VII, but has not been altered in any essential details. The cap of the real crown is of purple velvet. Fig. 643 represents the crown of the Queen Consort with which Queen Alexandra was crowned on August 9, 1902. It will be noticed that, unlike the king's crowns, this has eight arches. The circlet which forms the base is one and a half inches in height. 
The crown is entirely composed of diamonds, of which there are 3,972, and these are placed so closely together that no metal remains visible. The large diamond visible in the illustration is the famous Koinur. Resting upon the rim are four crosses petit, and as many fleurs de lis, from each of which springs an arch. As a matter of actual fact the crown was made for use on this one occasion and has since been broken up. There is yet another crown, probably the one with which we are most familiar. This is a small crown entirely composed of diamonds, and the earliest heraldic use which can be found of it is in the design by Sir Edgar Bohm for the 1887 Jubilee coinage. Though effective enough when worn, it does not, from its small size, lend itself effectively to pictorial representation, and as will be remembered, the design of the 1887 coinage was soon abandoned. This crown was made at the personal expense of Queen Victoria, and under her instructions, owing to the fact that her late majesty found her state crown uncomfortable to wear, and too heavy for prolonged or general use. It is understood, also, that the queen found the regulations concerning its custody both inconvenient and irritating. During the later part of her reign this smaller crown was the only one Queen Victoria ever wore. By her will the crown was settled as an heirloom upon Queen Alexandra, to devolve upon future queen's consort for the time being. This being the case, it is not unlikely that in the future this crown may come to be regarded as a part of the national regalia, and it is as well, therefore, to reiterate the remark, that it was made at the personal expense of Her Late Majesty, and is to no extent and in no way the property of the nation. Coronets of Rank Figure 644. Coronet of Thomas Fitzalan, Earl of Arundel from his monument in Arundel Church, 1415. Figure 645. Crown of King Henry IV. 1399-1413, from his monument in Trinity Chapel, Canterbury Cathedral. In spite of various continental edicts, the heraldic use of coronets of rank, as also their actual use, seems elsewhere than in Great Britain to be governed by no such strict regulations as are laid down and conformed to in this country. For this reason, no less than for the greater interest these must necessarily possess for readers in this country, English coronets will first claim our attention. It has been already observed that coronets or jeweled fillets are to be found upon the helmets even of simple knights from the earliest periods. They probably serve no more than decorative purposes, unless these fillets be merely turbans, or suggestions thereof. As late as the 15th century there appears to have been no regularized form, as will be seen from Fig. 644, which represents the coronet as shown upon the effigy of Thomas Fitzalan, Earl of Arundel, in Arundel Church, 1415. A very similar coronet surmounts the headdress of the effigy of Beatrice, Countess of Arundel, at the same period. In his will, Lionel, Duke of Clarence, 1368, bequeaths two golden circles, with one of which he was created Duke. It is of interest to compare this with figure 645, which represents the crown of King Henry IV. As represented on his effigy. Richard, Earl of Arundel, in his will, December 5, 1375, leaves his Molyeux Quran to his eldest son Richard, his second Molyeux Quran to his daughter Joan, and his Tears Quran to his daughter Alice. Though not definite proof of the point, the fact that the Earl distributes his coronets amongst his family irrespective of the fact that the earldom, of which one would presume the coronets to be a sign, would pass to his son, would seem to show that the wearing of a coronet even at that date was merely indicative of high nobility of birth, and not of the possession of a substantive parliamentary peerage. In spite of the variations in form, coronets were, however, a necessity. When both dukes and earls were created they were invested with a coronet in open parliament. As time went on the coronet, however, gradually came to be considered the sign of the possession of a peerage, and was so born, but it was not until the reign of Charles II. That coronets were definitely assigned by royal warrant, February 19, 1660, to peers not of the blood royal. Before this date a coronet had not, as has been already stated, been used heraldically or in fact by barons, who, both in armorial paintings and in Parliament, had used a plain crimson cap turned up with white fur. 
Figure 646. Coronet of the Prince of Wales. The coronet of the Prince of Wales is exactly like the official, St. Edward's, crown, except that instead of two intersecting arches it has only one. An illustration of this is given in Fig. 646, this being the usual form in which it is heraldically depicted. It should be noticed, however, that this coronet belongs to the prince as eldest son of the sovereign and heir apparent to the throne, and not as Prince of Wales. It was assigned by royal warrant February 9, 13 Charles II. The coronet of the Princess of Wales, as such, is heraldically the same as that of her husband. Figure 647. Coronet of the Younger Children of the Sovereign. The coronets of the sons and daughters or brothers and sisters of a sovereign of Great Britain, other than a Prince of Wales, is as in Fig. 647, that is, the circlet being identical with that of the royal crown, and of the Prince of Wales coronet, but without the arch. This was also assigned in the warrant of February 9, 13 Charles II. Officially this coronet is described as being composed of crosses petit and fleurs de lis alternately. The grandchildren of a sovereign being sons and daughters of the Prince of Wales, or of other sons of the sovereign, have a coronet in which strawberry leaves are substituted for the two outer crosses petit appearing at the edges of the coronet which is officially described as composed of crosses petit, fleurs de lis, and strawberry leaves. Princes of the English royal family, being sons of younger sons of a sovereign, or else nephews of a sovereign being sons of brothers of a sovereign, and having the rank and title of a duke of the United Kingdom, have a coronet composed alternately of crosses petit and strawberry leaves, the latter taking the place of the fleurs de lis upon the circlet of the royal crown. This coronet was also assigned in the warrant of February 9, 13 Charles II. It will be observed by those who compare one heraldic book with another that I have quoted these rules differently from any other work upon the subject. A moment's thought, however, must convince any one of the accuracy of my version. It is a cardinal rule of armory that save for the single circumstance of attainder no man's armorial insignia shall be degraded. Whilst any man's status may be increased, it cannot be lessened. Most heraldic books quote the coronet of crosses petit, fleurs de lis, and strawberry leaves as the coronet of the grandsons of the sovereign. Whilst the coronet of crosses petit and strawberry leaves is stated to be the coronet of nephews or cousins of the sovereign. Such a state of affairs would be intolerable, because it would mean the liability at any moment to be degraded to the use of a less honorable coronet. Take, for example, the case of Prince Arthur of Connaught. During the lifetime of Queen Victoria, as a grandson of the sovereign he would be entitled to the former, whereas as soon as King Edward ascended the throne he would have been forced to relinquish it in favor of the more remote form. The real truth is that the members of the royal family do not inherit these coronets as a matter of course. They technically and in fact have no coronets until these have been assigned by royal warrant with the arms. When such warrants are issued, the coronets assigned have up to the present time conformed to the above rules. I am not sure that the rules now exist in any more potent form than that up to the present time those particular patterns happen to have been assigned in the circumstances stated. But the warrants, though they contain no hereditary limitation, certainly contain no clause limiting their operation to the lifetime of the then sovereign which they certainly would do if the coronet only existed whilst the particular relationship continued. The terms, grandson of the sovereign, and, nephew of the sovereign, which are usually employed, are not correct. The coronets only apply to the children of princes. The children of princesses, who are undoubtedly included in the terms, grandson, and, nephew, are not technically members of the royal family, nor do they inherit either rank or coronet from their mothers. By a curious fatality there has never, since these royal coronets were differentiated, been any male descendant of an English sovereign more remotely related than a nephew, with the exception of the Dukes of Cumberland. Their succession to the throne of Hanover renders them useless as a precedent, inasmuch as their right to arms and coronet must be derived from Hanover and its laws, and not from this country. The Princess Frederica of Hanover, however, uses an English coronet and the royal arms of England, 
presumably preferring her status as a princess of this country to whatever de jure Hanoverian status might be claimed. It is much to be wished that a royal warrant should be issued to her which would decide the point, at present in doubt, as to what degree of relationship the coronet of the crosses petit and strawberry leaves is available for. Or failing that coronet what the coronet of prince or princess of this country might be, he or she not being child, grandchild, or nephew or niece of a sovereign. The unique use of actual coronets in England at the occasion of each coronation ceremony has prevented them becoming, as in so many other countries, mere pictured heraldic details. Consequently the instructions concerning them which are issued prior to each coronation will be of interest. The following is from the London Gazette of October 1, 1901. Earl Marshall's Office. Norfolk House, St. James's Square, S.W. October 1, 1901. The Earl Marshal's order concerning the robes, coronets, and which are to be worn by the peers at the coronation of their most sacred majesties King Edward VII and Queen Alexandra. These are to give notice to all peers who attend at the coronation of their majesties, that the robe or mantle of the peers be of crimson velvet, edged with miniver, the cape furred with miniver pure, and powdered with bars or rows of ermine, i.e. Narrow pieces of black fur, according to their degree, viz. Barons, two rows. Viscounts, two rows and a half. Earls, three rows. Marquises, three rows and a half. Dukes, four rows. The said mantles or robes to be worn over full court dress, uniform, or regimentals. The coronets to be of silver gilt, the caps of crimson velvet turned up with ermine, with a gold tassel on the top. And no jewels or precious stones are to be set or used in the coronets, or counterfeit pearls instead of silver balls. The coronet of a baron to have, on the circle or rim, six silver balls at equal distances. The coronet of a viscount to have, on the circle, sixteen silver balls. The coronet of an earl to have, on the circle, eight silver balls, raised upon points, with gold strawberry leaves between the points. The coronet of a marquis to have, on the circle, for gold strawberry leaves and four silver balls alternately, the latter a little raised on points above the rim. The coronet of a duke to have, on the circle, eight gold strawberry leaves. By His Majesty's Command. Norfolk, Earl Marshal. Earl Marshal's Office. Norfolk House, St. James's Square, S.W. October 1, 1901. The Earl Marshal's order concerning the robes, coronets, and which are to be worn by the peeresses at the coronation of their most sacred majesties King Edward VII and Queen Alexandra. These are to give notice to all peeresses who attend at the coronation of their majesties, that the robes or mantles appertaining to their respective ranks are to be worn over the usual full court dress. That the robe or mantle of a baroness be of crimson velvet, the cape whereof to be furred with miniver pure, and powdered with two bars or rows of ermine, i.e. narrow pieces of black fur. The said mantle to be edged round with miniver pure two inches in breadth, and the train to be three feet on the ground, the coronet to be according to her degree, viz. A rim or circle with six pearls, represented by silver balls, upon the same, not raised upon points. That the robe or mantle of a viscountess be like that of a baroness, only the cape powdered with two rows and a half of ermine, the edging of the mantle two inches as before, and the train one and a quarter yards, the coronet to be according to her degree, viz. A rim or circle with pearls, represented by silver balls, thereon, sixteen in number, and not raised upon points. That the robe or mantle of a countess be as before, only the cape powdered with three rows of ermine, the edging three inches in breadth, and the train one and a half yards. The coronet to be composed of eight pearls, represented by silver balls, raised upon points or rays, with small strawberry leaves between, above the rim. That the robe or mantle of a marchioness be as before, only the cape powdered with three rows and a half of ermine, the edging four inches in breadth, the train one and three quarters yards. The coronet to be composed of four strawberry leaves and four pearls, represented by silver balls, raised upon points of the same height as the leaves, alternately, above the rim. 
that the robe or mantle of a duchess be as before, only the cape powdered with four rows of ermine, the edging five inches broad, the train two yards, the coronet to be composed of eight strawberry leaves, all of equal height, above the rim. And that the caps of all the said coronets be of crimson velvet, turned up with ermine, with a tassel of gold on the top. By His Majesty's command. Norfolk, Earl Marshal. The coronation robe of a peer is not identical with his parliamentary robe of estate. This latter is of fine scarlet cloth, lined with taffeta. The distinction between the degrees of rank is effected by the guards or bands of fur. The robe of a duke has four guards of ermine at equal distances, with gold lace above each guard and tied up to the left shoulder by a white ribbon. The robe of a marquis has four guards of ermine on the right side, and three on the left with gold lace above each guard and tied up to the left shoulder by a white ribbon. An earl's robe has three guards of ermine and gold lace. The robes of a viscount and baron are identical, each having two guards of plain white fur. By virtue of various warrants of earls marshal, duly recorded in the College of Arms, the use or display of a coronet of rank by any person other than a peer is stringently forbidden. This rule, unfortunately, is too often ignored by many eldest sons of peers, who use peerage titles by courtesy. The heraldic representations of these coronets of rank are as follows. The coronet of a duke shows five strawberry leaves, figure 648. This coronet should not be confused with the ducal crest coronet. The coronet of a marquis shows two balls of silver technically known as pearls, and three strawberry leaves figure 649. The coronet of an earl shows five pearls raised on tall spikes, alternating with four strawberry leaves, figure 650. The coronet of a viscount shows nine pearls, all set closely together, directly upon the circlet, figure 651. The coronet of a baron shows four pearls upon the circlet, figure 652. This coronet was assigned by royal warrant, dated August 7th, 12 Charles II, to barons of England, and to barons of Ireland by warrant May 16, 5 James II. All coronets of degree actually, and are usually represented to, enclose a cap of crimson velvet, turned up with ermine. None of them are permitted to be jeweled, but the coronet of a duke, marquis, earl, or viscount is chased in the form of jewels. In recent times, however, it has become very usual for peers to use, Heraldically, for more informal purposes a representation of the circlet only, omitting the cap and the ermine edging. Figure 648 Figure 649 Figure 650 Figure 651 Figure 652 The crown or coronet of a king of arms, figure 653, is of silver gilt formed of a circlet, upon which is inscribed part of the first verse of the 51st Psalm, viz., Miserere me Deus Secundum Magna Misericordium Tuum. The rim is surmounted with sixteen leaves, in shape resembling the oak leaf, every alternate one being somewhat higher than the rest, nine of which appear in the profile view of it or in heraldic representations. The cap is of crimson satin, closed at the top by a gold tassel and turned up with ermine. Figure 653. The Crown of a King of Arms. Anciently, the crown of Lion King of Arms was, in shape, an exact replica of the crown of the King of Scotland, the only difference being that it was not jeweled. Coronets of rank are used very indiscriminately on the continent, particularly in France and the Low Countries. Their use by no means implies the same as with us, and frequently indicates little if anything beyond mere, noble, birth. The Mauerkrone, mural crown, Figure 654, is used in Germany principally as an adornment to the arms of towns. It is borne with three, four, or five battlement towers. The tincture, likewise, is not always the same, gold, silver, red, or the natural color of a wall being variously employed. Residential, i.e. Having a royal residence, and capital towns usually bear a mauerkrone with five towers, large towns one with four towers, smaller towns one with three. Strict regulations in the matter do not yet exist. It should be carefully noted that this practice is peculiar to Germany and is quite incorrect in Great Britain. 
Figure 655. Naval Crown. Figure 654. Mauerkrone. The Naval Crown, Schiffskrone, Fig. 655, on the circlet of which sails and sterns of ships are alternately introduced, is very rarely used on the continent. With us it appears as a charge in the arms of the towns of Chatham, Ramsgate, Devonport, and C. The naval coronet, however, is more properly a crest coronet, and as such will be more fully considered in the next chapter. It had, however, a limited use as a coronet of rank at one time, inasmuch as the admirals of the United Provinces of the Netherlands placed a crown composed of prows of ships above their escutcheons, as may be seen from various monuments. Chapter 23 Crest Coronets and Chapeaus The present official rules are that crests must be upon, or must issue from, a wreath, or torse, a coronet, or a chapeau. It is not at the pleasure of the wearer to choose which he will, one or other being specified and included in the terms of the grant. If the crest have a lawful existence, one or other of them will unchangeably belong to the crest, of which it now is considered to be an integral part. In Scotland and Ireland, Lion King of Arms and Ulster King of Arms have always been considered to have, and still retain, the right to grant crests upon a chapeau or issuing from a crest. But the power is, very properly, exceedingly sparingly used. And, except in the cases of arms and crests matriculated in Lion Register as of ancient origin and in use before 1672, or, confirmed, on the strength of user by Ulster King of Arms. The ordinary ducal crest coronet and the chapeau are not now considered proper to be granted in ordinary cases. Since about the beginning of the 19th century the rules which follow have been very definite, and have been very rigidly adhered to in the English College of Arms. Crests issuing from the ordinary, ducal crest coronet, are not now granted under any circumstances. The chapeau is only granted in the case of a grant of arms to a peer, the mural coronet is only granted to officers in the army of the rank of general or above. And the naval coronet is only granted to officers in His Majesty's Royal Navy of the rank of admiral and above. An eastern coronet is now only granted in the case of those of high position in one or other of the imperial services, who have served in India and the East. The granting of crests issuing from the other forms of crest coronets, the crown valari, and the crown palisado, is always discouraged, but no rule exists denying them to applicants. And they are to be obtained if the expectant grantee is sufficiently patient, importunate, and pertinacious. Neither form is, however, particularly ornamental, and both are of modern origin. There is still yet another coronet, the celestial coronet. This is not unusual as a charge, but as a coronet from which a crest issues I know of no instance, nor am I aware of what rules, if any, govern the granting of it. Definite rank coronets have been in times past granted for use as crest coronets, but this practice, the propriety of which cannot be considered as other than highly questionable, has only been pursued, even in the more lax days which are past. On rare and very exceptional occasions, and has long since been definitely abandoned as improper. In considering the question of crest coronets, the presumption that they originated from coronets of rank at once jumps to the mind. This is by no means a foregone conclusion. It is difficult to say what is the earliest instance of the use of a coronet in this country as a coronet of rank. When it is remembered that the coronet of a baron had no existence whatever until it was called into being by a warrant of Charles II. After the restoration, and that differentiated coronets for the several ranks in the peerage are not greatly anterior in date, the question becomes distinctly complicated. From certainly the reign of Edward the Confessor the kings of England had worn crowns, and the great territorial earls. Who it must be remembered occupied a position akin to that of a petty sovereign, far beyond the mere high dignity of a great noble at the present day. From an early period wore crowns or coronets not greatly differing in appearance from the crown of the king. But the peerage as such certainly neither had nor claimed the technical right to a coronet as a mark of their rank, in the 13th and 14th centuries. But coronets of a kind were used, as can be seen from early effigies, long before the use of crests became general. 
but these coronets were merely in the nature of a species of decoration for the helmet, many of them far more closely resembling a jeweled torse than a coronet. Parker in his Glossary of Terms Used in Heraldry probably correctly represents the case when he states, from the reign of Edward III. Coronets of various forms were worn, as it seems indiscriminately, by princes, dukes, earls, and even knights, but apparently rather by way of ornament than distinction, or if for distinction, only, like the collar of SS, as a mark of gentility. The helmet of Edward the Black Prince, upon his effigy at Canterbury, is surrounded with a coronet totally different from that subsequently assigned to his rank. The instance quoted by Parker might be amplified by countless others, but it may here with advantage be pointed out that the great helmet, or, as this probably is, the ceremonial representation of it, suspended above the prince's tomb, fig. 271, has no coronet, and the crest is upon a chapeau. Of the fourteen instances in the Plantagenet garter plates in which the torse appears, twelve were peers of England, one was a foreign count, and one only a commoner. On the other hand, of twenty-nine whose garter plates show crests issuing from coronets, for our foreigners, seven are commoners, and eighteen were peers. The coronets show very great variations in form and design, but such variations appear quite capricious, and to carry no meaning, nor does it seem probable that a coronet of gules or of azure, of which there are ten, could represent a coronet of rank. The garter plate of Sir William de la Pole, Earl of, afterwards Duke of, Suffolk, shows his crest upon a narrow black fillet. Consequently, whatever may be the conclusion as to the wearing of coronets alone, it would seem to be a very certain conclusion that the heraldic crest coronet bore no relation to any coronet of rank or to the right to wear one. Its adoption must have been in the original instance, and probably even in subsequent generations, a matter of pure fancy and inclination. This is borne out by the fact that whilst the garter plate of Sir Henry Borcia, Earl of Essex, shows his crest upon a torse, his effigy represents it issuing from a coronet. Until the reign of Henry VIII. The royal crest, both in the case of the sovereign and all the other members of the royal family, is always represented upon a chapeau or cap of dignity. The great seal of Edward VI. Shows the crest upon a coronet, though the present form of crown and crest were originated by Queen Elizabeth. In depicting the royal arms, it is usual to omit one of the crowns, and this is always done in the official warrants controlling the arms. One crown is placed upon the helmet, and upon this crown is placed the crest, but theoretically the royal achievement has two crowns, inasmuch as one of the crowns is an inseparable part of the crest. Probably the finest representation of the royal crest which has ever been done is the design for one of the smaller bookplates for the Windsor Castle Library. This was executed by Mr. Eve, and it would be impossible to imagine anything finer. Like the rest of the royal achievement, the royal crest is of course not hereditary, and consequently it is assigned by a separate royal warrant to each male member of the royal family. And the opportunity is then taken to substitute for the royal crown, which is a part of the sovereign's crest, a coronet identical with whatever may be assigned in that particular instance as the coronet of rank. In the case of royal bastards the crest has always been assigned upon a chapeau. The only case which comes to one's mind in which the royal crown has, outside the sovereign, been allowed as a crest coronet is the case of the town of I. The royal crown of Scotland is the crest coronet of the sovereign's crest for the kingdom of Scotland. This crest, together with the crest of Ireland, is never assigned to any member of the royal family except the sovereign. The crest of Ireland, which is on a wreath or an azure, is by the way confirmatory evidence that the crowns in the crests of Scotland and England have a duplicate and separate existence apart from the crown denoting the sovereignty of the realm. The ordinary crest coronet or, as it is usually termed in British heraldry, the ducal coronet, Ulster, however, describes it officially as, a ducal crest coronet, is quite a separate matter from a duke's coronet of rank. Whilst the coronet of a duke has upon the rim five strawberry leaves visible when depicted, a ducal coronet has only three. The ducal coronet, figure 656, is the conventional, regularized, development of the crest coronets employed in early times. 
Unfortunately it has in many instances been depicted of a much greater and very unnecessary width, the result being inartistic and allowing unnecessary space between the leaves. And at the same time leaving the crest and coronet with little circumferential relation. It should be noted that it is quite incorrect for the rim of the coronet to be jeweled in color though the outline of jeweling is indicated. Figure 656. Ducal Coronet Though ducal crest coronets are no longer granted, of course they are still exemplified and their use permitted where they have been previously granted, they are a very frequent occurrence in older grants and confirmations. It is quite incorrect to depict a cap, as in a coronet of rank, in a crest coronet, which is never more than the metal circlet, and consequently it is equally incorrect to add the band of ermine below it which will sometimes be seen. The coronet of a duke has in one or two isolated cases been granted as a crest coronet. In such a case it is not described as a duke's coronet, but as a ducal coronet of five leaves. It so occurs in the case of Ormsby Hamilton. The color of the crest coronet must be stated in the blazon. Crest coronets are of all colors, and will be sometimes found bearing charges upon the rim, particularly in the cases of mural and naval coronets. An instance of this will be seen in the case of Sir John W. Moore, and of Mansurg, the label in this latter case being an unalterable charge and not the difference mark of an eldest son. Though the tincture of the coronet ought to appear in the blazon, nevertheless it is always a fair presumption, when it is not specified, that it is of gold, coronets of colors being very much less frequently met with. On this point it is interesting to note that in some of the cases where the crest coronet is figured upon an early garter plate as of color, it is now borne gold by the present descendants of the family. For example on the garter plate of Sir Walter Hungerford, Lord Hungerford, the crest, a garb or, between two silver sickles, issues from a coronet azure. The various Hungerford families now bear it, or, the crest upon the garter plate of Sir Humphrey Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, a demi-swan argent, beaked gules, issues from a coronet gules. This crest as it is now borne by the present Lord Stafford is, out of a ducal coronet per pale gules and sable, and Another instance of colored coronets will be found in the crest of Nicholson, now borne by Shaw. Probably, however, the most curious instance of all will be found in the case of a crest coronet of ermine, of which an example occurs in the Gelra Armorial. A very general misconception, which will be found stated in practically every textbook of armory, is that when a crest issues from a coronet the wreath must be omitted. There is not and never has been any such rule. The rule is rather to the contrary. Instances where both occur are certainly now uncommon, and the presence of a wreath is not in present-day practice considered to be essential if a coronet occurs. But the use or absence of a wreath when the crest issues from a coronet really depends entirely upon the original grant. If no wreath is specified with the coronet, none will be used or needed, but if both are granted both should be used. An instance of the use of both will be found on the garter stall plate of Sir Walter Devereux, Lord Ferrers. The crest, a Talbot's head silver, issues from a coronet or, which is placed upon a torse argent and sable. Another instance will be found in the case of the grant of the crest of Hanbury. A quite recent case was the grant by Sir Bernard Burke, Ulster King of Arms, of a crest to Sir Richard Quain, Bart. The blazon of which was, on a wreath argent and azure, and out of a mural coronet proper a demi-lion rampant or, charged on the shoulder with a trefoil slipped vert, and holding between the paws a battle axe also proper, the blade gold. Other instances are the crests of Hamilton of Sunningdale and Tarleton. Another instance will be found in the grant to Ross of Bladensburg. Possibly this blazon may be a clerical error in the engrossment, because it will be noticed that the wreath does not appear in the emblazonment, plate 2. I wonder how many of the officers of arms are aware of the existence of a warrant, dated in 1682, issued by the Deputy Earl Marshal to the companies of painters, stainers, and coachmakers. Forbidding them to paint crests which issue out of ducal coronets without putting them upon wreaths of their colors. The wording of the warrant very plainly shows that at that date a wreath was always painted below a crest coronet. The warrant, however, is not so worded that it can be accepted as determining the point for the future, or that it would override a subsequent grant of a crest in contrary form. 
but it is evidence of what the law then was. No crest is now granted without either wreath, coronet, or chapeau. An instance of the use of the coronet of a marquis as a crest coronet will be found in the case of the Benting crest. There are some number of instances of the use of an earl's coronet as a crest coronet. Amongst these may be mentioned the crests of Sir Alan Seton Stewart, Bart. Out of an earl's coronet a dexter hand grasping a thistle all proper, that granted to Cassan of Sheffield House, Ireland, issuant from an earl's coronet proper, a boar's head and neck erased or longed gules. James Christopher Fitzgerald Kenny, ESQ. Dublin, out of an earl's coronet or, the pearls argent, a cubit arm erect vested gules, cuffed also argent, the hand grasping a roll of parchment proper, and Davidson, out of an earl's coronet or, a dove rising argent. Holding in the beak a wheatstalk bladed and eared all proper. I know of no crest which issues from the coronet of a viscount. But a baron's coronet occurs in the case of Forbes of Pitsligo and the cadets of that branch of the family, issuing out of a baron's coronet a dexter hand holding a scimitar all proper. Foreign coronets of rank have sometimes been granted as crest coronets in this country, as in the cases of the crests of Sir Francis George Manningham Boilo, Bart. Norfolk, in a nest or, a pelican in her piety proper, charged on the breast with a salter cooped gules, the nest resting in a foreign coronet, Henry Chamier, ESQ. Dublin, out of a French noble coronet proper, a cubit arm in bend vested azure, charged with five fleurs de lis in salter or, cuffed ermine, holding in the hand a scroll, and thereon an open book proper, garnished gold. John Francis Charles Fane de Salas, Count of the Holy Roman Empire, 1. Out of a marquee coronet or, a demi-woman proper, crowned or, hair flowing down the back, winged in place of arms and from the armpits azure, 2. Out of a ducal coronet or, an eagle displayed sable, ducally crowned also or, 3. Out of a ducal coronet a demi-lion rampant double-cued and crowned with a light coronet all or, brandishing a sword proper, hilt and pommel of the first, the lion caught east by two tilting spears of the same. From each a banner poly of six argent and gules, fringed also or, and Mahoney, Ireland, out of the coronet of a count of France a dexter arm in armor embowed grasping in the hand a sword all proper, hilt and pommel or. The blade piercing a fleur de lis of the last. A curious crest coronet will be found with the Sackville crest. This is composed of fleurs de lis only, the blazon of the crest being, out of a coronet composed of eight fleurs de lis or, and a stoil of eight points argent. A curious use of coronets in a crest will be found in the crest of Sir Archibald Dunbar, Bart. A dexter hand upon me reaching at an astral crown proper, and Sir Alexander James Dunbar, Bart. A dexter hand upon me proper reaching to two earls coronets tied together. Figure 657. Mural coronet. Next after the ordinary, ducal coronet, the one most usually employed is the mural coronet, figure 657, which is composed of masonry. Though it may be and often is of an ordinary heraldic tincture, it will usually be found proper. An exception occurs in the case of the crest of every halstead, out of a mural coronet checky or an azure, a demi-eagle ermine beaked or. Care should be taken to distinguish the mural crown from the battlements of a tower. This originated as a modern fakement and is often granted to those who have been using a mural coronet and desire to continue within its halo, but are not qualified to obtain in their own persons a grant of it. It should be noticed that the battlements of a tower must always be represented upon a wreath. Its facility for adding a noticeable distinction to a crest has, however, in these days, when it is becoming somewhat difficult to introduce differences in a stock pattern kind of crest. Led to its very frequent use in grants during the last hundred years. Care should also be taken to distinguish between the battlements of a tower and a crest issuing from a castle, as in the case of Harley, a tower, as in that of Boyce. And upon the capital of a column, as in the crests of Cooper Essex and Pease. Abroad, e.g. in the arms of Paris, it is very usual to place a mural crown over the shield of a town, and some remarks upon the point will be found on page. This at first sight may seem an appropriate practice to pursue, and several heraldic artists have followed it and advocated in this country. 
but the correctness of such a practice is, for British purposes, strongly and emphatically denied officially, and whilst we reserve this privilege for grants to certain army officers of high rank. It does not seem proper that it should be available for casual and haphazard assumption by a town or city. That being the case, it should be borne in mind that the practice is not permissible in British armory. The naval coronet, figure 658, though but seldom granted now, was very popular at one time. In the latter part of the 18th and the early part of the 19th centuries, naval actions were constantly being fought, and in a large number of cases where the action of the officer in command was worthy of high praise and reward. Part of such reward was usually an augmentation of arms. Very frequently it is found at the crest of augmentation issued from a naval coronet. This is, as will be seen, a curious figure composed of the sail and stern of a ship repeated and alternating on the rim of a circlet. Sometimes it is entirely gold, but usually the sails are argent. An instance of such a grant of augmentation will be found in the crest of augmentation for Brisbane and in a crest of augmentation granted to Sir Philip Bowes Broke to commemorate his glorious victory in the Shannon over the American ship Chesapeake. Figure 658. Naval Crown. Figure 659. Eastern Crown. Any future naval grant of a crest of augmentation would probably mean that it would be granted issuing out of a naval coronet, but otherwise the privilege is now confined to those grants of arms in which the patentee is of the rank of admiral. Instances of its use will be found in the crests of Schomburg and Farquhar, and in the crest of Dakins of Derbyshire, out of a naval coronet or a dexter arm embowed proper, holding in the hand a battle axe argent round the wrist a ribbon azure. The crest of Dakins is chiefly memorable for the curious motto which accompanies it, strike, Dakins, the devils in the hemp, of which no one knows the explanation. Why a naval crown was recently granted as a badge to a family named Vickers, Plate 8. I am still wondering. The crest of Lord Esti. Vincent, out of a naval coronet or, encircled by a wreath of oak proper, a demi-pegasus argent, maned and hoofed of the first, winged azure, charged on the wing with a fleur-de-lis gold, is worthy of notice owing to the encircling of the coronet. And in some number of cases the circlet of the coronet has been made use of to carry the name of a captured ship or of a naval engagement. The eastern coronet, figure 659, is a plain rim heightened with spikes. Formerly it was granted without restriction, but now, as has been already stated, it is reserved for those of high rank who have served in India or the East. An instance occurs, for example, in the crest of Rawlinson, Bart. Sable, three swords in pale proper, pommels and hilts or, two erect, points upwards, between them one, point downwards, on a chief embattled of the third and antique crown duels. Crest, out of an eastern crown or, a cubit arm erect in armor, the hand grasping a sword in bend sinister, and the wrist encircled by a laurel wreath proper. Figure 660. Crown Valari. Figure 661. Palisado Crown. Of identically the same shape is what is known as the antique coronet. It has no particular meaning, and though no objection is made to granting it in Scotland and Ireland, it is not granted in England. Instances in which it occurs under such a description will be found in the cases of Lanigan O'Keefe and Matheson. The Crown Valari or Valari Coronet, Figure 660, and the Palisado Coronet, Fig. 661, were undoubtedly originally the same, but now the two forms in which it has been depicted are considered to be different coronets. Each has the rim, but the Valari Coronet is now heightened only by pieces of the shape of Ver, whilst the Palisado Coronet is formed by high palisados affixed to the rim. These two are the only forms of coronet granted to ordinary and undistinguished applicants in England. The circlet from the crown of a king of arms has once at least been granted as a crest coronet, this being in the case of Rogers Harrison. In a recent grant of arms to G, the crest has no wreath, but issues from a circlet or charged with a fleur de lis gules. The circlet is emblazoned as a plain gold band. The chapeau. Some number of crests will be found to have been granted to be borne upon a chapeau in lieu of wreath or coronet. Other names for the chapeau, 
under which it is equally well known, are the cap of maintenance or cap of dignity. There can be very little doubt that the heraldic chapeau combines two distinct origins or earlier prototypes. The one is the real cap of dignity, and the other is the hat or cape lot which covered the top of the helm before the mantling was introduced, but from which the lambrequin developed. The curious evolution of the chapeau from the cape lot, which is so marked and usual in Germany, is the tall conical hat, often surmounted by a tuft or larger plume of feathers. And usually employed in German heraldry as an opportunity for the repetition of the livery colors, or a part of, and often the whole design of, the arms. But it should at the same time be noticed that this tall, conical hat is much more closely allied to the real cap of maintenance than our present crest, chapeau. Exactly what purpose the real cap of maintenance served, or of what it was a symbol, remains to a certain extent a matter of mystery. The cap of maintenance, a part of the regalia borne before the sovereign at the state opening of parliament, but not at a coronation, by the marquises of Winchester, the hereditary bearers of the cap of maintenance, bears, in its shape. No relation to the heraldic chapeau. The only similarity is its crimson color and its lining of ermine. It is a tall, conical cap and is carried on a short staff. Figure 662. Dot, the crown of King Charles II. Whilst crest coronets in early days appear to have had little or no relation to titular rank, there is no doubt whatever that caps of dignity had. Long before, a coronet was assigned to the rank of baron in the reign of Charles II. All barons had their caps of dignity, of scarlet lined with white fur, and in the old pedigrees a scarlet cap with a gold tuft or tassel on top and a lining of fur will be found painted above the arms of a baron. This fact, the fact that until after Stuart days the chapeau does not appear to have been allowed or granted to others than peers, the fact that it is now reserved for the crests granted to peers. The fact that the velvet cap is a later addition both to the sovereign's crown and to the coronet of a peer, and finally the fact that the cap of maintenance is borne before the sovereign only in the precincts of parliament, would seem to indubitably indicate that the cap of maintenance was inseparably connected with the lordship and overlordship of parliament vested in peers and in the sovereign. In the crumpled and tasseled top of the velvet cap, and in the ermine border visible below the rim, the high conical form of the cap of maintenance proper can be still traced in the cap of a peer's coronet. And that the velvet cap contained in the crown of the sovereign and in the coronet of a peer is the survival of the old cap of dignity there can be no doubt. This is perhaps even more apparent in figure 662, which shows the crown of King Charles II, than in the representations of the royal crown which we are more accustomed to see. The present form of a peer's coronet is undoubtedly the conjoining of two separate emblems of his rank. The cap of maintenance or dignity, however, as represented above the arms of a baron, as above referred to, was not of this high, conical shape. It was much flatter. The high, conical, original shape is, however, preserved in many of the early heraldic representations of the chapeau, as will be noticed from an examination of the ancient garter plates or from a reference to Fig. 271, which shows the helmet with its chapeau-borne crest of Edward the Black Prince. Figure 663. The Chapeau. Of the chapeaus upon which crests are represented in the early garter plates the following facts may be observed. They are twenty in number of the eighty-six plates reproduced in Mr. St. John Hope's book. It should be noticed that until the end of the reign of Henry VIII, the royal crest of the sovereign was always depicted upon a chapeau gules, lined with ermine. Of the twenty instances in which the chapeau appears, no less than twelve are representations of the royal crest, borne by closely allied relatives of the sovereign, so that we have only eight examples from which to draw deductions. But of the twenty it should be pointed out that nineteen are peers, and the only remaining instance, Sir John Gray, K.G. Is that of the eldest son and heir apparent of a peer, both shield and crest being in this case boldly marked with the label of an eldest son. Consequently it is a safe deduction that whatever may have been the regulations and customs concerning the use of coronets, there can be no doubt that down to the end of the 15th century the use of a chapeau marked a crest as that of a peer. Of the eight non-royal examples one has been repainted, 
and is valueless as a contemporary record. Of the remaining seven, four are of the conventional gules and ermine. One only has not the ermine lining, that being the crest of Lord Fanhope. It is plainly the royal crest, differenced, he being of royal but illegitimate descent, and probably the argent in lieu of ermine lining is one of the intentional marks of distinction. The chapeau of Lord Beaumont is azure, semetalise, lined ermine, and that of the Earl of Douglas is azure lined ermine, this being in each case in conformity with the mantling. Whilst the Beaumont family still use this curiously colored chapeau with their crest, the Douglas crest is now borne, by the Duke of Hamilton, upon one of ordinary tinctures. Chapeaus, other than of gules lined ermine, are but rarely met with, and unless specifically blazoned to the contrary a cap of maintenance is always presumed to be gules and ermine. About the Stuart period the granting of crests upon chapeaus to others than peers became far from unusual, and the practice appears to have been frequently adopted prior to the beginning of the 19th century. Some of these crest chapeaus, however, were not of gules. An instance of this kind will be found in the grant in 1667 to Sir Thomas Davies, then one of the sheriffs of the City of London, but afterwards, in 1677, Lord Mayor. The crest granted was, on a chapeau sable, turned up or, a demi-lion rampant of the last. The reason for the grant at that date of such a simple crest and the even more astonishingly simple coat of arms, or, a chevron between three mullets pierced sable, has always been a mystery to me. The arms of Lord Legan, granted or confirmed 1840, afford another instance of a chapeau of unusual color, his crest being, upon a chapeau azure turned up ermine, a greyhound statant gules, collared or. There are some number of cases in which peers whose ancestors originally bore their crests upon a wreath have subsequently placed them upon a chapeau. The Stanleys, Earls of Derby, are a case in point, as are also the Marquises of Exeter. The latter case is curious, because although they have for long enough so depicted their crest, they only comparatively recently, within the last few years, obtained the necessary authorization by the Crown. At the present time the official form of the chapeau is as in figure 663, with the turn-up split at the back into two tails. No such form can be found in any early representation, and most heraldic artists have now reverted to an earlier type. Before leaving the subject of the cap of maintenance, reference should be made to another instance of a curious heraldic headgear often, but quite incorrectly, styled a cap of maintenance. This is the fur cap invariably used over the shields of the cities of London, Dublin, and Norwich. There is no English official authority whatever for such an addition to the arms, but there does appear to be some little official recognition of it in Ulster's office in the case of the city of Dublin. The late Ulster King of Arms, however, informed me that he would, in the case of Dublin, have no hesitation whatever in certifying the right of the city arms to be so displayed, Plate 7. In the utter absence of anything in the nature of a precedent, it is quite unlikely that the practice will be sanctioned in England. The hat used is a flat-topped, brown fur hat of the shape depicted with the arms of the city of Dublin. It is merely, in London, a part of the official uniform or livery of the city sword-bearer. It does not even appear to have been a part of the costume of the Lord Mayor, and it must always remain a mystery why it was ever adopted for heraldic use. But then the chain of the Lord Mayor of London is generally called a collar of SS. Besides this the City of London uses a peer's helmet, a bogus modern crest, and even more modern bogus supporters, so a few other eccentricities need not in that particular instance cause surprise. Chapter 24 The Mantling or Lambrequin the mantling is the ornamental design which in a representation of an armorial achievement depends from the helmet, falling away on either side of the escutcheon. Many authorities have considered it to have been no more than a fantastic series of flourishes. Devised by artistic minds for the purpose of assisting ornamentation and affording an artistic opportunity of filling up unoccupied spaces in a heraldic design. There is no doubt that its readily apparent advantages in that character have greatly led to the importance now attached to the mantling in heraldic art. But equally is it certain that its real origin is to be traced elsewhere. 
The development of the heraldry of today was in the East during the period of the Crusades, and the burning heat of the eastern sun upon the metal helmet led to the introduction and adoption of a textile covering, which would act in some way as a barrier between the two. It was simply in fact and effect a primeval prototype of the puggery of Margate and Hindustan. It is plain from all early representations that originally it was short, simply hanging from the apex of the helmet to the level of the shoulders, overlapping the textile tunic or coat of arms, but probably enveloping a greater part of the helmet, neck, and shoulders than we are at present, judging from pictorial representations, inclined to believe. Adopted first as a protection against the heat, and perhaps also the rust which would follow damp, the lambrequin soon made evident another of its advantages. An advantage to which we doubtless owe its perpetuation outside eastern warfare in the more temperate climates of northern Europe and England. Textile fabrics are peculiarly and remarkably deadening to a sword cut, to which fact must be added the facility with which such a weapon would become entangled in the hanging folds of cloth. The hacking and hewing of battle would show itself plainly upon the lambrequin of one accustomed to a prominent position in the forefront of a fight. And the honorable record implied by a ragged and slashed lambrequin accounts for the fact that we find at an early period after their introduction into heraldic art that mantlings are depicted cut and torn to ribbons. This opportunity was quickly seized by the heraldic artist, who has always, from those very earliest times of absolute armorial freedom down to the point of greatest and most regularized control, been allowed an entire and absolute discretion in the design to be adopted for the mantling. Hence it is that we find so much importance is given to it by heraldic artists, for it is in the design of the mantling, and almost entirely in that opportunity, that the personal character and abilities of the artist have their greatest scope. Some authorities have, however, derived the mantling from the robe of a state, and there certainly has been a period in British armory when most lambrequins found in heraldic art are represented by an unmutilated cloth. Suspended from and displayed behind the armorial bearings and tied at the upper corners. In all probability the robes of a state of the higher nobility, no less than the then existing and peremptorily enforced sumptuary laws, may have led to the desire and to the attempt. At a period when the actual lambrequin was fast disappearing from general knowledge, to display arms upon something which should represent either the parliamentary robes of a state of a peer, or the garments of rich fabric which the sumptuary laws forbade to those of humble degree. To this period undoubtedly belongs the term mantling, which is so much more frequently employed than the word lambrequin, which is really, from the armorial point of view, the older term. The heraldic mantling was, of course, originally the representation of the actual, cape line, or textile covering worn upon the helmet, but many early heraldic representations are of mantlings which are of skin, fur, or feathers. Being in such cases invariably a continuation of the crest drawn out and represented as the lambrequin. When the crest was a part of the human figure, the habit in which that figure was arrayed is almost invariably found to have been so employed. The garter plate of Sir Ralph Bassett, one of the founder knights, shows the crest as a black boar's head, the skin being continued as the sable mantling. Some Sclavonic families have mantlings of fur only, that of the Hungarian family of Korinsky is a bare skin, and countless other instances can be found of the use by German families of a continuation of the crest for a mantling. This practice affords instances of many curious mantlings, this in one case in the Zurich Wappenroll being the scaly skin of a salmon. The mane of the lion, the crest of Mertz, and the hair and beard of the crests of bone and landshaden, are similarly continued to do duty for the mantling. This practice has never found great favor in England, the cases amongst the early garter plates where it has been followed standing almost alone. In a manuscript, M. 3. 67b, of the reign of Henry VII. Now in the College of Arms, probably dating from about 1506, an instance of this character can be found, however. It is a representation of the crest of Storton, Fig. 664, as it was born at that date, and was a black Benedictine demi-monk proper holding erect in his dexter hand a scourge. Here the proper black Benedictine habit, it has of later years been corrupted into the russet habit of a friar, is continued to form the mantling. Plate 7. 
Figure 664. The Crest of Storton. By what rules the colors of the Madlings were decided in early times it is impossible to say. No rules have been handed down to us, the old heraldic books are silent on the point, and it seems equally hopeless to attempt to deduce any from ancient armorial examples. The one fact that can be stated with certainty is that the rules of early days, if there were any, are not the rules presently observed. Some hold that the colors of the mantling were decided by the colors of the actual livery in use as distinct from the livery colors of the arms. It is difficult to check this rule, because our knowledge of the liveries in use in early days is so meager and limited. But in the few instances of which we now have knowledge we look in vain for a repetition of the colors worn by the retainers as liveries in the mantlings used. The fact that the livery colors are represented in the background of some of the early garter plates, and that in such instances in no single case do they agree with the colors of the mantling, must certainly dissipate once and for all any such supposition as far as it relates to that period. A careful study and analysis of early heraldic emblazonment, however, reveals one point as a dominating characteristic. That is, that where the crest, by its nature, lent itself to a continuation into the mantling it generally was so continued. This practice, which was almost universal upon the continent, and is particularly to be met with in German heraldry, though seldom adopted in England, certainly had some weight in English heraldry. In the recently published reproductions of the Plantagenet Garter Plate's 87 armorial achievements are included. Of these, in ten instances the mantlings are plainly continuations of the crests, being, feathered, or in unison. Fifteen of the mantlings have both the outside and the inside of the principal color and of the principal metal of the arms they accompany, though in a few cases, contrary to the present practice, the metal is outside. The lining being of the color. Nineteen more of the mantlings are of the principal color of the arms, the majority, eighteen, of these being lined with ermine. No less than forty-nine are of some color lined with ermine, but thirty-four of these are of gules lined ermine. And in the large majority of cases in these thirty-four instances neither the gules nor the ermine are in conformity with the principal color and metal, what we now term the livery colors, of the arms. In some cases the colors of the mantling agree with the colors of the crest, a rule which will usually be found to hold good in German heraldry. The constant occurrence of gules and ermine incline one much to believe that the colors of the mantling were not decided by haphazard fancy. But that there was some law, possibly in some way connected with the sumptuary laws of the period, which governed the matter, or, at any rate, which greatly limited the range of selection. Of the eighty-seven mantlings, excluding those which are gules lined ermine, there are four only the colors of which apparently bear no relation whatever to the colors of the arms or the crests appearing upon the same stall plate. In some number of the plates the colors certainly are taken from a quartering other than the first one. And in one at least of the four exceptions the mantling, one of the most curious examples, is plainly derived from a quartering inherited by the knight in question though not shown upon the stall plate. Probably a closer examination of the remaining three instances would reveal a similar reason in each case. That any law concerning the colors of their mantlings was enforced upon those concerned would be an unwarrantable deduction not justified by the instances under examination. But one is clearly justified in drawing from these cases some deductions as to the practice pursued. It is evident that unless one was authorized by the rule or reason governing the matter, whatever such rule or reason may have been, in using a mantling of gules and ermine. The dominating color, not as a rule the metal, of the coat of arms, or of one of the quarterings, or sometimes of the crest if the tinctures of arms and crest were not in unison, decided the color of the mantling. That there was some meaning behind the mantlings of gules lined with ermine there can be little doubt, for it is noticeable that in a case in which the colors of the arms themselves are gules and ermine, the mantling is of gules and argent. As by the way in this particular case is the chapeau upon which the crest is placed. But probably the reason which governed these mantlings of gules lined with ermine, as also the ermine linings of other mantlings, must be sought outside the strict limits of armory. That the colors of mantlings are repeated in different generations, and in the plates of members of the same family, clearly demonstrates that selection was not haphazard. 
certain of these early garter plates exhibit interesting curiosities in the mantlings. 1. Sir William Latimer, Lord Latimer, K.G., circa 1361-1381. Arms, gules across pat once or. Crest, a plume of feather sable, the tips or. Mantling gules with silver vertical stripes, lined with ermine. 2. Sir Bermond Arnaud de Presac, Soudan de la Tran, K.G., 1380 post 1384. Arms, or, a lion rampant double cued gules. Crest, a Midas head argent. Mantling sable, lined gules, the latter veined or. 3. Sir Simon Felbrig, K.G., 1397 to 1442. Arms, or, a lion rampant gules. Crest, out of a coronet gules, a plume of feathers ermine. Mantling ermine, lined gules, evidently a continuation of the crest. 4. Sir Reginald Cobham, Lord Cobham, K.G., 1352-1361. Arms, gules, on a chevron or, three estoyal sable. Crest, a soldan's head sable, the brow encircled by a torse or. Mantling sable, evidently a continuation of the crest, lined gules. 5. Sir Edward Churlton, Lord Churlton of Powys, K.G., 1406 to 7 to 1420 to 1. Arms, or, a lion rampant gules. Crest, on a wreath gules and sable, two lion's gams also gules, each adorned on the exterior side with three demi fleurs de lis issuing argent, the centers thereof or. Mantling, on the dexter side, sable, on the sinister side, gules. Both lined ermine. 6. Sir Hertong von Klux, K.G., 1421-1445 or 6. Arms, Argent, a vine branch cooped at either end in Ben Sable. Crest, out of a coronet or, a plume of feathers Sable and Argent. Mantling, on the dexter side, Azure. On the sinister, Gules, both lined ermine. 7. Sir Miles Stapleton, K.G., Founder Knight, Died 1364. Arms, Argent, a lion rampant sable. Crest, a soldan's head sable, around the temples a torse azure, tied in a knot, the ends flowing. Mantling sable, probably a continuation of the crest, lined gules. 8. Sir Walter Hungerford, Lord Hungerford and Heightsbury, K.G., 1421-1449. Arms, sable, two bars argent and in chief three plates. Crest, out of a coronet azure a garb or, enclosed by two sickles argent. Mantling, within and without dexter, berry of six ermine and gules, sinister, berry of six gules and ermine. The reason of this is plain. The mother of Lord Hungerford was a daughter and co-heir of Hussey. The arms of Hussey are variously given, berry of six ermine and gules, or, ermine, three bars gules. 9. Sir Humphrey Stafford, Earl of Stafford, 1429-1460. Arms, or, a chevron gules. Crest, out of a coronet gules, a swan's head and neck proper, beaked gules, between two wings also proper. Mantling, the dexter side, sable, the sinister side, gules, both lined ermine. Black and gules, it may be noted, were the livery colors of Buckingham, an earldom which had devolved upon the earls of Stafford. 10. Sir John Gray of Rithin, K.G., 1436-1439. Arms, quarterly, 1 and 4, berry of 6 argent and azure, in chief 3 tortos, 2 and 3, quarterly I and I I I, or, a manch gules, 2. And 3, berry of 8 argent and azure, an oral of 10 martlets gules. Over all a label of three points argent. Crest, on a chapeau gules, turned up ermine, a wyvern or, gorged with a label argent. Mantling or, lined ermine. 11. Sir Richard Neville, Earl of Salisbury, K.G., 1436-1460. Arms, quarterly, one and four, quarterly I and I I I, argent, three lozenges conjoined in fescules, two. 
and three, or, an eagle displayed vert, two and three, gules, a salter argent, a label of three points compony argent in azure. Crest, on a coronet, a griffin segent, with wings displayed or. Mantling, dexter side, gules, the sinister, sable, both lined ermine. Twelve, Sir Gaston de Foy, Count de Longueville, and K. K. G., 1438-1458. Arms, quarterly, one and four, or, three pallets gules, two and three, or, two cows passant in pale gules, over all a label of three points, each point or, on a cross sable, five escallops argent. Crest, on a wreath or and gules, a blackamoor's bust with ass's ear sable, vested poly or and gules, all between two wings, each of the arms as in the first quarter. Mantling poly of or and gules, lined vert. 13. Sir Walter Blunt, Lord Mountjoy, K.G., 1472-1474. Arms, quarterly, one, argent, two wolves passant in pale sable, on a boyer also argent eight salters cooped gules, for Ayala, two, or, a tower. Gules, for Mountjoy, three. Berry nebulae or and sable, for blunt, for, ver argent and gules, for gressly. Crest, out of a coronet two ibex horns or. Mantling sable, lined on the dexter side with argent, and on the sinister with or. 14. Frederick, Duke of Urbino. Mantling or, lined ermine. In continental heraldry it is by no means uncommon to find the device of the arms repeated either wholly or in part upon the mantling. In reference to this the tournament rules, of René, Duke of Anjou, throw some light on the point. These it may be of interest to quote. Vu two princes, seigneurs, barons, chuliers, e escuiers, ca a as intention de ternoyer, vu estis tinus vu rendre e s hebridges le quartrim jour duen le jour du tournoi. Pour faire de vos blasons finesters, sur pain de non ester recius audit tournoi. Les arms serant celis si. Le timber doit ester sur vin piece de queer bully, le kel doit ester bien faltry dvn doit diaspes, o u plus, par le de don, e doit continuer la dite piece de queer tout le summit du holm. E sera queert la dite piece du lambrican armoi de arms de celui ca le portera, e sur le dit lambrican o plus o du summit, sera assis le dit timber, e otter dis lui ora vn tortil de coulas k vudra le tournoir. Item, e quan tu les home serant ainsi mis et ordinez pour les departer, vindrin touts dames et damoiselles et tout seigneurs, chuliers, et escuiers, en les visitant dvn bout a autre, la present les jukes. Commenerant trois ou cotter tours les dames pour bien voir et visitor les timbers, e y ora vu herout ou pursuivant, cadira aux dames silen el android o el serant, le nom de so a cassant les timbers. A fin k sal en a ka eight de dames medit, e els touchant sun timber, chu i el soit lo lendemain pour recommand. Menetrie, l'origin de armoiries, pages 79 to 81. Whilst one can call to mind no instance of importance of ancient date where this practice has been followed in this country, there are one or two instances in the garter plates which approximate closely to it. The mantling of John, Lord Beaumont, is azure, semetalis as the field of his arms, lined ermine. Those of Sir John Borcia, Lord Berners, and of Sir Henry Borcia, Earl of Essex, are of gules, billet or, evidently derived from the quartering for Louvain upon the arms, this quartering being, gules, billet and a fess or. According to a M.S. of Vincent, in the College of Arms, the Warrens used a mantling checky of azure and or with their arms. A somewhat similar result is obtained by the mantling, gules, semav lozenges or, upon the small plate of Sir Sanchet d'Abrechecourt. The mantling of Sir Louis Robesart, Lord Borcia, is, azure, Byzanti, lined argent. The azure mantling on the garter plate of Henry V, as Prince of Wales, is, semav the French golden fleurs de lys. The Daubeny mantling is, semav mullets. On the brass of Sir John Wilcote, at two, the lambricans are checky. On the seals of Sir John Bussey, in 1391 and 1407, 
the mantlings are berry, the coat being argent, three bars sable. There are a few cases amongst the garter plates in which badges are plainly and unmistakably depicted upon the mantlings. Thus, on the lining of the mantling on the plate of Sir Henry Borsia, elected 1452, will be found water bouges, which are repeated on a fillet round the head of the crest. The stall plate of Sir John Borsia, Lord Berners, above referred to, elected 1459, is lined with silver on the dexter side, semin in the upper part with water bouges, and in the lower part with Borsia knots. On the opposite side of the mantling the knots are in the upper part, and the water bouges below. That these badges upon the mantling are not haphazard artistic decoration is proved by a reference to the monumental effigy of the Earl of Essex, in Little Easton Church, Essex. The differing shapes of the helmet, and of the coronet and the mantling, and the different representation of the crest, show that, although depicted in his garter robes, upon his effigy the helmet, crest, and mantling upon which the Earl's head there rests, and the representations of the same upon the garter plate, are not slavish copies of the same original model. Nevertheless upon the effigy, as on the garter plate, we find the outside of the mantling, semi of billets, and the inside, semi of water bouges. Another instance amongst the garter plates will be found in the case of Viscount Lovell, whose mantling is strewn with gold padlocks. Nearly all the mantlings on the garter stall plates are more or less heavily veined with gold, and many are heavily diapered and decorated with floral devices. So prominent is some of this floral diapering that one is inclined to think that in a few cases it may possibly be a diapering with floral badges. In other cases it is equally evidently no more than a mere accessory of design, though between these two classes of diapering it would be by no means easy to draw a line of distinction. The veining and heightening of a mantling with gold is at the present day nearly always to be seen in elaborate heraldic painting. From the garter plates of the 14th century it has been shown that the colors of a large proportion of the mantlings approximated in early days to the colors of the arms. The popularity of gules, however, was then fast encroaching upon the frequency of appearance which other colors should have enjoyed. And in the 16th century, in grants and other paintings of arms, the use of a mantling of gules had become practically universal. In most cases the mantling of gules, doubled argent, forms an integral part of the terms of the grant itself, as sometimes do the gold tassels, which are so frequently found terminating the mantlings of that and an earlier period. This custom continued through the Stuart period, and though dropped officially in England during the 18th century, when the mantling reverted to the livery colors of the arms, and became in this form a matter of course and so understood. Not being expressed in the wording of the patent, it continued in force in Lyon office in Scotland until the year 1890, when the present Lyon King of Arms, Sir James Balfour Paul, altered the practice, and, as had earlier been done in England, ordered that all future Scottish mantlings should be depicted in the livery colours of the arms, but in Scotland the mantlings, though now following the livery colours, are still included in the terms of the grant, and thereby stereotyped. In England, in an official exemplification at the present day of an ancient coat of arms, e.g. In an exemplification following the assumption of name and arms by royal license, the mantling is painted in the livery colours, irrespective of any ancient patent in which gules and argent may have been granted as the colour of the mantling. Though probably most people will agree as to the expediency of such a practice, it is at any rate open to criticism on the score of propriety, unless the new mantling is expressed in terms in the new patent. This would of course amount to a grant overriding the earlier one, and would do all that was necessary, but failing this, there appears to be a distinct hiatus in the continuity of authority. Berman linings to the mantling were soon denied to the undistinguished commoner, and with the exception of the early garter plates, it would be difficult to point to an instance of their use. The mantlings of peers, however, continued to be lined with ermine, and English instances under official sanction can be found in the visitation books and in the garter plates until a comparatively recent period. In fact the relegation of peers to the ordinary livery colours for their mantlings is, in England, quite a modern practice. In Scotland, however, the mantlings of peers have always been lined with ermine, and the present lion continues this whilst usually making the colours of the outside of the mantlings agree with the principal colour of the arms. 
This, as regards the outer color of the mantling, is not a fixed or stereotyped rule, and in some cases Lyon has preferred to adopt a mantling of gules lined with ermine as more conformable to a peer's parliamentary robe of estate. In the Deputy Earl Marshal's warrant referred to on page are some interesting points as to the mantling. It is recited that, some persons under ye degree of ye nobility of this real me do cause ermines to be depicted upon ye linings of those mantles which are used with their arms. And also that there are some that have lately caused the mantles of their arms to be painted like ostrich feathers as though, they were of some peculiar and superior degree of honor, and the warrant commands that these points are to be rectified. The royal mantling is of cloth of gold. In the case of the Sovereign and the Prince of Wales it is lined with ermine, and for other members of the royal family it is lined with argent. Queen Elizabeth was the first Sovereign to adopt the golden mantling, the royal tinctures before that date, for the mantling, being gules lined ermine. The mantling of or an ermine has, of course, since that date been rigidly denied to all outside the royal family. Two instances, however, occur amongst the early garter plates, viz. Sir John Grey de Ruthen and Frederick, Duke of Urbino. It is sometimes stated that a mantling of or an ermine is a sign of sovereignty, but the mantling of our own sovereign is really the only case in which it is presently so used. In Sweden, as in Scotland, the colors of the mantling are specified in the patent, and, unlike our own, are often curiously varied. The present rules for the color of a mantling are as follows in England and Ireland. 1. That with ancient arms of which the grant specified the color, where this has not been altered by a subsequent exemplification, the colors must be as stated in the grant, i.e. usually gules, lined argent. 2. That the mantling of the Sovereign and Prince of Wales is of cloth of gold, lined with ermine. 3. That the mantling of other members of the royal family is of cloth of gold lined with argent. 4. That the mantlings of all other people shall be of the livery colours. The rules in Scotland are now as follows. 1. That in the cases of peers whose arms were matriculated before 1890 the mantling is of gules lined with ermine, the Scottish term for lined is doubled. 2. That the mantlings of all other arms matriculated before 1890 shall be of gules and argent. 3. That the mantlings of peers whose arms have been matriculated since 1890 shall be either of the principal color of the arms, lined with ermine, or of gules lined ermine, conformably to the parliamentary robe of a state of a peer, as may happen to have been matriculated. 4. That the mantlings of all other persons whose arms have been matriculated since 1890 shall be of the livery colors, unless other colors are, as is occasionally the case, specified in the patent of matriculation. Whether in Scotland a person is entitled to assume of his own motion an ermine lining to his mantling upon his elevation to the peerage. Without a rematriculation in cases where the arms and mantling have been otherwise matriculated at an earlier date, or whether in England any peer may still line his mantling with ermine, are points on which one hesitates to express an opinion. When the mantling is of the livery colors the following rules must be observed. The outside must be of some color and the lining of some metal. The color must be the principal color of the arms, i.e. the color of the field if it be of color, or if it is of metal, then the color of the principal ordinary or charge upon the shield. The metal will be as the field, if the field is of metal, or if not, it will be as the metal of the principal ordinary or charge. In other words, it should be the same tinctures as the wreath. If the field is party of color and metal, i.e. per pale berry, quarterly, and k, then that color and that metal are the livery colors. If the field is party of two colors the principal color, i.e. the one first mentioned in the blazon, is taken as the color and the other is ignored. The mantling is not made party to agree with the field in British heraldry, as would be the case in Germany. If the field is of a fur, then the dominant metal or color of the fur is taken as one component part of the livery colors, the other metal or color required being taken from the next most important tincture of the field. For example, ermine, a fescules, has a mantling of gules and argent, whilst, or, a chevron ermines, would need a mantling of sable and or. The mantling for, azure, 
a lion rampant ermines would be azure and ore. But in a coat showing fur, metal, and color, sometimes the fur is ignored. A field of ver has a mantling argent and azure, but if the charge be ver the field will supply the one, i.e. either color or metal, whilst the ver supplies whichever is lacking. Except in the cases of Scotsmen who are peers and of the Sovereign and Prince of Wales, no fur is ever used nowadays in Great Britain for a mantling. In cases where the principal charge is proper, a certain discretion must be used. Usually the heraldic color to which the charge approximates is used. For example, Argent, issuing from a mount in base a tree proper, and k, would have a mantling vert and argent. The arms, or, three Cornish chuffs proper, or, argent, three negroes heads cooped proper, would have mantlings respectively sable and or and sable and argent. Occasionally one comes across a coat which supplies an impossible mantling, or which does not supply one at all. Such a coat would be, per ben sinister ermine and erminois, a lion rampant counterchanged. Here there is no color at all, so the mantling would be gules and argent. Argent, three stags trip pant proper, would have a mantling gules and argent. A coat of arms with a landscape field would also probably be supplied, in default of a chief, e. g, supplying other colors and tinctures, with a mantling gules and argent. It is quite permissible to vein a mantling with gold lines, this being always done in official paintings. In English official heraldry, where, no matter how great the number of crests, one helmet only is painted, it naturally follows that one mantling only can be depicted. This is always taken from the livery colors of the chief, i.e. the first, quartering or subquartering. In Scottish patents at the present day in which a helmet is painted for each crest the mantlings frequently vary, being in each case in accordance with the livery colors of the quartering to which the crest belongs. Consequently this must be accepted as the rule in cases where more than one helmet is shown. In considering the fashionings of mantlings it must be remembered that styles and fashions much overlap, and there has always been the tendency in armory to repeat earlier styles. Whilst one willingly concedes the immense gain in beauty by the present reversion in heraldic art to older and better, and certainly more artistic types. There is distinctly another side to the question which is strangely overlooked by those who would have the present-day heraldic art slavishly copied in all minutiae of detail. And even, according to some, in all the crudity of draftsmanship from examples of the earliest periods. Hitherto each period of heraldic art has had its own peculiar style and type, each within limits readily recognizable. Whether that style and type can be considered when judged by the canons of art to be good or bad, there can be no doubt that each style in its turn has approximated to, and has been in keeping with. The concurrent decorative art outside and beyond heraldry, though it has always exhibited a tendency to rather lag behind. When all has been said and done that can be, Heraldry, in spite of its symbolism and its many other meanings, remains but a form of decorative art. And therefore it is natural that it should be influenced by other artistic ideas and other manifestations of art and accepted forms of design current at the period to which it belongs. For, from the artistic point of view, the part played in art by heraldry is so limited in extent compared with the part occupied by other forms of decoration. That one would naturally expect heraldry to show the influence of outside decorative art to a greater extent than decorative art as a whole would be likely to show the influence of heraldry. In our present revulsion of mind in favor of older heraldic types, we are apt to speak of good or bad heraldic art. But art itself cannot so be divided, for after all allowances have been made for crude workmanship. And when bad or imperfect examples have been eliminated from consideration, and given always necessarily the essential basis of the relation of line to curve and such technical details of art, who on earth is to judge, or who is competent to say. Whether any particular style of art is good or bad. No one from preference executes speculative art which he knows whilst executing it to be bad. Most manifestations of art, and peculiarly of decorative art, are commercial matters executed with the frank idea of subsequent sale, and consequently with the subconscious idea, true though but seldom acknowledged, of pleasing that public which will have to buy. 
Consequently the ultimate appeal is to the taste of the public, for art, if it be not the desire to give pleasure by the representation of beauty, is nothing. Beauty, of course, must not necessarily be confounded with prettiness. It may be beauty of character. The result is, therefore, that the decorative art of any period is an indication of that which gives pleasure at the moment, and an absolute reflex of the artistic wishes, desires, and tastes of the cultivated classes to whom executive art must appeal. At every period it has been found that this taste is constantly changing, and as a consequence the examples of decorative art of any period are a reflex only of the artistic ideas current at the time the work was done. At all periods, therefore, even during the early Victorian period, which we are now taught and believe to be the most ghastly period through which English art has passed, the art in vogue has been what the public have admired, and have been ready to pay for, and most emphatically what they have been taught and brought up to consider good art. In early Victorian days there was no lack of educated people, and because they liked the particular form of decoration associated with their period, who is justified in saying that. Because that peculiar style of decoration is not acceptable now to ourselves, their art was bad, and worse than our own. If throughout the ages there had been one dominating style of decoration equally accepted at all periods and by all authorities as the highest type of decorative art, then we should have some standard to judge by. Such is not the case, and we have no such standard, and any attempt to arbitrarily create and control ideas between given parallel lines of arbitrary thought, when the ideas are constantly changing, is impossible and undesirable. Who dreams of questioning the art of Benvenuto Cellini, or of describing his craftsmanship as other than one of the most vivid examples of his period, and yet what had it in keeping with the art of the Louis XVI? Period, or the later art of William Morris and his followers? Widely divergent as are these types, they are nevertheless all accepted as the highest expressions of three separate types of decorative art. Anyone attempting to compare them, or to rank these schools of artistic thought in order of superiority, would simply be laying themselves open to ridicule unspeakable. For they would be ranked by the highest authorities of different periods in different orders, and it is as impossible to create a permanent standard of art as it is impossible to ensure a permanence of any particular public taste. The fact that taste changes, and as a consequence that artistic styles and types vary, is simply due to the everlasting desire on the part of the public for some new thing, and their equally permanent appreciation of novelty of idea or sensation. That masterminds have arisen to teach, and that they have taught with some success their own particular brand of art to the public, would seem rather to argue against the foregoing ideas were it not that. When the mastermind and the dominating influence are gone, the public, desiring as always change and novelty, are ready to fly to any new teacher and master who can again afford them artistic pleasure. The influence of William Morris in household decoration is possibly the most far-reaching modern example of the influence of a single man upon the art of his period. But mastermind as was his, and master craftsman as he was, it has needed but a few years since his death to start the undoing of much that he taught. After the movement initiated by Morris and carried further by the Arts and Crafts Society, which made for simplicity in structural design as well as in the decoration of furniture. We have now fallen back upon the flowery patterns of the early Victorian period, and there is hardly a drawing room in fashionable London where the chairs and settees are not covered with early Victorian chintzes. Artistic authorities may shout themselves hoarse, but the fashion having been set in Mayfair will be inevitably followed in suburbia. And we are doubtless again at the beginning of the cycle of that curious manifestation of domestic decorative art which was current in the early part of the 19th century. It is, therefore, evident that it is futile to describe varying types of art of varying periods as good or bad, or to differentiate between them, unless some such permanent basis of comparison or standard of excellence be conceded. The differing types must be accepted as no more than the expression of the artistic period to which they belong. That being so, one cannot help thinking that the abuse which has been heaped of late, by unthinking votaries of Plantagenet and Tudor heraldry, upon heraldic art in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries has very greatly overstepped the true proportion of the matter. Much that has been said is true, but what has been said too often lacks proportion. 
There is consequently much to be said in favor of allowing each period to create its own style and type of heraldic design, in conformity with the ideas concerning decorative art which are current outside heraldic thought. This is precisely what is not happening at the present time, even with all our boasted revival of armory and armorial art. The tendency at the present time is to slavishly copy examples of other periods. There is another point which is usually overlooked by the most blatant followers of this school of thought. What are the ancient models which remain to us? The early roles of arms of which we hear so much are not, and were never intended to be, examples of artistic execution. They are merely memoranda of fact. It is absurd to suppose that an actual shield was painted with the crudity to be met with in the rolls of arms. It is equally absurd to accept as unimpeachable models, garter plates, seals, or architectural examples unless the purpose and medium, wax, enamel, or stone, in which they are executed is borne in mind, and the knowledge used with due discrimination. Mr. Eve, without slavishly copying, originally appears to have modeled his work upon the admirable designs and ideas of the little masters of German art in the 16th and 17th centuries. He has since progressed therefrom to a distinctive and very excellent style of his own. Mr. Graham Johnson models his work upon Plantagenet and Tudor examples. The work of Pere Anselm, and of Pugin, the first start towards the present ideas of heraldic art, embodying as it did so much of the beauty of the older work whilst possessing a character of its own. And developing ancient ideals by increased beauty of execution, has placed their reputation far above that of others, who, following in their footsteps, have not possessed their abilities. But with regard to most of the heraldic design of the present day as a whole it is very evident that we are simply picking and choosing titbits from the work of bygone craftsmen, and copying, more or less slavishly, examples of other periods. This makes for no advance in design either, in its character or execution, nor will it result in any peculiarity of style which it will be possible in the future to identify with the present period. Our heraldry, like our architecture, though it may be dated in the twentieth century, will be a heterogeneous collection of isolated specimens of Gothic, Tudor, or Queen in style and type which surely is as anachronistic as we consider to be those Dutch paintings which represent Christ and the Apostles in modern clothes. Roughly the periods into which the types of mantlings can be divided, when considered from the standpoint of their fashioning, are somewhat as follows. There is the earliest period of all, when the mantling depicted approximated closely if it was not an actual representation of the capilote really worn in battle. Examples of this will be found in the Armorial de Gelra and the Zurich Wappenroll. As the mantling worn lengthened and evolved itself into the lambrequin, the mantling depicted in heraldic art was similarly increased in size, terminating in the long mantle drawn in profile but tasseled and with the scalloped edges. A type which is found surviving in some of the early garter plates. This is the transition stage. The next definite period is when we find the mantling depicted on both sides of the helmet and the scalloped edges developed, in accordance with the romantic ideas of the period. Into the slashes and cuts of the bold and artistic mantlings of Plantagenet armorial art. Slowly decreasing in strength, but at the same time increasing in elaboration, this mantling and type continued until it had reached its highest pitch of exuberant elaboration in Stuart and early Georgian times. Side by side with this over-elaboration came the revulsion to a Puritan simplicity of taste which is to be found in other manifestations of art at the same time, and which made itself evident in heraldic decoration by the use as mantling of the plain uncut cloth suspended behind the shield. Originating in Elizabethan days, this plain cloth was much made use of, but towards the end of the Stuart period came that curious evolution of British heraldry which is peculiar to these countries alone. That is the entire omission of both helmet and mantling. How it originated it is difficult to understand, unless it be due to the fact that a large number, in fact a large proportion, of English families possessed a shield only and neither claimed nor used a crest. And that consequently a large number of heraldic representations give the shield only. It is rare indeed to find a shield surmounted by helmet and mantling when the former is not required to support a crest. At the same time we find, among the official records of the period, that the documents of chief importance were the visitation books. 
In these, probably from motives of economy or to save needless draftsmanship, the trouble of depicting the helmet and mantling was dispensed with, and the crest is almost universally found depicted on the wreath, which is made to rest upon the shield, the helmet being omitted. That being an accepted official way of representing an achievement, small wonder that the public followed. And we find as a consequence that a large proportion of the bookplates during the 17th and 18th centuries had no helmet or mantling at all, the elaboration of the edges of the shield. Together with the addition of decorative and needless accessories bearing no relation to the arms, fulfilling all purposes of decorative design. It should also be remembered that from towards the close of the Stuart period onward, England was taking her art and decoration almost entirely from continental sources, chiefly French and Italian. In both the countries the use of crests was very limited indeed in extent, and the elimination of the helmet and mantling, and the elaboration in their stead of the edges of the shield. We probably owe to the effort to assimilate French and Italian forms of decoration to English arms. So obsolete had become the use of helmet and mantling that it is difficult to come across examples that one can put forward as mantlings typical of the period. Helmets and mantlings were of course painted upon grants and upon the stall plates of the knights of the various orders, but whilst the helmets became weak, of a pattern impossible to wear, and small in size. The mantling became of a stereotyped pattern, and of a design poor and wooden according to our present ideas. Figure 665. Carriage Panel of Georgiana, Marchioness of Chumley. Unofficial heraldry had sunk to an even lower style of art, and the regulation heraldic stationer's types of shield, mantling, and helmet are awe-inspiring in their ugliness. The term mantle is sometimes employed, but it would seem hardly quite correctly. To the parliamentary robe of estate upon which the arms of a peer of the realm were so frequently depicted at the end of the 18th and in the early part of the 19th centuries. Its popularity is an indication of the ever-constant predilection for something which is denied to others and the possession of which is a matter of privilege. Woodward, in his Treatise on Heraldry, treats of and dismisses the matter in one short sentence, in England the suggestion that the arms of peers should be mantled with their parliament robes was never generally adopted. In this statement he is quite incorrect, for as the accepted type in one particular opportunity of armorial display its use was absolutely universal. The opportunity in question was the emblazonment of arms upon carriage panels. In the early part of the 19th and at the end of the 18th centuries armorial bearings were painted of some size upon carriages, and there were few such paintings executed for the carriages, chariots, and state coaches of peers that did not appear upon a background of the robe of a state. With the modern craze for ostentatious unostentation, the result, there can be little doubt, in this respect of the wholesale appropriation of arms by those without a right to bear these ornaments. The decoration of a peer's carriage nowadays seldom shows more than a simple coronet, or a coronet crest, initial, or monogram. But the state chariots of those who still possess them almost all, without exception, show the arms emblazoned upon the robe of a state. The royal and many other state chariots made or refurbished for the recent coronation ceremonies show that, when an opportunity of the fullest display properly arises, the robe of a state is not yet a thing of the past. Fig. 665 is from a photograph of a carriage panel, and shows the arms of a former Marchioness of Chumley displayed in this manner. Incidentally it also shows a practice frequently resorted to, but quite unauthorized, of taking one supporter from the husband's shield and the other, when the wife was an heiress, from the arms of her family. The arms are those of Georgiana Charlotte, widow of George James, first Marquess of Chumley, and younger daughter and co-heir of Peregrine, third Duke of Ancaster. She became a widow in 1827 and died in 1838, so the panel must have been painted between those dates. The arms shown are, quarterly, one and four, gules, in chief two esquires' helmets proper, and in base a garb or, for Chumley, two. Gules, a chevron between three eagles' heads erased argent, three. Or, on a fess between two chevron sable, three cross crosslets or, for walpole, and on an escutcheon of pretense the arms of birdie, namely, argent, three battering rams fesswise in pale proper, headed and garnished azure. 
The supporters shown are, Dexter, a griffin sable, armed, winged, and membered or, from the Chumley achievement. Sinister, a friar vested in russet with staff and rosary or, one of the supporters belonging to the barony of Willoughby de Resby. To which the Marchioness of Chumley in her own right was a co-heir until the abeyance in the barony was determined in favour of her elder sister. In later times the arms of sovereigns, the German electors, and Kdot, were mantled, usually with crimson velvet fringed with gold, lined with ermine, and crowned. But the mantling armoy was one of the marks of dignity used by the Pères de France, and by cardinals resident in France, it was also employed by some great nobles in other countries. The mantling of the princes and dukes of Mirandola was Cechi Argent and Azure, lined with ermine. In France the mantling of the chancellor was of cloth of gold, that of presidents, of scarlet, lined with alternate strips of ermine and petit gris. In France, Napoleon I, who used a mantling of purple samet of golden bees, decreed that the princes and grand dignitaries should use an azure mantling thus samet, those of dukes were to be plain, and lined with ver instead of ermine. In 1817 a mantling of azure, fringed with gold and lined with ermine, was appropriated to the dignity of Père de France. The pavilion is a feature of heraldic art which is quite unknown to British heraldry, and one can call to mind no single instance of its use in this country, but as its use is very prominent in Germany and other countries, it cannot be overlooked. It is confined to the arms of sovereigns, and the pavilion is the tent-like erection within which the heraldic achievement is displayed. The pavilion seems to have originated in France, where it can be traced back upon the great seals of the kings to its earliest form and appearance upon the seal of Louis XI. In the case of the kings of France, it was of azure semetalis or. The pavilion used with the arms of the German emperor is of gold semet alternately of imperial crowns and eagles displayed sable, and is lined with ermine. The motto is carried on a crimson band, and it is surmounted by the imperial crown, and a banner of the German colors gules, argent, and sable. The pavilion used by the German emperor as king of Prussia is of crimson, semi of black eagles and gold crowns, and the band which carries the motto is blue. The pavilions of the king of Bavaria and the duke of Baden, the king of Saxony, the duke of Hesse, the duke of Mecklenburg-Schwerin, the duke of Saxe-Weimar-Eisenach, the duke of Saxe-Meiningen-Heilberghausen, the duke of Saxe-Altenburg, and the duke of Anhalt are all of crimson. In German heraldry a rather more noticeable distinction is drawn than with ourselves between the lambrequin, helmdeck, and the mantle, helmantle. This more closely approximates to the robe of a state, though the helmantle has not in Germany the rigid significance of peerage degree that the robe of a state has in this country. The German helmantle with few exceptions is always of purple lined with ermine, and whilst the mantle always falls directly from the coronet or cap, the pavilion is arranged in a dome-like form which bears the crown upon its summit. The pavilion is supposed to be the invention of the Frenchman Philip Moreau, 1680, and found its way from France to Germany, where both in the greater and lesser courts it was enthusiastically adopted. Great Britain, Austria-Hungary, Spain, Portugal, and Württemberg are the only royal arms in which the pavilion does not figure. Chapter 25 The Torse, or Wreath The actual helmet, from the very earliest heraldic representations which have come down to us, would sometimes appear not to have had any mantling. The crest being affixed direct to the, then, flat top of the helmet in use. But occasional crests appear very early in the existence of, ordered, armory, and at much about the same time we find the textile covering of the helmet coming into heraldic use. In the earliest times we find that frequently the crest itself was continued into the mantling. But where this was not possible, the attaching of the crest to the helmet when the mantling intervened left an unsightly joining. The unsightliness very soon called forth a remedy. At first this remedy took the form of a coronet or a plain fillet or ribbon round the point of juncture, sometimes with and sometimes without the ends being visible. If the ends were shown they were represented as floating behind, sometimes with and sometimes without a representation of the bow or knot in which they were tied. The plain fillet still continued to be used long after the torse had come into recognized use. The consideration of crest coronets has been already included, 
but with regard to the wreath and analysis of the Plantagenet garter plates will afford some definite basis from which to start deduction. Of the 86 achievements reproduced in Mr. St. John Hope's book, five have no crest. Consequently we have 81 examples to analyze. Of these there are 10 in which the crest is not attached to the lambrequin and helmet by anything perceptible, 8 are attached with fillets of varying widths, 21 crests are upon chapeaus, and 29 issue from coronets. But at no period governed by the series is it possible that either fillet, torse, chapeau, or coronet was in use to the exclusion of another form. This remark applies more particularly to the filleting torse, the latter of which undoubtedly at a later date superseded the former, for both at the beginning and at the end of the series referred to we find the fillet and the wreath or torse. And at both periods we find crests without either coronet, torse, chapeau, or fillet. The fillet must soon afterwards, in the 15th century, have completely fallen into desuetude. The torse was so small and unimportant a matter that upon seals it would probably equally escape the attention of the engraver and the observer. And probably there would be little to be gained by a systematic hunt through early seals to discover the date of its introduction, but it will be noticed that no wreaths appear in some of the early rolls. General Lee says, in the time of Henry V, and long after, no man had his badge set on a wreath under the degree of a knight. But that order is worn away. It probably belongs to the end of the 14th century. There can be little doubt that its twisted shape was an evolution from the plain fillet suggested by the turban of the East. We read in the old romances, in Mallory's, Mort d'Arthur, and elsewhere, of valiant knights who in battle or tournament wore the favor of some lady, or even the lady's sleeve, upon their helmets. It always used to be a puzzle to me how the sleeve could have been worn upon the helmet, and I wonder how many of the present day novelists, who so glibly make their knightly heroes of olden time wear the favors of their lady lovers. Know how it was done. The favor did not take the place of the crest. A knight did not lightly discard an honored, inherited, and known crest for the sake of wearing a favor only too frequently the mere result of a temporary flirtation. Nor to wear her colors could he at short notice discard or renew his lambrequin, surcoat, or the housings and trappings of his horse. He simply took the favor, the colors, a ribbon, or a handkerchief of the lady, as the case might be, and twisted it in and out or over and over the fillet which surrounded the joining place of crest and helmet. To put her favor on his helmet was the work of a moment. The wearing of a lady's sleeve, which must have been an honor greatly prized, is of course the origin of the well-known Manche, the solitary charge in the arms of Conyers, Hastings, and Wharton. Doubtless the sleeve twined with the fillet would be made to encircle the base of the crest, and it is not unlikely that the wide-hanging mouth of the sleeve might have been used for the lambrequin. The dresses of ladies at that period were decorated with the arms of their families, so in each case would be of the colors of the lady, so that the sleeve and its colors would be quickly identified. As it was no doubt usually intended they should be. The accidental result of twining a favor in the fillet, in conjunction with the pattern obviously suggested by the turban of the East, produced the conventional torse or wreath. As the conventional slashings of the lambrequin hinted at past hard fighting in battle, so did the conventional torse hint at past service to in favor of ladies, love and war being the occupations of the perfect knight of romance. How far short of the ideal knight of romance the knight of fact fell, perhaps the frequent borgers and batons of heraldry are the best indication. At first, as is evident from the garter plates, the colors of the tours seem to have had little or no compulsory relation to the livery colors of the arms. The instances to be gleaned from the Plantagenet garter plates which have been reproduced are as follows. Sir John Borsia, Lord Borsia. Tours, Sable and Vert. Arms, Argent and Gules. Sir John Grey, Earl of Tankerville. Tours, Vert, Gules, and Argent. Arms, Gules and Argent. Sir Louis Robsett, Lord Borsia. Tours, Azure, Or, and Sable. Arms, Vert and Or. The crest, derived from his wife, who was a daughter of Lord Borsia, is practically the same as the one first quoted. It will be noticed that the torse differs. 
Sir Edward Churlatan, Lord Churlatan of Poes. Torse, Gules and Sable. Arms, Or and Gules. Sir Gaston de Foy, Count de Longueville. Torse, Or and Gules. Arms, Or and Gules. Sir William Neville, Lord Falkenberg. Torse, Argent and Gules. Arms, Gules and Argent. Sir Richard Whitville, Lord Rivers. Torse, Vert. Arms, Argent and Gules. Sir Henry Borcia, Earl of Essex. Torse, Sable and Vert. Arms, Argent and Gules. This is the same crest above alluded to. Sir Thomas Stanley, Lord Stanley. Torse, Or and Azure. Arms, Or and Azure. Sir John Borcia, Lord Berners. Torse, Gules and Argent. Arms, Argent and Gules. This is the same crest above alluded to. Sir Walter Devereux, Lord Ferrers. Torse, Argent and Sable. Arms, Argent and Gules. The crest really issues from a coronet upon a torse in a previous case, this crest issues from a torse only. Sir Francis Lovell, Viscount Lovell. Torse, Azure and Or. Arms, Or and Gules. Sir Thomas Berg, Lord Berg. Torse, Azure and Sable. Arms, Azure and Ermine. Sir Richard Tunstall, KG Torse, Argent and Sable. Arms, Sable and Argent. I can suggest no explanation of these differences unless it be, which is not unlikely, that they perpetuate favors worn. Or perhaps a more likely supposition is that the wreath or torse was of the family colors, as these were actually worn by the servants or retainers of each person. If this be not the case, why are the colors of the wreath termed the livery colors? At the present time in an English or Irish grant of arms the colors are not specified, but the crest is stated to be on a wreath of the colors. In Scotland, however, the crest is granted in the following words, and upon a wreath of his liveries is set for crest. Consequently, I have very little doubt, the true state of the case is that originally the wreath was depicted of the colors of the livery which was worn. Then new families came into prominence and eminence, and had no liveries to inherit. They were granted arms and chose the tinctures of their arms as their colors, and used these colors for their personal liveries. The natural consequence would be in such a case that the torse, being in unison with the livery, was also in unison with the arms. The consequence is that it has become a fixed, unalterable rule in British heraldry that the torse shall be of the principal metal and of the principal color of the arms. I know of no recent exception to this rule, the latest, as far as I am aware, being a grant in the early years of the 18th century. This, it is stated in the patent, was the reg ranting of a coat of foreign origin. Doubtless the formality of a grant was substituted for the usual registration in this case, owing to a lack of formal proof of a right to the arms, but there is no doubt that the peculiarities of the foreign arms, as they had been previously born, were preserved in the grant. The peculiarity in this case consisted of a torse of three tinctures. The late Lion clerk once pointed out to me, in Lion Register, an instance of a coat there matriculated with a torse of three colors, but I unfortunately made no note of it at the time. Woodward alludes to the curious checky wreath on the seals of Robert Stuart, Duke of Albany, in 1389. This appears to have been repeated in the seals of his son Murdoch. The wreath of Patrick Hepburn appears to be of roses in the Jelra Armorial, and a careful examination of the plates in this volume will show many curious continental instances of substitutes for the conventional torse. Though by no means peculiar to British heraldry, there can be no manner of doubt that the wreath in the United Kingdom has obtained a position of legalized necessity and constant usage and importance which exists in no other country. As has been already explained, the torse should fit closely to the crest, its object and purpose being merely to hide the joining of crest and helmet. Unfortunately in British heraldry this purpose has been ignored. Doubtless resulting first from the common practice of depicting a crest upon a wreath and without a helmet, and secondly from the fact that many English crests are quite unsuitable to place on a helmet. 
in fact impossible to affix by the aid of a wreath to a helmet, and thirdly from our ridiculous rules of position for a helmet. Which result in the crest being depicted, in conjunction with the representation of the helmet, in a position many such crests never could have occupied on any helmet, the effect has been to cause the wreath to lose its real form. Which encircled the helmet, and to become considered as no more than a straight support for and relating only to the crest. When, therefore, the crest and its supporting basis is transferred from indefinite space to the helmet, the support, which is the torse, is still represented as a flat resting place for the crest. And it is consequently depicted as a straight and rigid bar, balanced upon the apex of the helmet. This is now and for long has been the only accepted official way of depicting a wreath in England. Certainly this is an ungraceful and inartistic rendering, and a rendering far removed from any actual helmet wreath that can ever have been actually born. Whilst one has no wish to defend the rigid bar, which has nothing to recommend it, it is at the same time worth while to point out that the heraldic day of actual helmets and actual usage is long since over, never to be revived. And that our heraldry of today is merely decorative and pictorial. The rigid bar is none other than a conventionalized form of the actual torse, and is perhaps little more at variance with the reality than is our conventionalized method of depicting a lambrequin. Whilst this conventional torse remains the official pattern, it is hopeless to attempt to banish such a method of representation, but Lion King of Arms, happily, will have none of it in his official register or on his patents. And few heraldic artists of any repute now care to so design or represent it. As always officially painted it must consist of six links alternately of metal and color, the livery colors, of the arms, of which the metal must be the first to be shown to the dexter side. The torse is now supposed to be and represented as a skein of colored silk intertwined with a gold or silver cord. Chapter 26 Supporters In this country a somewhat fictitious importance has become attached to supporters, owing to their almost exclusive reservation to the highest rank. The rules which hold at the moment will be recited presently, but there can be no doubt that originally they were in this country little more than mere decorative and artistic appendages. Being devised and altered from time to time by different artists according as the artistic necessities of the moment demanded. The subject of the origin of supporters has been very ably dealt with in A Treatise on Heraldry by Woodward and Burnett. And with all due acknowledgement I take from that work the subjoined extract. Supporters are figures of living creatures placed at the side or sides of an armorial shield, and appearing to support it. French writers make a distinction giving the name of supports to animals, real or imaginary, thus employed, while human figures or angels similarly used are called tenants. Trees, and other inanimate objects which are sometimes used, are called sushans. Ménétrier and other old writers trace the origin of supporters to the usages of the tournaments, where the shields of the combatants were exposed for inspection. And guarded by their servants or pages disguised in fanciful attire, Say the tournoi chewest venu ct usage pars k les chevaliers y fizoyant porter lures lances, e lures ecus, par de pages, et de valets de pied, de guises en ours, en lions. En mores, et en sauvages, usage de armoires, p. 119. The old romances give us evidence that this custom prevailed, but I think only after the use of supporters had already arisen from another source. There is really little doubt now that Anstis was quite correct when, in his Aspologia, he attributed the origin of supporters to the invention of the engraver, who filled up the spaces at the top and sides of the triangular shield upon a circular seal with foliage, or with fanciful animals. Any good collection of medieval seals will strengthen this conviction. For instance, the two volumes of Lang's Scottish seals afford numerous examples in which the shields used in the 13th and 14th centuries were placed between two creatures resembling lizards or dragons. See the seal of Alexander de Baliol, 1295. Lang, 2. 74. The seal of John, Duke of Normandy, eldest son of the King of France, before 1316 bears his arms, France ancient, a boyard gules, between two lions rampant away from the shield, and an eagle with expanded wings standing above it. The Secretum of Isabel de Flandres, circa 1308, 
has her shield placed between three lions, each charged with a bend, Vri, General Comflan, plates XLI, XLIV, 92. In 1332 Amon of Savoy places his arms, Savoy, with a label, between a winged lion in chief and a lion without wings at either side. Later, on the seal of Amadeus VI, a lion's head between wings became the crest of Savoy. In 1332 Amadeus bears Savoy on a lozenge between in chief two eagles, in base two lions. Sibrario, Numbers 61, 64, in Gichinon, Tomai, Number 130. In Scotland the shield of Reginald Crawford in 1292 is placed between two dogs, and surmounted by a fox, in the same year the poly shield of Reginald, Earl of Athol, appears between two lions in chief and as many griffins in flanks. Lang, I. 210, 761. The seal of Humbert II, Dauphin de Viennois in 1349, is an excellent example of the fashion. The shield of Dauphiny is in the center of a caterfoil. Two savages mounted on griffins support its flanks. On the upper edge an armed knight sits on a couchant lion, and the space in base is filled by a human face between two wingless dragons. The spaces are sometimes filled with the evangelistic symbols, as on the seal of Yolant de Flandres, Countess of Bar, circa 1340. The seal of Jean, Dame de Plasnes, in 1376 bears her arms and bunyera caterfoil supported by two kneeling angels, a demi-angel in chief, and a lion couchant guardant in base. Corporate and other seals afford countless examples of the interstices in the design being filled with the figures similar to those from which in later days the supporters of a family have been deduced. But I am myself convinced that the argument can be carried further. Fanciful ornamentation or meaningless devices may have first been made use of by seal engravers, but it is very soon found that the badge is in regular use for this purpose, and we find both animate and inanimate badges employed. Then where this is possible the badge, if animate, is made to support the helmet and crest, and, later on, the shield. And there can be no doubt the badge was in fact acting as a supporter long before the science of armory recognized that existence of supporters. Before passing to supporters proper, it may be well to briefly allude to various figures which are to be found in a position analogous to that of supporters. The single human figure entire, or in the form of a demi-figure appearing above the shield, is very frequently to be met with, but the addition of such figures was and remains purely artistic. And I know of no single instance in British armory where one figure, animate or inanimate, has ever existed alone in the character of a single supporter, and as an integral part of the heritable armorial achievement. Of course I accept those figures upon which the arms of certain families are properly displayed. These will be presently alluded to, but though they are certainly exterior ornaments, I do not think they can be properly classed as supporters unless to this term is given some elasticity. Or unless the term has some qualifying remarks of reservation added to it. There are, however, many instances of armorial ensigns depicted, and presumably correctly, in the form of banners supported by a single animal, but it will always be found that the single animal is but one of the pair of duly allocated supporters. Many instances of arms depicted in this manner will be found in Prince Arthur's book. The same method of display was adopted in some number of cases, and with some measure of success, in Foster's Peerage. Single figures are very frequently to be met with in German and Continental heraldry, but on these occasions, as with ourselves, the position they occupy is merely that of an artistic accessory, and bears no inseparable relation to the heraldic achievement. The single exception to the foregoing statement of which I am aware is to be found in the arms of the Swiss cantons. These thirteen coats are sometimes quartered upon one shield, but when displayed separately each is accompanied by a single supporter. Zurich, Lucerne, Uri, Unterwalden, Glarus, and Ball all bear the supporter on the dexter side. Bern, Schweig, Zug, Freiburg, and Solothurn on the sinister. Schaffhausen, Ram, and Appenzell, a bear, place their supporters in full aspect behind the shield. On the corbels of Gothic architecture, shields of arms are frequently supported by angels, which, however, cannot generally be regarded as heraldic appendages, 
being merely supposed to indicate that the owners have contributed to the erection of the fabric. Examples of this practice will be found on various ecclesiastical edifices in Scotland, and among others at Melrose Abbey, St. Giles, Edinburgh, and the Church of Seton in East Lothian. An interesting instance of an angel supporting a shield occurs on the beautiful seal of Mary of Geldres, Queen of James II. 1459, and the privy seal of David II. A hundred years earlier, exhibits a pretty design of an escutcheon charged with the ensigns of Scotland, and borne by two arms issuing from clouds above, indicative of divine support. Of instances of single objects from which shields are found depending or supported that treatise on heraldry states. Allusion has been made to the usage by which on vesica-shaped shields ladies of high rank are represented as supporting with either hand shields of arms. From this probably arose the use of a single supporter. Marguerite de Corcellus in 1284, and Alex de Verdun in 1311, bear in one hand a shield of the husband's arms, in the other one of their own. The curious seal of Muriel, Countess of Strathern, in 1284, may be considered akin to these. In it the shield is supported partly by a falcon, and partly by a human arm issuing from the sinister side of the vesica, and holding the falcon by the jesses, Lang, I, 764. The Early Seal of Bolslas III King of Poland, in 1255, bears a knight holding a shield charged with the Polish eagle, Vosburg, die Siegel de Mittelalters. In 1283 the seal of Florent of Hainaut bears a warrior in chain mail supporting a shield charged with a lion impaling an eagle demidiated. On the seal of Humphrey de Bohun in 1322 the guide is held by a swan, the badge of the Earls of Hereford. And in 1356 the shield of the first Earl of Douglas is supported by a lion whose head is covered by the crested helm, a fashion of which there are many examples. A helmed lion holds the shield of Magnus I, Duke of Brunswick, in 1326. On the seal of Jean, Duc de Berry, in 1393 the supporter is a helmed swan, compare the armorial slab of Henry of Lancaster, in Boutel, plate LXXAX. Jean IV, Comte d'Alençon, 1408, has a helmed lion siegeant as supporter. In 1359 a signet of Louis van Mael, Count of Flanders, bears a lion siegeant, helmed and crested, and mantled with the arms of Flanders between two small escutcheons of Nevers, or the county of Burgundy, Azure, Belletti, a lion rampant or. And Red Hell, Gules, two heads of rakes fesswise in pale or. A single lion siegeant, helmed and crested, bearing on its breast the quartered arms of Burgundy between two or three other escutcheons, was used by the dukes up to the death of Charles the Bold in 1475. In Lita's splendid work, Famigli Celebri Italiane, the Buonarotti arms are supported by a brown dog siegeant, helmed, and crested with a pair of dragon's wings issuing from a crest coronet. On the seal of Thomas Holland, Earl of Kent, in 1380 the shield is buckled round the neck of the white hind lodged, the badge of his half-brother, Richard II. Single supporters were very much in favor in the 13th and 14th centuries, and the examples are numerous. Charles, Dauphin de Viennois, circa 1355, has his shield held by a single dolphin. In 1294 the seal of the Dauphin Jean, son of Humberdi, bears the arms of Dauphiné pendant from the neck of a griffin. The shields of arms of Bertrand de Brickbeck, in 1325, Pierre de Tournebu, in 1339, of Charles, Count of Alassa, in 1356. And of Oliver de Clisson in 1397, are supported by a warrior who stands behind the shield. In England the seal of Henry Percy, 1st Earl, in 1346, and another in 1345, have similar representations. On several of our more ancient seals only one supporter is represented, and probably the earliest example of this arrangement occurs on the curious seal of William, 1st Earl of Douglas, c. 1356, where the shield is supported from behind by a lion, siegeant, with his head in the helmet, which is surmounted by the crest. On the seal of Archibald, 4th Earl of Douglas, c. 1418, the shield is held, along with a club, in the right hand of a savage erect, who bears a helmet in his left. 
while on that of William, 8th Earl, 1446, a kneeling savage holds a club in his right hand, and supports a coosh shield on his left arm. Figure 666. Arms of Sigmund Hegelshamer. An example reproduced from Jostamon's Wappen Und Stambach, published at Frankfurt, 1589, will be found in figure 666. In this the figure partakes more of the character of a shield guardian than a shield supporter. The arms are those of Sigmund Hegelshamer, otherwise Helt, living at Nuremberg. The arms are Sable, on a bend argent, an arrow gules. The crest is the head and neck of a hound sable, continued into a mantling sable, lined argent. The crest is charged with a pale argent, and thereupon an arrow as in the arms, the arrowhead piercing the ear of the hound. Seated figures as supporters are rare, but one occurs in figure 667, which shows the arms of the Valen family. They bear, argent, on a fess sable, three peas argent. The wings which form the crest are charged with the same device. This curious charge of the three letters is explained in the following saying. Piper peppered pecunium. Pecunia peppered pompam. Pompa peppered pauperium. Pauperis peppered pietatum. There are, however, certain exceptions to the British rule that there can be no single supporters, if the objects upon which shields of arms are displayed are accepted as supporters. It was always customary to display the arms of the Lord High Admiral on the sail of the ship. In the person of King William IV. Before he succeeded to the throne, the office of Lord High Admiral was vested for a short time, but it had really fallen into desuetude at an earlier date and has not been revived again, so that to all intents and purposes it is now extinct. And this recognized method of depicting arms is consequently also extinct. But there is one other case which forms a unique instance which can be classified with no others. The arms of Campbell of Cranish are always represented in a curious manner, the gyrony coat of Campbell appearing on a shield displayed in front of a lymphid, plate 2. What the origin of this practice is it would be difficult to say. Probably it merely originated in the imaginative ideas of an artist when making a seal for that family, artistic reasons suggesting the display of the gyrony arms of Campbell in front of the lymphid of Lorne. The family, however, seem to have universally adopted this method of using their arms, and in the year 1875, when Campbell of Inverneal matriculated in Lyon Register, the arms were matriculated in that form. I know of no other instance of any such coat of arms, and this branch of the ducal house of Campbell possesses armorial bearings which, from the official standpoint, are absolutely unique from one end of Europe to the other. In Germany the use of arms depicted in front of the eagle displayed, either single-headed or double-headed, is very far from being unusual. Whatever may have been its meaning originally in that country, there is no doubt that now and for some centuries past it has been accepted as meaning, or as indicative of, princely rank or other honors of the Holy Roman Empire. But I do not think it can always have had that meaning. About the same date the Earl of Mentithe placed his shield on the breast of an eagle, as did Alexander, Earl of Ross, in 1338. And in 1394 we find the same ornamentation in the seal of Euphemia, Countess of Ross. The shield of Ross is borne in her case on the breast of an eagle, while the arms of Leslie and Coleman appear on its displayed wings. On several other Scottish seals of the same era, the shield is placed on the breast of a displayed eagle, as on those of Alexander Abernethy and Alexander Cuman of Buchan, 1292, and Sir David Lindsay, Lord of Crawford. English heraldry supplies several similar examples, of which we may mention the armorial insignia of Richard, Earl of Cornwall, brother of Henry III, and of the ancient family of Latham, in the 14th century. A curious instance of a shield placed on the breast of a hawk is noticed by Hone in his table book, viz. The arms of the lord of the manor of Stoke Line, in the county of Oxford. It appears therefrom that when Charles I. held his parliament at Oxford, the offer of knighthood was gratefully declined by the then lord of Stoke Line, who merely requested, and obtained, the royal permission to place the arms of his family upon the breast of a hawk which has ever since been employed in the capacity of single supporter. What authority exists for this statement it is impossible to ascertain, and one must doubt its accuracy, 
because in England at any rate no arms, allocated to any particular territorial estate, have ever received official recognition. Figure 667. Arms of Valen of Augsburg. In later years, as indicative of rank in the Holy Roman Empire, the eagle has been rightly borne by the first Duke of Marlborough and by Henrietta his daughter, Duchess of Marlborough. But the use of the eagle by the later Dukes of Marlborough would appear to be entirely without authority, inasmuch as the Prince Dom, created in the person of the first Duke, became extinct on his death. His daughters, though entitled of right to the courtesy rank of princess and its accompanying privilege of the right to use the eagle displayed behind their arms, could not transmit it to their descendants upon whom the title of Duke of Marlborough was specially entailed by English Act of Parliament. The Earl of Denby and several members of the Fielding family have often made use of it with their arms, in token of their supposed descent from the Counts of Habsburg, which, if correct, would apparently confer the right upon them. This descent, however, has been much questioned, and in late years the claim thereto would seem to have been practically dropped. The late Earl Cooper, the last remaining prince of the Holy Roman Empire in the British peerage, was entitled to use the double eagle behind his shield, being the descendant and representative of George Nassau Clavering Cooper, 3rd Earl Cooper. Created a prince of the Holy Roman Empire by the Emperor Joseph II. The patent being dated at Vienna, January 31, 1778, and this being followed by a royal license from King George III. To accept and bear the title in this country. There are some others who have the right by reason of honours of lesser rank of the Holy Roman Empire, and amongst these may be mentioned Lord Methuen, who bears the eagle by royal warrant dated April 4, 1775. Sir Thomas Arundel, who served in the Imperial Army of Hungary, having in an engagement with the Turks near Strignum taken their standard with his own hands, was by Rodolf II. Created Count of the Empire to hold for him and the heirs of his body forever, dated at Prague December 14, 1595. This patent, of course, means that every one of his descendants in the male line has the rank of a Count of the Empire, and that every daughter of any such male descendant is a Countess. But this does not confer the rank of Count or Countess upon descendants of the daughters. It was this particular patent of creation that called forth the remark from Queen Elizabeth that she would not have her sheep branded by any foreign shepherd. And we believe that this patent was the origin of the rule translated in later times, temp. George IV, into a definite royal warrant, requiring that no English subject shall, without the express royal license of the sovereign conveyed in writing, accept or wear any foreign title or decoration. No royal license was subsequently obtained by the Arundel family, who therefore, according to British law, are denied the use of the privileged imperial eagle. Outside those cases in which the double eagle is used in this country to denote rank of the Holy Roman Empire, the usage of the eagle displayed behind the arms or any analogous figure is in British heraldry most limited. One solitary authoritative instance of the use of the displayed eagle is found in the coat of arms of the city of Perth. These arms are recorded in Lyon Register, having been matriculated for that royal burg about the year 1672. The official blazon of the arms is as follows, Gules ain holy lamb passant regardant staff and cross argent, with the banner of St. Andrew proper, all within a double trace sure counterflowered of the second, the escutcheon being surmounted on the breast of ain eagle with two necks displayed or. The motto in ain a scroll, pro rege leg et grege. Another instance of usage, though purely devoid of authority, occurs in the case of a coat of arms set up on one of the panels in the Hall of Lincoln's Inn. In this case the achievement is displayed on the breast of a single-headed eagle. What reason led to its usage in this manner I am quite unaware, and I have not the slightest reason for supposing it to be authentic. The family of Stuart Mentithe also placed their arms upon a single-headed eagle displayed gules, as was formerly to be seen in De Brett's peerage, but though arms are matriculated to them in Lyon Register. This particular adornment forms no part thereof, and it has now disappeared from the printed peerage books. The family of Britain have, however, recently recorded as a badge a double-headed eagle displayed ermine, holding in its claws an escutcheon of their arms, plate 8. Occasionally batons or wands or other insignia of office are to be found in conjunction with armorial bearings, 
but these will be more fully dealt with under the heading of insignia of office. Before dealing with the usual supporters, one perhaps may briefly allude to inanimate supporters. Probably the most curious instance of all will be found in the achievement of the Earls of Errol as it appears in the MS of Sir David Lindsay. In this two ox yokes take the place of the supporters. The curious tradition which has been attached to the Hay Arms is quoted as follows by Sir James Balfour Paul, Lion King of Arms, in his Heraldry in Relation to Scottish History and Art. Who writes, take the case of the well-known Code of the Hayes, and hear the description of its origin as given by Nisbet, in the reign of Kenneth III. About the year 980, when the Danes invaded Scotland, and prevailing in the Battle of Lunkarty, a country Scotsman with his two sons, of great strength and courage, having rural weapons, as the yokes of their plough, and such plough furniture. Stopped the Scots in their flight in a certain defile, and upbraiding them with cowardice, obliged them to rally, who with them renewed the battle, and gave a total overthrow to the victorious Danes. And it is said by some, after the victory was obtained, the old man lying on the ground, wounded and fatigued, cried, Hey, hey, which word became a surname to his posterity. He and his sons being nobilitate, the king gave him the aforesaid arms, argent, three escutcheons gules, to intimate that the father and the two sons had been luckily the three shields of Scotland. And gave them as much land in the Carse of Gowrie as a falcon did fly over without lighting, which having flown a great way, she lighted on a stone there called the Falcon Stone to this day. The circumstances of which story is not only perpetuated by the three escutcheons, but by the exterior ornaments of the achievement of the family of Errol, having for crest, on a wreath, a falcon proper. For supporters two men in country habits, holding the oxen yokes of a plough over their shoulders, and for motto, serve a jugum. Unfortunately for the truth of this picturesque tale there are several reasons which render it utterly incredible, not the least being that at the period of the supposed battle armorial bearings were quite unknown. And could not have formed the subject of a royal gift. Hill Burton, indeed, strongly doubts the occurrence of the battle itself, and says that Hector Bees, who relates the occurrence, must be under strong suspicion of having entirely invented it. As for the origin of the name itself, it is, as Mr. Cosmo Innes points out in his work on Scottish surnames, derived from a place in Normandy, and neither it nor any other surname occurred in Scotland till long after the Battle of Lunkarty. I have mentioned this story in some detail, as it is a very typical specimen of its class, but there are others like unto it, often traceable to the same incorrigible old liar, Hector Bees. It is not unlikely that the ox yoke was a badge of the Hayes, Earls of Errol, and a reference to the variations of the original arms, crest, and supporters of hay will show how the changes have been rung on the shields, falcon, ox yokes. And countrymen of the legend. Another instance is to be found in the arms of the Mowbray family as they were at one time depicted with an ostrich feather on either side of the shield, figure 675 and p. 465, and at first one might be inclined to class these amongst the inanimate supporters. The garter plate, however, of John Beaufort, Duke of Somerset, probably supplies the key to the whole matter, for this shows not only the ostrich feathers but also supporters of the ordinary character in their usual position. From the last mentioned instance, it is evident the ostrich feathers can be only representations of the badge, their character doubtless being peculiarly adaptable to the curious position they occupy. They are of course the same in the case of the Mowbray arms, and doubtless the ox yoke of the Earl of Errol is similarly no more than a badge. A most curious instance of supporters is to be found in the case of the arms of Viscount Montgomery. This occurs in a record of them in Ulster's office, where the arms appear without the usual kind of supporters, but represented with an arm in armor, on either side issuing from clouds in base, the hand supporting the shield. When supporters are inanimate objects, the escutcheon is said to be cotiste, a term derived from the French word coty, aside, in contradistinction to support it. An old Scottish term for supporters was, bearers. Amongst other cases where the shield is cotiste by inanimate objects may be mentioned the following. The Breton family of Bastard depict their shield cotiste by two swords, with the points in base. The Marquises Alberti similarly used two lighted flambeaux, and the Dalzells, of Bins, 
the extraordinary device of a pair of tent poles. Whether this last has been officially sanctioned I am unaware. The Pillars of Hercules, used by Charles V, are, perhaps, the best known of this group of supporters. In many cases, notably foreign, the supporters appear to have gradually receded to the back of the shield, as in the case of the Comte d'Irps, Chancellor of Brabant, where two maces, or, are represented salterwise behind the shield. Generally, however, this variation is found in conjunction with purely official or corporate achievements. A curious example of inanimate supporters occurs on the English seal of William, Lord Beautros, 1426, where, on each side of a couche shield exhibiting a griffin, segriant, and surmounted by a helmet and crest, a buttress is quaintly introduced. In evident allusion to the owner's name. A somewhat similar arrangement appears on the Scottish seal of William Ruthven, 1396, where a tree growing from a mount is placed on each side of the escutcheon. Another instance is to be found in the seal of John de Segrave, where a garb is placed on either side of the shield. Perhaps mention should here be made of the arms, granted in 1826, of the National Bank of Scotland, the shield of which is surrounded with two thistles proper disposed in oral. Heraldic supporters as such, or badges occupying the position and answering the purpose of supporters, and not merely as artistic accessories, in England date from the early part of the 14th century. Very restricted in use at first, they later rapidly became popular, and there were few peers who did not display them upon their seals. For some reason, however, very few indeed appear on the early garter plates. It is a striking fact that by far the larger number of the ancient standards display as the chief device not the arms but one of the supporters. And I am inclined to think that in this fact we have further confirmation of my belief that the origin of supporters is found in the badge. Even after the use of two supporters had become general, a third figure is often found placed behind the shield, and forms a connecting link with the old practice of filling the void spaces on seals, to which we have already referred. On the seal of William Sterling, in 1292, two lions rampant support the shield in front of a tree. The shield on the seal of Oliver Rollion, in 1376, is supported by an angel, and by two demi-lions couching garden in base. That of Pierre Avouar, in 1378, is held by a demi-eagle above the shield, and by two mermaids. On many ancient seals the supporters are disposed so that they hold the crested helm above a couche shield. The counter seals of Rudolf IV. Archduke of Austria, in 1359 and 1362, afford instances in which a second set of supporters is used to hold up the crested helm. The shield of Austria is supported by two lions, on whose volets are the arms of Habsburg and Pfert. The crested helm, coronet, and having a panache of ostrich feathers, is also held by two lions, whose volets are charged with the arms of Styria, and of Corinthia, Huber, Austria Illustrata, Tab. 18. In 1372 the seal of Edmund Mortimer represents his shield hanging from a rose tree, and supported by two lions couchant, of March, whose heads are covered by coronet helmets with a panache, azure, as crest. Boutel directs attention to the fact that the shield of Edmund de Arundel, 1301-1326, is placed between similar helms and panaches, without the supporting beasts, heraldry, historical and popular, pages 271-418. Crested supporters have sometimes been misunderstood, and quoted as instances of double supporters, for instance, by lower, curiosities of heraldry, who gives, p. 144, a cut from the achievement of the French Dalbrets as the most singular supporters, perhaps, in the whole circle of heraldry. These supporters are two lions couchant, or, each helmed, and crested with an eagle oval leaf. These eagles certainly assist in holding the shield, but the lions are its true supporters, nor is this arrangement by any means unique. The swans which were used as supporters by Jean, Duc de Berry, in 1386, are each mounted upon a bear. Two wild men, each a cheval on a lion, support the escutcheons of Gerard d'Arches, 1476, and of Nicole de Geyersme, 1464. Two lions siegeant, helmed and crested, the crest is a human head with the ears of an ass, 
were the supporters of Arnaud d'Albry in 1368. Scotland, which is the home of curiosities of heraldry, gives us at least two instances of the use of supporters which must be absolutely unique, that is, the surcharging of an escutcheon with an inescutcheon. To the latter of which supporters are attached. The first instance occurs in the cases of baronets of Nova Scotia, a clause appearing in all the earlier patents which ordained that the baronets, and their heirs male, should, as an additament of honor to their armorial ensigns, bear. Either on a canton or in escutcheon, in their option, the ensign of Nova Scotia, being argent, a cross of st. Andrew Azure, the badge of Scotland counterchanged, charged with an inescutcheon of the Royal Arms of Scotland, supported on the dexter by the royal unicorn, and on the sinister by a savage or wild man, proper. And for crest, a branch of laurel and a thistle issuing from two hands conjoined, the one being armed, the other naked, with the motto, Munit haec et altera vincit. The incongruity of these exterior ornaments within a shield of arms is noticed by Nisbet, who informs us, however, that they are very soon removed. In the year 1629, after Nova Scotia was sold to the French, the baronets of Scotland, and their heirs male, were authorized by Charles I. To wear and carry about their necks, in all time coming, an orange tawny silk ribbon, whereon shall be pendant, in escutcheon argent, a salter azure, thereon an inescutcheon, of the arms of Scotland. With an imperial crown above the scutcheon and encircled with this motto, Fax mentis honesti gloria. According to the same authority, this badge was never much used, about their necks, but was carried, by way of canton or in escutcheon, on their armorial bearings, without the motto, and, of course. Since then the superimposed supporters have been dropped. The same peculiarity of supporters being surcharged upon a shield will be found, however, in the matriculation, 1795, to coming Gordon of Altair. These arms are depicted on plate 3. In this the entire achievement, arms, crest, motto, and supporters, of Gordon of Gordon is placed upon an inescutcheon superimposed over the arms of coming. In Scotland the arms, and the arms only, constitute the mark of a given family, and whilst due difference is made in the respective shields. No attempt is made as regards crest or supporters to impose any distinction between the figures granted to different families even where no blood relationship exists. The result is that whilst the same crests and supporters are duplicated over and over again, they at any rate remain in Scotland simple, graceful, and truly heraldic, even when judged by the most rigid medieval standard. They are, of course, necessarily of no value whatever for identification. In England the simplicity is relinquished for the sake of distinction, and it is held that equivalent differentiation must be made, both in regard to the crests and the supporters, as is made between the shields of different families. The result as to modern crests is truly appalling, and with supporters it is almost equally so, for by their very nature it is impossible to design adequate differences for crests and supporters, as can readily be done in the charges upon a shield. Without creating monstrosities. With regret one has to admit that the dangling shields, the diapered chintz-like bodies, and the fasces and other footstools so frequently provided for modern supporters in England would seem to be pedantic, unnecessary. And inartistic strivings after a useless ideal. In England the right to bear supporters is confined to those to whom they have been granted or recorded, but such grant or record is very rigidly confined to peers, to knights of the garter, thistle, and st. Patrick, and to knights grand cross, or knights grand commanders, as the case may be, of other orders. Before the order of the bath was divided into classes, knights of the bath had supporters. As by an unwritten but nowadays invariably accepted law, the orders of the garter, thistle, and st. Patrick are confined to members of the peerage, those entitled to claim, upon their petitioning, a grant of supporters in England are in practice limited to peers and knights grand cross or knights grand commanders. In the cases of peers, the grant is always attached to a particular peerage, the remainder, in the limitations of the grant being to those of his descendants upon whom the peerage may devolve, or some other words to this effect. In the cases of life peers and knights grand cross the grant has no hereditary limitation, and the right to the supporters is personal to the grantee. 
There is nothing to distinguish the supporters of a peer from those of a Knight Grand Cross. Baronets of England, Ireland, Great Britain, and the United Kingdom as such are not entitled to claim grants of supporters, but there are some number of cases in which, by special favour of the sovereign, specific royal warrants have been issued either as marks of favour or as augmentations of honour, conveying the pleasure of the sovereign to the kings of arms, and directing the latter to grant supporters, to descend with the baronetcy. Of the cases of this nature the following may be quoted, Guise, Royal Warrant, dated July 12, 1863, Prevost, Royal Warrant, October 1816, Guinness, now Lord Ardalon, Royal Warrant, dated April 15, 1867, Halford, Royal Warrant, May 19, 1827. Otway, Royal Warrant, June 10, 1845, and Laking. These, of course, are exceptional marks of favor from the sovereign, and this favor in at least two instances has been extended to untitled families. In 1815 Mr. George Watson Taylor, an especial intimate of the then Prince Regent, by royal warrant dated September 28, 1815, was granted the following supporters, on either side a leopard proper, armed and longed gules, collared and chained or. A more recent instance, and, with the exception of an Irish case presently to be referred to, the only other one within the knowledge of the writer, is the case of the Speak Arms. It is recited in the Royal Warrant, dated July 26, 1867. That Captain John Hanning Speak was by a deplorable accident suddenly deprived of his life before he had received any mark of our royal favour, in connection with the discovery of the sources of the Nile. The warrant goes on to recite the grant to his father, William Speak, of Jordans, Co. Somerset, of the following augmentations to his original arms, Argent, two bars azure, namely, on a chief a representation of flowing water superinscribed with the word Nile, and for a crest of honorable augmentation a crocodile. Also the supporters following, that is to say, on the dexter side a crocodile, and on the sinister side a hippopotamus. Some number of English baronets have gone to the trouble and expense of obtaining grants of supporters in Lyon office. For example Sir Christopher Baines, by grant dated June 10, 1805, obtained two savages, wreathed about the temples and loins, each holding a club over the exterior shoulder. It is very doubtful to what extent such grants in Scotland to domiciled Englishmen can be upheld. Many other baronets have at one time or another assumed supporters without any official warrant or authority in consequence of certain action taken by an earlier committee of the baronetage. But cases of this kind are slowly dropping out of the peerage books, and this, combined with the less ostentatious taste of the present day in the depicting of armorial bearings upon carriages and elsewhere, is slowly but steadily reducing the use of supporters to those who possess official authority for their display. Another fruitful origin of the use of unauthorized supporters at the present day lies in the fact that grants of supporters personal to the grantee for his life only have been made to Knight's Grand Cross or to life peers in cases where a hereditary title has been subsequently conferred. The limitations of the grant of supporters having never been extended, the grant has naturally expired with the death of the life honor to which the supporters were attached. In addition to these cases there is a very limited number of families which have always claimed supporters by prescriptive right, amongst whom may be mentioned Tichborne of Tichborne, two lions guard ant gules. De Houghton of Houghton, two bulls argent, Scrope of Danby, two chuffs, and Stapleton. Concerning such cases it can only be said that in England no official sanction has ever been given to such use. And no case exists of any official recognition of the right of an untitled family to bear supporters to their arms save those few exceptional cases governed by specific royal warrants. In many cases, notably Scrup, Luttrell, Hilton, and Stapleton, the supporters have probably originated in their legitimate adoption at an early period in connection with peerage or other titular distinction and have continued inadvertently in use when the titular distinctions to which they belonged have ceased to exist or have devolved upon other families. Possibly their use in some cases has been the result of a claim to de jure honours. The cases where supporters are claimed, by prescriptive right, are few indeed in England, and need not be further considered. Whilst the official laws in Ireland are, 
and have apparently always been, the same as in England, there is no doubt that the heads of the different sects assert a claim to the right to use supporters. On this point Sir Bernard Burke, Ulster King of Arms, wrote, no registry of supporters to an Irish chieftain appears in Ulster's office, in right of his chieftaincy only, and without the honour of peerage. Nor does any authority to bear them exist. But nevertheless, the Adonovan, Uses, Dexter, a lion guard ant, and Sinister, a griffin, the O'Gorman, Uses, Dexter, a lion, and Sinister, a horse, the O'Reilly, Uses two lions or. The O'Connor Don, however, is in the unique position of bearing supporters by unquestionable right, inasmuch as the late Queen Victoria, on the occasion of her last visit to Dublin, issued her royal warrant conferring the right upon him. The supporters granted to him were two lions rampant gules, each gorged with an antique crown, and charged on the shoulder with an Irish harp oar. The right to bear supporters in Scotland is on a widely different basis from that in any other country. As in England and Ireland, Peers and Knights Grand Cross are permitted to obtain grants of these distinctions. But outside and beyond these there are many other families who bear them by right. At the official inquiry concerning the Lion Office, the Lion Depute, Mr. George Tate, put in a note of persons whom he considered might lawfully bear supporters under Scottish heraldic law. The following is the text of the note in question. Note of persons who are considered by George Tate, ESQ. Lion depute, to be entitled to supporters, furnished to the commissioners of inquiry by their desire, intimated to him at his examination this day, June 27, 1821. 1. Peers. By immemorial usage, peers have right to supporters, and supporters are commonly inserted in modern patents of peerage. This includes peeresses in their own right. 2. Ancient usage. Those private gentlemen, and the lawful heirs male of their bodies, who can prove immemorial usage of carrying supporters, or a usage very ancient, and long prior to the Act 1672, are entitled to have their supporters recognized. It being presumed that they received them from lawful authority, on account of feats of valor in battle or in tournament, or as marks of the royal favor, see Murray of Touchedam's case, June 24, 1778. 3. Barons. Lawful heirs male of the bodies of the smaller barons, who had the full right of free barony, not mere freeholders, prior to 1587, when representation of the minor barons was fully established, upon the ground that those persons were barons. And sat in Parliament as such, and were of the same as the titled barons. Their right is recognized by the writers on heraldry and antiquities. Persons having right on this ground, will almost always have established it by ancient usage, and the want of usage is a strong presumption against the right. 4. Chiefs. Lawful heirs male of chiefs of tribes or clans which had attained power, and extensive territories and numerous members at a distant period, or at least of tribes consisting of numerous families of some degree of rank and consideration. Such persons will in general have right to supporters, either as barons, great or small, or by ancient usage. When any new claim is set up on such a ground, it may be viewed with suspicion, and it will be extremely difficult to establish it, chiefly from the present state of society, by which the traces of clanship, or the patriarchal state, are in most parts of the country almost obliterated. And indeed it is very difficult to conceive a case in which a new claim of that kind could be admitted. Mr. Tate has had some such claims, and has rejected them. 5. Royal Commissions. Knights of the Garter and Bath, and any others to whom the King may think proper to concede the honour of supporters. These are the only descriptions of persons who appear to Mr. Tate to be entitled to supporters. An idea has gone abroad, that Scots baronets are entitled to supporters, but there is no authority for this in their patents, or any good authority for it elsewhere. And for many years subsequent to 1672, a very small portion indeed of their arms which are matriculated in the Lion Register, are matriculated with supporters. So small as necessarily to lead to this inference, that those whose arms are entered with supporters had right to them on other grounds, e.g. ancient usage, chieftainship, or being heirs of barons. The arms of few Scots baronets are matriculated during the last fifty or sixty years. 
but the practice of assigning supporters gradually gained ground during that time, or rather the practice of assigning supporters to them, merely as such, seems to have arisen during that period, and it appears to Mr. Tate to be an erroneous practice, which he would not be warranted in following. British baronets have also, by recent practice, had supporters assigned to them, but Mr. Tate considers the practice to be unwarranted. And accordingly, in a recent case, a gentleman, upon being created a baronet, applied for supporters to the king, having applied to Mr. Tate, and been informed by him that he did not conceive the Lord Lyon entitled to give supporters to British baronets. No females, except peeresses in their own right, are entitled to supporters, as the representation of families is only in the male line. But the widows of peers, by courtesy, carry their arms and supporters. And the sons of peers, using the lower titles of the peerage by courtesy, also carry the supporters by courtesy. Mr. Tate does not know of any authority for the Lord Lyon having a discretionary power of granting supporters, and understands that only the king has such a power. Humbly submitted by. Signed, G. Tate. Though this statement would give a good general idea of the Scottish practice, its publication entails the addition of certain qualifying remarks. Supporters are most certainly not, commonly inserted in modern patents of peerage. Supporters appertaining to peerages are granted by special and separate patents. These two English subjects are now under the hand and seal of garter alone. In the event of a grant following upon the creation of an Irish peerage, the patent of supporters would be issued by Ulster King of Arms. But it is competent to Lyon King of Arms to matriculate the arms of Scottish peers with supporters, or to grant these to such as may still be without them. Both Lyon and Ulster would appear to have the right to grant supporters to peers of the United Kingdom who are heraldically their domiciled subjects. With regard to the second paragraph of Mr. Tate's memorandum, there will be few families within its range who will not be included within the range of the paragraph which follows. And the presumption would rather be that the use of supporters by an untitled family originated in the right of barony than in any mythical grant following upon mythical feats of valor. Mr. Tate, however, is clearly wrong in his statement that no females, except peeresses in their own right, are entitled to supporters. They have constantly been allowed to the heir of line, and their devolution through female heirs must of necessity presuppose the right thereto of the female heir through whom the inheritance is claimed. A recent case in point occurs with regard to the arms of Hunter Weston, matriculated in 1880, Mrs. Hunter Weston being the heir of line of Hunter of Hunterston. Widows of peers, providing they have arms of their own to impale with those of their husbands, cannot be said to only bear the supporters of their deceased husbands by courtesy. With them it is a matter of right. The eldest sons of peers bearing courtesy titles most certainly do not bear the supporters of the peerage to which they are heirs. Even the far more generally accepted, courtesy, practice of bearing coronets is expressly forbidden by an Earl Marshal's warrant. Consequently it may be asserted that the laws concerning the use of supporters in Scotland are as follows. In the first place, no supporters can be born of right unless they have been the subject of formal grant or matriculation. The following classes are entitled to obtain, upon payment of the necessary fees, the grant or matriculation of supporters to themselves, or to themselves and their descendants according as the case may be, 1. Peers of Scotland. And other peers who are domiciled Scotsmen. 2. Knights of the Garter, Knights of the Thistle, and Knights of Esti. Patrick, being Scotsmen, are entitled as such to obtain grants of supporters to themselves for use during life, but as these three orders are now confined to members of the peerage. The supporters used would be probably those appertaining to their peerages, and it is unlikely that any further grants for life will be made under these circumstances. 3. Knights of the Bath until the revision of the order were entitled to obtain grants of supporters to themselves for use during their lifetimes, and there are many instances in the Lion Register where such grants have been made. 4. Knights Grand Cross of the Bath, of St. Michael and St. George, and of the Royal Victorian Order, and Knights Grand Commanders of the Orders of the Star of India, and of the Indian Empire, are entitled to obtain grants of supporters for use during their lifetimes. 5. 
the lawful heirs of the minor barons who had the full right of free barony prior to 1587 may matriculate supporters if they can show their ancestors used them, or may now obtain grants. Though practically the whole of these have been at some time or other matriculated in Lyon Register, there still remain a few whose claims have never been officially adjudicated upon. For example, it is only quite recently that the ancient Swinton supporters have been formally enrolled on the official records, Plate 4. 6. There are certain others, being chiefs of clans and the heirs of those to whom grants have been made in times past, who also have the right, but as no new claim is likely to be so recognized in the future. It may be taken that these are confined to those cases which have been already entered in the Lyon Register. During the latter part of the 18th century, the executive of Lyon office had fallen into great disrepute. The office of Lyon King of Arms had been granted to the Earls of Kinnell, who had contented themselves with appointing deputies and drawing fees. The whole subject of armorial jurisdiction in Scotland had become lax to the last degree, and very many irregularities had crept in. One, and probably the worst result, had been the granting of supporters in many cases where no valid reason other than the payment of fees could be put forward to warrant the obtaining of such a privilege. And the result was the growth and acceptance of the fixed idea that it was within the power of Lion King of Arms to grant supporters to anyone whom he might choose to so favor. Consequently many grants of supporters were placed upon the records, and many untitled families of Scotland apparently have the right under these patents of grant to add supporters to their arms. Though it is an arguable matter whether the Lord Lyon was justified in making these grants, there can be no doubt that, so long as they remain upon the official register, and no official steps are taken to cancel the patents. They must be accepted as existing by legal right. Probably the most egregious instance of such a grant is to be found in the case of the grant to the first baronet of the family of Antrobus, who on purchasing the estate of Rutherford, the seat of the extinct lords Rutherford, obtained from the then Lion King of Arms a grant of the peerage supporters carried by the previous owners of the property. With regard to the devolution of Scottish supporters, the large proportion of those registered in Lion office are recorded in the terms of some patent which specifies the limitations of their descent so that there are a comparatively small number only concerning which there can be any uncertainty as to whom the supporters will descend to. The difficulty can only arise in those cases in which the arms are matriculated with supporters as borne by ancient usage in the early years of the Lion Register. Or in the cases of supporters still to be matriculated on the same grounds by those families who have so far failed to comply with the Act of 1672. Whilst Mr. Tate, in his memorandum which has been previously quoted, would deny the right of inheritance to female heirs, there is no doubt whatever that in many cases such heirs have been allowed to succeed to the supporters of their families. Taking supporters as an uppunage of right of barony, either greater or lesser, there can be no doubt that the greater baronies, and consequently the supporters attached to them, devolved upon heirs female. And upon the heir of line inheriting through a female ancestor. And, presumably, the same considerations must of necessity hold good with regard to those supporters which are borne by right of lesser barony, for the greater and the lesser were the same thing, differing only in degree. Until in the year 1587 the lesser barons were relieved of compulsory attendance in Parliament. At the same time there can be no doubt that the headship of a family must rest with the heir male, and consequently it would seem that in those cases in which the supporters are born by right of being head of a clan or chief of a name, the right of inheritance would devolve upon the heir male. There must of necessity be some cases in which it is impossible to determine whether the supporters were originally called into being by right of barony or because of chieftainship. And the consequence has been that concerning the descent of the supporters of the older untitled families there has been no uniformity in the practice of lion office. And it is impossible from the precedents which exist to deduce any certain and unalterable rule upon the point. Precedents exist in each case, and the well-known case of Smith Cunningham and Dick Cunningham, which is often referred to as settling the point, did nothing of the kind. Inasmuch as that judgment depended upon the interpretation of a specific act of Parliament, and was not the determination of a point of heraldic law. The case, however, afforded the opportunity to Lord Geoffrey to make the following remarks upon the point, c.p. 355, Seton. 
If I may be permitted to take a common sense view, I should say that there is neither an inflexible rule nor a uniform practice in the matter. There may be cases where the heir of line will exclude the heir male, and there may be cases where the converse will be held. In my opinion the common sense rule is that the chief armorial dignities should follow the more substantial rights and dignities of the family. If the heir male succeed to the title and estates, I think it reasonable that he should also succeed to the armorial bearings of the head of the house. I would think it a very difficult proposition to establish that the heir of line, when denuded of everything else, was still entitled to retain the barren honors of heraldry. But I give no opinion upon that point. Mr. Seaton, in his Law and Practice of Heraldry in Scotland, sums up the matter of inheritance in these words, cp. 357, as already indicated, however, by one of the learned lords in his opinion on the case of Cunningham, the practice in the matter in question has been far from uniform. And accordingly we are very much disposed to go along with his relative suggestion, that the chief armorial dignities should follow the more substantial rights and dignities of the family. And that when the latter are enjoyed by the female heir of line, such heir should also be regarded as fairly entitled to claim the principal heraldic honors. The result has been in practice that the supporters of a family have usually been matriculated to whoever has carried on the name and line of the house, unless the supporters in question have been governed by a specific grant. The limitations of which exist to be referred to, but in cases where both the heir of line and the heir male have been left in a prominent position, the difficulty of decision has in many cases been got over by allowing supporters to both of them. The most curious instance of this within our knowledge occurs with regard to the family of Chisholm. Chisholm of Urchless Castle appears undoubtedly to have succeeded as head and chief of his name, the Chisholm, about the end of the 17th century. As such supporters were carried, namely, on either side a savage wreathed about the head and middle with laurel, and holding a club over his exterior shoulder. At the death of Alexander Chisholm, the Chisholm, February 7, 1793, the chieftainship and the estates passed to his half-brother William, but his heir of line was his only child Mary, who married James Gooden of London. Mrs. Mary Chisholm or Gooden in 1827 matriculated the undifferenced arms of Chisholm, Gules, a boar's head cooped or, without supporters, but in 1831 the heir male also matriculated the same undifferenced arms, in this case with supporters. The chieftainship of the Chisholm family then continued with the male line until the death of Duncan MacDonald Chisholm, the Chisholm, in 1859, when his only sister and heir became heir of line of the later chiefs. She was then Jemima Batten, and by royal license in that year she and her husband assumed the additional surname of Chisholm, becoming Chisholm Batten, and, contrary to the English practice in such cases. The arms of Chisholm alone were matriculated in 1860 to Mrs. Chisholm Batten and her descendants. These once again were the undifferenced coat of Chisholm, viz., gules, a boar's head coop door. Arms for Batten have since been granted in England, the domicile of the family being English, and the arms of the present Mr. Chisholm Batten, though including the quartering for Chisholm, is usually marshalled as allowed in the College of Arms by English rules. Though there does not appear to have been any subsequent rematriculation in favour of the heir male who succeeded as the Chisholm, the undifferenced arms were also considered to have devolved upon him together with the supporters. On the death of the last known male heir of the family, Roderick Donald Matheson Chisholm, the Chisholm, in 1887, Mr. James Chisholm Gooden Chisholm claimed the chieftainship as heir of line, and in that year the Gooden Chisholm arms were again rematriculated. In this case supporters were added to the again undifferenced arms of Chisholm, but a slight alteration in the supporters was made, the clubs being reversed and placed to rest on the ground. Amongst the many other untitled Scottish families who rightly bear supporters, may be mentioned Gibson of Pentland, Barclay of Urie, Barclay of Toey, Drummond of Meganch, McLaughlin of that ilk, Clooney, Macpherson, Cunningham, and Brisbane of that ilk. Armorial matters in the Channel Islands present a very unsatisfactory state of affairs. There never appears to have been any visitation, and the arms of Channel Island families which officially pass muster must be confined to those of the very few families, for example, the Carteret, Daubry, 
and Tupper, who have found it necessary or advisable on their own initiative to register their arms in the official English sources. In none of these instances have supporters been allowed, nor I believe did any of these families claim to use them, but some, Lempriere, de Saumarez, and other families, assert the possession of such a distinction by prescriptive right. If the right to supporters be a privilege of peerage, or if, as in Scotland, it anciently depended upon the right of free barony, the position of these Channel Island families in former days as seigneurial lords was much akin. But it is highly improbable that the right to bear supporters in such cases will ever be officially recognized, and the case of de Somares, in which the supporters were bedeviled and regranted to descend with the peerage, will probably operate as a decisive precedent upon the point and against such a right. There are some number of families of foreign origin who bear supporters or claim them by the assertion of foreign right. Where this right can be established their use has been confirmed by royal license in this country in some number of cases. For example, the cases of Rothschild and de Salas. In other cases, for example, the case of Chamier, no official record of the supporters exists with the record of the arms, and presumably the foreign right to the supporters could not have been established at the time of registration. With regard to impersonal arms, the right to supporters in England is not easy to define. In the case of counties, crests and supporters are granted if the county likes to pay for them. In the case of towns, the rule in England is that an ordinary town may not have supporters but that a city may, and instances are numerous where supporters have been granted upon the elevation of a town to the dignity of a city. Birmingham, Sheffield, and Nottingham are all recent instances in point. This rule, however, is not absolutely rigid, and an exception may be pointed to in the case of Liverpool, the supporters being granted in 1797, and the town not being created a city until a subsequent date. In Scotland, where, of course, until quite recently supporters were granted practically to anybody who chose to pay for them, a grant will be found for the county of Perth dated in 1800, in which supporters were included. But as to towns and cities it is no more than a matter of fees, any town in Scotland eligible for arms being at liberty to obtain supporters also if they are desired. In grants of arms to corporate bodies it is difficult to draw the line or to deduce any actual rule. In 23rd of Henry VIII. The Grocers Livery Company were granted two griffins per fescules and or, and many other of the livery companies have supporters to their arms. Others, for no apparent reason, are without them. The Th Merchant Adventurers Company or Hamburg Merchants have supporters, as had both the old and the new East India companies. The arms of Jamaica and Cape Colony and of the British North Borneo Company have supporters, but on the other hand no supporters were assigned to Canada or to any of its provinces. In Ireland the matter appears to be much upon the same footing as in England, and as far as impersonal arms are concerned it is very difficult to say what the exact rule is, if this is to be deduced from known cases and past precedents. Probably the freedom, amounting in many cases to great laxity, with which in English heraldic art the positions and attitudes of supporters are changed, is the one point in which English heraldic art has entirely ignored the trammels of conventionalized officialism. There must be in this country scores of entrance gates where each pillar of the gateway is surmounted by a shield held in the paws of a single supporter, and the governmental use of the royal supporters in an amazing variety of attitudes, some of which are grossly unheraldic, has not helped towards a true understanding. The reposeful attitude of watchful slumber in which the royal lion and unicorn are so often depicted may perhaps be in the nature of submission to the biblical teaching of Isaiah that the lion shall lie down with the lamb, and possibly therefore also with the unicorn. In these times of peace which have succeeded those earlier days when the lion beat the unicorn round and round the town. Figure 668. The arms used by Kilmarnock, Ayrshire, Azure, a fest checky gules and argent. Crest, a dexter hand raised in benediction. Supporters on either side a squirrel siegeant proper. In official minds, however, the sole attitude for the supporters is the rampant, or as near an approach to it as the nature of the animal will allow. A human being, a bird, or a fish naturally can hardly adopt the attitude. In Scotland, the land of heraldic freedom, 
various exceptions to this can be found. Of these one can call to mind the arms used by the town of Kilmarnock, figure 668, in which the supporters, squirrels proper, are depicted always as siegeant. These particular creatures, however, would look strange to us in any other form. These arms unfortunately have never been matriculated as the arms of the town, being really the arms of the Boyd family, the attainted earls of Kilmarnock, and consequently can hardly as yet be referred to as a definite precedent. Because official matriculation might result in a similar happening to the change which was made in the case of the arms of Inverness. In all representations of the arms of earlier date than the matriculation, the supporters, Dexter, a camel and, sinister, an elephant, are depicted statant on either side of the shield. No actual contact being made between the escutcheon and the supporters. But in 1900, when in a belated compliance with the Act of 1672 the armorial bearings of the Royal Burg of Inverness were matriculated, the position was altered to that more usually employed for supporters. The supporters always used by Sir John Maxwell Sterling Maxwell of Pollock are two lions siegeant guardant. These, as appears from an old seal, were in use as far back as the commencement of the 15th century, but the supporters officially recorded for the family are two apes. In English armory one or two exceptional cases may be noticed. For example, the supporters of the city of Bristol, which are, on either side, on a Mount Vert, a unicorn siegeant or, armed, maned, and ungild sable. Another instance will be found in the supporters of Lord Rosemead, which are, on the dexter side an ostrich and on the sinister side a kangaroo, both regarding proper. From the nature of the animal, the kangaroo is depicted siegeant. Supporters in Germany date from the same period as with ourselves, being to be met with on seals as far back as 1276. At first they were similarly purely artistic adjuncts, but they have retained much of this character and much of the purely permissive nature in Germany to the present day. It was not until about the middle of the 17th century that supporters were granted or became hereditary in that country. Grants of supporters can be found in England at an earlier date, but such grants were isolated in number. Nevertheless supporters have become hereditary very soon after they obtained a regularly heraldic, as opposed to a decorative, footing. Their use, however, was governed at that period by a greater freedom as to alteration and change than was customary with armory in general. Supporters were an adjunct of the peerage, and peers were not subject to the visitations. With his freedom from arrest, his high social position, and his many other privileges of peerage, a peer was, too big, a person formerly to accept the dictatorial armorial control which the crown enforced upon lesser people. Short of treason, a peer in any part of Great Britain for most practical purposes of social life was above the ordinary law. In actual fact it was only the rights of one peer as opposed to the rights of another peer that kept a Lord of Parliament under any semblance of control. When the great lords of past centuries could and did raise armies to fight the king a peer was hardly likely to, nor did he, brook much interference. Of the development of supporters in Germany Stroll writes. Only very late, about the middle of the 17th century, were supporters granted as hereditary, but they appear in the arms of burghers in the first half of the 15th century. And the arms of many towns also possess them as decorative adjuncts. The first supporters were human figures, generally portraits of the arms bearers themselves, then women, young men, and boys, so called Schildbuben. In the second half of the 14th century, animals appear lions, bears, stags, dogs, griffins, and. In the 15th century one frequently encounters angels with richly curling hair, saints, patrons of the bearer or of the town, then later, nude wild men and women, walled mansion, thickly covered with hair. With garlands round their loins and on their heads. The thick, hairy covering of the body in the case of women is only to be met with in the very beginning. Later the endeavor was to approach the feminine ideal as nearly as possible, and only the garlands were retained to point out the origin and the home of these figures. At the end of the 15th and in the 16th century, there came into fashion lansconets, huntsmen, pretty women and girls, both clothed and unclothed. Speaking of the present day, and from the executive standpoint, he adds. 
supporters, with the exception of flying angels, should have a footing on which they can stand in a natural manner, whether it be grass, a pedestal, a tree, or line of ornament, and to place them upon a ribbon of a motto is less suitable because a thin ribbon can hardly give the impression of a sufficiently strong support for the invariably heavy-looking figures of the men or animals. The supporters of the shield may at the same time be employed as bearers of the helmets. They bear the helmets either over the head or hold them in their hands. Figures standing near the shield, but not holding or supporting it in any way, cannot in the strict sense of the word be designated supporters, such figures are called shieldwachter, shieldwatchers or guardians. Human figures as supporters. Of all figures employed as supporters probably human beings are of most frequent occurrence, even when those single and double figures referred to on an earlier page, which are not a real part of the heraldic achievement, are excluded from consideration. The endless variety of different figures perhaps gives some clue to the reason of their frequent occurrence. Though the nude human figure appears, male, upon the shield of Dalziel and, female, in the crest of Ellis, Agar Ellis, formerly Viscount Clifton, one cannot call to mind any instance of such an occurrence in the form of supporters. Though possibly the supporters of the Glazier's Livery Company, two naked boys proper, each holding a long torch inflamed of the last, and of the Joiner's Livery Company, two naked boys proper. The Dexter holding in his hand an emblematical female figure, crowned with a mural coronet sable, the sinister holding in his hand a square, might be classed in such a character. Nude figures in armory are practically always termed savages, or occasionally woodmen or wild men, and garlanded about the loins with foliage. Figure 669. Arms of our broth, gules, a portcullis with chains pendant or. Motto, Propter Libertatum. Supporters, Dexter, St. Thomas a Becket in his archiepiscopal robes all proper. Sinister, a baron of Scotland armed cap a pie, holding in his exterior hand the letter from the Convention of the Scottish Estates, held at our broth in the year of 1320, addressed to Pope John XXI, all proper with various adjuncts, clubs, banners, trees, branches, and k. Savages will be found as the supporters of the arms of the German Emperor, and in the sovereign arms of Brunswick, Denmark, schwarzburg sondershausen and Rüttelstad, as well as in the arms of the Kingdom of Prussia. They also appear in the arms of the Kingdom of Greece, though in this case they should perhaps be more properly described as figures of Hercules. In British armory, Amongst many other families, two savages are the supporters of the Marquess of Aylesbury, Lord Calthorpe, Viscount de Vesey, Lord Elphinstone, the Earl of Elgin and Kincardine, the Duke of Fife. Earl Fitzwilliam, each holding in the exterior hand a tree eradicated, Lord Kinnaird, the Earl of Morton. And amongst the baronets who possess supporters, Menzies, Douglas of Carr, and William Drummond have on either side of their escutcheons a savage. Earl Paulet alone has both man and woman, his supporters being, Dexter, a savage man. Sinister, a savage woman, both wreathed with oak, all proper. As someone remarked on seeing a realistic representation of this coat of arms by Catton, R. the blazon might more appropriately have concluded, all improper. Next after savages, the most favored variety of the human being adopted as a supporter is the man in armor. Even as heraldic and heritable supporters angels are not uncommon, and are to be met with amongst other cases in the arms of the Marquess of Waterford, the Earl of Dudley, and Viscount Dillon. It is rare to find supporters definitely stated to represent any specific person, but in the case of the arms of our broth, figure 669, the supporters are Dexter, Street Point Thomas a Becket, and Sinister, a Baron of Scotland. Another instance, again from Scotland, appears in a most extraordinary grant by the Lion in 1816 to Sir Jonathan Wathen Waller, Bart, of Braywick Lodge, Company Berks, and of Twickenham, Company Middlesex. In this case the supporters were two elaborately harnessed ancient warriors, to commemorate the surrender of Charles, Duke of Orleans, at the memorable Battle of Agincourt, that word being the motto over the crest, in the year 1415. To Richard Waller of Groombridge in Kent, E.S.Q from which Richard the said Sir Jonathan Wathen Waller is, according to the tradition of his family, descended.
This pedigree is set out in Burke's Peerage, which assigns as arms to this family the old coat of Waller of Groombridge, with the augmented crest, viz. On a Mount Vert, a walnut tree proper, and pendant there from an escutcheon of the arms of France with a label of three points argent. Considerable doubt, however, is thrown upon the descent by the fact that in 1814, when Sir Jonathan, then Mr. Phipps, obtained a royal license to assume the name and arms of Waller, a very different and much bedeviled edition of the arms and not the real coat of Waller of Groombridge was exemplified to him. These supporters, the grant was quite ultra vires, Sir Jonathan being a domiciled Englishman, do not appear in any of the peerage books, and it is not clear to what extent they were ever made use of. But in a painting which came under my notice the Duke of Orleans, in his surcoat of France, could be observed handing his sword across the front of the escutcheon to Mr. or Sir, Richard Waller. The supporters of the Needlemakers' Company are commonly known as Adam and Eve, and the motto of the company, they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons, bears this supposition out. The blazon, however, is, Dexter, a man, sinister, a woman, both proper, each wreathed round the waist with leaves of the last, in the woman's Dexter hand and needle or. The supporters of the Earl of Aberdeen are, Dexter and Earl and Sinister a doctor of laws, both in their robes all proper. Highlanders in modern costume figure as supporters to the arms of McConaughey Wellwood, and in more ancient garb in the case of Clooney McPherson, and soldiers in the uniforms of every regiment, and savages from every clime. Have at some time or other been pressed into heraldic service as supporters. But a work on armory is not a handbook on costume, military and civil, nor is it an ethnographical directory, which it would certainly become if any attempt were to be made to enumerate the different varieties of men and women. Clothed and unclothed, which have been used for the purposes of supporters. Animals as supporters. When we turn to animals as supporters, we at once get to a much wider range, and but little can be said concerning them beyond stating that though usually rampant, they are sometimes segent, and may be guardant or regardant. One may, however, append examples of the work of different artists, which will doubtless serve as models, or possibly may develop ideas in other artists. The lion naturally first claims one's attention. Fig. 670 shows an interesting and curious instance of the use of a single lion as a supporter. This is taken from a drawing in the possession of the town library at Breslau, Herald, 1888, number 1, and represents the arms of Dr. Heinrich Rubisch, physician to the King of Hungary and Bohemia. The arms are, profess, the chief argent, a point throughout sable, charged with a lion's face, holding in the jaws an annulet, and the base also argent charged with two bars sable. The mantling is sable and argent. Upon the helmet as crest are two buffalo's horns of the colors of the shield, and between them appears, apparently as a part of the heritable crest, a lion's face holding an annulet as in the arms. This, however, is the face of the lion, which, standing behind the escutcheon, is employed as the supporter, though possibly it is intended that it should do double duty. This employment of one animal to serve a double armorial purpose is practically unknown in British armory, except possibly in a few early examples of seals, but in German heraldry it is very far from being uncommon. Figure 670. Arms of Dr. Heinrich Rubisch. Winged lions are not very usual, but they occur as the supporters of Lord Bray, on either side a lion guardant or winged ver. A winged lion is also one of the supporters, the Dexter, of Lord Leckenfield, but this, owing to the position of the wings, is quite unique. The blazon is, a lion with wings inverted azure, collared or. Two lions rampant double-cued, the Dexter or, the sinister sable, are the supporters of the Duke of Portland, and the supporters of both the Earl of Feversham and the Earl of Dartmouth afford instances of lions crowned with a coronet and issuing there from a plume of ostrich feathers. Sea lions will be found as supporters to the arms of Viscount Falmouth, two sea lions erect on their tails Argent, Guttdale arms, and the Earl of Hoth bears, Dexter, a sea lion as in the crest. Sinister, a mermaid proper, holding in her exterior hand a mirror. The heraldic tiger is occasionally found as a supporter, 
and an instance occurs in the arms of the Marquis of Dufferin and Ava. It also occurs as the sinister supporter of the Duke of Leeds, and of the Baroness Darcy de Nath, and was the dexter supporter of the Earls of Holderness. Two heraldic tigers are the supporters both of Sir Andrew Noel Agnew, Bart. And of the Marquis of Anglesey. Of recent years the natural tiger has taken its place in the heraldic menagerie, and instances of its appearance will be found in the arms of Sir Mortimer Durand, and as one of the supporters of the arms of the city of Bombay. When occurring in heraldic surroundings it is always termed for distinction a Bengal tiger, and two royal Bengal tigers are the supporters of Sir Francis Outram, Bart. On either side a royal Bengal tiger guard ant proper, gorged with a wreath of laurel vert, and on the head an eastern crown or. The griffin is perhaps the next most favorite supporter. Male griffins are the supporters of Sir George John Edgerton Dashwood, on either side a male griffin argent, gorged with a collar flory counterflory gules. A very curious supporter is borne by Mr. Styleman Lestrange. Of course, as a domiciled English commoner, having no royal license to bear supporters, his claim to these additions would not be recognized. But their use no doubt originated in the fact that he represents the lines of several coerships to different baronies by writ, to some one of which, no doubt, the supporters may have at some time belonged. The dexter supporter in question is, a stag argent with a lion's forepaws and tail, collared. The supporters recently granted to Lord Milner are two, springbok, and the same animal, an oryx, or springbok, is the sinister supporter of the arms of Cape Colony. Goats are the supporters of the Earl of Portsmouth, who styles his chamois or wild goats, of Lord Bagot and Lord Cranworth, and they occur in the achievements of the Barony of Ruthven and the Marquis of Normanby. The supporters of Viscount Southwell are two Indian goats. Rams are the supporters of Lord de Ramsey and Lord Sherard. A ram is also one of the supporters attached to the Barony of Ruthven, and one of the supporters used by the town of New Galloway. These arms, however, have never been matriculated, which on account of the curious charge upon the shield is very much to be regretted. The supporters of Lord Mowbray and Storton afford an example of a most curious and interesting animal. Originally the Lord Storton used two antelopes azure, but before the seventeenth century these had been changed to two sea dogs. When the abeyance of the barony of Mowbray was determined in favor of Lord Storton the dexter supporter was changed to the lion of Mowbray, but the sinister supporter still remained a sea dog. The horse and the pegasus are constantly met with supporting the arms of peers and others in this country. A bay horse regarded figures as the dexter supporter of the Earl of Yarborough. And the horses which support the shield of Earl Cooper are very specifically detailed in the official blazon two dun horses close-cropped, except a tuft upon the withers, and docked, a large blaze down the face, a black list down the back. And three white feet, viz. The hind feet and near forefoot. Lord Joycey has two Shetland ponies and Lord Winterstoke has two horses sable, maned, tailed, and girthed or. The arms of the City of London are always used with dragons for supporters, but these supporters are not officially recorded. The arms of the City of London are referred to at greater length elsewhere in these pages. The town of Appleby uses dragons with wings expanded, most fearsome creatures, but these are not official, nor are the dragon siegeant adderst gules. Each holding an ostrich feather argent affixed to a scroll, which some enterprising artist designed for Cheshire. Dragons will be found as supporters to the arms of the Earl of Enniskillen, Lord Street Oswald, the Earl of Castle Stuart, and Viscount Arbuthnot. The heraldic dragon is not the only form of the creature now known to armory. The Chinese dragon was granted to Lord Goff as one of his supporters, and it has since also been granted as a supporter to Sir Robert Hart, Bart. Wyverns are the supporters of the Earl of Meath and Lord Burgler, and the sinister supporter of both Lord Raglan and Lord Lividen. The arms of the Royal Burg of Dundee are quite unique. The official blazon runs, Azure, a pot of growing lilies argent, the escutcheon being supported by two dragons, their tails now together underneath vert. With this word in an scroll above a lily growing out of the top of the shield as the former, De Donum. 
Though blazoned as dragons, the creatures are undoubtedly wyverns. Wyverns when figuring as supporters are usually represented standing on the one claw and supporting the shield with the other, but in the case of the Duke of Marlborough, whose supporters are two wyverns. These are generally represented siegeant erect, supporting the shield with both claws. This position is also adopted for the wyvern supporters of Sir Robert Arbuthnet, Bart, and the Earl of Egelinton. Two cockatrices are the supporters of Lord Donomore, the Earl of Westmeath, and Sir Edmund Nugent, Bart. And the Dexter supporter of Lord Lanesborough is also a cockatrice. The basilisk is the same creature as the cockatrice, and in the arms of the town of Baal, German Basel, is an example of a supporter blazoned as a basilisk. The arms are, Argent, a crozier sable. The supporter is a basilisk vert, armed in jelloped gules. The supporters of the plasterer's company, which were granted with the arms, January 15, 1556, are, two openasi, figures very similar to griffins, vert pursed, purfled, or, beaked sable, the wings gules. The dexter supporter of the arms of Cape Colony is a, new. The zebra, the giraffe, and the okapi are as yet unclaimed as supporters, though the giraffe, under the name of the camelopard, figures in some number of cases as a crest, and there is at least one instance, Kemsley, of a zebra as a crest. The ass, though there are some number of cases in which it appears as a crest or a charge, does not yet figure anywhere as a supporter, nor does the mule. The hyena, the sacred cow of India, the bison, the giant sloth, and the armadillo are all distinctive animals which still remain to be withdrawn from the heraldic lucky bag of garter. The mythical human-faced winged bull of Egyptian mythology, the harpy, and the female centaur would lend themselves well to the character of supporters. Robertson of Struan has no supporters matriculated with his arms, and it is difficult to say for what length of time the supporters now in use have been adopted. But he is chief of his name, and the representative of one of the minor barons, so that there is no doubt that supporters would be matriculated to him if he cared to apply. Those supporters in use, viz. Dexter, a serpent. Sinister, a dove, the heads of each encircled with rays, must surely be no less unique than is the strange compartment, a wild man lying in chains, which is borne below the arms of Struan Robertson and which was granted to his ancestor in 1451 for arresting the murderers of King James I. The supporters belonging to the city of Glasgow are also unique, being two salmon, each holding a signet ring in the mouth. The supporters of the city of Waterford, though not recorded in Ulster's office, have been long enough in use to ensure their official confirmation if a request to this effect were to be properly put forward. They are, on the Dexter side a lion, and on the sinister side a dolphin. Two dolphins azure, Findor, are the supporters of the Waterman and Lighterman's Livery Company, and were granted 1655. Birds as supporters. Whilst eagles are plentiful as supporters, nevertheless if eagles are eliminated the proportion of supporters which are birds is not great. A certain variety in differentiation is obtained by altering the position of the wings, noticeably in regard to eagles. But these differences do not appear to be by any means closely adhered to by artists in pictorial representations of armorial bearings. Fig. 671 ought perhaps more properly to have been placed amongst those eagles which, appearing as single figures, carry shields charged upon the breast, but in the present case, in addition to the shield charged upon it in the usual manner. It so palpably supports the two other escutcheons, that we are tempted to include it amongst definite supporters. The figure represents the arms of the free city of Nuremberg, and the design is reproduced from the title page of the German edition of Andreas Veselai's Anatomia, printed at Nuremberg in 1537. The eagle is that of the German Empire, carrying on its breast the impaled arms of Castile and Austria. The shields it supports may now be said both to belong to Nuremberg. The Dexter shield, which is the colored seal device of the old imperial city, is, azure, a harpy, in German Frauenadler or maiden eagle, displayed and crowned or. The sinister shield, which may more properly be considered the real arms of Nuremberg, is, per pale or, a double-headed imperial eagle displayed, 
demidiated with bendy of six gules and argent. The supporters of Lord Amherst of Hackney are two herons, on either side a heron proper, collared or. Figure 671. The Arms of Nuremberg. The city of Calcutta, to which arms and supporters were granted in 1896, has for its supporters adjutant birds, which closely approximate to storks. Two woodpeckers have recently been granted as the supporters of Lord Peckover. Chapter 27 The Compartment A compartment is anything depicted below the shield as a foothold or resting place for the supporters, or indeed for the shield itself. Sometimes it is a fixed part of the blazon and a constituent part of the heritable heraldic bearings. At other times it is a matter of mere artistic fancy, and no fixed rules exist to regulate or control nor even to check the imagination of the heraldic artist. The fact remains that supporters must have something to stand upon, and if the blazon supplies nothing, the discretion of the artist is allowed considerable laxity. On the subject of compartments a great deal of diversity of opinion exists. There is no doubt that in early days and early examples supporters were placed to stand upon some secure footing. But with the decadence of heraldic art in the 17th century came the introduction of the gilded, freehand copy, scroll with which we are so painfully familiar, which one writer has aptly termed the heraldic gas bracket. Arising doubtless from and following upon the earlier habit of balancing the supporters upon the unstable footing afforded by the edge of the motto scroll, the gas bracket was probably accepted as less open to objection. It certainly was not out of keeping with the heraldic art of the period to which it owed its evolution, or with the style of armorial design of which it formed a part. It still remains the accepted and official style and type in England, but Scotland and Ireland have discarded it. And, compartments, in those countries are now depicted of a nature requiring less gymnastic ability on the part of the animals to which they afford a foothold. The style of compartment is practically always a matter of artistic taste and design. With a few exceptions it is always entirely disregarded in the blazon of the patent, and the necessity of something for the supporters to stand upon is as much an understood thing as is the existence of a shield whereon the arms are to be displayed. But as the shape of the shield is left to the fancy of the artist, so is the character of the compartment. And the Lion Register nowadays affords examples of achievements where the supporters stand on rocks and flowery mounds or issue from a watery abiding place. The example set by the Lion Register has been eagerly followed by most heraldic artists. Figure 672 it is a curious commentary upon the heraldic art of the close of the 18th and the early part of the 19th centuries that whilst the gymnastic capabilities of animals were admitted to be equal to tightrope exhibitions of balancing upon the ordinary scroll, these feats were not considered practicable in the case of human beings, for whom little square platforms were always provided. Figure 672, which represents the sinister supporter of Lord Scarsdale, viz. The figure of liberality represented by a woman habited argent, mantled purple, holding a cornucopia proper, shows the method by which platform accommodation was provided for human figures when acting as supporters. At the same time this greater freedom of design may occasionally lead to mistakes in relation to English supporters and their compartments. Following upon the English practice already referred to of differentiating the supporters of different families, it has apparently been found necessary in some cases to place the supporters to stand upon a definite object. Which object is recited in the blazon and becomes an integral and unchangeable portion of the supporter. Thus Lord Torrington's supporters are each placed upon dismounted ship's guns, dexter, and heraldic antelope ermine, horned, tusked, maned and hoofed or, standing on a ship gun proper. Sinister, a seahorse proper, on a light gun, Lord Hawke's Dexter supporter rests his sinister foot upon a dolphin, and Lord Herschel's supporters each stand upon a fasces, supporters, on either side a stag proper, collared azure. Standing on a fasces or. The supporters of Lord Ivey each rest a hind foot upon an escutcheon, supporters, on either side a stag gules, a tired and collared gemel or, resting the inner hoof on an escutcheon vert charged with a lion rampant of the second. Whilst the inner hind foot of each of Lord Burton's supporters rests upon a stag's head cabochet proper. Probably absurdity could go no further. But in the case of the supporters granted to Cape Town, fig. 
673, the official blazon runs as follows, on the dexter side, standing on a rock, a female figure proper, vested argent, mantle and sandals azure, on her head an estoil radiated or, and supporting with her exterior hand an anchor also proper. And on the sinister side, standing on a like rock, a lion rampant guardant gules. In this case it will be seen that the rocks form an integral part of the supporters, and are not merely an artistic rendering of the compartment. The illustration, which was made from an official drawing supplied from the Herald's College, shows the curious way in which the motto scroll is made to answer the purpose of the compartment. Figure 673. Arms of Cape Town, or, an anchor erect sable, stock proper, from the ring a ribbon flowing azure, and suspended there from an Escokian gules charged with three annulets of the field. And for the crest, on a wreath of the colors, upon the battlements of a tower proper, a trident in Ben Dexter or, surmounted by an anchor and cable in Ben Sinister Sable. Occasionally the compartment itself, as a thing apart from the supporters, receives attention in the blazon, e.g. in the case of the arms of Baron de Worms, which are of foreign origin, recorded in this country by royal warrant. His supporters are, on a bronze compartment, on either side a lion gold, collared and chained or, and pendant from the compartment a golden scroll, thereon in letters gules the motto, Vinctus non Victus. In the royal arms of the United Kingdom the motto, Dieu et mon droit, is required to be on the compartment below the shield, and thereon the union badge of the rose, thistle, and shamrock engrafted on the same stem. The city of Norwich is not officially recognized as having the right to supporters, and doubtless those in use have originated in the old artistic custom, previously referred to, of putting escutcheons of arms under the guardianship of angels. They may be so deciphered upon an old stone carving upon one of the municipal buildings in that city. The result has been that two angels have been regularly adopted as the heraldic supporters of the city arms. The point that renders them worthy of notice is that they are invariably represented each standing upon its own little pile of clouds. The arms of the Royal Burg of Montrose, Forfarshire, afford an official instance of another variety in the way of a compartment, which is a fixed matter of blazon and not depending upon artistic fancy. The entry in Lion Register is as follows. The Royal Burg of Montrose gives for ensigns armorial, argent, a rose gules. The shield adorned with helmet, mantling, and wreath suitable thereto. And for a crest, a hand issuing from a cloud and reaching down a garland of roses proper, supported by two mermaids erisying from the sea proper. The motto, Mer ditat rosa decorat. And for a rever, gules, st. Peter on the cross proper, with the keys hanging at his girdle or. Which arms, and, ext December 16, 1694. An English example may be found in the case of the arms of Boston, which are depicted with the supporters, again two mermaids, rising from the sea. Though to what extent the sea is a fixed and unchangeable part of the achievement in this case is less a matter of certainty. Probably of all the curious supporters to be found in British armory, those of the city of Southampton, plate 7, must be admitted to be the most unusual. As far as the actual usage of the arms by the corporation is concerned, one seldom if ever sees more than the simple shield employed. This bears the arms, profess gules and argent, three roses counterchanged. But in the official record of the arms in one of the visitation books a crest is added, namely, upon a mount vert, a double tower or, and issuing from the upper battlements thereof a demi-female affront proper, vested purper. Crined and crowned with an eastern coronet also or, holding in her dexter hand a sword erect point upwards argent, pommel and hilt of the second, and in her sinister hand a balance sable, the pan's gold. The shield in the visitation book rests upon a mount vert, issuing from waves of the sea, and thereupon placed on either side of the escutcheon a ship of two masts at anchor, the sails furled all proper, the round top or. And from each masthead flying a banner of a sea. George, and upon the stern of each vessel a lion rampant or, supporting the escutcheon. From the fact that in England the compartment is so much a matter of course, it is scarcely ever alluded to, and the term, compartment, is practically one peculiar to Scottish heraldry. It does not appear to be a very ancient heraldic appendage, 
and was probably found to be a convenient arrangement when shields were depicted erect instead of kush, so as to supply a resting place, or standpoint, for the supporters. In a few instances the compartment appears on seals with kush shields, on which, however, the supporters are usually represented as resting on the sides of the escutcheon, and bearing up the helmet and crest, as already mentioned. Sir George Mackenzie conjectures that the compartment represents the bearer's land and territories, though sometimes, he adds, it is bestowed in recompense of some honourable action. Thus the earls of Douglas are said to have obtained the privilege of placing their supporters with a pail of wood wreathed, because the doughty lord, in the reign of King Robert the Bruce, defeated the English in Jedburgh Forest. And, caused wreath and impale, during the night, that part of the wood by which he conjectured they might make their escape. Such a fence compartment appears on the seal of James Douglas, 2nd Earl of Angus, Dominus de Abernethy et Jedworth Forest, 1434, on that of George Douglas, 4th Earl, 1459. And also on those of several of his successors in the earldom, 1511-1617. A still earlier example, however, of a compartment representing a park with trees, and, enclosed by a wattled fence, occurs on the seal of Walter Stewart, Earl of Athol, c. 1430, where the escutcheon is placed in the entrance to the park between two trees. Nisbet refers to a seal of William, 1st Earl of Douglas, 1377, exhibiting a single supporter, a lion, sitting on a compartment like to a rising ground, with a tree growing out of it, and semi of hearts, mullets, and cross crosslets. These being the charges of Douglas and Marr in the escutcheon. According to Sir George Mackenzie, these compartments were usually allowed only to sovereign princes. And he further informs us that, besides the Douglases, he knows of no other subject in Britain, except the Earl of Perth, whose arms stand upon a compartment. In the case of the Perth family, the compartment consists of a green hill or mount, some of cal traps, or cheval traps, with the relative motto, gang warily, above the achievement. Albeit of late, says Mackenzie, compartments are become more common, and some families in Scotland have some creatures upon which their achievement stands, as the Laird of Dundas, whose achievement has for many hundreds of years stood upon a salamander in flames proper, a device of the kings of France, and Robertson of Struan has a monstrous man lying under the escutcheon chain, which was given him for his taking the murderer of James I. Such figures, however, as Nisbet remarks, cannot properly be called compartments, having rather the character of devices, while, in the case of the Struan achievement, the chained man would be more accurately described as an honourable supporter. Sir George Mackenzie engraves the coat of Denham of Ould, viz. A stag's head, cabo shed, below a shield couche charged with three lozenges, or fusils, conjoined in bend. In like manner, Nisbet represents the crest and motto of the Scots of Thirlstane, by way of compartment, below the escutcheon of Lord Napier, and a blazing star, with the legend, Lucio Boreal, under that of Captain Robert Seaton. Of the family of Meldrum. While in the case of the illumination which accompanies the latest entry in the first volume of the Lion Register, 1804, relative to the arms of John Hepburn Belshaz of Invermay, the trunk of an oak tree sprouting forth anew is placed on a compartment under the shield, with the motto, Reverescit. Two other instances of regular compartments are mentioned by Nisbet, viz. those carried by the Macfarlands of that ilk and the Ogilvies of Inner Quarity. The former consists of a wavy representation of Loch Sloy, the gathering place of the clan, which word is also inscribed on the compartment as their CRI de guerre or slogan. While the latter is a green hill or rising terrace, on which are placed two serpents, Naud, spouting fire, and the motto, Terina Pericula Sperno. For some of the foregoing instances I am indebted to Seton's well-known Law and Practice of Heraldry in Scotland. Chapter 28 Mottos. To the uninitiated, the subject of the motto of a family has a far greater importance than is conceded to it by those who have spent any time in the study of armory. Perhaps it may clear the ground if the rules presently in force are first recited. It should be carefully observed that the status of the motto is vastly different in England and in other countries. Except in the cases of impersonal arms, and not always then, 
the motto is never mentioned or alluded to in the terms of the patent in a grant of arms in England. Consequently they are not a part of the estate created by the letter's patent, though if it be desired a motto will always be painted below the emblazonment in the margin of the patent. Briefly speaking, the position in England with regard to personal armorial bearings is that mottos are not hereditary. No one is compelled to bear one, nor is any authority needed for the adoption of a motto, the matter is left purely to the personal pleasure of every individual. But if that person elects to use a motto, the officers of arms are perfectly willing to paint any motto he may choose upon his grant, and to add it to the record of his arms in their books. There is no necessity expressed or implied to use a motto at all, nor is the slightest control exercised over the selection or change of mottos, though, as would naturally be expected. The officers of arms would decline to record to any private person any motto which might have been appropriated to the sovereign or to any of the orders of knighthood. In the same way no control is exercised over the position in which the motto is to be carried or the manner in which it is to be displayed. In Scotland, however, the matter is on an entirely different footing. The motto is included within the terms of the patent, and is consequently made the subject of grant. It therefore becomes inalienable and unchangeable without a rematriculation, and a Scottish patent moreover always specifies the position in which the motto is to be carried. This is usually, in an scroll over the same, i.e. over the crest, though occasionally it is stated to be borne on, a compartment below the arms. The matter in Ireland is not quite the same as in either Scotland or England. Sometimes the motto is expressed in the patent, in fact this is now the more usual alternative, but the rule is not universal, and to a certain extent the English permissiveness is recognized. Possibly the subject can be summed up in the remark that if any motto has been granted or is recorded with a particular coat of arms in Ireland, it is expected that that shall be the motto to be made use of therewith. As a general practice the use of mottos in England did not become general until the 18th century, in fact there are very few, if any, grants of an earlier date on which a motto appears. The majority, well on towards the latter part of the 18th century, had no motto added, and many patents are still issued without such an addition. With rare exceptions, no mottos are to be met with in the visitation books, and it does not appear that at the time of the visitations the motto was considered to be essentially a part of the armorial bearings. The one or two exceptions which I have met with where mottos are to be found on visitation pedigrees are in every case the arms of a peer. There are at least two such in the Yorkshire visitation of 1587, and probably it may be taken for granted that the majority of peers at that period had begun to make use of these additions to their arms. Unfortunately we have no exact means of deciding the point, because peers were not compelled to attend a visitation, and there are but few cases in which the arms or pedigree of a peer figure in the visitation books. In isolated cases the use of a motto can, however, be traced back to an even earlier period. There are several instances to be met with upon the early garter plates. Many writers have traced the origin of mottos to the slogan or war cry of battle, and there is no doubt whatever that instances can be found in which an ancient war cry has become a family motto. For example, one can refer to the Fitzgerald, Cromabu, other instances can be found amongst some of the Highland families, but the fact that many well known war cries of ancient days never became perpetuated as mottos. And also the fact that by far the greater number of mottos, even at a much earlier period than the present day, cannot by any possibility have ever been used for or have originated with the purposes of battle cries. Inclines me to believe that such a suggested origin for the motto in general is without adequate foundation. There can be little if any connection between the war cry as such and the motto as such. The real origin would appear to be more correctly traced back to the badge. As will be found explained elsewhere, the badge was some simple device used for personal and household purposes and seldom for war, except by persons who used the badge of the leader they followed. No man wore his own badge in battle. It generally partook of the nature of what ancient writers would term a quaint conceit. And much ingenuity seems to have been expended in devising badges and mottos which should at the same time be distinctive and should equally be or convey an index or suggestion of the name and family of the owner. 
Many of these badges are found in conjunction with words, mottos, and phrases, and as the distinction between the badge in general and the crest in general slowly became less apparent, they eventually in practice became interchangeable devices. If the same device did not happen to be used for both purposes. Consequently the motto from the badge became attached to the crest, and was thence transferred to its present connection with the coat of arms. Just as at the present time a man may and often does adopt a maxim upon which he will model his life, some pithy proverb, or some trite observation, without any question or reference to armorial bearings, so, in the old days. When learning was less diffuse and when proverbs and sayings had a wider acceptance and vogue than at present, did many families and many men adopt for their use some form of words. We find these words carved on furniture, set up on a cornice, cut in stone, and embroidered upon standards and banners, and it is to this custom that we should look for the beginning of the use of mottos. But because such words were afterwards in later generations given an armorial status, it is not justifiable to presume such status for them from their beginnings. The fact that a man put his badges on the standard that he carried into battle, and with his badges placed the mottos that thereto belonged, has led many people mistakenly to believe that these mottos were designed for war cries and for use in battle. That was not the case. In fact it seems more likely that the bulk of the standards recorded in the books of the heralds which show a motto were never carried in battle. With regard to the mottos in use at the moment, some of course can be traced to a remote period, and many of the later ones have interesting legends connected therewith. Of mottos of this character may be instanced that Jour de ma vie of West, which was formerly the motto of the La War family, adopted to commemorate the capture of the King of France at the Battle of Poitiers. There are many other mottos of this character, amongst which may be mentioned the Grip Fast of the Leslies, the origin of which is well known. But though many mottos relate to incidents in the remote past, true or mythical, the motto and the incident are seldom contemporary. Nothing would be gained by a recital of a long list of mottos, but I cannot forbear from quoting certain curious examples which by their very weirdness must excite curiosity as to their origin. A family of Martin used the singular words, he who looks at Martin's ape, Martin's ape shall look at him, whilst the Curzon's use, let Curzon hold what Curzon held. The Cranston motto is still more grasping, being, thou shalt want ere I want. But probably the motto of the Dakins is the most mysterious of all, strike Dakins, the devils in the hemp. The motto of Corbett, Deus Pasic Corvos, evidently alludes to the raven or ravens, Corby crows, upon the shield. The mottos of Trafford, now thus, and, gripe griffin, hold fast, the curious Pilkington motto, Pilkington pale down, the master mows the meadows, and the serve a jugum, of hay have been the foundation of many legends. The Fwimus of the Bruce family is a pathetic allusion to the fact that they were once kings, but the majority of ancient mottos partake rather of the nature of a pun upon the name. Which fact is but an additional argument towards the supposition that the motto has more relation to the badge than to any other part of the armorial bearings. Of mottos which have a punning character may be mentioned Mon Dieu est ma Roche, which is the motto of Roche, Lord Fermoy, Cavendo Tutus, which is the motto of Cavendish, Forte Scutum Salus Ducum, which is the motto of Fortescue. Set on, which is the motto of Seton, the Fydd of Davies, and Vernon Semper Vire, the well-known pun of the Vernons. Another is the apocryphal Quid Rides, which Theodore Hook suggested for the wealthy and retired tobacconist. This punning character has of late obtained much favor, and wherever a name lends itself to a pun the effort seems nowadays to be made that the motto shall be of this nature. Perhaps the best pun which exists is to be found in the motto of the Barnard family, who, with arms, argent, a bear rampant sable, muzzle door, and crest, a demi-bear as in the arms, use for the motto, bear and forbear, or in Latin. As it is sometimes used, fair et perfer. Others that may be alluded to are the, what I win I keep, of win law, the, libertas, of liberty, the, do be crux I be a lux, of Sir William Crooks, the, bear thee well, of Bardwell, the, gare lo pied fort, of Bedford, the, gare la bet, of Garbet and the, cave deus vidit, of cave. Other mottos, and they are a large proportion, 
are of some saintly and religious tendency. However desirable and acceptable they may be, and however accurately they may apply to the first possessor, they sometimes are sadly inappropriate to later and more degenerate successors. In Germany, a distinction appears to be drawn between their Walsbruch, i.e. those which are merely dictated by personal choice, and the armorial mottos which remained constantly and heritably attached to the armorial bearings. Such as the God MIT UNS, God with us, of Prussia and the Nihil Sign Deus, of Hohenzollern. The initial or riddle mottos appear to be peculiar to Germany. Well-known examples of these curiosities are the W G W, i.e. We got will as God wills, or W D W, i.e. We do willst as thou wilt, which are both frequently to be met with. The strange but well-known alphabet or vowel motto A E I O V of the Emperor Frederick III has been variously translated: Aquila electa just omnia vincit. The chosen eagle vanquishes all by right, aller Ehren ist Esterich Volume 50, Austria is full of every honor, or perhaps with more likelihood. Austria is state imperer orb universo, all the earth is subject to Austria. The CRI de guerre, both as a heraldic fact and as an armorial term, is peculiar, and exclusively so, to British and French heraldry. The national CRI de guerre of France, Montjoy Saint Denis, appeared above the pavilion in the old royal arms of France, and probably the English royal motto, Dieu et mon droit, is correctly traced to a similar origin. A distinction is still made in modern heraldry between the CRI de guerre and the motto, inasmuch as it is considered that the former should always of necessity surmount the crest. This is very generally adhered to in Scotland in the cases where both a motto and a CRI de guerre, or, as it is frequently termed in that country, slogan, exist, the motto, contrary to the usual Scottish practice. Being then placed below the shield. It is to be hoped that a general knowledge of this fact will not, however, result in the description of every motto found above a crest as a CRI de guerre. And certainly the concentrated piety now so much in favor in England for the purposes of a motto can be quite fitly left below the shield. Artists do not look kindly on the motto for decorative purposes. It has been usually depicted in heraldic emblazonment in black letters upon a white scroll, tinted and shaded with pink, but with the present revival of heraldic art. It has become more general to paint the motto ribbon in conformity with the color of the field, the letters being often shown thereon in gold. The color and shape of the motto ribbon, however, are governed by no heraldic laws, and except in Scottish examples should be left, as they are purely unimportant accessories of the achievement wholly at the discretion of the artist. Chapter 29. Badges. The exact status of the badge in this country, to which it is peculiar, has been very much misunderstood. This is probably due to the fact that the evolution of the badge was gradual, and that its importance increased unconsciously. Badges do not formerly appear to have ever been made the subjects of grants, and the instances which can be referred to showing their control, or attempted control, by the crown in past times are very rare indeed. As a matter of fact, the crown seems to have perhaps purposely ignored them. They are not, as we know them, found in the earliest times of heraldry, unless we are to presume their existence from early seals, many of which show isolated charges taken from the arms. For if in the cases where such charges appear upon the seals we are to accept those seals as proofs of the contemporary existence of those devices as heraldic badges, we should often be led into strange conclusions. There is no doubt that these isolated devices which are met with were not only a part of the arms, but in many cases the origin of the arms. Devices possessing a more or less personal and possessive character occur in many cases before record of the arms they later developed into can be traced. This will be noticed in relation to the arms of Swinton, to which reference is made elsewhere. If these are badges, then badges go back to an earlier date than arms. Such devices occur many centuries before such a thing as a shield of arms existed. The heraldic badge, as we know it, came into general use about the reign of Edward III. 
That is, the heraldic badge is a separate matter having a distinct existence in addition to concurrent arms, and having at the same time a distinctly heraldic character. But long before that date, badges are found with an allied reference to a particular person, which very possibly are rightly included in any enumeration of badges. Of such a character is the badge of the broom plant, which is found upon the tomb of Geoffrey, Count of Anjou, from which badge the name of the Plantagenet dynasty originated, Plantagenet, by the way, was never a personal surname. But was the name of the dynasty. It is doubtful, however, if at that early period there existed much if indeed any opportunity for the use of heraldic badges. At the same time, as far back as the reign of Richard I. And some writers would take examples of a still more remote period, these badges must have been occasionally depicted upon banners, for Richard I appears to have had a dragon upon one of his banners. These banner decorations, which at a later date have been often accepted as badges, can hardly be quite properly so described, for there are many cases where no other proof of usage can be found. And there is no doubt that many such are instances of no more than banners prepared for specific purposes. And the record of such and such a banner cannot necessarily carry proof that the owner of the banner claimed or used the objects depicted thereupon as personal badges. If they are to be so included some individuals must have reveled in a multitude of badges. But the difficulty in deciding the point very greatly depends upon the definition of the badge. And if we are to take the definition according to the manner of acceptance and usage at the period when the use of badges was greatest, then many of the earliest cannot be taken as coming within the limits. In later Plantagenet days, badges were of considerable importance, and certain characteristics are plainly marked. They were never worn by the owner, in the sense in which he carried his shield, or bore his crest. They were his sign mark indicative of ownership, they were stamped upon his belongings in the same way in which government property is marked with the broad arrow, and they were worn by his servants. They were worn not only by his retainers, but very probably were also worn more or less temporarily by adherents of his party if he were big enough to lead a party in the state. At all times badges had very extensive decorative use. There was never any fixed form for the badge, there was never any fixed manner of usage. I can find no fixed laws of inheritance, no common method of assumption. In fact the use of a badge, in the days when everybody who was anybody possessed arms, was quite subsidiary to the arms, and very much akin to the manner in which nowadays monograms are made use of. At the same time care must be taken to distinguish the badge from the rebus. And also from the temporary devices which we read about as having been so often adopted for the purpose of the tournament when the combatant desired his identity to be concealed. Modern novelists and poets give us plenty of illustrations of the latter kind, but proof of the fact even that they were ever adopted in that form is by no means easy to find. Though their professedly temporary nature of course militates against the likelihood of contemporary record. The rebus had never an heraldic status, and it had seldom more than a temporary existence. A fanciful device adopted, we hear of many such instances, for the temporary purpose of a tournament could generally be so classed, but the rebus proper has some device, usually a pictorial rendering of the name of the person for whom it stood. In such a category would be included printers and mason's marks, but probably the definition of Dr. Johnson of the word rebus, as a word represented by a picture, is as good a definition and description as can be given. The rebus in its nature is a different thing from a badge, and may best be described as a pictorial signature, the most frequent occasion for its use being in architectural surroundings. Where it was constantly introduced as a pun upon some name which it was desired to perpetuate. The best known and perhaps the most typical and characteristic rebus is that of Islip, the builder of part of Westminster Abbey. Here the pictured punning representation of his name had nothing to do with his armorial bearings or personal badge. But the great difficulty, in dealing with both badges and rebuses, is the difficulty of knowing which is which, for very frequently the same or a similar device was used for both purposes. Parker, in his glossary of heraldic terms, gives several typical examples of rebuses which very aptly illustrate their status and meaning. At Lincoln College at Oxford, and on other buildings connected with Thomas Beckington, 
Bishop of Bath and Wells, will be found carved the rebus of a beacon issuing from a ton. This is found in conjunction with the letter T for his Christian name, Thomas. Now this design was not his coat of arms, and was not his crest, nor was it his badge. Another rebus which is found at Canterbury shows an ox and the letters N, E, as the rebus of John Oxney. A rebus which indicates Thomas Coniston, abbot of Cirencesta, which can be found in Gloucester Cathedral, is a comb and a ton, and the printer's mark of Richard Grifton, which is a good example of a rebus and its use, was a tree or graft. Growing on a ton. In none of these cases are the designs mentioned on any part of the arms, crest, or badge of the persons mentioned. Rebuses of this character abound on all our ancient buildings, and their use has lately come very prominently into favor in connection with the many elusive bookplates, the design of which originates in some play upon the name. The words, device, ensign, and cognizance have no definite heraldic meaning, and are used impartially to apply to the crest, the badge, and sometimes to the arms upon the shield, so that they may be eliminated from consideration. There remains therefore the crest and the badge between which to draw a definite line of distinction. The real difference lay in the method of use, though there is usually a difference of form, recognizable by an expert, but difficult to put into words. The crest was the ornament upon the helmet, seldom if ever actually worn, and never used except by the person to whom it belonged. The badge, on the other hand, was never placed upon the helmet, but was worn by the servants and retainers, and was used right and left on the belongings of the owner as a sign of his ownership. So great and extensive at one period was the use of these badges, that they were far more generally employed than either arms or crest. And whilst the knowledge of a man's badge or badges would be everyday knowledge in common repute throughout the kingdom, few people would know that man's crest, fewer still would ever have seen it worn. It is merely an exaggeration of the difficulty that we are always in uncertainty whether any given device was merely a piece of decoration borrowed from the arms or crest, or whether it had continued usage as a badge. In the same way many families who had never used crests, but who had used badges, took the opportunity of the visitations to record their badges as crests. A notable example of the subsequent record of a badge as a crest is met with in the Storton family. Their crest, originally a buck's head, but after the marriage with the heiress of Lemoigny, a demi-monk, can be readily substantiated, as can their badge of the drag or sledge. At one of the visitations, however, a cadet of the Storton family recorded the sledge as a crest. Uncertainty also arises from the lack of precision in the diction employed at all periods, the words badge, device, and crest having so often been used interchangeably. Another difficulty which is met with in regard to badges is that, with the exception of the extensive records of the royal badges and some other more or less informal lists of badges of the principal personages at different periods. Badges were never a subject of official record, and whilst it is difficult to determine the initial point as to whether any particular device is a badge or not, the difficulty of deducing rules concerning badges becomes practically impossible. And after most careful consideration I have come to the conclusion that there were never any hard and fast rules relating to badges, that they were originally and were allowed to remain matters of personal fancy. And that although well-known cases can be found where the same badge has been used generation after generation, those cases may perhaps be the exception rather than the rule. Badges should be considered and accepted in the general run as not being matters of permanence, and as of little importance except during the time from about the reign of Edward III to about the reign of Henry VIII. Their principal use upon the clothes of the retainers came to an end by the creation of the standing army, the beginning of which can be traced to the reign of Henry VIII. And as badges never had any ceremonial use to perpetuate their status, their importance almost ceased altogether at that period except as regards the royal family. Speaking broadly, regularized and recorded heraldic control as a matter of operative fact dates little if any further back than the end of the reign of Henry VIII. Consequently badges originally do not appear to have been taken much cognizance of by the heralds. Their actual use from that period onwards rapidly declined, and hence the absence of record. 
Though the use of badges has become very restricted, there are still one or two occasions on which badges are used as badges, in the style formerly in vogue. Perhaps the case which is most familiar is the broad arrow which is used to mark government stores. It is a curious commentary upon heraldic officialdom and its ways that though this is the only badge which has really any extensive use, it is not a crown badge in any degree. Although this origin has been disputed it is said to have originated in the fact that one of the Sydney family, when master of the ordnance, to prevent disputes as to the stores for which he was responsible, marked everything with his private badge of the broad arrow, and this private badge has since remained in constant use. One wonders at what date the officers of His Majesty will observe that this has become one of His Majesty's recognized badges, and will include it with the other royal badges in the warrants in which they are recited. Already more than two centuries have passed since it first came into use, and either they should represent to the government that the Fian is not a crown mark, and that some recognized royal badge should be used in its place. Or else they should place its status upon a definite footing. Another instance of a badge used at the present day in the ancient manner is the conjoined rose, thistle, and shamrock which is embroidered front and back upon the tunics of the beefeaters and the yeomen of the guard. The crowned harps which are worn by the Royal Irish Constabulary are another instance of the kind, but though a certain number of badges are recited in the warrant each time any alteration or declaration of the royal arms occurs. Their use has now become very limited. Present badges are the crowned rose for England, the crowned thistle for Scotland, and the crowned trefoil and the crowned harp for Ireland. Whilst for the Union there is the conjoined rose, thistle, and shamrock under the crown, and the crown shield which carries the device of the Union Jack. The badge of Wales, which has existed for long enough, is the uncrowned dragon upon a mount vert, and the crown ciphers, one within and one without the garter, are also depicted upon the warrant. These badges, which appear on the sovereign's warrant, are never assigned to any other member of the royal family, of whom the Prince of Wales is the only one who rejoices in the possession of officially assigned badges. The badge of the eldest son of the sovereign, as such, and not as Prince of Wales, is the plume of three ostrich feathers, and filled with the circlet from his coronet. Recently an additional badge, on a mount vert, a dragon passant gules, charged on the shoulder with a label of three points argent, has been assigned to His Royal Highness. This action was taken with the desire to in some way gratify the forcibly expressed wishes of Wales, and it is probable that, the precedent having been set, it will be assigned to all those who may bear the title of Prince of Wales in future. The only instances I am personally aware of in which a real badge of ancient origin is still worn by the servants are the cases of the state liveries of the Earl of Yarborough, whose servants were an embroidered buckle. And of Lord Mowbray and Storton, whose servants were an embroidered sledge. The family of Daubeny of Coat still bear the old Daubeny badge of the pair of bat's wings, Lord Stafford still uses his Stafford knot. I believe the servants of Lord Bray still wear the badge of the hempbrake, and those of the Earl of Loudon were the Hastings Monch, and doubtless there are a few other instances. When the old families were becoming greatly reduced in number, and the nobility and the upper classes were being recruited from families of later origin, the wearing of badges, like so much else connected with heraldry, became lax in its practice. The servants of all the great nobles in ancient days appear to have worn the badges of their masters in a manner similar to the use of the royal badge by the yeomen of the guard, although sometimes the badge was embroidered upon the sleeve. And the wearing of the badge by the retainers is the chief and principal use to which badges were anciently put. Nisbet alludes on this point to a paragraph from the Act for the Order of the Riding of Parliament in 1681, which says that, the noblemen's lackeys may have over their liveries velvet coats with their badges, i.e. their crests and mottoes done on plate, or embroidered on the back and breast conform to ancient custom. A curious survival of these plates is to be found in the large silver plaques worn by so many bank messengers. Badges appear, however, to have been frequently depicted semé upon the lambrequins of armorial achievements, as will be seen from many of the old garter plates. But here, again, it is not always easy to distinguish between definite badges and artistic decoration, nor between actual badges in use and mere appropriately selected charges from the shield. 
The Waterbouges of Lord Berners, the knot of Lord Stafford, popularly known as the Stafford Knot, the Harrington Fret, the Ragged Staff or the Bear and the Ragged Staff of Lord Warwick, this being really a conjunction of two separate devices. The Rose of England, the Thistle of Scotland, and the Sledge of Storton, the hemp rake of Lord Bray wherever met with are readily recognized as badges, but there are many badges which it is difficult to distinguish from crests. And even some which in all respects would appear to be more correctly regarded as coats of arms. It is a point worthy of consideration whether or not a badge needs a background. Here, again, it is a matter most difficult to determine, but it is singular that in any matter of record the badge is almost invariably depicted upon a background, either of a standard or a mantling, or upon the field of a roundel. And it may well be that their use in such circumstances as the two cases first mentioned may have only been considered correct and the color of the mantling or the standard happened to be the right color for the background of the badge. Badges are most usually met with in stained glass upon roundels of some color or colors, and though one would hesitate to assert it as an actual fact. There are many instances which would lead one to suppose that the background of a badge was usually the livery color or colors of its then owner, or of the family from which it was originally inherited. Certain is it that there are very few contemporary instances of badges which, when emblazoned, are not upon the known livery colors. And if this fact be accepted, then one is perhaps justified in assuming all to be livery colors, and we get at once a ready explanation on several points which have long puzzled antiquaries. The name of Edward, the Black Prince, has often been a matter of discussion, and the children's history books tell us that the nickname originated from the color of his armor. This may be true enough, but as most armor would be black when it was unpolished, and as most armor was either polished or dull, the probabilities are not very greatly in its favor. Though there can be found instances, it was not a usual custom for anyone to paint his armor red or green. Even if the armor of the prince were enameled black it would be so usually hidden by his surcoat that he is hardly likely to have been nicknamed from it. It seems to me far more probable that black was the livery color of the black prince, and that his own retainers and followers wore the livery of black. If that were the case, one understands at once how he would obtain the nickname. The nickname is doubtless contemporary. A curious confirmation of my supposition is met with in the fact that his shield for peace was, sable, three ostrich feathers two and one, the quill of each passing through a scroll argent. There we get the undoubted badge of the ostrich feather, which was originally born singly, depicted upon his livery color, black. The badges represented in Prince Arthur's book in the College of Arms, an important source of our knowledge upon the subject, are all upon backgrounds. And the curious divisions of the colors on the backgrounds would seem to show that each badge had its own background, several badges being only met with upon the same ground when that happens to be the true background belonging to them. But in attempting to deduce rules, it should be remembered that in all and every armorial matter there was greater laxity of rule at the period of the actual use of arms as a reality of life than it was possible to permit when the multiplication of arms as paper insignia made regulation necessary and more restrictive. So that an occasional variation from any deduction need not necessarily vitiate the conclusion, even in a matter exclusively relating to the shield. How much more, then, must we remain in doubt when dealing with badges which appear to have been so largely a matter of personal caprice. It is a striking comment that of all the badges presently to be referred to of the Stafford family, each single one is depicted upon a background. It is a noticeable fact that of the eighteen badges exemplified as belonging to the family of Stafford, nine are upon party-colored fields. This is not an unreasonable proportion if the fields are considered to be the livery colors of the families from whom the badges were originally derived. But it is altogether out of proportion to the number of shields in any roll of arms which would have the field party per pale, or party in any other form of division. With the exception of the second badge, which is on a striped background of green and white, all the party backgrounds are party per pale which was the most usual way of depicting a livery in the few records which have come down to us of the heraldic use of livery colors, and of the eighteen badges. No less than eight are upon a party-colored field of which the dexter is sable and the sinister gules. Scarlet and black are known to have been the livery colors of Edward Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, 
who was beheaded in 1521. The arms of the town of Buckingham are on a field per pale sable and gules. With regard to the descent of badges and the laws which govern their descent still less is known. The answer to the question, how did badges descend, is simple, nobody knows. One can only hazard opinions more or less pious, of more or less value. It is distinctly a point upon which it is risky to be dogmatic, and we must wait for the development which will follow the recent revival of the granting of standards. As cases occur for decision precedents will be found and disclosed. Whilst the secrecy of the records of the College of Arms is so jealously preserved it is impossible to speak definitely at present. For an exact and comprehensive knowledge of exact and authoritative instances of fact is necessary before a decision can be definitely put forward. Unless some officer of arms will carefully collate the information which can be gleaned from the records in the College of Arms which are relevant to the subject, it does not seem likely that our knowledge will advance greatly. The grant of supporters to the Earl of Stafford, as under, is worthy of attention. To all and singular to whom these presents shall come, John Anstis Esker Garter Principal King of Arms, sends greeting, whereas His Late Majesty King James II by letters patents under the Great Seal. Did create Henry Stafford Howard to be Earl of Stafford, to have and hold the same to him and the heirs males of his body. And for default thereof to John and Francis his brothers and the heirs males of their bodies respectively, whereby the said earldom is now legally vested in the right honble William Stafford Howard son and heir of the said John. And in regard that ye said Henry late Earl of Stafford omitted to take any grant of supporters, which the peers of this realm have an indisputable right to use and bear. The Right Honourable Henry Bowes Howard Earl of Berkshire Deputy, with the royal approbation, of His Grace Thomas Howard Duke of Norfolk Earl Marshal and Hereditary Marshal of England hath been pleased to direct me to grant to the said Right Honourable William Stafford Howard Earl of Stafford the supporters formerly granted to ye late Viscount Stafford. Grandfather to the said Earl. As also to order me to cause to be depicted in the margin of my said grant ye arms of Thomas of Woodstock Duke of Gloucester quartered with the arms of the said Earl of Stafford. Together with the badges of the said noble family of Stafford, now these presents witness that according to the consent of the said Earl of Berkshire signified under his lordship's hand and seal I do by the authority and power annexed to my office hereby grant and assign to ye said right honourable William Stafford Howard Earl of Stafford. The following supporters which were heretofore borne by the late Lord Viscount Stafford, that is to say, on the dexter side a lion argent. And on the sinister side a swan sir giant argent gorged with a ducal coronet per pale gules and sable beaked and membered of the second. To be used and borne at all times and upon all occasions by the said Earl of Stafford and the heirs males of his body. And such persons to whom the said earldom shall descend according to the law and practice of arms without the let or interruption of any person or persons whatsoever. And in pursuance of the warrant of the said Earl of Berkshire, the arms of Thomas of Woodstock Duke of Gloucester, as the same are on a plate remaining in the chapel of St. George within ye castle of Windsor. Set up there for his descendant the Duke of Buckingham are depicted in the margin, and quartered in such place and manner as the same were formerly borne by the Stafford's Dukes of Buckingham. Together with eighteen badges belonging to the said most ancient and illustrious family of Stafford, as the same are represented in a manuscript remaining in the College of Arms, Fig. 674, in witness whereof I the said garter have hereto subscribed my name and affixed the seal of my office this first day of August Anno Domini 1720. John Anstis Garter Principal King of Arms. Figure 674. The Stafford badges as exemplified in 1720 to William Stafford Howard, Earl of Stafford. It may be of interest to call attention to the fact that in this exemplification the royal arms are displayed before those of Stafford. On the face of it, the document, as far as it relates to the badges, is no more than a certificate or exemplification, in which case it is undoubted evidence that badges descend to the air general as due quarterings. But there is the possibility that the document is a regrant in the nature of an exemplification following a royal license, or a regrant to remove uncertainty as to the attainder. And if the document, as far as its relation to the badges goes, has any of the character of a grant, it can have but little value as evidence of the descent of badges. 
It is remarkable that it is absolutely silent as to the future destination of the badges. The real fact is that the whole subject of the descent and devolution of badges is shrouded in mystery. Each of the badges, Fig. 674, is depicted within a circle adorned with a succession of Stafford knots, as is shown in the one instance at the head. Five of these badges appear upon a well-known portrait of Edward, Duke of Buckingham. The fact that some of these badges are really crests depicted upon wreaths goes far as an authority for the use of a crest upon livery buttons for the purposes of a badge. In ancient days all records seem to point to the fact that badges were personal, and that though they were worn by the retainers, they were the property of the head of the family, rather than, as the arms, of the whole family. And though the information available is meager to the last degree, it would appear probable that in all cases where their use by other members of the family than the head of the house can be proved. The likelihood is that the cadets would render feudal service and would wear the badge as retainers of the man whose standard they followed into battle, so that we should expect to find the badge following the same descent as the peerage. Together with the lands and liabilities which accompanied it. This undoubtedly makes for the inheritance of a badge upon the same line of descent as a barony by writ, and such a method of inheritance accounts for the known descent of most of the badges heraldically familiar to us. Probably we shall be right in so accepting it as the ancient rule of inheritance. But, on the other hand, a careful examination of the Book of Standards, now preserved in the College of Arms, provides several examples charged with marks of cadency. But here again one is in ignorance whether this is an admission of inheritance by cadets, or whether the cases should be considered as grants of different versions to cadets. This then gives us the badge, the property in and of which would descend to the heir general, and perhaps also to cadets, whilst it would be used, if there were no inherited right, in token of allegiance or service, actual, quasi-actual, or sentimental, by the cadets of the house and their servants. For whilst the use of the cockade is a survival of the right to be waited on and served by a soldier servant, the use of a badge by a cadet may be a survival and reminder of the day when, until they married heiresses and continued or founded other families, the cadets of a house owed and gave military service to the head of their own family. And in return were supported by him. From the wording of the recent grants of badges I believe the intention, however, is that the badge is to descend of right to all of those people on whom a right to it would devolve if it were a quartering. The use of badges having been so limited, the absence of rule and regulation leaves it very much a matter of personal taste how badges, where they exist, shall be heraldically depicted. And perhaps it is better to leave their manner of display to artistic requirements. The most usual place, when depicted in conjunction with an achievement, is on either side of the crest, and they may well be placed in that position. Where they exist, however, they ought undoubtedly to be continued in use upon the liveries of the servants, and the present practice is for them to be placed on the livery buttons, and embroidered upon the epaulets or on the sleeves of state liveries. Undoubtedly the former practice of placing the badge upon the servant's livery is the precursor of the present vogue of placing crests upon livery buttons. And many heraldic writers complain of the impropriety of placing the crest in such a position. I am not sure that I myself may not have been guilty in this way. But when one bears in mind the number of cases in which the badge and the crest are identical, and when, as in the above instance, devices which are undoubtedly crests are exemplified as and termed badges. Even as such being represented upon wreaths, and even in that form granted upon standards, whilst in other cases the action has been the reverse, it leaves one under the necessity of being careful in making definite assertions. Having dealt with the laws, if there ever were any, and the practice concerning the use and display of badges in former days, it will be of interest to notice some of those which were anciently in use. I have already referred to the badge of the ostrich feathers, now borne exclusively by the heir apparent to the throne. The old legend that the Black Prince won the badge at the Battle of Cressy by the capture of John, King of Bohemia, together with the motto, Itch Dain, has been long since exploded. Sir Harris Nicholas brought to notice the fact that among certain pieces of plate belonging to Queen Philippa of Hainaut was a large silver gilt dish enameled with a black escutcheon with ostrich feathers, vo scutch negro companies de ostrich. 
and upon the strength of that, suggested that the ostrich feather was probably originally a badge of the Counts of Hainaut derived from the County of Ostrovos, a title which was held by their eldest sons. The suggestion in itself seems probable enough and may be correct, but it would not account for the use of the ostrich feathers by the Mowbray family, who did not descend from the marriage of Edward III. And Philippa of Hainaut. Contemporary proof of the use of badges is often difficult to find. The Mowbrays had many badges, and certainly do not appear to have made any very extensive use of the ostrich feathers. But there seems to be very definite authority for the existence of the badge. There is in one of the records of the College of Arms, R. 22, 67, which is itself a copy of another record, the following statement. The descent of Mowbray written at length in Latin from the Abbey Book of Newborough wherein rich too gay to Thomas Duke of North. And Earl Marshal the arms of St. Edward Confessor entice words. E. Dedit item tomi ad pretandum in sigillo et vexillo quo arma sti Edwardi. It circo arma by portata port of it sil, t si Edwardi e domini marshalis anglii cum duobus peni stricionis erectus e super crestum leonum et duo parva scuta cum leonibus et utrac, parto predictorum armorum. Figure 675. The arms granted by King Richard II. To Thomas de Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, and showing the ostrich feather badges. Accompanying this is a rough trick sketch of the arms upon which the illustration, figure 675, has been based. Below this extract in the college records is written in another hand, I find this then in ye chancel window of Effingham by Bungay in the top of the cot window with Mowbray and Segrave on the side in glass there. Who the writer was I am unaware. He appends a further sketch to his note, which slightly differs. No helmet or crest is shown, and the central shield has only the arms of Brotherton. The feathers which flank it are both enfilled below the shield by one coronet. Of the smaller shields at the side, the dexter bears the arms of Mowbray and the sinister those of Segrave. Possibly the Mowbrays, as recognized members of the royal family, bore the badge by subsequent grant and authorization and not on the simple basis of inheritance. An ostrich feather piercing a scroll was certainly the favorite badge of the Black Prince and so appears on several of his seals, and triplicate it occurs on his Shield of Peace, Fig. 478, which, set up under the instructions in his will, still remains on his monument in Canterbury Cathedral. The arms of Sir Roger de Clarendon, the illegitimate son of the Black Prince, were derived from this Shield for Peace, which I take it was not really a coat of arms at all but merely the badge of the prince depicted upon his livery color, and which might equally have been displayed upon a roundel. In the form of a shield bearing three feathers the badge occurs on the obverse of the second seal of Henry IV. In 1411, a single ostrich feather with the motto, Ich Dain, upon the scroll is to be seen on the seal of Edward, Duke of York, who was killed at the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. Henry IV. As Duke of Lancaster placed on either side of his escutcheon an ostrich feather with a garter or belt carrying the motto, Sovereign, twined around the feather, John of Gaunt used the badge with a chain laid along the quill, and Thomas. Duke of Gloucester, used it with a garter and buckle instead of the chain. Whilst John Beaufort, Duke of Somerset, placed an ostrich feather on each side of his shield, the quills in his case being Compony Argent and Azure, like the boy around his arms. Figure 676. Seal of King James II. For the Duchy of Lancaster. There is a note in Harl. MS 304, Folio 12, which, if it be strictly accurate, is of some importance. It is to the effect that the feather silver with the pen gold is the king's, the ostrich feather pen and all silver is the prince's, i.e. The Prince of Wales, and the ostrich feather gold the pen ermine is the Duke of Lancaster's. That statement evidently relates to a time when the three were in existence contemporaneously, i.e. before the accession of Henry IV. In the reign of Richard II. There was no Prince of Wales. During the reign of Edward III. From 1376 onwards, Richard, afterwards Richard II, was Prince of Wales, and John of Gaunt was Duke of Lancaster, so cr. 1362. 
But John of Gaunt used the feather in the form above stated, and to find the Duke of Lancaster before John of Gaunt we must go back to before 1360, when we have Edward III. As king, the Black Prince as prince, and Henry of Lancaster, father-in-law of John of Gaunt, as Duke of Lancaster. He derived from Henry III, and like the Mowbrays had no blood descent from Philippa of Hainaut. A curious confirmation of my suggestion that black was the livery color of the Black Prince is found in the fact that there was in a window in St. Dunstan's Church, London, within a wreath of roses a roundel per pale sanguine and azure, these being unquestionably livery colors, a plume of ostrich feathers argent, quill door, enfilled by a scroll bearing the words, Ich Dain. Above was the prince's coronet and the letters E and P, one on each side of the plume. This was intended for Edward VI, doubtless being erected in the reign of Henry VIII. The badge in the form in which we know it, i.e. Enfilled by the princely coronet, dates from about the beginning of the Stuart dynasty, since when it appears to have been exclusively reserved for the eldest son and heir apparent to the throne. At the same time the right to the display of the badge would appear to have been reserved by the sovereign, and Woodward remarks. On the privy seals of our sovereigns the ostrich feather is still employed as a badge. The shield of arms is usually placed between two lions siegeant guardant adderst, each holding the feather. On the privy seal of Henry VIII. The feathers are used without the lions, and this was the case on the majority of the seals of the Duchy of Lancaster. On the reverse of the present seal of the duchy the feathers appear to be ermine. Figure 678. Badge of Edward IV. Figure 677. Badge of King Henry II. Figure 676 shows the seal of James II. For the Duchy of Lancaster. The seal of the Lancashire County Council shows a shield supported by two Talbot Segent Adderst, each supporting in the exterior paw an ostrich feather Semetalis. It is possible that the Talbots may be intended for lions and the fleurs de lys for ermine spots. The silver swan, one of the badges of King Henry V, was used also by Henry IV. It was derived from the de Bohuns, Mary de Bohun being the wife of Henry IV. From the de Bohuns it has been traced to the Mandevilles, earls of Essex, who may have adopted it to typify their descent from Adam Fitzswan, Temp. Conquest. Fig. 33 on the same plate is the white heart of Richard II. Although some have traced this badge from the white hind used as a badge by Joan, the fair maid of Kent, the mother of Richard II, it is probably a device punning upon his name, Rich Heart. Richard II. Was not the heir of his mother. The heir was his half-brother, Thomas Holland, Earl of Kent, who did use the badge of the hind, and perhaps the real truth is that the Earl of Kent having the better claim to the hind. Richard was under the necessity of making an alteration which the obvious pun upon his name suggested. There is no doubt that the crest of Ireland originated therefrom. The stag in this case was undoubtedly lodged in the earliest versions, and I have been much interested in tracing the steps by which the springing attitude has developed owing to the copying of badly drawn examples. Amongst the many royal and other badges in this country there are some of considerable interest. Figure 677 represents the famous badge of the Broomcod, or Plantagenista, from which the name of the dynasty was derived. It appears to have been first used by King Henry II, though it figures in the decoration of the tomb of Geoffrey, Count of Anjou. Peascod Street in Windsor of course derives its name therefrom. The well-known badges of the White and Red Roses of York and Lancaster have been already referred to, and Figure 678, the well-known device of the Rose and Soliel, used by King Edward IV, was really a combination of two distinct badges, viz. The Blazing Sun of York and the White Rose of York. The rose again appears in 679, here demediated with the pomegranate of Catherine of Aragon. This is taken from the famous tournament roll, now in the College of Arms, which relates to the tournament, 13th and 14th of February, 1510, to celebrate the birth of Prince Henry. Figure 679. Compound badge of Henry VIII. And Catherine of Aragon. From the Westminster Tournament Roll. Figure 681. Two badges of Henry VII, viz. 
the sunburst, and the crown portcullis. Figure 680. Badge of Richard I. Richard I, John, and Henry III. Are all said to have used the device of the crescent and star, figure 680. Henry VII. Is best known by his two badges of the crown portcullis and the sunburst, figure 681. The suggested origin of the former, that it was a pun on the name Tudor, i.e. Tudor, is confirmed by the motto Altera Securitas, which was used with it, but at the same time is rather vitiated by the fact that it was also used by the Beauforts, who had no Tudor descent. Save a very tentative remark hazarded by Woodward, no explanation has as yet been suggested for the sunburst. My own strong conviction, based on the fact that this particular badge was principally used by Henry VII, who was always known as Henry of Windsor, is that it is nothing more than an attempt to pictorially represent the name Windsor by depicting winds of or. The badge is also attributed to Edward III, and he, like Henry VII, made his principal residence at Windsor. Edward IV also used the White Lion of March, whence is derived the shield of Ludlow, Azure, a lion couchant guardant, between three roses argent, Ludlow being one of the fortified towns in the Welsh marches, and the Black Bull which, though often termed of Clarence, is generally associated with the Duchy of Cornwall. Richard III, as Duke of Gloucester, used a white boar. The Earl of Northumberland used a silver crescent, the Earl of Douglas, a red heart, the Earl of Pembroke, a golden packhorse with collar and traces. Lord Hastings bore as badge a black bull's head erased, gorged with a coronet, Lord Stanley, a golden griffin's leg, erased, Lord Howard, a white lion charged on the shoulder with a blue crescent. Sir Richard Dunstable adopted a white cock as a badge, Sir John Savage, a silver unicorn's head erased, Sir Simon Montford, a golden lily, Sir William Gresham, a green grasshopper. Figure 682. Badge of the Duke of Suffolk. Figure 683. Badge of Thomas Howard, Duke of Norfolk. Figure 684. Stafford Knot. Figure 685. Wake or Ormond Knot. Figure 686. Borsia Knot. Figure 687. Hanege Knot. Two curious badges are to be seen in figures 682 and 683. The former is an ape's clog argent, chained or, and was used by William de la Pole, Duke of Suffolk, died in 1450. Figure 683, a sailet silver, M.S. Call of Arms, 2nd M. 16, is the badge of Thomas Howard, Duke of Norfolk, died in 1524. Various families used knots of different design, of which the best known is the Stafford Knot, figure 684. The wholesale and improper appropriation of this badge with a territorial application has unfortunately caused it to be very generally referred to as a Staffordshire Knot. And that it was the personal badge of the Lord Stafford is too often overlooked. Other badge knots are the Wake or Ormond Knot, figure 685, the Borsia Knot, figure 686, and the Hanege Knot, figure 687. The personal badges of the members of the royal family continued in use until the reign of Queen Anne, but from that time forward the royal badges obtained a territorial character. The Rose of England, the Thistle of Scotland, and the Shamrock of Ireland. To these popular consent has added the Lotus Flower for India, the Maple for Canada, and in a lesser degree the Wattle or Mimosa for Australia. But at present these lack any official confirmation. The two first named, nevertheless, figured on the coronation invitation cards. Chapter 30 Heraldic Flags, Banners, and Standards When it comes to the display of flags, the British-born individual usually makes a hash of the whole business, and flies either the sovereign's personal coat of arms, which really should only be made use of over a residence of the sovereign when the sovereign is actually there, or flown at sea when the sovereign is on board. Or else he uses the national flag, colloquially termed the Union Jack, which, strictly speaking, and as a matter of law, ought never to be made use of on land except over the residence of the sovereign in his absence. Or on a fortress or other government building. 
but recently an official answer has been given in Parliament, declaring what is presumably the pleasure of His Majesty to the effect that the Union Jack is the national flag, and may be flown as such on land by any British subject. If this is the intention of the Crown, it is a pity that this permission has not been embodied in a royal warrant. The banner of St. George, which is a white flag with a plain red cross of ST. George throughout, is now appropriated to the Order of the Garter, of which ST. George is the patron saint, though I am by no means inclined to assert that it would be incorrect to make use of it upon a church which happened to be specifically placed under the patronage of St. George. The white ensign, which is a white flag bearing the cross of ST. George and in the upper quarter next to the staff or reproduction of the Union device, belongs to the Royal Navy, and certain privileged individuals to whom the right has been given by a specific warrant. The blue ensign, which is a plain blue flag with the Union device on a canton in the upper corner next to the staff, belongs to the Royal Naval Reserve. And the red ensign, which is the same as the former, except that a red flag is substituted for the blue one, belongs to the ships of the merchant service. These three flags have been specifically called into being by specific warrants for certain purposes which are stated in these warrants, and these purposes being wholly connected with the sea, neither the blue, the red, nor the white ensign ought to be hoisted on land by anybody. Of course there is no penalty for doing so on land, though very drastic penalties can be enforced for misuse of these ensigns on the water, a step which is taken frequently enough. For a private person to use any one of these three flags on land for a private purpose. The only analogy which I can suggest to bring home to people the absurdity of such action would be to instance a private person for his own private pleasure adopting the exact uniform of some regiment whenever he might feel inclined to go bathing in the sea. If he were to do so, he would find under the recent act that he had incurred the penalty, which would be promptly enforced, for bringing His Majesty's uniform into disrepute. It is much to be wished that the penalties exacted for the wrongful display of these flags at sea should be extended to their abuse on shore. The development of the Union Jack and the warrants relating to it are dealt with herein by the Rev. J. R. Crawford, M.A. In a subsequent chapter, and I do not propose to further deal with the point, except to draw attention to a proposal, which is very often mooted, that some change or addition to the Union Jack should be made to typify the inclusion of the colonies. But to begin with, what is the Union Jack? Probably most would be inclined to answer, the flag of the empire. It is nothing of the kind. It is in a way stretching the definition to describe it as the king's flag. Certainly the design of interlaced crosses is a badge of the king's, but that badge is of a later origin than the flag. The flag itself is the fighting emblem of the sovereign, which the sovereign has declared shall be used by his soldiers or sailors for fighting purposes under certain specified circumstances. That it is used, even officially, in all sorts of circumstances with which the king's warrants are not concerned is beside the matter, for it is to the royal warrants that one must refer for the theory of the thing. Now let us go further back and trace the argent, across gules, the part which is England's contribution to the Union Jack, which itself is a combination of the crosses of St. George, St. Andrew, and St. Patrick. The theory of one is the theory of the three, separately or conjoined. Argent, a cross gules, was never the coat of arms of England, except under the Commonwealth, when its use for armorial purposes may certainly be disregarded. And the reason it came to be regarded as the flag of England is simply and solely because fighting was always done under the supposed patronage of some saint, and England fought, not under the arms of England, but under the flag of St. George, the patron saint of England and of the Order of the Garter. The battle cry, St. George for Merry England, is too well known to need more than the passing mention. Scotland fought under St. Andrew. Ireland, by a similar analogy, had for its patron Saint St. Patrick, if indeed there was a cross of St. Patrick before one was needed for the Union flag, which is a very doubtful point, and the Union Jack was not the combination of three territorial flags, but the combination of the recognized emblems of the three recognized saints. And though England claimed the sovereignty of France, and for that reason quartered the arms of France, no Englishman bothered about the patronage of St. 
Dennis, and the emblem of St. Dennis was never flown in this country. The fact that no change was ever made in the flag to typify Hanover, whilst Hanover duly had its place upon the arms, proves that the flag was recognized to be, and allowed to remain. The emblem of the three patron saints under whose patronage the British fought, and not the badge of any sovereignty or territorial area. If the colonies had already any saint of their own under whose patronage they had fought in bygone days, or in whose name they wished to fight in the future. There might be reason for including the emblem of that saint upon the fighting flag of the empire. But they have no recognized saintly patrons, and they may just as well fight for our saints as choose others for themselves at so late a day. But having a flag which is a combination of the emblems of three saints, and which contains nothing that is not a part of those emblems, to make any addition heraldic or otherwise to it now would, in my opinion, be best expressed by the following illustration. Imagine three soldiers in full and complete uniform, one English, one Scottish, and one Irish, it being desired to evolve a uniform that should be taken from all three for use by a Union regiment. A tunic from one, trousers from another, and a helmet from a third, might be blended into a very effective and harmonious composite uniform. Following the analogy of putting a boyer, which is not the emblem of a saint, round the recognized emblems of the three recognized saints, and considering it to be in keeping because the boyer was heraldic and the emblems heraldic. One might argue, that because a uniform was clothing as was also a ballet dancer's skirt, therefore a ballet dancer's skirt outside the whole would be in keeping with the rest of the uniform. For myself I should dislike any addition to the union device, as much as we should deride the donning of tool skirts outside their tunics and trousers by the brigade of guards. The flag which should float from a church tower should have no more on it than the recognized ecclesiastical emblems of the saint to whom it is dedicated, the keys of St. Peter, the wheel of St. Catherine, the sword of St. Paul, the cross and martlets of St. Edmund, the lily of St. Mary, the emblem of the Holy Trinity, or whatever the emblem may be of the saint in question. The alternative for a church is the banner of St. George, the patron saint of the realm. The flags upon public buildings should bear the arms of the corporate bodies to whom those buildings belong. The flag to be flown by a private person, as the law now stands, should bear that person's private arms, if he has any, and if he has not he should be content to forego the pleasures arising from the use of bunting. A private flag should be double its height in length. The entire surface should be occupied by the coat of arms. These flags of arms are banners, and it is quite a misnomer to term the banner of the royal arms the royal standard. The flags of arms hung over the stalls of the Knights of the Garter, St. Patrick, and the former Knights of the Bath are properly, and are always termed banners. The term standard properly refers to the long tapering flag used in battle, and under which an overlord mustered his retainers in battle. This did not display his armorial bearings. Next to the staff usually came the cross of St. George, which was depicted, of course, on a white field. This occupied rather less than one-third of the standard. The remainder of the standard was of the color or colors of the livery, and thereupon was represented all sorts of devices, usually the badges and sometimes the crest. The motto was usually on transverse bands, which frequently divided the standard into compartments for the different badges. These mottos from their nature are not war cries, but undoubtedly relate and belong to the badges with which they appear in conjunction. The whole banner was usually fringed with the livery colors, giving the effect of a boyer compony. The use of standards does not seem, except for the ceremonial purposes of funerals, to have survived the Tudor period, this doubtless being the result of the creation of the standing army in the reign of Henry VIII. The few exotic standards, e.g. remaining from the Jacobite rebellion, seldom conform to the old patterns, but although the shape is altered, the artistic character largely remains in the regimental colors of the present day with their assorted regimental badges and scrolls with the names of battle honors. With the recent revival of the granting of badges the standard has again been brought into use as the vehicle to carry the badge, plate 8. The arms are now placed next the staff, and upon the rest of the field the badge is repeated or alternated with the crest. 
Badges and standards are now granted to any person already possessing a right to arms and willing to pay the necessary fees. Plate 8. The armorial use of the banner in connection with the display of heraldic achievements is very limited in this country. In the case of the Marquess of Dufferin and Ava the banner or flag is an integral and unchangeable part of the heraldic supporters, and in Ross of Bladensburg, e.g., it is similarly an integral part of the crest. In the warrant of augmentation granted to H.M. Queen Victoria Eugenie of Spain on her marriage, banners of the Royal Arms of England were placed in the paws of her supporters. Other cases where arms have been depicted on banners are generally no more than matters of artistic design, but in the arms of Scotland as matriculated in Lyon Register for King Charles II. The supporters are accompanied by banners, the dexter being of the arms of Scotland, and the sinister the banner of St. Andrew. These banners possess rather a different character, and approach very closely to the German use. The same practice has been followed in the seals of the Duchy of Lancaster, inasmuch as on the obverse of the seal of George IV. And the seal of Queen Victoria the royal supporters hold banners of the arms of England and of the Duchy, i.e. England, a label for difference. James I, on his great seal had the banners of Cadwallader, Azure, a cross pat Fitch or, and King Edgar, Azure, a cross pat once between four martlets or, and on the great seal of Charles I. The Dexter supporter holds a banner of St. George, and the sinister a banner of St. Andrew. Figure 688. Middle, arms of the Duchy of Saxe Altenburg. From Stroll's Deutsche Wappenroll. Of the heraldic use of the banner in Germany, Stroll writes. The banner appears in a coat of arms, either in the hands or paws of the supporters, fig. 688, also set up behind the shield, or the pavilion, as, for instance, in the larger achievement of His Majesty the German Emperor, in the large achievement of the Kingdom of Prussia, of the Dukedom of Saxe Altenburg. And further in the arms of State of Italy, Russia, Romania, and K. Banners on the shield as charges, or on the helmet as a crest, are here, of course, not in question, but only those banners which serve as prakstuk, appendages of magnificence. The banners of the 12th and 13th centuries are long and narrow, and frequently run in stripes, like battlements. However, in the second half of the 13th century flags were also to be met with, with the longer side attached to the stick. Later on the banners became more square, and show on the top a long strip, generally of another color, the schwenkel, i.e. something that flourishes, waves to and fro. To bear a red schwenkel was a special privilege, similar to the rite of sealing with red wax. The ecclesiastical banner has three points, and is provided with rings on the top in order that it may be fastened to the stick by them, in an oblique position. The banner always represents the field of the shield, and assumes accordingly its tincture. The charges of the shield should be placed upon the banner without the outline of a shield, and the edge against the flagstaff is considered the dexter. It follows from this that the figure must be turned towards it. For instance, if the shield bear the following arms, argent and eagle gules, the same figure, suited to the size of the flag, appears on the banner, with its head turned towards the staff. If it be wished to represent only the colors of the arms upon the flag, that of the charge is placed above, and that of the field below. Thus, for example, the Prussian flag is black and white, corresponding to the black eagle on the silver field. The flag of Hohenzollern is white and black, corresponding to their coat of arms, quartered silver and black, because in the latter case, so soon as a heraldic representation is available, from the position of the colored fields. The correct order of the tinctures is determined. Chapter 31. Marks of Cadency. The manner in which cadency is indicated in heraldic emblazonment forms one of the most important parts of British armory. But our own intricate and minutely detailed systems are a purely British development of armory. I do not intend by the foregoing remark to assert that the occasional use, or even, as in some cases, the constant use of altered arms for purposes of indicating cadency is unknown on the continent. Because different branches of one family are constantly found using, for the purposes of distinction, variations of the arms appertaining to the head of their house. In France especially the boyer has been extensively used, 
but the fact nevertheless remains that in no other countries is there found an organized system or set of rules for the purpose. Nor is this idea of the indication of cadency wholly a modern development, though some, in fact most, of the rules presently in force are no doubt a result of modern requirements. And do not date back to the earliest periods of heraldry in this country. The obligation of cadet lines to difference their arms was recognized practically universally in the 14th century. And when, later, the systematic use of differencing seemed in danger of being ignored, it was made the subject of specific legislation. In the treatise of Zypoius, the Notitia Juris Belgicae, Lib. 12. Quoted also in Ménétrier, Recherches du Blazon, p. 218, we find the following. Ut secundo edi ulterius genitae, quinimo primogenite vivo pater, integra insignia non gerent, sed aliqua nota distincta, ut perpetuo lini dignasi possent, ex qua quique descendent, donec anteriors defesserent. Acceptis Luxembourgis edi geldris, cabus non sunt tu mores. The exception is curious. The choice of these brisures, as marks of difference are often termed, was, however, left to the persons concerned. And there is, consequently, a great variety of differences or differentiation marks which seem to have been used for the purpose. The term brichure is really French, whilst the German term for these marks is Bayesian. British heraldry, on the contrary, is remarkable for its use of two distinct sets of rules, the English and the Scottish, the Irish system being identical with the former. To understand the question of cadency it is necessary to revert to the status of a coat of arms in early periods. In the first chapter we dealt with the origin of armory. And in a subsequent chapter with the status of a coat of arms in Great Britain, and it will therefrom have been apparent that arms, and a right to them, developed in this country as an adjunct of, or contemporaneously with. The extension of the feudal system. Every landowner was at one time required to have his seal, presumably, of arms, and as a result arms were naturally then considered to possess something of a territorial character. I do not by this mean to say that the arms belonged to the land and were transferable with the sale and purchase thereof. There never was in this country a period at which such an idea held, nor were arms originally entirely personal or individual. They belonged rather to a position halfway between the two. They were the arms of a given family, originating because that family held land and accepted the consequent responsibilities thereto belonging, but the arms appertained for the time being to the member of that family who owned the land. And that this is the true idea of the former status of a coat of arms is perhaps best evidenced by the Gray and Hastings controversy, which engaged the attention of the court of chivalry for several years prior to 1410. The decision and judgment in the case gave the undifferenced arms of Hastings to the heir general, Gray de Ruthen, the heir male, Sir Edward Hastings, being found only capable of bearing the arms of Hastings subject to some mark of difference. This case, and the case of Scrope and Grosvenor, in which the king's award was that the boyer was not sufficient difference for a stranger in blood, being only the mark of a cadet, show clearly that the status of a coat of arms in early times was that in its undifferenced state it belonged to one person only for the time being, and that person the head of the family. Though it should be noted that the term, head of the family, seems to have been interpreted into the one who held the lands of the family, whether he were heir male or heir general being apparently immaterial. This much being recognized, it follows that some means were needed to be devised to differentiate the armorial bearings of the younger members of the family. Of course the earliest definite instances of any attempt at a systematic, differencing, for cadency which can be referred to are undoubtedly those cases presented by the arms of the younger members of the royal family in England. These cases, however, it is impossible to take as precedents. Royal arms have always, from the very earliest times, been a law unto themselves, subject only to the will of the sovereign. And it is neither safe nor correct to deduce precedents to be applied to the arms of subjects from proved instances concerning the royal arms. Probably, apart from these, the earliest mark of cadency which is to be met with in heraldry is the label, fig. 689, used to indicate the eldest son, and this mark of difference dates back far beyond any other regularized methods applicable to, younger, sons. 
The German name for the label is Turnierkragen, i.e. Tournament collar, which may indicate the origin of this curious figure. Probably the use of the label can be taken back to the middle or early part of the 13th century, but the opportunity and necessity of marking the arms of the heir apparent temporarily. He having the expectation of eventually succeeding to the undifferenced arms, is a very different matter to the other opportunities for the use of marks of cadency. The lord and his heir were the two most important members of the family, and all others sunk their identity in their position in the household of their chief unless they were established by marriage or otherwise, in lordships of their own. In which cases they are usually found to have preferred the arms of the family from whom they inherited the lordships they enjoyed. And their identities being to such a large extent overlooked, the necessity for any system of marking the arms of a younger son was not so early apparent as the necessity for marking the arms of the heir. Figure 689. The label. The label does not appear to have been originally confined exclusively to the heir. It was at first the only method of differencing known, and it is not therefore to be wondered at that we find that it was frequently used by other cadets, who used it with no other meaning than to indicate that they were not the head of the house. It has, consequently, in some few cases, for example, in the arms of Courtney, Fig. 246, Babington, and Barrington, become stereotyped as a charge, and is continuously and unchangeably used as such, whereas doubtless it may have been no more originally than a mere mark of cadency. The label was originally drawn with its upper edge identical with the top of the shield, figure 520, but later its position on the shield was lowered. The number of points on the label was at first without meaning, a five-pointed label occurring in figure 690 and a seven-pointed one in figure 235. In the role of Curlaverick the label is repeatedly referred to. Of Sir Maurice de Berkeley it is expressly declared that. Unlabel de Osser avoid. Pors Qe Ces Perez Vivoit. Sir Patrick Dunbar, son of the Earl of Lothian, i.e. Of March, then bore arms similar to his father, with the addition of a label Azure. On the other hand, Sir John de Segrave is said to bear his deceased father's arms undifferenced, while his younger brother Nicholas carries them with a label, Gules. And in the case of Edmund de Hastings the label is also assigned to a younger brother. Further proof of its being thus borne by cadets is furnished by the evidence in the Grey and Hastings controversy in the reign of Henry IV. From which it appeared that the younger line of the Hastings family had for generations differenced the paternal coat by a label of three points. And, as various knights and esquires had deposed to this label being the cognizance of the nearest heir, it was argued that the defendant's ancestors would not have borne their arms in this way had they not been the reputed next heirs of the family of the Earl of Pembroke. The label will be seen in figures 690 and 691 and 692, though its occurrence in the last case in each of the quarters is most unusual. The Argent label on the arms for the sovereignty of man is a curious confirmation of the reservation of an Argent label for royalty. Figure 692. Arms of William Le Scrope, Earl of Wilts, d. 1399 Quarterly, 1 and 4, the arms of the Isle of Man, a label Argent, 2 and 3, Azure, a bend or, a label Gules. From Wilmont's Roll, 16th century. Figure 691. Arms of John de la Pole, Earl of Lincoln, son of John, Duke of Suffolk, d. 1487, quarterly, 1 and 4, azure, a fess between three leopards' faces or, 2 and 3, per fescules and argent, a lion rampant q forche or, armed and longed azure, over all a label argent. From his seal. Figure 690. Arms of John de Lacy, Earl of Lincoln, died in 1240, quarterly, or and gules, a Ben Sable, and a label Argent. M. S. Cott. Nero, D. 1. William Ruthven, Provost of Perth, eldest son of the Master of Ruthven, bore a label of four points in 1503. Two other instances may be noticed of a label borne by a powerful younger brother. One is Walter Stewart, Earl of Mentith, the fourth High Steward, in 1292, and we find the label again on the seal of his son Alexander Stuart, Earl of Mentith. At Curlaverick, Henry of Lancaster, 
brother and successor of Thomas, Earl of Lancaster. Portrait Les Armes Son Frere. O Beau Bastown Sans Label. I.e. he bore the royal arms, differenced by a bendlet azure. Jane Fentown, daughter and heir apparent of Walter Fentown of Bakey, bore a label in 1448, and dropped it after her father's death. This is apparently an instance quite unique. I know of no other case where the label has been used by a woman as a mark of difference. In France the label was the chief recognized mode of difference, though the bend and the boyer are frequently to be met with. In Germany, Spenner tells us that the use of the label, though occasional, was not infrequent, Securi in Gallia vix alias discernicularum modus frequentur est, iteraria exemplar reparamus in Germania, and he gives a few examples. Though he is unable to assign the reason for its assumption as a hereditary bearing. The most usual method of differencing in Germany was by the alteration of the tinctures or by the alteration of the charges. As an example of the former method, the arms of the Bavarian family of Partenek may be instanced, figs. 693 to 697, all representing the arms of different branches of the same family. Figure 693. Partenek. Figure 694. Kammer. Figure 695. Kammerberg. Figure 696. Hildrichshauser. Figure 697. Massenhauser. Next to the use of the label in British heraldry came the use of the boyer. And the latter as a mark of cadency can at any rate be traced back as a well-established matter of rule and precedent as far as the Scrope and Grosvenor controversy in the closing years of the 14th century. At the period when the Boyer as a difference is to be most frequently met with in English heraldry, it never had any more definite status or meaning than a sign that the bearer was not the head of the house. Though one cannot but think that in many cases in which it occurs its significance is a doubt as to legitimate descent, or a doubt of the probability of an asserted descent. In modern English practice the boyer as a difference for cadets only continues to be used by those whose ancestors bore it in ancient times. Its other use as a modern mark of illegitimacy is dealt with in the chapter upon marks of illegitimacy, but the curious and unique Scottish system of cadency borgers will be presently referred to. In Germany of old the use of the boyer as a difference does not appear to have been very frequent, but it is now used to distinguish the arms of the crown prince. In Italian heraldry, although differences are known, there is no system whatever. In Spain and Portugal marks of cadency, in our sense of the word, are almost unknown, but nevertheless the boyer, especially as indicating descent from a maternal ancestor, is very largely employed. The most familiar instance is afforded by the royal arms of Portugal, in which the arms of Portugal are surrounded by a boyer of Castile. Differencing, however, had become a necessity at an earlier period than the period at which we find an approach to the systematic usage of the label, boyer, and bend, but it should be noticed that those who wished, and needed. To difference were those younger members of the family who by settlement, or marriage, had themselves become lords of other estates and heads of distinct houses. For a man must be taken as a head of a house for all intents and purposes as soon as by his possession of lands held in chief he became himself liable to the crown to provide stated military service. And as a consequence found the necessity for a banner of arms under which his men could be mustered. Now having these positions as overlords, the inducement was rather to set up arms for themselves than to pose merely as cadets of other families, and there can be no doubt whatever that at the earliest period, differencing, for the above reason, took the form of and was meant as a change in the arms. It was something quite beyond and apart from the mere condition of a right to recognized arms, with an indication thereupon that the bearer was not the person chiefly entitled to the display of that particular coat. We therefore find cadets bearing the arms of their house with the tincture changed, with subsidiary charges introduced, or with some similar radical alteration made. Such coats should properly be considered essentially different coats, merely indicating in their design a given relationship rather than as the same coat regularly differenced by rule to indicate cadency. For instance, the three original branches of the Conyers family bear, Azure, a Monch Ermin, Azure, a Monchor, Azure, a Montcherman debrosed by a Bendlet Gules. 
The coat differenced by the bend, of course, stands self-confessed as a differenced coat, but it is by no means certain, nor is it known whether Azure, a Monch Ermin, or Azure, a Monch or indicates the original Conyers arms. For the very simple reason that it is now impossible to definitely prove which branch supplies the true head of the family. It is known that a wicked uncle intervened, and usurped the estates to the detriment of the nephew and heir, but whether the uncle usurped the arms with the estates. Or whether the heir changed his arms when settled on the other lands to which he migrated, there is now no means of ascertaining. Similarly we find the Darcy arms, Argent, three Sinkfoils gules, which is probably the oldest form, Argent, Chrysaly and three Sinkfoils gules, and Azure, Chrysaly and three Sinkfoils Argent. And countless instances can be referred to where, for the purpose of indicating cadency, the arms of a family were changed in this manner. This reason, of which there can be no doubt, supplies the origin and the excuse for the custom of assigning similar arms when the descent is but doubtful. Similarity originally, though it may indicate consanguinity, was never intended to be proof thereof. The principal ancient methods of alteration in arms, which nowadays are apparently accepted as former modes of differencing merely to indicate cadency, may perhaps be classified into a. Change of tincture. b. The addition of small charges to the field, or to an ordinary, c. The addition of a label or, d. Of a canton or quarter, e. The addition of an inescutcheon, f. The addition, or change, of an ordinary. g. The changing of the lines of partition enclosing an ordinary, and perhaps also, h. Diminishing the number of charges, i. A change of some or all of the minor charges. At a later date came, j, the systematic use of the label, the boyer, and the bend, and subsequently, k, the use of the modern systems of, marks of cadency. Perhaps, also, one should include, l, the addition of quarterings, the use of, m, augmentations and official arms, and, n, the escutcheon and surtout, indicating a territorial and titular lordship, but the three last mentioned. Though useful for distinction and frequently obviating the necessity of other marks of cadency, did not originate with the theory or necessities of differencing, and are not properly marks of cadency. At the same time, the warning should be given that it is not safe always to presume cadency when a change of tincture or other slight deviation from an earlier form of the arms is met with. Many families when they exhibited their arms at the visitations could not substantiate them, and the heralds, in confirming arms, frequently deliberately changed the tinctures of many coats they met with. To introduce distinction from other authorized arms. Practically contemporarily with the use of the boyer came the use of the bend, then employed for the same purpose. In the armorial de Gelra, one of the earliest armorials now in existence which can be referred to, the well-known coat of Abernethy is there differenced by the bend letting railed. And the arms of the King of Navarre bear his quartering of France differenced by a bend let compony. Amongst other instances in which the bend or bend let appears originally as a mark of cadency, but now as a charge, may be mentioned the arms of Fitzherbert, Fulton, Stuart, Earl of Galloway, and others. It is a safe presumption with regard to ancient coats of arms that any coat in which the field is sema is in nine cases out of ten a differenced coat for a junior cadet, as is also any coat in which a charge or ordinary is debrosed by another. Of course in more modern times no such presumption is permissible. An instance of a sema field for cadency will be found in the case of the Darcy arms already mentioned. Little would be gained by a long list of instances of such differences, because the most careful and systematic investigations clearly show that in early times no definite rules whatever existed as to the assumption of differences, which largely depended upon the pleasure of the bearer, and no system can be deduced which can be used to decide that the appearance of any given difference or kind of difference meant a given set of circumstances. Nor can any system be deduced which has any value for the purposes of precedent. Certain instances are appended which will indicate the style of differencing which was in vogue. But it should be distinctly remembered that the object was not to allocate the bearer of any particular coat of arms to any specific place in the family pedigree, but merely to show that he was not the head of the house. 
entitled to bear the undifferenced arms, if indeed it would not be more accurate to describe these instances as simply examples of different coats of arms used by members of the same family. For it should be remembered that anciently, before the days of black and white illustration, prominent change of tincture was admittedly a sufficient distinction between strangers in blood. Beyond the use of the label and the boyer there does not seem to have been any recognized system of differencing until at the earliest the 15th century, probably any regulated system does not date much beyond the commencement of the series of Visitations Of the four sons of Gillis de Maley, who bore, or, three mallets vert, the second, third, and fourth sons respectively made the charges, gules, azure, and sable. The Argent field of the Douglas coat was in some branches converted into ermine as early as 1373, and the descendants of the Douglases of Dalkeith made the chief gules, instead of azure. A similar mode of differencing occurs in the Lion Register in many other families. The maize of Colban in the North Bora, Sable, field for their arms in lieu of the more usual azure, and there seems reason to believe that the southern Frasers originally bore their field sable. The change to azure being an alteration made by those branches who migrated northwards. An interesting series of arms is met with in the case of the differences employed by the Earls of Warwick. Walleran, Earl of Warwick, died in 1204, appears to have added to the arms of Warren, his mother's family, a chevron ermine. His son Henry, Earl of Warwick, died in 1229, changed the chevron to a bend, but Thomas, Earl of Warwick, died in 1242, reverted to the chevron, a form which was perpetuated after the earldom had passed to the house of Beecham. An instance of the addition of mullets to the bend in the arms of Bohun is met within the cadet line created earls of Northampton. The shield of William de Romare, Earl of Lincoln, who died in 1198, is adduced by Mr. Planche is an early example of differencing by crosses crosslet, the principal charges being seven massels conjoined, three, three, and one. We find in the rolls of arms of the 13th and early part of the 14th century many instances of coats cruzily, belletti, bezendi, and plain diascallops, fleuret, and a less trefoils d'or. With these last Sir Edmund Dacre of Westmoreland powdered the shield borne by the head of his family, gules, three escallops or, roll of Edward II. The coat borne by the Actons of Aldenham, gules, cruzily or, two lions passant argent, is sometimes quoted as a gerated coat of Lestrange. For Edward de Acton married the co-heiress of Lestrange, living 1387, who bore simply, gules, two lions passant argent. That the arms of Acton are derived from Lestrange cannot be questioned, but the probability is that they were a new invention as a distinct coat, the charges suggested by Lestrange. The original coat of the House of Berkeley in England, Berkeley in Scotland, appears to have been, gules, a chevron or, or, argent. The seals of Robert de Berkeley, who died for Henry III. And Maurice de Berkeley, who died 1281, all show the shield charged with a chevron only. Maurice de Barkle, in the roll temp. Henry III, bears, gowls, a chevron argent. But Thomas, son of Maurice, who died 15 Edward II, has the present coat, gules, a chevron between ten crosses petit argent, while in the role of Edward II, the gowls o de les rosettes de argent et un chevron de argent, is attributed to Sir Thomas de Berkeley. In Leicestershire the Berkeleys gerated with sinkfoils, an ancient and favourite bearing in that county, derived of course from the arms or badge of the Earl of Leicester. In Scotland the Barclays difference by change of tincture, and bore, azure, a chevron argent between, or in chief, three crosses petit of the same. An interesting series of differences is met with upon the arms of Neville of Raby, which are, gules, a salter argent, and which were differenced by a crescent, sable, a martlet, gules, a mullet, sable, and a mullet, azure, a fleur de lis. A rose, gules, a pellet, or annulet, sable, this being the difference of Lord Latimer, and two interlaced annulets, azure, all borne on the center point of the salter. The interlaced annulets were borne by Lord Montague, as a second difference on the arms of his father, Richard Neville, Earl of Salisbury. 
he and his brother the kingmaker both using the curious Komponi label of Azure and Argent borne by their father, which indicated their descent from John of Gaunt. One of the best known English examples of differencing by a change of charges is that of the coat of the Cobhams, Gules, a chevron or, in which the ordinary was charged by various cadets with three pierced estoils, three lions, three crossed crosslets, three fleurs de lis, three crescents, and three martlets, all of sable. The original grey coat, berry of six argent and azure, is differenced in the role of Edward I by a bend gules for John de Grey, at Curlaverick this is enrailed. The segrave coat, sable, a lion rampant argent, is differenced by the addition of a bendlet or, or, a bendlet gules, and the last is again differenced by enrailing it. In the Calais role the arms of William de Warren, Chequy, or and Azure, are differenced by the addition of a canton said to be that of Fitzalan, but really that of Nerford. Whilst no regular system of differencing has survived in France, and whilst outside the royal family arms in that country show comparatively few examples of difference marks. The system as regards the French royal arms was well observed and approximated closely to our own. The Dauphin of France bore the royal arms undifferenced but never alone, they being always quartered with the sovereign arms of his personal sovereignty of Dauphiné, or, a dolphin embowed azure, finned gules. This has been more fully referred to on page 254. It is much to be regretted that the arms of H.R.H. The Prince of Wales do not include the arms of his sovereignty of the Duchy of Cornwall, nor any allusion to his dignities of Prince of Wales or Earl of Chester. Figure 698. Seal of Elizabeth, Widow of Philip, Duke of Orleans. The arms of the Dukes of Orleans were the arms of France differenced by a label argent. This is to be observed, for example, upon the seal, fig. 698, of the Duchess Charlotte Elizabeth of Orleans, widow of Philip of Orleans, brother of King Louis XIV. Of France. She was a daughter of the elector Charles Louis. The arms of the old Dukes of Anjou were the ancient coat of France, Azure, Semetalis or, differenced by a label of five points gules, but the younger house of Anjou bore the modern arms of France differenced by a boyer gules. The Dukes d'Alençon also used the boyer gules, but charged this with eight plates, whilst the Dukes de Berry used a boyering railed gules. The Counts d'Angouline used the arms of the Dukes of Orleans, adding a crescent gules on each point of the label, whilst the Counts d'Artois used France, ancient, differenced by a label gules, each point charged with three castles, towers, or the rules which govern the marks of cadency at present in England are as follows, and it should be carefully borne in mind that the Scottish system bears no relation whatever to the English system. The eldest son during the lifetime of his father differences his arms by a label of three points cooped at the ends. This is placed in the centre chief point of the escutcheon. There is no rule as to its colour, which is left to the pleasure of the bearer, but it is usually decided as follows. 1 that it shall not be metal on metal, or color on color, too, that it shall not be argent or white. And, if possible, that it shall differ from any color or metal in which any component part of the shield is depicted. Though anciently the label was drawn throughout the shield, this does not now seem to be a method officially adopted. At any rate drawn throughout it apparently obtains no official countenance for the arms of subjects, though many of the best heraldic artists always so depict it. The eldest son bears this label during his father's lifetime, succeeding to the undifferenced shield on the death of his father. His children, being the grandchildren of the then head of the house, difference upon the label, but such difference marks are, like their father's, only contemporary with the life of the grandfather, and immediately upon the succession of their father, the children remove the label, and difference upon the original arms. The use of arms by a junior grandson is so restricted in ordinary life that to all intents and purposes this may be ignored, except in the case of the heir apparent of the heir apparent, i.e. of the grandson in the lifetimes of his father and grandfather. In his case one label of five points is used, and to place a label upon a label is not correct when both are marks of cadency, and not charges. But the grandson on the death of his father, during the lifetime of the grandfather, 
and when the grandson succeeds as heir apparent of the grandfather, succeeds also to the label of three points. Which may therefore more properly be described as the difference mark of the heir apparent than the difference mark of the eldest son. It is necessary, perhaps, having said this, to add the remark that heraldry knows no such thing as disinheritance, and heirship is an inalienable matter of blood descent, and not of worldly inheritance. No woman can ever be an heir apparent. Though now the number of points on a label is a matter of rule, this is far from having been always the case, and prior to the Stuart period no deductions can be drawn with certainty from the number of the points in use. It seems a very great pity that no warrants were issued for the children of the then Duke of York during the lifetime of Queen Victoria, as labels for great-grandchildren would have been quite unique. If the eldest son succeeds through the death of his mother to her arms and quarterings during his father's lifetime, he must be careful that the label which he bears as heir apparent to his father's arms does not cross the quartering of his mother's arms. If his father bears a quarterly shield, the label is so placed that it shall apparently debrose all his father's quarterings, i.e. In a shield quarterly a for the label would be placed in the center chief point, the center file of the label being upon the paler line, and the other files in the first and second quarters respectively, whilst the color would usually depend as has been above indicated, upon the tinctures of the pronominal arms. Due regard, however, must be had that a label of gules, for example, is not placed on a field of gules. A party-colored label is not nowadays permissible, though instances of its use can occasionally be met with in early examples. Supposing the field of the first quarter is argent, and that of the second azure, in all probability the best color for the label would be gules, and indeed gules is the color most frequently met with for use in this purpose. If the father possessed the quarterly coat of, say, for quarterings, which are debruised by a label by the heir apparent, and the mother die, and the heir apparent succeed to her arms, he would of course, after his father's death, arrange his mother's quarterings with these, placing his father's pronominal arms one and four, the father's quartering in the second quarter, and the mother's arms in the third quarter. This arrangement, however, is not permissible during his father's lifetime, because otherwise his label in chief would be held to debrose all the four coats. And the only method in which such a combination could be properly displayed in the lifetime of the father but after the death of his mother is to place the father's arms in the grand quartering in the first and fourth quarters. Each being debrosed by the label, and the mothers in the grand quartering in the second and third quarters without any interference by the label. The other marks of difference are, for the second son a crescent, for the third son a mullet, for the fourth son a martlet, for the fifth son an annulet, for the sixth son a fleur de lis, for the seventh son a rose. For the eighth son a cross maline, for the ninth son a double catafoil, figure 699. Of these the first six are given in Boswell's, Works of Armory, 1572. And the author adds, If there be any more than six brethren the devise or assignment of further difference only appertaineth to the kingis of arms especially when they visit their several provinces. And not to the father of the children to give them what difference he list, as some without authority do allege. Figure 699. The English Marks of Cadency. The position for a mark of difference is in the center chief point, though it is not incorrect, and many such instances will be found, for it to be charged on a chevron or fess, in the center point. This, however, is not a very desirable position for it in a simple coat of arms. The second son of the second son places a crescent upon a crescent, the third son a mullet on a crescent, the fourth son a martlet on a crescent, and so on. And there is an instance in the visitation of London in which the arms of cocaine appear with three crescents one upon another, this instance has been already referred to on page 344. Of course, when the English system is carried to these lengths it becomes absurd, because the crescents charged one upon each other become so small as to be practically indistinguishable. There are, however, very few cases in which such a display would be correct, as will be presently explained. This difficulty, which looms large in theory, amounts to very little in the practical use of armory, but it nevertheless is the one outstanding objection to the English system of difference marks. 
It is constantly held up to derision by those people who are unaware of the next rule upon the subject, which is that as soon as a quartering comes into the possession of a cadet branch, which quartering is not enjoyed by the head of the house, all necessity for any marks of difference at all is considered to be ended. Provided that that quartering is always displayed, and that cadet branch then begins afresh from that generation to redifference. Now there are few English families in whose pedigree during three or four generations one marriage is not with an heiress in blood, so that this theoretical difficulty very quickly disappears. No doubt there is always an inducement to retain the quarterings of an historical or illustrious house which may have been brought in in the past. But if the honors and lands brought in with that quartering are wholly enjoyed by the head of the house, it becomes, from a practical point of view, mere affectation to prefer that quartering to another, brought in subsequently, of a family. The entire representation of which belongs to the junior branch and not to the senior. If the old idea of confining a shield to four quarters be borne in mind, concurrently with the necessity, for purposes of distinction, of introducing new quarterings, the new quarterings take the place of the old. The use of which is left to the senior branch. Under such circumstances, and the regular practice of them, the English system is seldom wanting. And it at once wipes out the difficulty which is made much of, that under the English system there is no way of indicating the difference between the arms of uncle and nephew. If the use of impalements is also adhered to, the difficulty practically vanishes. To difference a single coat the mark of difference is placed in the center chief point. To difference a quarterly coat of four quarters the same position on the shield is most generally used, the mark being placed over the paler line, though occasionally the difference mark is placed, and not incorrectly. In the center of the quarterings. A coat of six quarters, however, is always differenced on the fess line of partition, the mark being placed in the fess point, because if placed in the center chief point it would only appear as a difference upon the second quartering. So that on all shields of six or more quarterings the difference mark must be placed on some line of partition at the nearest possible point to the true center fess point of the escutcheon. It is then understood to difference the whole of the quarterings over which it is displayed, but directly a quartering is introduced which has been inherited subsequently to the cadency which produced the difference mark. That difference mark must be either discarded or transferred to the first quartering only. The use of these difference marks is optional. Neither officially nor unofficially is any attempt made to enforce their use in England, they are left to the pleasure and discretion of the bearers, though it is a well understood and well accepted position that, unless differenced by quarterings or impalement, it is neither courteous nor proper for a cadet to display the arms of the head of his house, beyond this, the matter is usually left to good taste. There is, however, one position in which the use of difference marks is compulsory. If under a royal license or other exemplification, for instance, the creation of a peerage, a difference mark is painted upon the arms, or even if an exemplification of the arms difference is placed at the head of an official record of pedigree, those arms would not subsequently be exemplified, or their use officially admitted, without the difference mark that has been recorded with them. The differencing of crests for cadency is very rare. Theoretically, these should be marked equally with the shield, and when arms are exemplified officially under the circumstances above referred to, crest. Figure 700. King John, before his accession to the throne. From M. S. Cott, Julius, C. 7. Figure 701. Edmund, Crouch Back, Earl of Lancaster, second son of Henry III. From his tomb. His arms are elsewhere given, de gaules of trois leopards passants d'or, et lambel d'aja florite d'or. Figure 702. Thomas, Earl of Lancaster, died in 1322, son of preceding England with a label azure, each point charged with three fleurs de lis. From his seal, 1301. Figure 703. Henry of Lancaster, 1295 to 1324, brother of preceding, before he succeeded his brother as Earl of Lancaster, England, with a bend azure. From his seal, 1301. After 1324, he bore England with a label as his brother. Figure 704. Henry, Duke of Lancaster, son of preceding. From his seal, 
1358. Figure 705. Edward of Carnarvon, Prince of Wales, afterwards Edward II. Bore before 1307, England with a label Azure. From his seal, 1305. Figure 706. John of Eltham, second son of Edward II, England with a boyar of the arms of France. From his tomb. Figure 707. Arms of Edmund of Woodstock, Earl of Kent, third son of Edward I, England within a boyar argent. The same arms were borne by his descendant, Thomas de Holland, Earl of Kent. Figure 708. The arms of John de Holland, Duke of Exeter, d. 1400 England, a boyar of France. From his seal, 1381. Supporters, and shield are all equally differenced, but the difficulty of adding difference mark on difference mark when no marriage or heiress can ever bring in any alteration to the crest is very generally recognized and admitted. Even officially, and it is rare indeed to come across a crest carrying more than a single difference mark. The grant of an augmentation to any cadet obviates the slightest necessity for any further use of difference marks inherited before the grant. There are no difference marks whatever for daughters, there being in English common law no seniority between the different daughters of one man. They succeed equally, whether heiresses or not, to the arms of their father for use during their lifetimes, and they must bear them on their own lozenges or impaled on the shields of their husbands. With the difference marks which their father needed to use. It would be permissible, however, to discard these difference marks of their fathers if subsequently to his death his issue succeeded to the position of head of the family. For instance, suppose the daughters of the younger son of an earl are under consideration. They would bear upon lozenges the arms of their father, which would be those of the earl, charged with the mullet or crescent which their father had used as a younger son. If by the extinction of issue the brother of these daughters succeed to the earldom, they would no longer be required to bear their father's difference mark. There are no marks of difference between illegitimate children. In the eye of the law an illegitimate person has no relatives, and stands alone. Supposing it be subsequently found that a marriage ceremony had been illegal, the whole issue of that marriage becomes of course illegitimate. As such, no one of them is entitled to bear arms. A royal license, and exemplification following thereupon, is necessary for each single one. Of these exemplifications there is one case on record in which I think nine follow each other on successive pages of one of the grant books, all differ in some way, usually in the color of the boyar. But the fact that there are illegitimate brothers of the same parentage does not prevent the descendants of any daughter quartering the differenced coat exemplified to her. As far as heraldic law is concerned, she is the heiress of herself, representing only herself, and consequently her heir quarters her arms. Marks of difference are never added to an exemplification following upon a royal license after illegitimacy. Marks of difference are to indicate cadency, and there is no cadency vested in a person of illegitimate birth, their right to the arms proceeding only from the regrant of them in the exemplification. What is added in lieu is the mark of distinction to indicate the bastardy. Figure 709. John de Holland, Duke of Exeter, son of preceding. Arms as preceding. From his seal. Figure 710. Henry de Holland, Duke of Exeter, son of preceding. Arms as preceding. From his seal, 1455. Figure 711. Thomas of Brotherton, Earl of Norfolk, second son of Edward I, Arms of England, a label of three points argent. Figure 712. Thomas de Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, died in 1400. From a drawing of his seal, M. S. Cott, Julius, C. 7, F. 166. Arms, C. page 465. Figure 713. John de Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, died in 1432. Arms as figure 711. From his garter plate. Figure 714. John de Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk, d. 1461 arms as figure 711. From his seal. Figure 715. Edward the Black Prince, quarterly, 1 and 4 France, ancient, 2 and 3 England, and a label of 3 points argent. 
from his tomb. Figure 716. Richard, Prince of Wales, afterwards Richard II, son of preceding, arms as preceding. From his seal, 1377. Figure 717. Edmund of Langley, Duke of York, fifth son of King Edward III. France, ancient, and England quarterly, a label of three points argent, each point charged with three tordos. From his seal, 1391. His son, Edward, Earl of Cambridge, until he succeeded his father, i.e. Before 1462, bore the same with an additional difference of a boyer of Spain, figure 316. Vincent attributes to him, however, a label as figure 719, which possibly he bore after his father's death. The method of differencing the English royal arms is quite unique, and has no relation to the method ordinarily in use in this country for the arms of subjects. The royal arms are not personal. They are the sovereign arms of dominion, indicating the sovereignty enjoyed by the person upon the throne. Consequently they are in no degree hereditary, and from the earliest times, certainly since the reign of Edward I. The right to bear the undifferenced arms has been confined exclusively to the sovereign upon the throne. In early times there were two methods employed, namely, the use of the boyer and the varieties of the label, the label of the heir apparent to the English throne being originally of Azure. The arms of Thomas of Woodstock, the youngest son of Edward I, were differenced by a boyer argent, his elder brother, Thomas de Brotherton, having had a label of three points argent, whilst the eldest son, Edward II, as Prince of Wales used a label of three points azure. From that period to the end of the Tudor period the use of labels and borgers seems to have continued concurrently, some members of the royal family using one, some the other. Though there does not appear to have been any precise rules governing a choice between the two. When Edward III claimed the throne of France and quartered the arms of that country with those of England, of course a portion of the field then became azure, and a blue label upon a blue field was no longer possible. The heir apparent therefore differenced his shield by the plain label of three points argent, and this has ever since, down to the present day, continued to be the difference used by the heir apparent to the English throne. A label of gules upon the gules quartering of England was equally impossible, and consequently from that period all labels used by any member of the royal family have been argent, charged with different objects. These being frequently taken from the arms of some female ancestor. Figures 700 to 730 are a somewhat extensive collection of variations of the royal arms. Lionel of Antwerp, Duke of Clarence, third son of Edward III. Bore, France, Ancient, and England Quarterly, a label of three points argent, and on each point a canton gules. The use of the boyer as a legitimate difference upon the royal arms ceased about the Tudor period, and differencing between members of the royal family is now exclusively done by means of these labels. A few cases of borgers to denote illegitimacy can, however, be found. The method of deciding these labels is for separate warrants under the hand and seal of the sovereign to be issued to the different members of the royal family, assigning to each a certain coronet, and the label to be borne over the royal arms. Crest, and Supporters these warrants are personal to those for whom they are. Figure 718. Richard, Duke of York, son of Edward, Earl of Cambridge and Duke of York arms as preceding. From his seal, 1436. Figure 719. Referred to under figure 717. Figure 720. Thomas of Woodstock, Earl of Buckingham, seventh son of Edward III, France, ancient, and England quarterly, a Boyer Argent. From a drawing of his seal, 1391, M. S. Cott, Julius, C. 7. Figure 721. Henry of Monmouth, afterwards Henry V. France, Modern, and England Quarterly, a label of three points Argent. From his seal. Figure 722. Richard, Duke of Gloucester, afterwards Richard III, a label of three points Ermine, on each point a canton gules. Figure 723. Humphrey of Lancaster, Duke of Gloucester, fourth son of Henry IV, France, modern, and England quarterly, a boyer argent. From his seal. 
Figure 724. John de Beaufort, Earl and Marquis of Somerset, son of John of Gaunt. Arms subsequent to his legitimation, France and England quarterly, within a boyer Gobany Azure and Argent. Prior to his legitimation he bore, per pale Argent and Azure, the livery colours of Lancaster, a bend of England, i.e. a bend gules charged with three lions passant guard antor, with a label of France. Figure 725. Thomas, Duke of Clarence, second son of Henry IV. France and England quarterly, a label of three points ermine. From his seal, 1413. Figure 726. George Plantagenet, Duke of Clarence, brother of Edward IV, France and England quarterly, a label of three points argent, each charged with a canton gules. From M. S. Harl. 521. Issued, and are not hereditary. Of late their use, or perhaps may be their issue, has not been quite so particularly conformed to as is desirable, and at the present time the official records show the arms of their royal highnesses the Duchess of Fife, the Princess Victoria, and the Queen of Norway, still bearing the label of five points indicative of their position as grandchildren of the sovereign, which of course they were when the warrants were issued in the lifetime of the late Queen Victoria. In spite of the fact that the warrants have no hereditary limitation, I am only aware of two modern instances in which a warrant has been issued to the son of a cadet of the royal house who had previously received a warrant. One of these was the late Duke of Cambridge. The warrant was issued to him in his father's lifetime, and to the label previously assigned to his father a second label of three points gules, to be borne directly below the other, was added. The other case was that of his cousin, afterwards Duke of Cumberland and King of Hanover. In his case the second label, also gules, was charged with the white horse of Hanover. Figure 727. John, Duke of Bedford, third son of Henry IV. France and England quarterly, a label of five points, the two dexter ermine, the three sinister azure, charged with three fleurs de lis or. From M. S. Ad. 18850. Figure 728. Jasper Tudor, Duke of Bedford, France and England Quarterly, a Boyer Azure, charged with Martlet's or. From his seal. Although uncle of Henry VII, Jasper Tudor had no blood descent whatever which would entitle him to bear these arms. His use of them is very remarkable. Figure 729. Thomas de Beaufort, Earl of Dorset, brother of John, Earl of Somerset, Figure 724 France and England Quarterly, a Boyer Componi Ermine and Azure. From his garter plate. Figure 730. John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, Bore, France, Ancient, and England Quarterly, a label of three points ermine, i.e. each point charged with three ermine spots. The label of the eldest son of the heir apparent to the English throne is not, as might be imagined, a plain label of five points, but the plain label of three points, the center point only being charged. The late Duke of Clarence charged the center point of his label of three points with a cross cooped gules. After his death the Duke of York relinquished the label of five points which he had previously borne, receiving one of three, the center point charged with an anchor. In every other case all of the points are charged. The following examples of the labels in use at the moment will show how the system now exists. Prince of Wales. A label of three points argent. Princess Royal, Louise, Duchess of Fife. A label of five points argent, charged on the center and outer points with a cross of St. George gules, and on the two others with a thistle proper. Princess Victoria. A label of five points argent, charged with three roses and two crosses gules. Princess Maud, H.M. the Queen of Norway. A label of five points argent, charged with three hearts and two crosses gules. The Duke of Edinburgh, Duke of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha. A label of three points argent, the center point charged with a cross gules, and on each of the others an anchor azure. His son, the hereditary prince of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha, who predeceased his father, bore a label of five points, the first, third, and fifth each charged with a cross gules, and the second and fourth each with an anchor azure. Figure 731. Fig. 731. 
label of the late hereditary prince of Saxe Coburg and Gotha. The Duke of Connaught, a label of three points argent, the center point charged with St. George's Cross, and each of the other points with a fleur de lis azure. The late Princess Royal, German Empress, the, a label of three points argent, the center point charged with a rose gules, and each of the others with a cross gules. The late Grand Duchess of Hesse. A label of three points argent, the center point charged with a rose gules, and each of the others with an ermine spot sable. Princess Christian of Schleswig Holstein, a label of three points, the center point charged with a ST. George's cross, and each of the other points with a rose gules. Princess Louise, Duchess of Argyle, a label of three points, the center point charged with a rose, and each of the other two with a canton gules. Princess Henry of Battenberg. A label of three points, the center point charged with a heart, and each of the other two with a rose gules. The late Duke of Albany. A label of three points, the center point charged with St. George's cross, and each of the other two with a heart gules. The Dukes of Cambridge. The first duke had a label of three points argent, the center point charged with a St. George's cross, and each of the other two with two hearts in pale gules. The warrant to the late duke assigned him the same label with the addition of a second label, plain, of three points gules, to be borne below the former label. The first duke of Cumberland. A label of three points argent, the center point charged with a fleur de lis azure, and each of the other two points with a cross of St. George gules. Of the foregoing recently assigned labels all are borne over the plain English arms, 1 and 4 England, 2 Scotland, 3 Ireland, charged with the escutcheon of Saxony, except those of the Dukes of Saxe-Coburg and Gotha, Cambridge, and Cumberland. In the two latter cases the labels are borne over the latest version of the arms of King George III, i.e. with the in escutcheon of Hanover, but, of course, neither the electoral bonnet nor the later crown which surmounted the inescutcheon of Hanover was made use of. And the smaller inescutcheon bearing the crown of Charlemagne was also omitted for the children of George III. Except in the case of the Prince of Wales, who bore the plain inescutcheon of gules, but without the crown of Charlemagne thereupon. The labels for the other sons and daughters of King George III were as follows. The Duke of York a label of three points argent, the center point charged with a cross gules. The Duke of York bore upon the inescutcheon of Hanover an inescutcheon argent, in the place occupied in the royal arms by the inescutcheon charged with the crown of Charlemagne, charged with a wheel of six spokes gules. For the bishopric of Osnaburg, which he possessed. The Duke of Clarence, afterwards William IV. A label of three points argent, the center point charged with a cross gules, and each of the others with an anchor erect azure. The Duke of Kent had his label charged with a cross gules between two fleurs de lis azure. The Duke of Sussex. The label argent charged with two hearts in pale gules in the center point between two crosses gules. The Princess Royal, Queen of Wurttemberg, a rose between two crosses gules. The Princess Augusta. A like label, charged with a rose gules between two ermine spots. The Princess Elizabeth, Princess of Hesse Homburg. A like label charged with a cross between two roses gules. The Princess Mary, Duchess of Gloucester, dot, a like label, charged with a rose between two cantons gules. The Princess Sophia, dot, a like label, charged with a heart between two roses gules. The Princess Amelia, dot, a like label, charged with a rose between two hearts gules. The Duke of Gloucester, brother of George III. A label of five points argent, charged with a fleur de lis azure between four crosses gules. His son, afterwards Duke of Gloucester, bore an additional plain label of three points during the lifetime of his father. The royal labels are placed across the shield, on the crest, and on each of the supporters. The crest stands upon and is crowned with a coronet identical with the circlet of any coronet of rank assigned in the same patent, the lion supporter is crowned and the unicorn supporter is gorged with a similar coronet. It may perhaps be of interest to note that no badges and no motto are ever now assigned in these royal warrants except in the case of the Prince of Wales. 
F.M. H.S.H. Prince Leopold of Saxe-Coburg, the consort of H.R.H. The Princess Charlotte, only child of George IV. Received by warrant dated April 7, 1818, the right to use and bear the royal arms, without the Inniscokian of Charlemagne's crown, and without the Hanoverian royal crown, differenced with a label of five points argent. The center point charged with a rose gules, quarterly with the arms of his illustrious house, berry of ten sable and or, a crown of rue in bend vert, the royal arms in the first and fourth quarters. By Queen Victoria's desire this precedent was followed in the case of the late prince consort, the label in his case being of three points argent, the center point charged with a cross gules, and, by a curious coincidence, the arms of his illustrious house, with which the royal arms were quartered, were again the arms of Saxony, these appearing in the second and third quarters. Quite recently a royal warrant has been issued for H.M. Queen Alexandra. This assigns, upon a single shield within the garter, the undifferenced arms of His Majesty impaled with the undifferenced arms of Denmark. The shield is surmounted by the royal crown. The supporters are, Dexter, the Lion of England, and, Sinister, a savage wreathed about the temples and loins with oak and supporting in his exterior hand a club all proper. This sinister supporter is taken from the royal arms of Denmark. Abroad there is now no equivalent whatever to our methods of differencing the royal arms. An official certificate was issued to me recently from Denmark of the undifferenced royal arms of Denmark certified as correct for the princes and princesses of that country. But the German crown prince bears his shield within a boyer gules. And anciently in France, from which country the English system was very probably originally derived, the differencing of the royal French arms for the younger branches seems to have been carefully attended to, as has been already specified. Differencing in Scotland is carried out on an entirely different basis from differencing in England. In Scotland the idea is still rigidly preserved and adhered to that the coat of arms of a family belongs only to the head of the family for the time being. And the terms of a Scottish grant are as follows. Know ye therefore that we have devised and do by these presents assign ratify and confirm to the said, and his descendants with such congruent differences as may hereafter be matriculated for them the following ensigns armorial. Under the accepted interpretation of Scottish armorial law, whilst the inherent gentility conferred by a patent of arms is not denied to cadets. No right to make use of arms is conceded to them until such time as they shall elect to matriculate the arms of their ancestor in their own names. This point has led to a much purer system of heraldry in Scotland than in England, and there is far less heraldic abuse in that country as a result, because the differences are decided not haphazardly by the user himself, as is the case in England. But by a competent officer of arms. Moreover the constant occasions of matriculation bring the arms frequently under official review. There is no fixed rule which decides ipsi facto what difference shall be borne. And consequently this decision has retained in the hands of the heraldic executive an amount of control which they still possess far exceeding that of the executive in England. And perhaps the best way in which to state the rules which hold good will be to reprint a portion of one of the rhymed lectures, delivered by Sir James Balfour Paul which is devoted to the point. I have said that in Scotland the principle which limited the number of paternal coats led to a careful differencing of these coats as borne by the junior branches of the family. Though the English system was sometimes used, it has never obtained to any great extent in Scotland, the practice here being generally to difference by means of a boyer. In which way many more generations are capable of being distinguished than is possible by the English method. The weak point of the Scottish system is that, whilst the general idea is good, there is no definite rule whereby it can be carried out on unchanging lines, much is left to the discretion of the authorities. As a general rule, it may be stated that the second son bears a plain boyer of the tincture of the principal charge in the shield, and his younger brothers also bear plain borgers of varying tinctures. In the next generation the eldest son of the second son would bear his father's coat and boyer without change, the second son would have the boyer enrailed, the third, invected. The fourth, indented, and so on, the other sons of the younger sons in this generation differencing their father's borgers in the same way. The junior members of the next generation might have their borgers parted per pale, 
the following generations having their borgers parted per fess and per salter, per cross or quarterly, gyrony or compony, that is. Divided into alternate spaces of metal or color in a single trace, this, however, being often in Scotland a mark of illegitimacy, countercompone or a similar pattern in two tracts or checky with three or more tracts. You will see that these modifications of the simple boyer afford a great variety of differences, and when they are exhausted the expedient can then be resorted to of placing on the borgers charges taken from other coats. Often from those of a maternal ancestor. Or they may be arbitrarily assigned to denote some personal characteristic of the bearer, as in the case of James Maitland, major in the Scots Regiment of Foot Guards. Who carries the dismembered lion of his family within a boyer wavy azure charged with eight hand grenades or, significant, I presume, of his military profession. You will observe that, with all these varieties of differencing we have mentioned, the younger branches descending from the original eldest son of the parent house are still left unprovided with marks of cadency. These, however, can be arranged for by taking the ordinary which appears in their father's arms and modifying its boundary lines. Say the original coat was Argent, a chevron gules, the second son of the eldest son would have the chevron enrailed, but without any boyer, the third, invected, and so on. And the next generations the systems of borgers accompanying the modified chevron would go on as before. And when all these methods are exhausted, differences can still be made in a variety of ways, e.g. by charging the ordinary with similar charges in a similar manner to the boyer as Erskine of Shieldfield, a cadet of Balgowny, who bore, argent, on a pale sable, a cross-crosslet fitchy or within a boyer azure or by the introduction of an ordinary into a coat which had not won previously, a bend or the ribbon, which is a small bend, being a favorite ordinary to use for this purpose. Again, we occasionally find a change of tincture of the field of the shield used to denote cadency. There are other modes of differencing which need not be alluded to in detail, but I may say that on analyzing the earlier arms in the lion register, I find that the boyer is by far the most common method of indicating cadency being used in no less than 1080 cases. The next most popular way is by changing the boundary lines of an ordinary, which is done in 563 shields, 233 cadets difference their arms by the insertion of a smaller charge on the ordinary and 195 on the shield. A change of tincture, including counterchanging, is carried out in 155 coats, and a canton is added in 70 cases, while there are 350 coats in which two or more of the above methods are used. From these figures, which are approximately correct, you will see the relative frequency of the various modes of differencing. You will also note that the original coat of a family can be differenced in a great many ways so as to show the connection of cadets with the parent house. The drawback to the system is that heralds have never arrived at a uniform treatment so as to render it possible to calculate the exact relationship of the cadets. Much is left, as I said, to the discretion of the officer granting the arms. But still it gives considerable assistance in determining the descent of a family. The late Mr. Stoddart, Lion Clerk Depute, who was an able herald, particularly in matters relating to Scotland, had elaborated a definite system of these borgers for differencing which would have done much to simplify Scottish cadency. Its weak point was obviously this, that it could only be applied to new matriculations of arms by cadets. And so, if adopted as a definite and unchangeable matter of rule, it might have occasioned doubt and misunderstanding in future times with regard to many important Scottish coats now existing, without reference to Mr. Stoddart's system. But the scheme elaborated by Mr. Stoddart is now accepted as the broad basis of the Scottish system for matriculations, figure 732. In early Scottish seals the borgers are to so large an extent enrailed as to make it appear that the later and present rule, which gives the plain borger to immediate cadets, was not fully recognized or adopted. Borgers charged appear at a comparatively early date in Scotland. The borger compony in Scotland and the borger wavy in England, which are now used to signify illegitimacy, will be further considered in a subsequent chapter, but neither one nor the other originally carried any such meaning. The doubtful legitimacy of the Avondale and Oakletree Stuarts, who bore the Boyer Compony in Scotland, along with its use by the Beauforts in England. 
has tended latterly to bring that difference into disrepute in the cadency of lawful sons, yet some of the bearers of that boyer during the first twenty years of the Lion Register were unquestionably legitimate, whilst others, as Scott of Gorenberry and Patrick Sinclair of Ulbester, were illegitimate, or at best only legitimated. The light in which the Boyer Componi had come to be regarded is shown by a royal warrant granted in 1679 to John London of that ilk, allowing him to drop the coat which his family had hitherto carried, and, as descended of a natural son of William the Lion, to bear the arms of Scotland within a Boyer Componi Argent and Azure. The Boyer Counter Company is assigned to fifteen persons, none of them, it is believed, of illegitimate descent, and some expressly said to be lineally and lawfully descended from the ancestor whose arms they bore thus differenced. The idea of this Boyer having been at any time a mark of bastardy is a very modern error, arising from a confusion with the Boyer Componi. Figure 732. The scheme of cadency Borgers devised by Mr. Stoddart. In conclusion, attention needs to be pointedly drawn to the fact that all changes in arms are not due to cadency, nor is it safe always to presume cadency from proved instances of change. Instead of merely detailing isolated instances of variation in a number of different families, the matter may be better illustrated by closely following the successive variations in the same family. And an instructive instance is met with in the case of the arms of the family of Swinton of that ilk. This is peculiarly instructive, because at no point in the descent covered by the arms referred to is there any doubt or question as to the fact of legitimate descent. Claiming as they do a male descent and inheritance from Lyulf the son of Adolf, vice comes of Northumbria. Whose possession before 1100 of the lands of Swinton is the earliest contemporary evidence which has come down to us of landowning by a Scottish subject. It is unfortunate that we cannot with authority date their armorial ensigns before the later half of the 13th century. Charters there are in plenty. Out of the 23 earliest Scottish writings given in the National Mises of Scotland, nine, taken from the Coldingham documents preserved at Durham, refer to the village and lands of Swinton. Among these are two confirmations by David I, i.e. Before 1153, of Swinton, in hereditate sibi et hereditibus, to mio militai hernolfo or arnolto isti mio militai, the first of the family to follow the Norman fashion and adopt the territorial designation of de Swinton. While at Durham and elsewhere, Cospatrick de Swinton and his son Alan and grandson Alan appear more than eighty times in charters before 1250. Figure 733. Seal of Alan de Swinton, circa 1271. But it is not till we come to see. 1271 that we find a Swinton seal still attached to a charter. This is a grant by a third Alan of the Kirk Croft of Lower Swinton to God and the Blessed Cuthbert and the Blessed Ebba and the Prior and Monks of Coldingham. The seal is of a very early form, figure 733, and may perhaps have belonged to the father and grandfather of the particular Alan who uses it. Of the Henry de Swinton who came next, and who swore fealty to Edward I of England at Berwick in 1296, and of yet a fourth Alan, no seals are known. These were turbulent days throughout Scotland, but then we find a distinct advance. A shield upon a diapered ground, and upon it the single boar has given place to the three boars' heads which afterwards became so common in Scotland. Nisbet lends his authority to the tradition that all the families of border birth who carried them, Gordon, Nisbet, Swinton, Redpath, Dunce, he mentions, and he might have added others, were originally of one stock, and if so, the probability must be that the breed sprung from Swinton. Figure 734. Seal of Henry de Swinton, 1378. This seal, figure 734, was put by a second Henry de Swinton to one of the family charters, probably of the date of 1378, which have lately been placed for safe keeping in the register house in Edinburgh. His successor, Sir John, the hero of Noyan in Picardy, of Audubon, and Hamilton, was apparently the first of the race to use supporters. His seal, figure 735, belongs to the second earliest of the Douglas charters preserved at Drumlanrick. Its date is 1389, and Sir John de Swintown is described as Dominus de Mar, a title he bore by right of his marriage with Margaret, Countess of Douglas and March. 
This probably also accounts for his coronet, and it is interesting to note that the helmet, coronet, and crest are the exact counterpart of those on the garter plate of Ralph, Lord Bassett, in St. George's Chapel at Windsor. It is possibly more than a coincidence, for Froissart mentions them both as fighting in France ten to twenty years earlier. Figure 735. Seal of Sir John de Swinton, 1389. Figure 736. Seal of Sir John de Swinton, 1475. Figure 737. Seal of Robert Swinton, of that ilk, 1598. Figure 738. Arms of Swinton. From Swinton Church, 163 Of his son, the second Sir John, Lord of that ilk, we have no seal. His lance it was that overthrew Thomas, Duke of Clarence, the brother of Henry V, at Bosian 1421, and he fell, a young man, three years later with the flower of the Scottish army at Vernuel. But in 1475 his son, a third Sir John, uses the identical crest and shield which his descendants carry to this day, figure 736. John had become a common name in the family, and the same or a similar seal did duty for the next three generations. But in 1598 we find the great-great-grandson, Robert Swinton of that ilk, who represented Berwickshire in the first regularly constituted Parliament of Scotland, altering the character of the boar's heads, figure 737. He would also appear to have placed upon the chevron something which is difficult to decipher, but is probably the rose so borne by the Hepburns, his second wife having been a daughter of Sir Patrick Hepburn of Whitecastle. Whatever the charge was, it disappeared from the shield, figure 738, erected on the outer wall of Swinton Church by his second son and eventual heir, Sir Alexander, also member for his native county. But the boar's heads are turned the other way, perhaps an imitation of those above the very ancient effigy of the first Sir Alan inside the church. Sir Alexander's son, John Swinton, Laird Swinton, Carlyle calls him, wrecked the family fortunes. According to Bishop Burnett he was, the man of all Scotland most trusted and employed by Cromwell, and he died a Quaker, excommunicated and forfeited. To the circumstance that when, in 1672, the order went out that all arms were to be officially recorded, he was a broken man under sentence that his arms should be lace-ret and delete out of the herald's books. We probably owe it that until of late years no Swinton arms appeared on the Lion Register. Figure 739. Bookplate of Sir John Swinton of that ilk, 1707. Figure 740. Bookplate of Archibald Swinton of Kimmergame. Then to come to less stirring times, and turn to bookplates. His son, Yet another Sir John of that ilk, in whose favour the forfeiture was rescinded, sat for Berwickshire in the last Parliament of Scotland and the first of Great Britain. His bookplate, figure 739, is one of the earliest Scottish dated plates. His grandson, Captain Archibald Swinton of Kimmergame, County Berwick, figure 740, was an ardent book collector up to his death in 1804, and Archibald's great grandson, Captain George C. Swinton, fig. 741, walked as March Percivant in the procession in Westminster Abbey at the coronation of King Edward VII of England in 1902, and smote on the gate when that same Edward as first of Scotland claimed admission to his castle of Edinburgh in 1903. Figure 741. Bookplate of Captain George S. Swinton, March Percivant of Arms. The arms as borne today by the head of the family, John Adolph Blagrave Swinton of Swinton Bank, a lieutenant in the Lothians and Berwickshire Imperial Yeomanry, are as given, Plate 4. Chapter 32. Marks of Bastardy. It has been remarked that the knowledge of, the man in the street, is least incorrect when he knows nothing. Probably the only heraldic knowledge that a large number possess is summed up in the assertion that the heraldic sign of illegitimacy is the, bar sinister. No doubt it is to the novelists, who, seeking to touch lightly upon an unpleasant subject, have ignorantly adopted a French colloquialism, that we must attribute a great deal of the misconception which exists concerning illegitimacy and its heraldic marks of indication. I assert most unhesitatingly that there are not now and never have been any unalterable laws as to what these marks should be, and the colloquialism which insists upon the bar sinister is a curiously amusing example of an utter misnomer. 
To anyone with the most rudimentary knowledge of heraldry it must plainly be seen to be radically impossible to depict a bar sinister, for the simple reason that the bar is neither dexter nor sinister. It is utterly impossible to draw a bar sinister, such a thing does not exist. But the assertion of many writers with a knowledge of armory that, bar sinister, is a mistake for, ben sinister, is also somewhat misleading, because the real mistake lies in the spelling of the term. The, bar sinister, is merely the French translation of ben sinister, the French word, bar, meaning a bend. The French, bar, is not the English, bar. In order to properly understand the true significance of the marks of illegitimacy, it is necessary that the attempt should be made to transplant oneself into the environment when the laws and rules of heraldry were in the making. At that period illegitimacy was of little if any account. It has not debarred the succession of some of our own sovereigns, although, from the earliest times, the English have always been more prudish upon the point than other nations. In Ireland, even so late as the reign of Queen Elizabeth, it is a striking genealogical difficulty to decide in many noble pedigrees which if any of the given sons of any person were legitimate, and which of the ladies of his household, if any, might be legally termed his wife. In Scotland we find the same thing, though perhaps it is not quite so blatant to so late a date, but considering what are and have been the Scottish laws of marriage, it is the fact or otherwise of marriage which has to be ascertained. And though in England the legal status was recognized from an earlier period, the social status of the illegitimate offspring of a given man depended little upon the legal legitimacy of birth, but rather upon the amount of recognition the bastard received from his father. If a man had an unquestionably legitimate son, that son undoubtedly succeeded, but if he had not, any technical stain upon the birth of the others had little effect in preventing their succession. A study of the succession to the barony of Maynil clearly shows that the illegitimate son of the second Lord Maynil succeeded to the estates and peerage of his father in preference to his legitimate uncle. There are many other analogous cases. And when the church juggled at its pleasure with the sacrament of marriage, dispensing and annulling or recognizing marriages for reasons which we nowadays can only term whimsical, small wonder is it that the legal fact, though then admitted, had little of the importance which we now give to it. When the actual fact was so little more than a matter at the personal pleasure of the person most concerned, it would be ridiculous to suppose that any perpetuation of a mere advertisement of the fact would be considered necessary. Whilst the fact itself was so often ignored. So that until comparatively recent times the Crown certainly never attempted to enforce any heraldic marks of illegitimacy. Rather were these enforced by the legitimate descendants if and when such descendants existed. The point must have first arisen when there were both legitimate and illegitimate descendants of a given person, and it was desired to make record of the true line in which land or honours should descend. To effect this purpose, the arms of the illegitimate son were made to carry some charge or alteration to show that there was some reason which debarred inheritance by their users. Whilst there remain those entitled to bear the arms without the mark of distinction. But be it noted that this obligation existed equally on the legitimate cadets of a family, and in the earliest periods of heraldry there is little or no distinction either in the marks employed or in the character of the marks. Which can be drawn between mere marks of cadency and marks of illegitimacy. Until a comparatively recent period it is absolutely unsafe to use these marks as signifying or proving either legitimate cadency or illegitimacy. The same mark stood for both, the only object which any distinctive change accomplished, being the distinction which it was necessary to draw between those who owned the right to the undifferenced arms, and owned the land, and those who did not. The object was to safeguard the right of the real possessors and their true heirs, and not to penalize the others. There was no particular mark either for cadency or for illegitimacy, the distinctions made being dictated by what seemed the most suitable and distinctive mark applicable to the arms under consideration. When that much has been thoroughly grasped, one gets a more accurate understanding of the subject. One other point has to be borne in mind, and to the present generation, which knows so well how extensively arms have been improperly assumed, the statement may seem startling, and that is, that the use of arms was formerly evidence of pedigree. As late as the beginning of the 19th century evidence of this character was submitted to the Committee of Privileges at the hearing of a peerage case. 
The evidence was admitted for that purpose, though doubt, in that case very properly, was thrown upon its value. Therefore, in view of the two foregoing facts, there can be very little doubt that the use of armorial marks of bastardy was not invented or instituted, nor were these marks enforced, as punishment or as a disgrace. It is a curious instance how a careful study of words and terms employed will often afford either a clue or confirmation, when the true meaning of the term has long been overlooked. The official term for a mark of cadency is a difference mark, I. E. It was a mark to show the difference between one member of a family and another. The mark used to signify a lack of blood relationship, and a mark used to signify illegitimacy are each termed a mark of distinction, i.e. A mark that shall make something plainly distinct. What is that something? The fact that the use of the arms is not evidence of descent through which airship can be claimed or proved. This, by the way, is a patent example of the advantage of adherence to precedent. The inevitable conclusion is that a bastard was originally only required to mark his shield sufficiently that it should be distinctly apparent that airship would never accrue. The arms had to be distinct from those borne by those members of the family upon whom airship might devolve. The social position of a bastard as belonging to a family was pretty generally conceded, therefore he carried their arms, sufficiently marked to show he was not in the line of succession. This being accepted, one at once understands the great variety of the marks which have been employed. These answered the purpose of distinction, and nothing more was demanded or necessary. Consequently a recapitulation of marks, of which examples can be quoted, would be largely a list of isolated instances. And as such they are useless for the purposes of deduction in any attempt to arrive at a correct conclusion as to what the ancient rules were. In brief, there were no rules until the 18th, or perhaps even until the 19th century. The only rule was that the arms must be sufficiently marked in some way. This is borne out by the dictum of Menestrier. Except the label, which has been elsewhere referred to, the earliest marks of either cadency or illegitimacy for which accepted use can be found are the bend and the boyer. But the bend for the purpose of illegitimacy seems to be the earlier, and a bend superimposed over a shield remained a mark of illegitimate cadency until a comparatively late period. This bend as a difference naturally was originally depicted as a bend dexter, and as a mark of legitimate cadency is found in the arms of the younger son of Edmund Crouchback, Earl of Lancaster, before he succeeded his elder brother. There are scores of other similar instances which a little research will show. Whether the term left-handed marriage is the older, and the sinister bend is derived therefrom, or whether the slang term is derived from the sinister bend, it is perhaps not necessary to inquire. But there is no doubt that from an early period the bend of cadency, when such cadency was illegitimate, is frequently met with in the sinister form. But concurrently with such usage instances are found in which the dexter bend was used for the same purpose, and it is very plainly evident that it was never at that date looked upon as a penalty, but was used merely as a distinction. Or for the purpose of showing that the wearer was not the head of his house or in possession of the lordship. The territorial idea of the nature of arms, which has been alluded to in the chapter upon marks of cadency, should be borne in mind in coming to a conclusion. Soon after the recognition of the bend as a mark of illegitimacy we come across the boyer, but there is some confusion with this, borgers of all kinds being used indiscriminately to denote both legitimate and illegitimate cadency. There are countless other forms of marking illegitimacy, and it is impossible to attempt to summarize them, and absolutely impossible to draw conclusions as to any family from marks upon its arms when this point is under discussion. To give a list of these instances would rather seem an attempt to deduce a rule or rules upon the point, so I say at once that there was no recognized mark, and any plain distinction seems to have been accepted as sufficient. And no distinction whatever was made when the illegitimate son, either from failure of legitimate issue or other reason, succeeded to the lands and honors of his father. Out of the multitude of marks, the bend, and subsequently the bend sinister, emerge as most frequently in use, and finally the bend sinister exclusively. So that it has come to be considered, and perhaps correctly as regards one period, that its use was equivalent to a mark of illegitimacy in England. 
but there has always remained to the person of bastard descent the right of discarding the bastardist coat and adopting a new coat of arms. The only requirement as to the new coat being that it shall be so distinct from the old one as not to be liable to confusion therewith. And it is a moot point whether or not a large proportion of the instances which are tabulated in most heraldic works as examples of marks of bastardy are anything whatever of the kind. My own opinion is that many are not, and that it is a mistake to so consider them. The true explanation undoubtedly in some, and outside the royal family probably in most, being that they are new coats of arms adopted as new coats of arms, doubtless bearing relation to the old family coat but sufficiently distinguished therefrom to rank as new arms, and were never intended to be taken as, and never were bastardist examples of formerly existing coats. It is for this reason that I have refrained from giving any extensive list such as is to be found in most other treatises on heraldry, for all that can be said for such lists is that they are lists of the specific arms of specific bastards. Which is a very different matter from a list of heraldic marks of illegitimacy. Another objection to the long lists which most heraldic works give of early instances of marks of bastardy as data for deduction lies in the fact that most are instances of the illegitimate children of royal personages. It is singularly unsafe to draw deductions, to be applied to the arms of others, from the royal arms, for these generally have laws unto themselves. The bend sinister in its bare simplicity, as a mark of illegitimacy, was seldom used, the more frequent form being the sinister bendlet, or even the diminutive of that, the cadiz. There is no doubt, of course, that when a sinister bend or bendlet debruises another coat that that is a bastardist version of an older coat. But examples can be found of the sinister bend as a charge which has no reference whatever to illegitimacy. Two instances that come to mind, which can be found by reference to any current peerage, are the arms of Schiffner and Burne Jones. Certainly in these cases I know of no illegitimacy, and neither coat is a bastardist version of an older existing coat. Anciently the bendlet was drawn across arms and quarterings, and an example of a coat of arms of some number of quarterings debruised for an illegitimate family is found in the registration of a Talbot pedigree in one of the visitation books. As a mark of distinction upon arms the bend sinister for long past has fallen out of use, though for the purpose of differencing crests a bendlet wavy sinister is still made use of, and will be again presently referred to. Next to the bend comes the boyer. Borgers of all kinds were used for the purposes of cadency from practically the earliest periods of heraldic differencing. But they were used indiscriminately, as has been already stated, both for legitimate and illegitimate cadency. John of Gaunt, as is well known, was the father of Henry IV and the ancestor of Henry the Seventh, The former being the issue of his legitimate wife, the latter coming from a son who, as one of the old chroniclers puts it, was of double advoutry begotten. But, as every one knows, John of Gaunt's children by Catherine Rowett or Swinford were legitimated by Act of Parliament, the Act of Parliament not accepting the succession to the throne. A disability later introduced in letters patent of the Crown when giving a subsequent confirmation of the Act, but which, nevertheless, they could not overrule. But taking the sons of the latter family as legitimate, which, whatever may have been the moral aspect of the case, they were undoubtedly in the eyes of the common law after the passing of the act referred to. They existed concurrently with the undoubtedly senior descendants of the first marriage of John of Gaunt with Blanche of Lancaster. And it was necessary, whether they were legitimate or not, to distinguish the arms of the junior from the senior branch. The result was that as legitimate cadets, and not as bastards, the arms of John of Gaunt were differenced for the line of the Dukes of Somerset by the addition of the Boyer Compony Argent and Azure, the livery colours of Lancaster. It is a weird position, for these colours were derived from the family of the legitimate wife. The fight as to whether these children were legitimate or illegitimate was, of course, notorious, and a matter of history. But from the fact that they bore a Boyer Compony, an idea grew up both in this country and in Scotland also from the similarity of the cases of the doubtful legitimacy of the Avondale and Oakletree Stuarts, who both used the Boyer Compony. That the Boyer Compony was a sign of illegitimacy, whereas in both countries at an earlier period it undoubtedly was accepted as a mark of legitimate cadency. 
As a mark of bastardy it had subsequently some extensive use in both countries, and it still remains the only mark now used for the purpose in Scottish heraldry. Whether it was that it was not considered as of a fixed nature, or whether it was that it had become notorious and unacceptable, it is difficult to say. Though the officers of arms have been blamed for making a change on the assumption that it was the latter. Some writers who clamor strongly for the penalizing of bastard arms, and for the plain and recognizable marking of them as such, a position adopted rather vehemently by Woodward, a singularly erudite heraldic writer, are rather uncharitable. And at the same time rather lacking in due observation and careful consideration of ancient ideas and ancient precedents. That the recognized mark has been changed at different periods, and as a consequence that to a certain extent the advertisement it conveys has been less patent is, of course. Put down to the venality of medieval heralds, happily their backs are broad, by those who are too short-sighted to observe that the one thing an official herald moves heaven and earth to escape from is the making of a new precedent. And that, on the score of signs of illegitimacy, the official heralds, when the control of arms passed into their hands, found no established rule. So far from having been guilty of venality, as Woodward suggests, they have erred on the other side, and by having worked only on the limited number of precedents they found they have stereotyped the advertisement. And thereby made the situation more stringent than they found it. We have it from biblical sources that the sins of the fathers shall be visited upon the children unto the third and fourth generations, and this spirit has undoubtedly crept into the views of many writers. But to get into the true perspective of the matter one needs to consider the subject from the point of view of less prudish days than our own. I have no wish to be misunderstood. In these days much heraldic reviewing of the blatant and baser sort depends not upon the value of the work performed, a point of view which is never given a thought, but entirely upon the identity of the writer whose work is under review. And is largely composed of misquotation and misrepresentation. It may perhaps be as well, therefore, to state that I am not seeking to condone illegitimacy or to combat present opinions upon the point. I merely state that our present opinions are a modern growth, and that in the 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries, when the fundamental principles of heraldry were in the making. It was not considered a disgrace to have an illegitimate son, nor was it considered then that to be of illegitimate birth carried the personal stigma that came later. At any rate, the fact remains that a new mark was called into being in England about the year 1780 when in a grant to Zachary to quarter the arms of Sacheverell, from which family he was in the female line illegitimately descended. The Boyer Wavy was first met with as a sufficient and proper mark of illegitimacy. The curious point is that before that date in Scotland and in England the Boyer Wavy possessed nothing of this character, and to the present day the Boyer Wavy in Scotland is undoubtedly nothing more than a legitimate mark of legitimate cadency. For which mark Mr. Stoddart provides a place in the scheme of differencing which he tabulated as the basis of cadency marks in Scotland, figure 732. Since that date the Boyer Wavy has remained the mark which has been used for the purpose in England, as the Boyer Compony has remained the mark in Scotland. Bearing in mind that the only necessity was some mark which should carry sufficient distinction from the arms of the family, it follows, as a natural consequence of human nature. That as soon as any particular mark became identified with illegitimacy, after that was considered to be a stigma, that mark was quietly dropped and some other substituted. And no one should be surprised to find the Borgers wavy and Compony quietly displaced by something else. If any change is to be made in the future it is to be hoped that no existing mark will be adopted, and that the marks in England and Scotland shall not conflict even if they do not coincide. The Bendlet Sinister, however, survives in the form of the Batten Sinister, which is a bendlet cooped placed across the center of the shield. The Batten Sinister, however, is a privilege which, as a charge on a shield, is reserved, such as it is, for royal bastards. The latest instance of this was in the exemplification of arms to the Earl of Munster and his brothers and sisters early in the 19th century. Other surviving instances are met with in the arms of the Duke of St. Albans and the Duke of Grafton. Another privilege of royal bastards is that they may have the baton of metal, a privilege which is, according to Barry, denied to those of humbler origin. 
According to present law the position of an illegitimate person heraldically is based upon the common law of the country, which practically declares that an illegitimate child has no name, no parentage, and no relations. The illegitimacy of birth is an insuperable bar to inheritance, and a person of illegitimate birth inherits no arms at all, the popular idea that he inherits a right to the arms subject to a mark of distinction being quite incorrect. He has none at all. There has never been any mark which, as a matter of course and of mere motion, could attach itself automatically to a shield, as is the case with the English marks of difference, e.g. the crescent of the second son or the mullet of the third. This is a point upon which I have found mistaken ideas very frequently held, even by those who have made some study of heraldry. But a very little thought should make it plain that by the very nature of the fact there cannot be either a recognized mark, compulsory use, or an ipsi facto sign. Illegitimacy is negative, not positive, a fact which many writers hardly give sufficient weight to. If any one of illegitimate birth desires to obtain a right to arms he has two courses open to him. He can either, not disclosing the fact of his illegitimacy, and not attempting to prove that he is a descendant of any kind from anyone else, apply for and obtain a new grant of arms on his own basis. And worry through the college the grant of a coat as closely following in design that of the old family as he can get. Which means that he would be treated and penalized with such alterations, not marks of distinction, as would be imposed upon a stranger in blood endeavoring to obtain arms founded upon a coat to which he had no right. The cost of such a proceeding in England is seventy-six pounds, tens, the usual fees upon an ordinary grant. The alternative course is simple. He must avow himself a bastard, and must prove his paternity or maternity, as the case may be, for in the eye of the law, common and heraldic, he bears the same relation, which is nil, and the same right to the name and arms, which is nil. Of both his father and his mother. Illegitimacy under English law affords one of the many instances in which anomalies exist, for, strange as the statement is, a bastard comes into the world without any name at all. Legally, at birth a bastard child has then no name at all, and no arms. It must subsequently acquire such right to a name, whatever right that may amount to, as user of and reputation therein may give him. He inherits no arms at all, no name, and no property, save by specific devise or bequest. The lack of parents operates as a chasm which it is impossible to bridge. It is not a case of a peculiar bridge or a faulty bridge, there is no bridge at all. Names, in so far as they are matters of law, are subject to canon law, at any rate, the law upon the subject, such as it is, originated in canon law, and not in statute or common law. Canon law was made, and has never since been altered, at a time when surnames were not in existence. A bastard no more inherits the surname of the mother than it does the surname of its father. And the spirit of petty officialism, so rampant amongst the clergy, which seeks to impose upon a bastard Nolan's volans the surname of its mother, has no justification in law or fact. A bastard has precisely as little right to the surname of its mother as it has to the surname of its father. Obviously, however, under the customs of our present social life, every person must have a surname of one kind or another. And it is here that the anomaly in the British law exists, inasmuch as neither statute nor canon law provide any means for conferring a surname. That the king has the prerogative, and exercises it, of conferring or confirming surnames is, of course, unquestioned. But it is hardly to be supposed that the king will trouble himself to provide a surname for every illegitimate child which may be born. And outside this prerogative, which probably is exercised about once a year, there is no method provided or definitely recognized by the law to meet this necessity. To obviate the difficulty, the surname has to be that which is conferred upon the child by general custom. And as an illegitimate child is in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred brought up by its mother, it is usually by the same custom which confers the surname of its owner upon a dog in so many parts of the country that a bastard child gets known by its mother's surname, and consequently has that surname conferred upon it by general custom. The only names that an illegitimate child has an inalienable right to are the names by which it is baptized. 
And if two names are given, and the child or its guardians elect that it should be known only by those baptismal names, and if common repute and general custom, as would be probable, uses the last of those names as a surname. There is no legal power on earth which can force upon the child any other name. And if the last of the baptismal names happens to be its father's surname, the child will have an absolute right to be known only by its Christian names, which to all intents and purposes will mean that it will be known by its father's surname. In the same way that an illegitimate child inherits no surname at all, it equally inherits no arms. Consequently it has no shield upon which to carry a mark of bastardy, if such a mark happened to be in existence. But if under a will or deed of settlement an illegitimate child is required to assume the name and arms of its father or of its mother, a royal license to assume such name and arms is considered to be necessary. It may be here noted that voluntary applications to assume a name and arms in the case of an illegitimate child are not entertained unless it can be clearly shown, which is not always an easy matter, what the parentage really was. It will be noticed that I have said he will be required to prove his paternity. This is rigorously insisted upon, inasmuch as it is not fair to penalize the reputation of a dead man by inflicting upon him a record of bastard descendants whilst his own life might have been stainless. An illegitimate birth is generally recorded under the name of the mother only, and even when it is given, the truth of any statement as to paternity is always open to grave suspicion. There is nothing, therefore, to prevent a person asserting that he is the son of a duke, whereas his real father may have been in a very plebeian walk in life. And to put the arms of the duke's family at the mercy of any fatherless person who chose to fancy a different version of them would be manifestly unjust, so that without proof in a legal action of the actual paternity, or some recognition under a will or settlement, it is impossible to adopt the alternative in question. But if such recognition or proof is forthcoming, the procedure is to petition the sovereign for a royal license to use, or continue to use, the name desired and to bear the arms of the family. Such a petition is always granted, on proper proof of the facts, if made in due form through the proper channels. The royal license to that effect is then issued. But the document contains two conditions, the first being that the arms shall be exemplified according to the laws of arms, with due and proper marks of distinction, and that the royal license shall be recorded in the College of Arms. Otherwise, to be void and of none effect. The invariable insertion of this clause puts into the hands of the college one of the strongest weapons the officers of arms possess. Under the present practice the due and proper marks of distinction are, for the arms, a boyer wavy round the shield of the most suitable color, according to what the arms may be. But if possible of some color or metal different from any of the tinctures in the arms. The crest is usually differenced by a bendlet sinister wavy, but a pallet wavy is sometimes used, and sometimes a salter wavy, cooped or otherwise. The choice between these marks generally depends upon the nature of the crest. But even with this choice, the anomaly is frequently found of blank space being carefully debrosed. Seeing that the mark of the debrosing is not a tangible object or thing, but a mark painted upon another object, such a result seems singularly ridiculous, and ought to be avoided. Whilst the ancient practice certainly appears to have been to make some slight change in the crest, it does not seem to have been debrosed in the present manner. There are some number of more recent cases where, whilst the existing arms have been charged with the necessary marks of distinction, entirely new, or very much altered crests have been granted without any recognizable marks of distinction. There can be no doubt that the bendlet wavy sinister upon the crest is a palpable penalizing of the bearer, and I think the whole subject of the marks of bastardy in the three kingdoms might with advantage be brought under official consideration. With a view to new regulations being adopted. A bendlet wavy sinister is such an absolute defacement of a crest that few can care to make use of a crest so marked. It carries an effect far beyond what was originally the intention of marks of distinction. A few recent bastardist exemplifications which have issued from Ulster's office have had the crest charged with a batten cooped sinister. The batten cooped sinister had always hitherto been confined to the arms of royal bastards, but I am not aware of any royal crest so bastardist. 
Of course no circumstances can be conceived in which it is necessary to debrue supporters, as under no circumstances can these be the subject of a royal license of this character. Except in a possible case where they might have been granted as a simple augmentation to a man and his descendants, without further limitation. I know of no bastardist version consequent upon such a grant. Supporters signify some definite honor which cannot ordinarily survive illegitimacy. The Boyer wavy is placed round the pronominal arms only, and no right to any quarterings the family may have enjoyed previously is conferred, except such right to a quarterly coat as might ensue through the assumption of a double name. Quartering is held to signify representation which cannot be given by a royal license. But a quartering of augmentation or a duplicate coat for the pronominal name which had been so regularly used with the alternative coat as to constitute the two something in the nature of a compound coat would be exemplified all within a boyer wavy. Each illegitimate coat stands on its own basis, and there is a well-known instance in which a marriage was subsequently found to be illegal, or to have never taken place, after which, I believe, some number of brothers and sisters obtained royal licenses and exemplifications. The descendants of one of the brothers will be found in the current peerage books, and those who know their peerage history well will recognize the case I allude to. All the brothers and sisters had the same arms exemplified, each with a boyer wavy of a different color. If there were descendants of any of the sisters, those descendants would have been entitled to quarter the arms, because the illegitimacy made each sister an heiress for heraldic purposes. This is a curious anomaly, for had they been legitimate the descendants would have enjoyed no such right. In Scotland the mark of illegitimacy for the arms is the boyer componi, which is usually but not always indicative of the same. The Boyer Counter Company has been occasionally stated to have the same character. This is hardly correct, though it may be so in a few isolated cases, but the Boyer Checky has nothing whatever of an illegitimate character. It will be noticed that whilst the Boyer Company and the Boyer Counter Company have their checkers or panes, to use the heraldic term, following the outline of the shield, by lines parallel to those which mark its contour. The Boyer Checky is drawn by lines parallel to and at right angles to the paler line of the shield, irrespective of its outline. A Boyer Checky must, of course, at one point or another show three distinct rows of checks. The bastardising of crests even in England is a comparatively modern practice. I know of no single instance ancient or modern of the kind in Scottish heraldry, though I could mention scores of achievements in which the shields carry marks of distinction. This is valuable evidence, for no matter how lax the official practice of Scottish armory may have been at one period, the theory of Scottish armory far more nearly approaches the ancient practices and rules of heraldry than does the armory of any other country. That theory is much nearer the ideal theory than the English one, but unfortunately for the practical purposes of modern heraldic needs, it does not answer so well. At the present day, therefore, a Scottish crest is not marked in any way. Most handbooks refer to a certain rule which is supposed to exist for the differencing of a coat to denote illegitimacy when the coat is that of the mother and not the father, the supposed method being to depict the arms under a surcoat. The result being much the same as if the whole of the arms appeared in exaggerated flaunches, the remainder of the shield being left vacant except for the tincture of the surcoat. As a matter of fact only one instance is known, and consequently we must consider it as a new coat devised to bear reference to the old one, and not as a regularized method of differencing for a particular set of circumstances. In Ireland the rules are to all intents and purposes the same as in England, with the exception of the occasional use of a sinister batten instead of a bendlet wavy sinister upon the crest. In Scotland, where royal licenses are unknown, it is merely necessary to prove paternity, and rematriculate the arms with due and proper marks of distinction. It was a very general idea during a former period, but subsequently to the time when the bend and bendlet sinister and the boyer were recognized as in the nature of the accepted marks of bastardy, and when their penal nature was admitted. That whatever mark was adopted for the purpose of indicating illegitimacy need only be borne for three generations. Some of the older authorities tell us that after that length of time had elapsed it might be discarded, and some other and less objectionable mark be taken in its place. The older writers were striving, 
consciously or unconsciously, to reconcile the disgrace of illegitimacy, which they knew, with heraldic facts which they also knew. And to reconcile in certain prominent families undoubted illegitimacy with unmarked arms, the probability being that their sense of justice and regard for heraldry prompted them to the remark that some other mark of distinction ought to be added. Whilst all the time they knew it never was. The arms of Byron, Somerset, Maynill, and Herbert are all cases where the marks of illegitimacy have been quietly dropped, entire reversion being had to the undifferenced original coat. At a time when marks of illegitimacy, both in fact and in theory, were nothing more than marks of cadency and difference from the arms of the head of the house, it was no venality of the heralds, but merely the acceptance of current ideas. That permitted them to recognize the undifferenced arms for the illegitimate descendants when there were no legitimate owners from whose claim the arms of the others needed to be differentiated. And when lordships and lands had lapsed to a bastard branch. To this fact must be added another. The armorial control of the heralds after the days of tournaments was exercised through the visitations and the Earl Marshal's court. Peers were never subject to the visitations, and so were not under control unless their arms were challenged in the Earl Marshal's court by the rightful owner. The cases that were notorious are cases of the arms of peers. The visitations gave the officers of arms greater control over the arms of commoners than they had had theretofore, and the growing social opinions upon legitimacy and marriage brought social observances more into conformity with the technical law. And made that technical law of no inheritance and no paternity an operative fact. The result is that the hard legal fact is now rigidly and rightly insisted upon, and the claim and right to arms of one of illegitimate descent depends and is made to depend solely upon the instruments creating that right. And the conditions of due and proper marks of distinction always subject to which the right is called into being. Nowadays there is no release from the penalty of the Borgers' wavy and Componi save through the avenue of a new and totally different grant and the full fees payable therefore. But, as the bearer of a Boyer wavy once remarked to me, I had rather descend illegitimately from a good family and bear their arms marked than descend from a lot of nobodies and use a new grant. But until the common law is altered, if it ever is, the game must be played fairly and the conditions of a royal license observed, for the sins of the fathers are visited upon the children. Although I have refrained from giving any extended list of bastardist coats as examples of the rules for indicating illegitimacy, reference may nevertheless be made to various curious examples. The canton has occasionally been used. Sir John de Warren, a natural son of John, Earl of Surrey, Sussex, and Warren, died in 1347, bore a canton of the arms of his mother, Alice de Nerford, Gules, a lion rampant ermine, over the checky shield of Warren. A similar instance can be found in modern times, the arms of Charlton of Apley Castle, Company Salop, being bastardised by a sinister canton which bears two coats quarterly, these coats having formerly been quarterings born in the usual manner. The custom of placing the paternal arms upon a bend has been occasionally adopted, but this of course is the creation of a new coat. It was followed by the Beauforts before their legitimation, and by Sir Roger de Clarendon, the illegitimate son of the Black Prince. The Somerset family, who derived illegitimately from the Beauforts, Dukes of Somerset, first debrused the Beaufort arms by a bendlet sinister, but in the next generation the arms were placed upon a wide fess, this on a plain field of ore. Although the Somersets, Dukes of Beaufort, have discarded all signs of bastardy from their shield, the version upon the fess was continued as one of the quarterings upon the arms of the old Shropshire family of Somerset Fox. One of the most curious bastardist coats is that of Henry Fitzroy, Duke of Richmond and Somerset, illegitimate son of Henry VIII. This shows the royal arms within a boyer quarterly ermine in counter company or an azure, debruised by a batten sinister argent, an inescutching quarterly gules and ver, or an vert, possibly hinting at the blunt arms of his mother. Berry nebulae or an sable, over all a lion rampant argent, on a chief azure a tower between two stags heads cabo shed argent, a tired or. Chapter 33 The Marshalling of Arms